Yeah, thank you all for, for agreeing to participate. This is absolutely uh, fantastic. So we're here to talk about uh, the topic is artist signings in 2020, uh, particularly as it pertains to artists that are previously unsigned. But I'd love to hear your opinions on you know running the gamut. Uh, so just a, a quick rundown of who you guys all are. I got Andy from Fearless. Eric from Hopeless, Carl from Good Fight, and Blasco from Mercenary with us today. Thank you all very much. I was hoping that because if we release this as an audio version that you guys would be willing to um, uh, take a moment to uh, uh, get people familiar to, with your voice before I start asking the questions. So uh, uh, Andy, if you wouldn't mind starting uh, just a few seconds uh, about yourself, I'd really appreciate that. And then we'll pass along to the next person. Uh, hey, I'm Andy Sorio, I head up Fearless Records. I also head up the a &R there. Uh, I'm glad to join us I'm with a group of very, very fine gentlemen I have a long history with and <laughs> honored to be invited here. Excellent. Uh, Eric? Uh, I'm Eric Tobin, and I do a &R at Hopeless Records and known Maori for 123 years, and uh, that's <laughs> been really good for me. I think, um, and look forward, thanks for having me on here, look forward to uh, chatting. Thank you, and uh, Blasco. Hey, uh, I'm Blasco, I'm happy to be here. Hey to everyone, I haven't seen or talked to most of you in a, quite a while, so I'm glad this pulled us all together. Uh, I, as a musician, I play bass for Ozzy Osbourne, and I also have a management company, and um, I manage a bunch of bands, so. Uh, and I've been doing that for 15 years. So that's my brief bio. Awesome. And Carl, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to ha have you um, uh, introduce yourself, and then I'm going to ask you the first question. All right. I, uh, my name's Carl. I uh, uh, own a company called Good Fight Entertainment. I'm a, I own the record label, which is Good Fight Music. I'm a partner in the management company, Good Fight Management. Uh, I also do A and R for E One Heavy with, and there's a good fight imprint there. Um, I've known Maori since the '90s, and we were in shitty bands together. And I made him move a couch for me once because he had a van and I didn't. I've also known. <laughs> I lived with, uh, in a bus with Tobin for uh, two weeks, and Blasco and Andy. I've known you guys for for way too long as well. So uh, I, I appreciate you guys asking me to be here. Excellent, thank you. Carl, what was your outlook for 2020 and how has coronavirus changed that, both for your, your yeah, for, for everything that you do? So it's, it's been, uh, so honestly, I was looking down the, the barrel of, so I started doing management, um, I guess a decade ago, something like that. Previously, I've been doing, you know, since the 90s, I've just, my main focus has been the record label. And then uh, when we started Good Fight, I started delving into management as well, like, you know, something like Glasgow, though, um, and doing both. And uh, I felt like as we were going more digital, that having, you know, a supplementary service-based business that didn't cost me anything but made revenue would help. Uh, I was looking down my biggest year of management ever. Uh, brought on two new clients that were super exciting, are still super exciting. Things were looking great. Um, and now none of that is happening. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where it's like, all right, this is what I was looking forward to. This is what I projected. And now this is the reality of it. Um, I'm okay because I have the record label and obviously the vast majority of our business is digital and that's going to get us through. Um, but I've spent the last three weeks, the vast majority of my time is doing a, pretty much anything I can to find the, the various outlets that our artists can use to find for uh, uh, government funding, whether it's unemployment for artists or the SBA stuff or music cares and all there. There's so many funds that are set up for artists, which is great. They're not applicable to me, but they're applicable to my band. So I've been doing the best I can to find, to push those towards the guys. And Eric, uh, can you relate to uh, what Carl's going through? You, do you have a different set of, uh, a different agenda? Did you have a different outlook for this year than what he had? You know, I think that I, I can, 
some of it's that way. I mean, the, the one thing that I don't have to, to deal with as much is, is touring on my side. I don't have any of that. Um, my, our year has, has generally not changed too much. We've changed a couple of things. Um, those artists that have already had uh, their releases set up, we're trying to stick to those schedules. Um, we're trying not to change it because, you know, I think there's even more of a bottleneck come the end of this year. You know, if everybody's canceled this year. They're trying to, to figure out fall time and springtime. We're trying to keep releases in the same place. Um, and have contingency plans. So my year hasn't, uh, it hasn't changed too dramatically. Um, you know, I think we're trying to keep as many things in place as we can. And those things that aren't announced, trying to move them along. But they, so far going to this year, it's, uh, and I'll say this too, it's a little case by case. And we've only been in this for about three weeks, four weeks. I don't actually know all of the things that have changed yet, because I think some of the stuff that has initially changed feels like we've got under control. The bigger question is what hasn't changed yet that we don't have under control, if that makes any sense at all. And Blasco, I would imagine that touring is a much bigger piece of your pie than perhaps it is with the A&R guys, right? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, first thing I want to say, though, is just anyone that's listening to the audio portion of this, you know, we're, we're doing this via video conference, and i just like to give a thumbs up to Carl proudly um, uh, in front of his Nickelback multi-platinum record, just, uh, okay, you know, it's just zero fucks. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so, uh, but, but yes, my year has been totally, uh, turned upside down. So, you know, um, uh, improvise, right? Like, uh, you do what you got to do. And, um, and, uh, but yeah, man, I had a, I had a hot shit year planned out that now is, um, in the, in the crapper. Um, so I, I got to You know, I'm just in a position to improvise and adapt, um, as all of us are. Um, and we have, you know, no real light at the end of the tunnel. So, um, you know, we're just doing all, I think we're, all of us are kind of relatively doing all the same things and have all the same struggles and, you know, we just hope to get out of it sooner than later. Thanks. And Andy, because uh, you're doing the A&R side of things, uh, did you have a particular perspective on who you wanted to sign or what you wanted to look for in artists that you wanted to sign when you started this year that change, has now changed because of coronavirus? You know, I, I wouldn't say a lot has changed. We, you know, we, we still want to sign unique, great artists that we believe in. I think there is a, a moment of, of hesitancy where you're just trying to pivot on your current records and knowing that we all had things slide um, from 20 to 21, because as we're looking at the analytics, that people were pointing to think what people are doing in times of uncertainty. They're eating comfort foods, they're listening to Christmas music, for Christ's sake. On the radio, Christmas songs are being played currently. So new music discovery is becoming a challenge, right? It, you, we can all listen to our, uh, in Carl's case, our favorite Nickelback records, or in, in my case, uh, a Smith's record. But we can all, we can all listen to something uh, that we're comfortable with, uh, but music, new music discovery is going to be tough. So we have a handful of artists on our roster that we're, we're sliding because so much of our development is, is dependent on touring. And that's where touring really, um, and, and festivals and having the right looks. And that's where all of our worlds kind of collide there for a minute because, you know, you, you got to hang your head on the touring for the development. And when it's not there and you're seeing slides, things slide into March of next year, and I'm hearing there's no availability from the agents that still have jobs, then we're then we're all looking for a world of hurt. So you know, fortunately, you know, for fearless, we have, uh, you know, we have had great years in a row, and we're putting together a very productive year this year. Um, obviously, you know, we've had to make changes to um, just release schedules and just the uncertainty. And I think the biggest thing for myself and and Eric kind of mentioned is like it, it it's really just all fluid. We we have releases that we want to stick to this year. We want people to have a reason to smile and get behind something. But at the same, get behind the artists and support them. But at the same time, we have to look that you know uh, it's twenty five percent of this country may be unemployed in two months, and and we also have to factor those things in. So getting through those tough times is, you know, we're not. It's the world. It's everyone, and we want artists to have a fair shot. But it's not very fair for us to be to to say, hey, let's put your record out in May, but you may not see the road again till March um, or April, and that that could be. Uh, disheartening so you know fingers crossed that you know we all we all wake up out of this bad dream in july and we have some runway to the fall and people can um feel comfortable and be safe going to shows again and, and you know we turn the switch back on but 
you know, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm looking at the fall and I think it's going to be great. It's going to be bottlenecked for sure. And, um, I mean, and I'm looking at next year and I want everyone to recover. I want the world to recover, but, uh, you know, in terms of signing artists, I think we're still very open to everything, all levels. Eric, is that the same with you? I'm muting. Um, yeah, it is. I mean, there's no change in, uh, um, you know, to even just back Annie's point up, like there's no change in that strategy of signing. I think that if anything right now, um, uh, unsigned artists especially have an opportunity to uh, create uh, and not just create, but connect with the fans that they have. And um, so our strategies we're still looking for things that are unique, interesting, and know how to connect with fans. And um, never was there a better time for those artists to not say the words, I need to be on tour because you can't. So I don't, uh, there's no excuse in that space. So yeah, we're still, nothing's really changed on the, the A&R front. Um, if anything, there's an opportunity to look at more right now. And Mike, uh, anything that you're doing with 10th Street that uh, are, are you looking at artists at all, uh, signing from the management side of things? Is that on pause? Is that something that was already on pause anyway? Um, it's really a case by case basis. Um, there is some stuff that we're looking at. And, you know, I think the philosophy has changed just a little bit um, in regards to knowing what it takes to break and develop artists, which typically has been a lot of touring, we might be looking at something that's already got its legs moving on the social side, um, you know, that we can make an impact on for when things do adjust. Um, and we come out of this with whatever the new normal is. Um, you know, and for the artists that I handle in particular, um, you know, I'm really using it as an opportunity to try to look under the hood of the automobile and do some maintenance while the vehicle isn't moving at 100 miles an hour down the road. So it's a really unique time. And thankfully, we've got a little bit of a buffer. Um, you know, uh, we've just, you know, if we come out of this, as Andy talked about with touring in the fall, we're just going to move a couple pieces around and have a, a really good strategy to, you know, hopefully make the most of it. If things change beyond that, you know, I think that's where everybody, as Eric said, you know, we just have no real map for that yet. Carl, can I ask you uh, whether coronavirus or anything else in 2020 has significantly changed what you look at, what metrics you're paying attention to? Mike mentioned social. Uh, when you're looking at artists that you're considering signing? I don't think it's changed anything as far as artists signing some things go. Like when this whole, you know, when Armageddon popped up on us, I had five or six bands that I've been in conversations with that I was chasing and hoping to, you know, potentially sign. Um, all those bands I still have been maintaining relationships with and talking to and things like that. And it's just, uh, you know, so nothing's changed as far as that goes. Um, you know, my situation's a little unique. I have my own record label, which is, you know, Good Fight. We call it Good Fight Proper. And then I have a Good Fight imprint at E1. Um, and obviously everything I do at E1, um, <clears throat> I have, you know, people above me that, you know, lay the law as far as what we're able to do. And, uh, you know, so yeah, everyone's looking at it and we're like, all right, what's our budget's going to be like for the rest of this year and for, for next year. And, uh, one of, one of the things that is applicable to both my label and to E1 heavy is, releases that we were planning for spring right now and for you know later in the summer we're pushing so all of a sudden you've got a release schedule where you're looking at like all right shit all of a sudden you know fall 2020 is looking pretty full and honestly also skeptical because we don't know what's going to happen there and then it gets and then all of a sudden 2021 is getting really really full so so yeah, that, that has something to do with it when, you know, when you're looking at budgets and various things like that. Um, yeah, it's how to fit everything in there. And beyond that, the responsibility to the bands that you're signing, you're like, all right, um, if I'm going to sign two or three bands for releases at the end of this year and in 2021. Um, and then all of a sudden it's like, all right, now you're going to be stacked on top of you know, these other releases, you know, potentially, you know, large releases from, you know, bigger bands as opposed to, 
you know, like bands that I'm signing that are developing bands, like, you know, so it's, it's, that absolutely takes into effect. You have to, you know, it's, you have to do your due diligence to the artist and make sure that like the manpower of the record label is there to make sure that you can, you know, do the work for each artist as opposed to like, I don't want to put out three records in the same month, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, it, even things are changing. Absolutely. I'm still chasing the exact same bands and I still want to get a hold of all of them. And I still got to tell them, you know, and, and you know, bands because they're like, I know this shit is crazy, but our record's ready to go. So you think we can get it out in October? And it's like, hmm, probably no, you know? And so it's one of those things where it's like, all right, we're, we still want to do this, but we have to figure out when's going to be best for you. And, you know, and every band is ready to go. As soon as you tell them like, all right, time to go, they're ready to go. But you got to make sure that all the guns are firing behind them as well. And that's in their best interest. So, you know, it's, it's been, it's weird to think about that sort of thing. And we're trying to do the best by all the bands that we're looking at. And also the bands that we've already signed that have new records coming and things like that. So it's trying to shake it all out and how we're going to figure it. Thanks. Blasco, there are two things that jumped out at me that I wanted to ask you about uh, that, that Carl just said. One is budgets and how this has been so financially challenging, what that might do for budgets for the artists that you work with. And then secondary to that being, uh, I'm not sure what artists you might have had that had releases like that happened right before the S hit the fan and how this has crippled their ability to support the album. Can you talk about either of those or both? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I mean, fortunately, the majority of my artists were in a position to make a record. And fortunately, they all had record labels that weren't financially crippled. So we were able to extract some of the advance to put them in the studio and start writing and, and crafting a record that will come out early 2021. So, uh, so the way I'm kind of looking at it is we sort of shifted to studio time. Uh, we're able to pick up a little bit of change to kind of cover the difference. And this is time that was going to needed to be spent anyway. Um, so as much as everyone would have liked to have been out touring, making money and, you know, seeing their fans, at least we're using, utilizing this time constructively. Um, and, you know, we just kind of push forward, you know, those, those, those budgets. So that was, and like I said, fortunately, I was in a position to make records for all those bands, like they were long overdue. And, you know, so now it's just kind of logical that we, we pivoted to that you know scenario so um does that answer your question kind yeah of? absolutely thanks uh andy is that something uh, that uh, you've been playing with uh, over uh, over at your place uh, yeah, yeah you know i think yeah i think you know it the first immediate reaction was like okay now we don't have to rush anything let's get in the studio let's write the records let's get it to the point or we're going to have a better product whenever the switch gets turned back on, right? Um, the the challenge there is a, a, a writing session over Zoom is about half uh, as productive as a face to face, and a lot of our artists and some of our um, some of our things to build in our runway to these records in the fall are are in a in a tough spot. The you know we can't really go film a, a music videos. We can't do certain photo shoots. And we certainly can't get people in the room together um, as people read further and further, especially in LA where most of our work is done. You know, we're, we're in a pretty bad spot as we were discussing earlier. Shouldn't even be going to buy groceries at this point. But, you know, I think, you know, the, when the first, when we kind of went first on lockdown, I was like, cool, let's pivot. Let's give everyone the tools to be able, all of our artists, the tools and managers to go and create. And I think what, where there is right now is there's a lot of forgiveness in the quality. It's more about just the content and getting it out there. People don't need super polished content. They need to, they need consistency with it, with with artists and brands that they love. And you know that was the first objective. And then you know second, like let's plan out how we can get more at home. So do we have certain artists that can record a record start to finish in in their basement or their spare room? Yes. Do we have an artist that doesn't has no ability to even you know do liners for radio? Yes. So we kind of look at the whole spectrum and see what we can actually accomplish by sitting at home, not being in groups. So, and, and case by case, like everyone agrees, everyone's case by case, what we can get out of them. And, um, you know, 
we we look to get more out of what we have. So artists that we have on the roster that, I mean, maybe we're digging up B-sides. Maybe we're finishing um, remixes or acoustic records. So we're looking at what more we can do with our hands tied. Um, but, you know, studio time, you know, we're fortunate. If people want to work, we'll get them there. Eric, hopefully I, got a, I, I got a quick one for Andy, if you don't mind me jumping yeah, in. Yeah. Uh, if that I think, uh, what about the artists that had records come out? Um, didn't you just have a couple artists that records came out in the last month? Yeah. So, uh, you know, specifically August Burns Red just had a record come out on Friday. Um, and we had, you know, we had such incredible attention around this record, um, you know, on all aspects. And the band does so much that it was actually a little surprising. But I think it was it, when right now we're all feeling this as a community. So I feel there's a lot of people in the rock or metal or hardcore community that were rallied around this a bit, you know. So they chose to stay the course, but we, they also stood the course, but we had production in place, you know. Now we're going to talk about production. I know we're living in a digital era, but there are a certain segment of artists that want vinyl and everything globally right we have to hit the switch on all this so with records that we have had come out um because of the focus and because of the growth we've seen at youtube uh you know everyone knows that streaming kind of dipped 10 percent right at the 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 crack of this but it's slowly recovering um if you have an audience like august burns red and you have a new record there's a lot of excitement there's a lot of support in the community so we didn't lose a step there and i think we're having you know we're having a fantastic trajectory you know, it stood. It, it actually did really well. iTunes. It's streaming really well. There was tons of press coverage globally. So um, the band was committed to do a lot globally, and we got uh, everything. I like I said, I felt like there was a big rally around it, which uh, was amazing because we didn't we didn't know going into it. We just knew that you know um, <clears throat> the s hit the fan, and and we sat there and and had to you know pile up everything, and it 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 worked. So. Um, that's why I, I stick to everyone's point <clears throat> or Eric's point a little bit that I don't think it's, it's a tremendous fail to put out an artist with an audience right now. Um, I think obviously there's not much in terms of competition, if you will. I think there's going to be a lot of records that come out this summer, or if you're taking records to radio that are going to be okay because, uh, it's that, or you get in the fall and there's going to be 14 records every week stepping on top of each other. And you know, there's, it's going to be, it's going to be a bottleneck. So um, you kind of have to pick your poison. But I think, you know, with, with the growth digitally and, and you see the YouTube number skyrocketing, if you can feed that machine YouTube community, then there's going to be a lot of attention towards it. Yeah, Eric. I, I don't know if it's all right if I, if I jump in real quick. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, one of the things that, that I've seen, uh, I saw a bunch of reports uh, in the last week and early this week about how, you know, music industry overall streaming numbers are drastically down and all that sort of stuff. Um, as far as my things have gone, people are, are craving content and it's definitely jumped up. And, uh, you know, so I don't know if it's a, may, maybe it's niche based or something like that. Cause obviously, you know, the vast majority of people, uh, instead of driving or doing whatever they would normally do to consume music, they're watching Netflix because they're stuck at home. But, I, I've also seen, you know, correlating to what Andy said, that I, I've seen, you know, my digital numbers have been great. And, uh, you know, and it's and I've gone to, to my bands and been like, hey, this is a, a solid time to release some content. Maybe not an album, necessarily. Um, I definitely am not looking to move anything up. But whether it's a single or if it's just something, you know, like they've got something there, like, yeah, let, let's, let's get it out there. Because I have seen people have been excited to consume things. And, uh, you know, and as far as online sales and things like that, like my online sales, there are, you know, like web store and things like that. Uh, we released uh, a record for a band called End um, in conjunction with Closed Casket. And we did that in March and it flew like, like, beyond expectations and that was great um and then conveniently my web store warehouse closed so we can't fulfill any orders so that sucks but you know at the very least i think at least now people still want to consume things and digitally i think that'll continue um because obviously digitally is cheap and or free if you have a subscription you know that sort of thing so but uh yeah just fully agreeing with what andy's saying and Eric, uh, you had a record came out right before the S hit the fan too. Was it Neck Deep? I think. 
Uh, Neck Deep's not out yet. We launched the record right before this started. You know, they uh, they have a release or they have a big show they're putting on in the UK at Ali Pali. We had the record coming out, so we wanted to launch early to coincide with that plan. And and then, you know, this hits. Um, you know, I think the process has been stay the course on that. So, um, you know, we've um, we've added. You know, we had to make a change on a video. Um, just because we, you know, with the rules in the UK and here, we can't shoot certain things. So we had to make some changes. Uh, same one for another artist we have where we, we ended up doing more a crowdsourcing video. So I think Annie mentioned it. We're just using the tools that we have. Um, you know, I think that, and I'm sure everyone's saying the same thing to their employees. It's like trying to stay away from knee jerk reactions. Like, oh my God, we got to stop everything and change everything. Um, we've just said, let's just, let's go forward. I mean, things have changed in, in sort of pre orders and ticket sales, but nothing so dire that that um that uh we have to change everything and, and the reality is is that and to, to carl's point there is a lot more time to consume i don't necessarily think it's music and i think that putting out music uh, if you don't have to um, can be avoided i do think where uh, at least for the age group we're dealing with um, they do want to consume they want to consume in small little short videos through platforms and the, the big conversation with artists has been again I often hear we don't like doing it or we're on tour or this or that. And uh, this opportunity to double down on, on core fan connectivity will make everybody, I think on this call more money. Um, but of course you can only lead a horse to water. <laughs> anybody else? I, can I throw this out to everybody? Like how challenging is it to get your artists on to just do stupid stuff on YouTube and, you know, just do fun stuff on Facebook live streams, Instagram live streams and stuff like that. Is, is that just like pulling teeth or is it even productive at a time like this? Case by case. Case by case. Oh, man. Do you see an impact for those who are doing it well? Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. 100%. All right, cool. And any sort of like best practices that you'd love to point people to? Like clients that you think, geez, I wish everybody look at what they're doing because that's, that's great. It, it sounds super vague, but consistency is super important and just being yourself. You know, if you're playing Call of Duty for five days straight, then Twitch might be the place for you. That's it. Just be yourself and be consistent. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Uh, Mike, anything with Ice Nine is that they're doing that like uh, online in order to sort of keep the profile up? I mean, I know that they're between album cycles and everything like that, but uh, they had a pretty bet packed uh, touring schedule that's uh, that's gotten shafted. Yeah, I mean, we've got a couple different like lines that we're towing. Some is what can we do in the immediate, right, to just entertain the fans and make sure that they know we're there and that we care, you know. And the other is. You know, as Andy sort of mentioned, what do we have that um, we're sitting on that we might be able to, you know, put out in the future? So there's a couple of things that, you know, we didn't have a definitive release timeline for that are now in the works to, to have those come out. Um, and back to your previous question, you know, I think obviously it's case by case. Um, you know, what I've found is just like Eric said, it's got to be genuine and it's got to be consistent, but also kind of pointing to what others are doing and showing that it's working. You know, I've seen a number of things kind of kind of come up and, you know, Bad Wolves, for instance, who's at 10th Street, they put up a Patreon and they kind of threw it out there, you know, and I think they're learning along the way, but the bottom line is people are coming to it. And yeah, if they had strategized and spent another two weeks, you know, maybe they could have made the profitability more, but if they waited two weeks, they might have lost that to, you know, I saw Circus Survive. I know that's not the same core fan base, but more and more people are, are getting to it. So I think, you know, it's really, I'm trying to see what, as, as I think Andy said, you know, what can we put out there that doesn't have to be completely polished? Can we do that now? And then going and polishing some of the things so that can come later, but ultimately using this time, going back to that kind of car and maintenance metaphor to, to totally overhaul, you know, the engine. So when the roads are open again, we're actually smooth sailing. That's great. Blasco, can I ask you, I'm not sure about like on your roster, 
strategically where you are with each of them, but are there clients that you've got where strategically you, there's a place you wanted them to get to and a strategy to get there and this is either a really great opportunity to like double down on that strategy or has caused you to have to iterate. Maybe this isn't a situation that you're facing, but I throw that out just in case. Uh oh, hold on a second. Let me mute let me mute you real quick. There you go. Yeah. Again, sorry. I think my my takeaway from all of this is that artists in in artists digging deeper into the platforms that have been provided to us. Meaning that, as an example, Randy from Lamb of God was on Instagram Live earlier today interviewing or just having a chat with Gary from, you know, Slayer and Exodus. Um, and because, you know, Gary was, uh, he had the, the, the COVID uh, coronavirus, right? And uh, so he was asking him about it and stuff. So, these are maybe things that weren't happening before that maybe should continue to happen, right? So to me, the positive takeaway is you've got all these artists that are now uncovering the, the depth of what these platforms are to where, you know, engaging your fans, like on that chat they had, I mean, when I popped in there, there was like a thousand people in there watching it. And so they're clearly engaged. So um, I, I feel like if artists can really kind of take this time and learn from it and whenever we all hopefully go back to some sense of normality that they don't just forget this time. Like I, it would be great if they continued to have chats and Instagram lives and Zoom calls and know that you can connect with your fan base on all these different uh, you know, angles of, of these platforms. So um, that's, that's kind of how I walk away from this is I hope it continues. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Carl, you kind of set us off on this. Um, are there any of these particular platforms that you are particularly fond of or that uh, during this time seeing you know more YouTube, uh, more Instagram followers, that sort of thing uh, is going to turn you on more as you consider artists that you want to sign in the future? Is this going to change anything at all on the metric side of things? Honestly, I don't think anything's going to move the dial as far as what I'm looking for as far as signing and things like that. Um, at the same time, you know, I am looking for, you know, for the, for the bands on my, whether it's on the label or management or things that they can do, you know, during this time that might monetize something for them. And, uh, and it's been weird because I, I've talked to them and, you know, there's been an initiative. Uh, there's a number of great labels actually. Fearless has been amazing. They've sent over the list of basically everything that's potential for an artist to do right now um, that could generate something for them, uh, you know, online. And we've been going through that with, uh, you know, with bands I manage, and and I've obviously utilized that because uh, Fearless has done a better job than I have for my label clients. Um, so thank you, Andy, because I'm using that for them, and. Uh, you know, we're looking at it to see, like, all right, what what makes sense? And uh, a lot of my bands are too small where, you know, it's like, what's, you know, you do something in a vacuum, it's no one cares. So it is what it is. Um, but, you know, for the larger bands, you know, there, there's definitely some things out there that, that could make sense and generate some revenue. And then, you know, other bands, I had a conversation with a, with a, one of my clients today. I was like, hey, you should do this. You know, you, you have a huge base and a big following and, and this. And I know right now you're going to be home for the next six months and you've been home for a couple months prior to this and let's do something. And, uh, you know, and we just went back and forth on discussion. And they're just like, you know, it's the same argument with, do you want to play a basketball game in front of nobody? Um, Vincent Mann just had WrestleMania in front of nobody. And, uh, you know, as far as I can tell from the internet, that went pretty good. But talking to, you know, to, to this band, they're like, just, you know, like, that doesn't work for us. So they're like, it's just like, I feel like that's going to let people behind the curtain and it's not what we want to project to our fans and our audience and more so to what we want to become. So it's, it's been weird. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, you know, what the best bet is for them. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely nothing as far as the online thing goes that makes me be like, fuck yeah, you guys are doing this. Nothing, nothing new. Right, I'll, I'll preface it that way. 
nothing new that I'm like, oh, you guys are doing this. That makes me want to, you know, like look at what you're doing and sign you. Because from the get go, I've always said any band I want to sign, I want to work with them, not for them. So I've always wanted to go after bands that are already doing things and working. And in this environment, yeah, there's going to be bands that are going to come out. They're going to figure things out and be creative and do more that, than other bands. And yeah, that, that'll definitely turn people's heads. Um, I don't know the extent that that's going to make a difference, but it'll definitely open eyes. It, it's funny because it, it, you sort of put him, the thought in my head like, you know, that this could be looked at as almost like a MySpace era in a way where, you know, some bands are going to really, really embrace this and do something awesome and unique with it. And just on the basis of that alone might be able to get the attention of people like you, but uh, for, perhaps not. No, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, bands are going to do things that make sense. I mean, ever since the internet popped off, there's been bands that have figured it out. There's been bands that have like <clears throat> figured out how to work on there, but it's always been this double-edged sword. I mean, we all know a bunch of bands that have figured out the right songs to cover in their garage and put online and pop off on YouTube and, you know, and then in turn Spotify and things like that. And they, meanwhile, they have no legitimate real following. You know, that there's no, like, no one's going to see them live or things like that. Blasco was making, you know, denoted my Nickelback uh, plaque back there. But, uh, <laughs> and that was one of the first things I did when I was at Roadrunner, when the, one of the, the, the only job I've ever had. But, like, you look at it and there's, like, you know, there's things that bands can do that are going to get attention. And that's going to garner some spins online, and, you know, that sort of thing. But is that going to, it's just a matter of what it's going to result in, whether as far as people coming to shows, building a general fan base and things like that. So, you know, that's, that's the key. Um, and I don't know how much you can do right now when you can't leave the house to like, you know, build a real legit fan base. I think if you're already an artist that has one, you can feed them and cultivate them, but I don't know how much you can do to build a new one. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. And, and there's something that I'm myself and probably everyone here is, you know, you see something, whether it's getting your attention, you love the songs or it's, it's, it has all the right, um, you know, things you're looking for. But I'm always a person that has to get on a flight and go see it live. Um, and that's, it's really hard for, for me to want to sign anything or be involved in something that I can't see live and, and look and see, Hey, it might be rough, but I can see where it ends up. Um, so we're not going to be able to do that anytime soon. And obviously I think in our space, it's a little different. People want to learn their instruments. There's been a, a little bit of a rebirth for that, but you know, in others, in other spaces, maybe the urban space and you know, where the streaming can go bonkers and everything, but um, you know, the kids never left his bedroom and he's deathly afraid of the stage. And that's, that's happened lots of times. There are a lot of things that my friends work with and, whether they're the managers or the agents and they're like, holy shit, like, you know, this guy's doing this kind of business with his own self-released music, but he can't get on stage, you know? So again, uh, I'm always, my gut is always to go see it live and, and, and to, you know, meet people and get a vibe of people. And, and, and I like speaking to the artists. I want to see where their heads at, where their vision, where their lives, their backgrounds, you know? Um, you know, cause I think in the day, if you're signing an artist, it, you know, it's a true partnership. It's like, you know, between you, the agent, the manager, it's you're the parents now. So um, you kind of want to get that. And I, I think it's hard to just to see something, um, you know, on some videos and then go and, and sign a deal. So. And Andy, when you, when I know this sounds like a real basic question, but I yeah. get this all the time from, uh, for, you know, from our following, but like when you go to see a band live and, that you're considering signing, yeah. how much of a factor is it that there are a lot of people in that room versus just seeing somebody in front of almost nobody except for you and they just light your soul up, you know? Yeah, it can be zero people in the room. I can care less. Okay. It's it, it's even better. If there's zero people in the room and, and you're great and you're really, you can see the passion on stage and they're caring, uh, you know, it's better than guys sitting there, you know, looking down the floor and burning holes through their shoes. You know, like if they're scared to be on stage in front of zero, I hate to tell them the first year or two might be in front of zero, you know. 
And Eric, I assume you're uh, you sort of the same way. Are you planning on getting on some of these cheap American Airlines flights as soon as this blows over to fly across the country to see bands all over the place, or or what? I mean, I, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really I. I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, 
clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really I. I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really I. I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So 
less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really I. I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really I. I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really I. I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be, would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be, would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I, and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, 
you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be, would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the room because uh, clearly this thing is just not packing up and going away. So less people's uh, would be would be all right with me right now in a room. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I think that everything that, that, you know, Andy, you said everything that's smart about this is really, I, I and am I going to get cheap flights when this is over? I hope they still exist when it's over. That'd be real nice. Uh, and I hope that bands are playing and that I can go and see them. And I wouldn't mind if there was no one in the Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for agreeing to take part in this panel. I'm totally blown away by everybody that's agreed to be a part of this. So what I wanted to do to start is I'm just going to give a very brief uh, like introduction, but I really wanted you guys to... Uh, uh, to introduce yourself so that people can get used to your voices if they're hearing this as a pure audio version rather than watching this on YouTube, if that's all right. So uh, uh, starting with uh, Eddie Levy from uh, Undercover Marketing. Eddie, you want to uh, say hey? Sure. Um, so this is Eddie Levy from Undercover Marketing. We're based here in New York City. Uh, we're a relatively new company. We've been around about eight months. And uh, we're having a fun time here in the pandemic trying to come up with new ways to, you know, bring money to our clients. Cool. Do you want to mention any of the clients that you currently work with? I can only mention the ones that are not undercover. See what, <laughs> you see what I did there? Um, we currently do supplemental marketing for um, Kill Switch Engage, Blue October, Insane Clown Posse, uh, Low Cut Connie, um, a band called Dead, and another band called AVAT from Miami, Florida. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Mike Mowry uh, from uh, 10th Street Management. Uh, Mike, you want to do a, pre a brief introduction? Uh, guys, I'm Mike. I manage Ice Nine Kills. Uh, I'm delighted to bring three of uh, my favorite guys in marketing uh, to this panel. So that's what I got. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> cool. And Tim Brennan from Spine Farm Records. Tim, uh, great to have you. Thanks so much for taking part. Yeah, really excited to be part of this you know i've been working with mike for years and worked with eddie and derek on various projects so i'm happy to be part of this panel and derek brewer from manifest manifest group well derek? actually with shelter music group now is about a uh, little less than a month wow okay my apologies All right. no, breaking fine. news breaking yeah. news <laughs> it hasn't been formally announced so i guess this is an exclusive I, apparently <laughs> <laughs> Well, very cool. So, so who are you working with at, at Shelter? Sure. Um, well, I mean, that company um, has bands like Fleetwood Mac, ZZ Top, Perfect Circle. I brought over all my uh, clients that I had from the company that I started Manifest. So they include bands like Dance Gavin Dance, Pele Royale, Crown the Empire, Dying Fetus, um, several others. For sure. Cool. So, very cool. Well, awesome. Thanks all for uh, for being here, uh, Eddie. If it's all right, uh, let's start with you since you're the you know you got marketing right in your uh, job title. Um, oh <laughs> so, can you talk to me a little bit about what is your strategy when you sit down with a new client in order to figure out what's going to work for them marketing wise? I mean, it, it really depends on the client. The way we view our clients is every nobody's the same everybody's completely different so we take a meeting with each person and we tailor our approach to what the client needs so i can't give you like a one box this is how we do it every single artist we touch is a different approach um and i think that's important sorry is there are there like uh sort of commonalities that things you know you must start with something like are they do you ask them to get the ball rolling on, on what how they want to be represented that sort of thing 
Well, I mean, I think you have to start having a conversation with an artist about where they come from, what they believe in, and what they're looking to do, what their real goals are. Um, and then from there, you lead the way. I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff here where we're just trying to figure out who these people are that are consuming the rock and the metal music at this point. I mean, I think one of the things I notice about having worked with Eddie is he brings a vast knowledge. You know, when we were working on a client together, he brought tons of his own insight and research to the project and immediately kind of stormed in with a bunch of ideas. Cool. And Tim, when you are working with your artists, how often are you using a third party marketing firm and how often are you directly involved in what the band's doing and, and how much input do you take from the band itself? I think taking input from the band itself is absolutely key. You know, we always say we're marketing people, not a product. Um, you know, I think that's really key, especially, you know, in this scene where, you know, sometimes you're working with a band from, you know, the ground up. Others are established, but, you know, are we looking for different angles for them? How are we looking to work with them? Um, you know, uh, as far as hiring outside companies, it really depends on the project. Uh, we don't do a ton of that. We do a not lot. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> We've been, you know, we take a lot in-house. You know, Spine Farm is a label that's part of Universal Music Group. So we have a lot of resources kind of at our fingertips. You know, we kind of operate as an indie within a major. Um, you know, so it really depends on the project, the artists, uh, and we go right from there. Derek, you talk about how you work with artists who you start working with from the ground up is mm -hmm. mentioned versus those who have already come, who already come to you with a certain uh, perspective on how they, their marketing should go. Okay, and I, I apologize. Can you just repeat the first part of the question? Sorry. Yeah, like how do you approach marketing for artists that you start working with from the ground up versus those who come to you with something already somewhat established? Okay, yeah, no, for sure. Um, basically, you know, it starts off with just either in person or over the phone or video chat, just talking to the artist with the, the team that I have surrounding me and finding out, you know, the various different um, – sellable points within that particular act and what um, would resonate with, you know, potential uh, new fan base and their current fan base and really hitting to those points and, you know, covering all the bases surrounding that from the social media perspective to the overall aesthetic and look to the promo photos and, you know, basically all that. Mike, when you were working with your clients, how do you find those sellable points that Derek's talking about? It, it, are you looking for uh, visual? Are you looking for sound, personality? I mean, I think it's a little bit all of the above. And, you know, like Eddie said, you kind of do it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think, you know, what attracts us to artists is, you know, typically multiple parts of the total package. And as we get in and get familiar, um, you know, just by kind of, uh, the leading questions that come with anybody that's got the you know experience that any of us on this you know panel have that stuff starts to come out and then we look for you know the things that can really uh, immediately be exploited or kind of developed and then the other ones that need more work and will take more time and I think you know we've kind of always got you know uh, the multi-tiered strategy in mind but you know, knowing we play to the strengths of our artists, you know, if they're better at the visual component of it, we're going to double down on the visual component of it while trying to develop those other things. So. Eddie, do you find like the artists that you work with, are they in, I would think that they're inside the bubble a little bit and have a really hard time kind of seeing how they are perceived. Uh, do you, what do you bring to the table and how do you help artists recognize these sellable points and these things about themselves that their audiences uh, and potential audience will latch onto? Uh, again, every artist is different. I'll give you a good example though. Like one of the things we did recently with the insane clown posse is we tried to, uh, we, we, we pitched them on this thing called custom clown clips, which is basically you can go to this website, you can have one of the guys do a custom clip for you and we'll turn it around in six days. Kind of like Cameo, but a lot more clown makeup to it. Um, and instead of going to your usual suspects or just putting it up on social media, had a whole conversation with the publicist, talked to the manager, and partnered with Forbes and kind of got the guys and, and the team outside of the comfort zone 
where they would normally have done stuff. I mean, you know, to think that Forbes would cover the insane clown posse in 2020 was, was kind of crazy. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's a, crazier than Magnus, right? Um, the, yeah, yeah. It, with ICP, I mean, they're, they're just, I mean, it, they're such a, a for marketing wise, there's such a, a, a defined yeah. vision at this point. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's, it's a, it, is that, is something like those clips, is that part of an overall strategy or is this like a, it's a low hanging fruit idea, let's just go out and do it? It's, a, it's an overall strategy. I think that the band has become more infamous for their name than for their music. And this is just another step for us to try to bring their music back to the forefront and get people talking about them again so we can reintroduce some new tunes here in a couple of months. Excellent. And Tim, uh, on the topic of partnerships, you know, like Forbes, I mean, our partnerships from a marketing perspective seem like they're a really awesome opportunity. Is that something that you guys seek out or is that something that is just, it's much, much more difficult to get? And then how does that if you do, does that, how does that work between established artists and the developing artists that you work with? Well, to answer the first part of your question, it's absolutely important. I think one of the things we try and do with all of our artists is to find out where their interests lie first. You know, whether we team up with our publicity teams, you know, we always have a, have a questionnaire that goes out to them. You know, what are you into? Are you, are you an extreme sports guy? Are you a gamer? Um, you know, Where's, where does your passion lie outside the music? Because obviously the music's first, um, but then we try and find ways to expand. You know, um, I think, you know, that also goes into like the sync world too, where sync can absolutely change even the course of a project. It can bring a project that, you know, couldn't get off the ground. And if you get the right sync and you're with the right partner, it can propel you into the stratosphere very, very quickly. Um, and uh, Paul, can you repeat the the second part of the question, though? So, I well, just uh, what are the types of uh, uh, partnerships that you seek out for those artists that you're working with that are developing versus those that are a little bit more established? Huh. You know, <laughs> developing stuff. It, I I think that you know we always try and find um, you know a merch a merch deal to work with or a merch sponsor. I think that's a, you know, that's a good way to start. You know, we work, we work hand in hand with the managers to try and help get sponsorships, whether it's gear sponsorships too, you know, is this a, is this a band that's going to appear, appeal to all the instrument, all the instrument blogs and stuff like that. I think that's a good, a good place to start. Um, and yeah, I guess kind of starting there, are some of the key ones. Excellent. Mike, you talked before, uh, about with me about how you can implement a really great strategy for trying to attract those gear sponsorships early in your career by kind of acting like you're already sponsored in a way if that makes sense do you, can you uh, uh sort of uh talk about that a little bit more and does that can you sp expand on that perhaps and in, into other types of uh brand partnerships beyond just gears well, it kind of goes back to what Tim had said, where, you know, they do this questionnaire with their artists of the things that they're interested in. And so people in bands naturally, uh, presumably the instrumentalists are, you know, fans of the instruments that they're actually playing. And so, you know, sort of the easiest way to get the attention of, you know, somebody who you might want to endorse you later on is to or start endorsing the product anyways. So, you know, like Fake it to make it is what you're saying? Absolutely. I mean, a little yeah. bit, right? right? Or just, you know, self-promotion or promotion of the product that you actually like using. Um, I mean, Mike, when we did Tooth Grinder, like, we pushed the Vans angle, you know, really hard. We were like, Will's showing how, how much he loved his Vans during every show. Will's was the drummer of Tooth Grinder. And I think we really pushed it and we were able to get a, a, a sponsorship with them. Yeah. yeah and, and that was one of those cool ones where like it wasn't necessarily that he came to us and said hey this is what i'm doing it's like he was doing it someone on the team it might have even been tim noticed it and then said hey can we do something bigger with this and we all you know somebody had a relationship with bands and we went to them and yeah it started to develop organically so um i think we've all got countless examples of ways that our artists have done it and you know there's times that it doesn't work either you know yeah. they do it mm -hmm. and and that's why it kind of has to be 
well, it doesn't kind of have to be, it has to be genuine. If you're doing it just with the sole idea of eventually getting endorsed, you may left up, you may be left, you know, disappointed in the end. No, but that's, that's a real easy way to, uh, not easy, but that's a, it's a helpful way to get the gear endorsements for sure, though, if you have um, band members that do have a decent enough following on the so, on social media, and may, they might not be um, endorsed by this particular drum company, but if they do have the kit and they're constantly doing um, playthroughs or they're doing their photos on Instagram and they're hashtagging in the company, that gives us the ammo to go to those companies at NAM or whenever you can get them on the phone or email to show them um, you know, footage or, or assets showing ammunition, if you will, of saying, look, this artist has already been promoting this brand over and over. These are the views. These are how many lights. What can we do further to enter into a more um, actual partnership to where we can build this from bigger than where it is right now? And Derek, yeah, and, and I was, I was just going to say, Paul, to expand on that, right? It would then go, let's say, whoever Derek's artist is that's got these great endorsements, they've got a new product coming out. If the relationship's been built over time and it is, you know, mutually symbiotic, you can go to them and say, hey, how about some promotional posts uh, for whatever our product is? And that's really kind of the key when you've got, you know, multiple lanes of those types of outside sources helping you promote the product that you're doing. You know, it's, uh, it's like influencers, you know, but more from a, a brand perspective. Oh, very cool. Uh, Derek, uh, on that topic of like uh, – uh, of influencers and brands and then the band itself your clients have their own brands and some of those brands are extremely different from one to the next yeah so how are you balancing the um the the need to try to get some of these brands and influencers uh involved with your acts while at the same time protecting their brands how much of a balance is that i mean so if I'm just going by like some examples of even on this panel, like the couple of the bands that stick out that have like this very dedicated following that they've built up over a couple of several years, Ice Nine Kills, Insane Clown Posse. I mean, I can say Dance Gavin Dance on my end. It's like they have put together a style, and a, a style, aesthetic brand, if you will, of what fans, it's not, even outside the music, but what fans can anticipate and look uh, look to um, in, in terms of putting out content, the merch items, the album covers, there's, there seems to be a, a trend that follows. And like that to me is like so valuable over time because you built this up organically or, you know, through various discussions with management or labels, but you built up this whole um, world around you that just to me helps sell as much tickets or music as the music itself. You see what I'm saying? Like you can, you like with Dance Gavin Dance, we put out an album. There's the uh, typically the same person that does the album artwork um, goes from the next to the next, and there's a theme, there's a following, and you see it with a lot of the you know the other artists that I just mentioned. There are different. Um, processes that follow that the fans the hardcore fans the fans that have been there for many years they've grown accustomed to and they appreciate it and it just helps overall on, on on the whole thing and in terms of like um influencers i personally haven't had too too much experience with like any and maybe i'm not totally clear on the definition of influencers but i haven't had too much experience with actual quote unquote influencers but i have started to just very recently with tiktok just entered that world where we are reaching out to for some certain projects that I have. We are reaching out to actual people on TikTok that have a very good following that know how to do it. And we're feeding them some ideas and some um, pieces of the different songs for them to make videos to. And we're going to see how that actually goes and how far that spreads. What's your uh, TikTok handle there, Derek? Oh, my TikTok hand, handle? Um, I'll, let love, me know about, after this follow. call. I'll make my own, and I'll let you know, and you can follow me. My first call. <laughs> <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I do not have one, but I, I, am, I wish for this call I could have better input, but like literally these past two, couple, two, three weeks, I've been diving into it a bit deeper and starting to get some real know-how into like how to go in. And there are, there are um, individual people out there that, you know, um, that actually are starting their own companies, you know, um, freelancers that have much more knowledge than I do and have access to these people that uh, have their big followings and can pitch ideas to them and then they'll run with it. Eddie, yeah. how much of a, of a wormhole is TikTok? Should we, should we dive in at all here? Um, I mean, I don't personally think it, it, it's very effective for 
a lot of the bands that we're talking about here. Uh, it skews very, very young. Um, I'm, I'm trying to play with it a little bit for Blue October um, because the songs have a little bit of a dance, dance vibe to them, the newer mm -hmm. tracks. Um, but as it relates to like an Ice Nine Kills or, you know, a Tooth Grinder, uh, it's, it just doesn't, it's not the right audience. Yeah, like we have, we, have, we have an urban side project from one of our artists that we're trying to start there. I don't know if I can take, uh, you know, just for example, I work with Bullet From a Valentine and Atreyu, and I don't really know if TikTok is the right audience for those two bands. You know, I'd, I'd prefer to start, you know, really, you know, we're really going at Twitch a lot, a lot harder than a TikTok because most of our bands are gamers, you know. Yep. Um, it just seems like we have more influence there. Like we premiered a video for the Browning on Twitch because he's a giant gamer. So it's just one example. How did that go? Well, not in the, tw the premiere of the video on that. It was. It went great because Johnny from the Browning is a giant gamer. He, yeah. he you know, he has a really big following, um, and uh, it was super interactive. He has his own custom, you know, <laughs> emojis and stuff. Right. Like he, he's really awesome. set up there, and uh, you know, it, it just gave a really nice kick in the ass to that campaign. Oh. For sure. Well, I'm like, I'll say, you know, Paul, I don't, I don't know, you know, the platform is sort of independent. I mean, why I like working with a guy like Eddie or, you know, a guy like Tim and, you know, Derek and I have, you know, worked at the same company before. It's like, it's really about the idea. You know, it's about finding this unique lane um, that no one else is, has really, you know, thought of for this particular for whatever the particular artist is and then you know depending on whichever platform you deem the most important if not all of them you figure out the strategy that's important for those gotcha awesome well mike it's just to uh, sort of talk about the idea of brand and ice nine kills has been mentioned a couple times now like they're uh, over the uh with this uh, the um uh, silver screen uh, Silver Screen, there was a very, very defined, very specific branding for the band that was, you know, with, with the videos and everything. It all uh, uh, was very, very consistent. How um, how uh, sort of well-defined was that brand early on, and how has it evolved? Is there any fear of uh, being sort of trapped by the brand at all for the band as artists? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think it's developed over time, and um, I can't say whether or not I think we'll be trapped. I mean, the beautiful thing is there's, you know, precedent set for horror-infused, you know, metal, and I think, you know, thankfully our singer is uh, smart enough to to be able to sort of uh, weave his own story that is to come, and those are things that we've considered. This has been a fantastic foundation that's been laid that we can then explore from um so you know i mean to me right like what's been so cool and you know we worked with eddie eddie's company uh on this was you know we released that record in october of 2018 and you know october 2019 came around and you know part of the challenge as derek can attest as a manager you know you got just so many things that are happening at any one point sometimes the marketing you know is you know it's important but to dig in and find a unique angle on any given, you know, day, week, month, or year is actually part of the biggest challenge. So, you know, Eddie called me up and just said, hey, you know, what are you doing for the month of October? And I said, well, I got this idea, that idea, this idea. He goes, I got your idea, you know? And then he's a guy that, you know, came up with the idea because that's a personality that Eddie has. But more importantly, right, he, he's able to take it out of my hands and go implement it. And I think that's really, you know, regardless of, you know the ice nine kills brand which is incredibly important if we didn't have that it probably wouldn't have lent itself to eddie's idea but you know what i love about a good marketer in both tim and eddie is like they're helping us as managers find whatever that idea is and, and really figure out the way to implement it the good thing about your band is that halloween happens every year so it's like an it's a never-ending mm -hmm. marketing cycle for you I mean, it's, it's really a great, it's a great brand. And Eddie, are, yeah. you, are you looking at like something like a fan avatar to align with the brand of the band and then trying to find that idea where those two things meet? 
or it just it's just it's a good idea we know it works you just go <laughs> that uh i mean I'll, I'll tell you the idea real quick i don't know we don't have to get too deep into it but obviously the band's all around horror and uh you know halloween and that and that feeling so i called mike up we called the president of the label we got the approval on the budget and we basically went up to their home state of massachusetts right that where they're from we're pretty sure it's one of those and uh on three days notice we rented out a haunted house the week of halloween uh, we brought an entire film crew up there with us. We dressed Spencer, the lead singer of the band, up as a character in the haunted house and spent the entire day filming him scaring the shit out of his fans because we opened it up just to the Ice Nine Kills fans. And it was a great piece of content. It did, I mean, we got five pieces of content out of it. Traveled. It was really good. That's awesome. Tim, uh, can you give uh, – do you have, like, an example or an anecdote or something that you – uh, that you guys have done at Spine Farm where it just, it was that perfect mix of brand and fan that something that really clicked or, or something that you're working on now that you're excited about. <laughs> working on now is tough. <laughs> the whole world is stopped. Um, I, I will say, well, one project I'm really excited about is um, one of our new signings, Saw. I'll just use them as an example. Um, because one of the reasons why we signed the guys and this kind of, I think ties everything a little bit together. Um, you know, we saw that the guys had been calling their fans equals and basically saying you're on, we're no bigger than you, you know, you're on the same level. We are, we're all in this together. Um, you know, they had a hit song called brother, uh, which was about, uh, the, the two members of the band, their brother had passed away. So it was a letter to them. And it just felt so real. Um, we were able to do an acoustic version. Um, we're still working on that video to be a memorial piece uh, for that song. You know, and it kind of has led itself into the timing now. Um, you know, with everything going on, everybody's lost someone. Um, you know, and having this fan group called The Equals that's been so active um, has really helped to drive us, you know, like they want to be on the same level as everybody. So they did their live video, their live concert shoot from their garage now um, for the quarantine. You know, another example is uh, with Atreyu with uh, the superhero song we just released. You know, it was originally written from the perspective of, you know, being a superhero to your kids. But we talked about it and we we're like, you know, there's so many everyday superheroes right now. So, you know, we're trying to tie that song into thanking people. Um, you know, and just, and, and running with that, you know, sometimes it's the moment, sometimes it's, it's the band imagery. I think with Ice Nine Kills too, I think you guys would agree, but you have to have the chops to start too, you know, like it starts there. And then when you can tie the image together, it just, it just, you know, it brings, it, it can be magical. That's awesome. Thank you. Derek, with your clients, uh, you know, how, how amenable are they to your ideas and, and how often are they coming to you with ideas that you can find ways to uh, apply? Sure. Um, I mean, it depends on the band and what their personalities are and how a depth they are to their you know own likeness and um some bands like you take a band like palais royale 90 percent of the ideas are coming starting at least from them and wanting to implement because they know their brand so well um there's you know then in other cases it's it's, it's just like a lot of things to derive from you know the group chats that i have with each individual individual ones the main thing that i've found that's been the most helpful in making any of this happen and i'm sure mike can also agree to this as management is the constant communication with your bands and just talking ideas talking about the different songs and and whether it's my idea or whether it's one of their ideas or it's or it's half and half or you know the the execution of it all is the most important important like um we put together these really cool ideas and seeing it through and making it happen that, and, and, and watching it grow. Um, that's where the most success comes from. But to go back to your original point, it, there's no, there's no, um, set path. Like it can, it, it, it comes from any which way. Um, and mostly it's because we're all just having constant, uh, discussions about the, the overall project. 
Mike, uh, Derek mentioned the idea of ideas versus execution, and Eddie mentioned earlier budgets. Like, how are you guys trying to find creative ways to do things within a budget? Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the beauty. Every one of us on this call has had a background of, of scrapping and knowing how to do it. Like all of us more or less come from the same world. We've known each other 15, 20 years and probably why we've ended up on this call and is, you know, we know how to, how to do that. And um, it looks different every single time, but the beauty is, you know, I think so much of it is about like trying to find these ways to validate the artist, uh, you know, in sort of a step by step, you know, capacity. And so you do something at the lowest budget you know, that gets some eyes and ears. And again, you know, when Eddie talked about going and filming this event, you know, cool, it was amazing to do it at this, you know, location that was near the band's town and to have it Spencer involved, but we created all this content that gets to be spread to the world. And just like he did with ICP and Forbes, right? It's like, oh, okay, all of a sudden there's this extra layer of validation that goes to that band. So, you know, as you do the first one, you know, which, there's so many tools that artists have in their own hands that really it's just the idea. I mean, you know, Eddie's team was helpful to execute because the rest of us were doing a million other things in regards to our artists. But if I'm a band sitting at home, you know, looking at this video, you know, I'd be saying, wonderful. Uh, the takeaway is, you know, let's get the great idea and then figure out the way to to execute it. Everybody has, you know, the tools are in, in, in the, the, either in individuals or the artist's hands um, to do that with. Well, but I, Eddie, my, to your point, I think, I think that the great idea doesn't work if, you, if the band doesn't have the great foundation, which, you know, thankfully, Iceland Kills has the great foundation and they've, you know, spent the last 10 years laying it. Um, I don't think that that would have worked for every band. But I love that idea that, that the walk before you run a little bit with, uh, you know, your marketing, Eddie, are there like just missed opportunities that you see a lot of artists who have these tools within their grasp that they just don't take advantage of? Every day. <laughs> so what, Every day. What's, what's a couple things that just like, just jump out at you, just make you want to scream? Well, uh, Mallory's probably heard me talk about this a million times at this point. Um, artists, today or labels, whatever you want to call them, um, they forget to pin songs to the Spotify page. Drives us crazy. Or, you know, and I, whoever watches this, don't take this the wrong way, because you probably know who it is. When you're on Instagram and you're posting about something going on and you post a link in the description, it's not clickable. So you're marketing into an ether. And the simplest 101 is put the link in the bio and just write the links in the bio. But a lot of these rock bands, they just don't understand that yet. They haven't really come into 2020. <laughs> Tim, anything yeah, I, that I, frustrates I, you? I 100% agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, you know, one of the things I was always taught too is if, if you're not including your sales link, why are you doing it as well? You know, link like some uh, a service like Linkfire, which you can link to every single store in every single country around the world, is just a basic. You know, like w w if I'm a kid any somewhere in you know in Sweden, I want to be able to click and find my store and localize it. Um, but yeah, forget forgetting a simple thing like that, it, it, it's really tough. Derek, can you talk about, like, for me as a fan, one of the things that I find really frustrating are artists who show up when they want to, want to sell me something, whether it's a ticket to a show or an album, and then they disappear for 18 months. And I, so I'm curious as to, um, uh, has there been any evolution or do you think there should be any evolution in how uh, uh, marketing can be more evergreen? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part, uh, again, just going on uh, specifically my artists, you know, Instagram and Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, wonderful tools and really good to, you know, sell your products, your merch, your 
shows, you know, advertise things, your songs. But I think honestly, like the most success I've seen with posts that have gone quote unquote viral or the most relevant are the, are the more, the more casual or um, I'm trying to think of the word right now, but, but just the, the, the type of posts that just are one of the guys sitting in a chair or, or is sitting in a good setting. That's not like pushing, not pushing a product. Yeah. Well, it's not a, it's not a, com- yeah. it's not a commerce post. It's a person. Correct. It's it just, it's just ba- basically them in, in real life. Just, um, you know, just yeah. Seemingly comes out of nowhere, just a real nice picture. Those get the most likes, the most shares, the most responses, for sure. I, I think the four of us have all worked in, like, the same scene, too, and I think you can smell a fake pretty, pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in your career, you've worked with hardcore bands to, you know, the radio bands, and it, it's real. If, if they're not true to themselves, too, it makes it really hard. So Tim, how do you balance that when you've got an artist who, like, not posting is them being true to themselves, but you need them to do stuff? It, it, sometimes that does get really hard, um, you know. But you can do. Uh, you don't have to. Like, it could be like, what am I listening to on Spotify? That's sometimes that's personal enough. You know, like, am I go? Is is your artist a gym rat? Maybe he doesn't want to show his face, but you can be like, here's my gym routine. Um, if he, is he a chef? Is is he a gamer? Like you can go in different ways, where it doesn't have to be just you know here I am with four girls, <laughs> you know, or something like that. You know, and I think there's balance to it all too, because as you're saying, that's that is very nice to see. I also see artists that do too much of that too. Like we don't need to see what's going on every 15 minutes of the day. We do want to see things. Like <laughs> there is a there is a good solid balance between showing your lifestyle photos advertising your tours and your merchandise and, and not doing overdoing each of those items you know spreading in balance you know spreading it across the board Derek any marketing that you guys do for revenue generation between tours for the bands I mean yeah also you know different dif- uh, different uh, merch exclusives um, you know one thing that's been really successful for me is like um, you know, and again, this goes back to bands that have a very long-standing fan base. You know, we find very unique things within the wording and the uh, the lyrics of the songs. Um, you know, and we make products out of that that the fan base would love. Like an example is like this um, lyric in one of the Dance Gavin dance songs that talk about Pico de Gallo. We made our own Pico de Gallo brand and put it up for sale, and it sold out like within like an hour's worth of time. Hundreds and hundreds, close to thousands of. Um, you know, salsa. <laughs> and and that was a, a great revenue generator, made the fans happy, and it's a collectible item. So, I mean, that's something that we're definitely doing. I mean, now as we're in, right now in 2020, I think we're all pivoting and shifting to figuring out ways to, you know, create sources of income through stream, uh, through, you know, streaming and video and things like that, that we couldn't do with, uh, you know, that we didn't probably pay attention to as much when we were focused on touring and merchandise. Eddie, that's an awesome point that Derek just brought up on the focus on, on streaming. And it sort of ties into what you were talking about, that piece of low, piece of low-hanging fruit of pinning your songs to Spotify. Like, what, what – I mean, how are you directing fans to Spotify to get more of those streams? Is that so low a revenue generator for the bands that it isn't a focus? No, or- it's a big focus. Okay, good. Yeah, it's a big focus. I mean – not only it's not it's not necessarily just for revenue it's it's a good marketing point when you can say to somebody i've got 10 million streams i mean derek mike what's the math on that how much is that going to generate revenue wise do you guys remember what the equation is I don't have it right out from me it's, it's still pretty solid for sure for right uh, yeah. but it's not like it's not you know 10 million singles it's not 10 million albums it's right. it's still you know it's second platform. home money. Second home money. There you go. Second yeah. home money. But at the at the end of the day, it's still very. It's an important, absolutely important thing to feed because that's how everybody consumes their music. I think it's important to also note that most people, a lot of people, don't only use Spotify, mm-hmm. um, and you have to be smart on how you spread it out. I mean, there's Spotify, there's Apple. The, the one that I focus on heavily now because it's how I consume new music is YouTube, and I think rock bands and metal bands in our genre completely ignore the platform. Um, and it's, it's crazy to me that, 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 you know, 
we're still educating them on on how to consume music because YouTube pays just as good as anybody else does. I think Pandora is another one too because oh, Pandora is great. Yeah, I feel like a lot of bands haven't been focused on Pandora, and hey, Pandora is part of Sirius now too. So I mean, you know, and 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 I think Pandora is a lot more friendly because you can go in the back end and put out a message to your fans that appears on your station. Um, you know, about touring or, hey, here's my new song. Here's an anecdote about that song. You can do those types of things with Pandora too. Well, Tim, one of the things that we talk about at uh, Outer Loop is just how, um, especially for bands who are doing everything for themselves, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're clawing their way to get up. They're, they are often told you need to be really active on Facebook and Twitch and Twitter and Instagram and YouTube and, and it just gets spread so thin. And the same thing I think could happen with the streaming platforms. But so do you have any advice for, for artists who are DIY and need to figure out where they need to focus at this stage of their career? I would, I would actually say that you can, you can spread it out between members as well. You know, if, if there's one person that's more familiar with the Twitter, have him run the Twitter, you know, but keep the message consistent. Have, 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 a, have a common voice with each other. Um, you know, one of the things we always try and do is, if, you know, the packaging has colors, for example, you, you want to tie, you want to tie it all together. Like have, have your imaging be consistent, but be, you know, be one voice. But I would say, you know, split it between your bands. Like bands are multiple members. You guys, they can all do something. They all have their talents. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Also, you know, Spotify for artists, you know, they can go in themselves. They can see what they're doing. You can do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to count on anybody else. You, you can do it yourself. An artist we're looking at signing right now has done all their pitching um, through, through that, you know, app. They've gotten, they've gotten key playlists. Which artist is that? Hmm. So it will remain nameless for now. <laughs> Mike, uh, how many of your clients, present and past, have been active in using Spotify for artists, or has your man, you as a manager, your team uh, at the management company, have you guys uh, dived in to do that for them? And what are you guys doing? What works? I mean, it's a little bit of a mix, um, in all honesty, depending on whether or not the band, you know, some of the bands really take to that and are motivated by being able to go in and manipulate the stuff and see the things in, in real time. Um, you know, there's a number of tools that we use to measure these things and try to share it. I mean, to me, it's all about figuring out what motivates the artist and not trying to get them to do something that, you know, inherently they just aren't interested in. So I like to take it back a step, right, and figure out what is it, you know, like we talked, you guys talked about social posts and whatnot. I mean, you know, there's a healthy balance of everything. It's like you've got to have brand awareness be just one component of it. Then you've got to have calls to action be another component of it. As these guys talked about with balance, it's got to be the same thing with streaming platforms or just the ways that people consume music. Ultimately, where I typically start is where does the artist consume music? You know, if they consume it on YouTube, like Eddie's saying, where he consumes it, then he gets a little bit more passionate about trying to figure that out and figure out the way to game the system. I think that's ultimately like the mindset that all of us on this call have is a way like of how do you how do you sneak one past the goalie, right? Like, what is it? There's all this stuff out here that you're talking about. So many platforms, all this stuff. Like, what can we do to either work twice as hard as someone else? And really that's not as appealing as work twice as smart as someone else. So what is it about which platform that, you know, the artist likes or that our team likes, but yeah, I mean, we, we do ultimately try to support in every way we can, but you know, you've heard it a million times, Paul, it comes back to, you know, what is it that you're pushing? It makes it so much better if the, you know, if we've got a great song and or a great, you know, brand as we've talked about, and then as we're pushing that, it's just not as much of a slog. And, you know, the, the dominoes eventually start to fall and fall much quicker. Derek, with, um, uh, it's funny because I was going to want to dive into, okay, Spotify. All right, now let's talk about YouTube. Now let's talk about, but, and that's not the way to go. So, because uh, what Mike's saying, I think really kind of nails it, 
with your clients, um, uh, there are some bands that seem to have really embraced the music video uh, more than others, perhaps. You know, like Dance Gavin Dance has got amazing, elaborate, at least by appearances, expensive looking videos. Um, you know, and there's guys like Oliver Tree who've got tens of millions, hundreds of millions of views for their for his very expensive videos. What what is the sort of um, uh, the balance there between a budget for a music video versus uh, when you might not yet have those views? Is well, it, does it correlate? Well, listen, I, I mean, you raised a, a, a very interesting point that I could just give you in in terms of dance, Gavin Dance, and I think this is actually just you know indicative of what's going on in the world right now. They do have some very um, solidly budgeted videos that are very visual and they they're great they're excellent videos um but due to what we're dealing with right now they have an album coming out and they still had a, a need to uh make some videos uh to further promote songs and um coincidentally a video that we just put out that's having a really high amount of views and doing quite well is that we were able to get fan submitted videos of them following a theme of keeping clean keeping hygienic and you know we had hundreds and hundreds of submissions the label went through and edited them all down and got the you know the, the fans to sign the waivers so that we could legally put them out there was no issues and we put that video out i believe it was last week or close enough to it and that's getting just just as good as a response you know in terms of viewers and people getting excited about it and that was done with a much more minimal budget than uh, a higher end budget uh, video. So maybe that's to speak for the times that are going on right now. And that's the best that we could do because we were not able to do a full production. Um, that's not to say we would stop doing full production videos, but it's just interesting to see right now, given the circumstances that we're under and the resources that we had, we were able to put together something really cool and unique and creative and it reacted very well. Eddie, with the videos, either on YouTube, music videos, or just video in general as a medium, uh, how do you need to align it with everything else inside the marketing strategy for an artist? I think the important part about videos today, because you don't, the only platform for it to go on is, is, is YouTube or the internet or whatever it is. There's no, there's no MTV anymore or VH1. So these things have really quick burns. And I think if you don't hit it at the right moment, you put it out too soon, you lose your biggest asset. You lose your biggest tool to market the record, to market the band. And a lot of times I see artists go day in at the same time as the song coming out. And I don't think that that gives them, you know, the fan base enough time to marinate with the song and learn it and really become familiar. That's why I like to space it out. Um, and I think when you space it out and, a, and the fan base has already consumed the song and they get it, watching the video is just that much better. And how about like, what's the difference between marketing the video versus marketing the album that the video is supposed to be marketing for? You get my question there? Uh, I mean, I think they all fit into the same packaging, right? I, you know, you're ultimately marketing a video is the same, in my opinion, is similar to marketing. You're streaming on Spotify, you're streaming on Apple, uh, or any other DSP because it all counts towards the consumption number. So you look at, I look at a video the same way I would a uh, Spotify playlist or a stream or anything that way. And then, you know, tying back into the, to the, you know, the album launch, of course you want the video to, to fit the aesthetic of the album and the band. Yeah. Mike is, is live streaming during uh, the lockdown. Is that working? Well, I can't tell you. I don't have anybody who's live streaming. Uh, frankly, we've we've opted, you know, uh, with Ice Nine Kills to kind of do the the slower, longer play. We've got some initiatives that we've been um, working on, and and some content that we've been sitting on. So it hasn't been a priority. Uh, I've seen some artists really uh, seem to capitalize on it. I think. You know, the question is for everybody is how are the artists going to make money? So I've watched, you know, certain bands start to put it behind a, pay a paywall, you know, whether that's a Patreon or something else. And, you know, I think every action is intended to get attention and, you know, live streaming briefs well, but when everybody's doing it and you just go back into the competitive phase of, you know, everything else, like, you know, you go to Spotify and if you're a no-name artist or you're an artist without much of a, 
you know, uh, a jumping off point, it's really hard to get attention. It's sort of the same thing here with live streaming. So, you know, what we're concentrating on doing is, is, you know, timing it. So it's got the most impact, not only to uh, serve our fans who are patiently waiting, but also to potentially, you know, help us with the stream of revenue that's been lost by, by touring. Tim, I saw you nodding while uh, Mike is saying uh, uh, about making money. Is it making money in 2020 or is it about making money in 2021? <laughs> I think it's a combination of both. We just had a pretty established artist um, do a live stream behind a paywall and it was very, very successful. Uh, we're really, we were really happy with the performance, but you know, it's an artist on its sixth album. Um, you know, that's a little different than a new artist who is developing. I would say for developing artists, for new artists, you can go on Instagram and, and, and do a guitar lesson. You can, we're having another band doing a Netflix watch party where the, they're just watching a movie with their fans. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, I, I think, and I think this is the challenge right now is staying connected with your fans when you can't tour. And if I'm a band like the one I like talked about, talked about, there's opportunities for them. They should be seeking those out, and I'm sure they are. You know, for the newer bands, I think it is getting in the faces of the fans you have. Tell them to share. Tell them to share. You know, play my guitar lick. Share this with somebody. You know, I, it, I, there's no right answer right now, but uh, you know, I think you, each band is going to try and find its way. And it's re it's it's a really tough period. I I think. Absolutely. Derek, it seems like probably your acts are on all different stages of album cycles, etc. where some of your artists, perhaps this couldn't be timed better and others, it couldn't be timed worse, like Dance, Gavin, Dance. Uh, so uh, how, how are, what are you communicating with them? What are you telling them the, between the artists who it times well for, for those who don't? Um, well, look, you, you know, um, <laughs> We had no control over any of this, um, but yes, it was some bad timing for sure. But, you know, in terms of those artists that do have albums coming out in the very immediate future, uh, we made the decision to, can I curse on this? I guess uh, just, you know, uh, sorry. Absolutely. We made the decision to just be like, you know, fuck it, we're going forward and we're going to release these albums. These are what the fans are waiting for. Um, a huge component of the physical part and the touring part are completely taking out. Everybody recognizes that. And we're coming up with all the ways, best ways possible that we can still have a successful release. Um, and this is for a few artists that I have that will definitely be putting albums out when the possibility of retail and touring are not in the mix at all. And um, we feel it's better service. It's a better service to the fans to have the music come out. Um, they're still going to listen to it. It's probably going to be on different ways that we anticipated. Um, so that's every band that I work with that is coming that has material that's supposed to come out um, during the shutdown. They're still moving forward with it. Um, as far as artists that didn't have releases um, planned, at least now for this period, however long that may be, um, it's a great time for them to continue to write, record. There's no big pressure on them. The touring again is taken out of the equation. Um, I think it'll. I think after all this is said and done, there's going to be a lot of great music coming out for a lot of people, a lot of bands. It's going to be fantastic. And I think the live touring is going to be that much more robust. I mean, I, I do think there's going to be a big bottleneck and it's going to be kind of like, shit, I agree. where do we go? Uh, there's shows every night, but it's going to eventually, you know, unbottle. And I really think a lot of people are going to take live music for granted like they may have before. I think it might change. Cons I think it might change some consumption habits too, like because yeah. you can't go to a store. I think it's going to actually help grow streaming too. Right? No, now. I agree with that. In, in the, I, I think I was more talking about like once this is over, like when people are having such a dire outlook. I think yeah. once this is over and cleared, I think the, I personally think the music business is going to come back that much more stronger. But for right now, I agree with you. Also, it, it is. Yeah. Um, there's going to be an equal amount of consumption. It's just different how it's going to be consumed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tim, anything different that you're communicating to your acts about, depending on whether they're mid-album cycle or outside of album cycle right now? Um, I think we're trying to create more content. 
you know, like that's been the one thing we're trying to, especially if you're, if we're heading towards a release, we're trying to, this is the time for you to go and re- record your drum lessons and record your guitar lessons. And, um, are you a gamer? Make your Twitch channel now while you're home. Like let's, 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 let's get everything either set up and, and, and for some artists it's actually take, it's a time to take a breath and also figure out, is there some a way we could be more effective? Um, so it, it, I, it depends on the artist, but but yeah, we're 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 trying to take this time to um, get our ducks in a row in a lot of in a lot of places where it was nonstop. Eddie, did it did this lockdown really change things up for you and your clients, or uh, or are you able to uh, skate through this relatively okay? I it changed it up a great deal, and it made it a lot more interesting. You know, um, a lot of our clients relied heavily on touring. And that was a big marketing driver. And now that that's gone, it's giving us the freedom to be more creative with other marketing drivers that they may have said no to uh, had they just been on the road doing the typical, you know, album cycle. Awesome. Mike, I got to leave you with uh, some final thoughts on that. Uh, uh, anything you want to add to as far as like the value of marketing? Perhaps we're all, everybody's recognizing it a little bit more when it's, uh, when touring has gone away. I think for me, like the takeaway really is, you know, everybody, as Derek pointed out, you know, this is happening to everybody at the same time. So no matter what uh, is occurring, I mean, this does allow us to sort of take these fresh looks at things. As Tim said, either guys get a breather or as Eddie said, you know, people, um, you know, they're having to pivot and do things that they may not have traditionally done. I think Tim and Derek both said that as well. But you know the to me like the the foundation of what we try to do with artists and marketing is all the same you know it's just that we are now strategizing for you know all online as opposed to the old mix which was predominantly touring so you know inevitably you know those of us on this call will hopefully be around for another couple decades doing this we'll see other further changes but I think what makes these guys successful is, you know, they've laid the foundation. They know how to get the most out of any situation uh, by focusing on the fundamentals inherent to that situation. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a really exciting time, in all yeah. honesty. And I think most of us on this call, you know, are thriving, you know, because, as I said previously, you know, it's like we didn't have the chance to ever have the artist stop, you know, the engine is, you know, the car stopped, it's up on blocks and we're looking under it saying what, you know, what parts can we replace? What parts can we make better? Understanding that eventually the race is going to continue and we'll get the car back out there and, you know, presumably it'll just be better and we'll have a better, you know, those of us that are, are, are spending the time and focusing on this and the developing artists out there, those who are really using this time as a way to, to work on some of these fundamentals, they're just going to be in a great spot, you know, when it does return to whatever the new normal is. Every, every single band, every single one is, this is not a problem of like, Oh, we just had a couple of bands have some bad luck. Like every single band is going through all this and it all, no one is growing touring wise right now while this is happening. So we all have to figure out what we can do to grow, you know, on the other side, meaning the, the, the online side, the marketing yeah. side without the touring. Well, awesome. Thank you guys very, very much. This has been a pretty amazing conversation. So thank you. I uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, uh, Derek from, uh, let's see, Derek, you're from Sheltered Music Group. Sorry. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Mike from Test yes. Management, Tim from Spine Farm, and Eddie from Undercover Marketing. Thank you very, very much. I uh, hope you guys will be willing to do this again. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is an amazing, amazing group of people. We're here to tackle uh, how to book gigs in 2020, if gigs are to be had, or how to get ready for 2021. And, oh, man, uh, Mike put together an amazing (laughs) panel here of people who would know this inside and out from all sorts of different angles. Uh, So I'll just go one by one. If you could just introduce yourself and, uh, you know, where your your main uh, business of operations and what you do for that business. Uh, We'll start there with uh, with you, Peter. Uh, My name is Peter Orr. Uh, 
I have a company called Anchors Away, and I have uh, venues in Denver and in Dallas. I have uh, the Oriental Theater in Denver, and in Dallas I have Gas Monkey and Gas Monkey Live, and I've been doing concerts for 25 years or so. Thank you, Kim. Hi, my name's Kim Schoen. I'm an artist manager. I've been doing that for about 10 years now. Um, I've worked with stadium level arena acts down to uh, club acts and currently manage Motionless and White and the Messenger Birds based in Los Angeles. Awesome. Uh, uh, Anthony. Hey, gang. Um, founder and owner of Come and Take It Productions in uh, Austin, Texas. Been booking shows here for 10 plus years or so. Uh, and uh, co-owner of Come and Take It Live. We opened uh, just over three years ago, or right around three years ago. Excellent, thank you. And Dave? Yeah, um, I, I am a co-founder, co-owner of Sound Talent Group. We're a, an agency. We book tours for bands, everything from Motionless and White with Kim uh, to Parkway Drive and Lamb of God and Run DMC and uh, Kill Switch Engage and August Burns Red and many more. Um, and I uh, also uh, started Velocity Records and uh, that's uh, I also on the record label and amongst other businesses. But that's uh, that's a little bit of, of what I do. And I'll give you the same preface I gave these guys before, but we're all working from home. So I apologize in advance if you get a couple dogs barking in the background. <laughs> uh, from time to time, and uh, also I've not shaved or cut my hair under quarantine, so <laughs> I I normally do look like I live in a home and not on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and Mike. Hey guys, uh, Mike, uh, founder of Outer Loop Coaching, along with you, Paul, and uh, manager over at Tenth Street Entertainment. Um, manage Ice Nine Kills, and uh, yeah. That's really it. <laughs> uh, Peter, can we start with you, uh, with, with your venues? Are you, with the fact that you've got nothing going on right now, just like every other venue across the world, uh, are you looking at booking at a, a particular high margin shows or particular types of shows once your doors are able to open again? It's so hard to say with not knowing how we're going to open or what our capacities are going to be limited to because they could say you could open in May, but you can only do 200 people or 50 people, or you can open in August and you can do whatever number. So we're kind of been talking amongst ourselves for the partners in my different ventures to say, what are we going to do? And when they say, Hey, you can open at 200 cap, what are we going to do? Because we need to make some money. So we have kind of different plans for the different ways that could be opened. And we're just waiting for the information just like everybody else. Gotcha. And uh, should booking agents and artists, even like local artists in your town, should they be keeping their ear to the ground for these types of announcements? And then what slots are going to be available for which types of bands? I mean, if they open on a, on a more limited basis where we can at least put some people in our, in our venues, um, but at such a limited capacity that it prohibits Dave's bands and everybody's bands from touring still, because nobody, you know, August Burns Red's not going to go around and play 100 cap venues, or maybe they will, I don't know. But if that happens, then we're going to have to fill it with local bands because that's who's sitting around trying to, waiting to make some money too. So if it opens on a smaller amount, we have, we'll be ready to hit up all our local bands and start doing as many local shows as we can, given the capacity. Excellent. So, Anthony, anything different with the way that you're approaching things that uh, come and take it? Uh, no, man, to be honest with you, everything that Peter just said is, is right on par, I think, with, um, I would imagine, every promoter in the country right now, you know, just kind of waiting to see you know when we're able to begin operating again and what kind of restrictions we're going to have when that begins you know um i feel like uh the the venues themselves might find themselves uh in i don't want to say a better scenario because depending on capacity and overhead you know it it might cost them more just to be open than it would for them to be closed but maybe they can open for small local shows and for alcohol sales and things like that but I feel comparatively that's going to be a drop in the bucket. So we're just kind of waiting yeah, to see what, what we can and can't do. 
The other, the other thing I want to add is it's hard to tell what the public's going to want to do. So while we want to have some shows just to bring some semblance of normalcy back to life, you know, it's nice to want to make some money because we're not, none of us are making it right now. But at the same time, just to have a little bit of regularity back into life and give people that would be nice. But again, you know, who knows who's going to come show up when we do have those capacities. Dave, are, is this the same thing you're hearing from uh, promoters you talk to? Uh, what's uh, what's your strategy going to be from the other side of the t of the uh, desk? Yeah, you know, um, it is. The problem right now is that there's not a single person that knows more than another person, right? It's not like, uh, you know, I'm about to tell you guys something that none of you have heard and vice versa. Like, we're all going off the same information and just interpreting it the best that we can. Um, and you know, and so it's really hard. I think, I think the hardest part, and it's kind of what Peter started to say, but like, I think the hardest part is just not knowing, right? Like it, even if um, they said right now, like there will not be a single show in any capacity for the next 18 months. But after that, we're back, we're back rolling. At least then we'd have a, at least then like, well, obviously that's not something we want to hear. At least we'd be able to plan and prepare, right? But like, we don't know if we're going to be allowed to do shows in a month, six months, 12 months, 18 months, we don't know what capacities we'll be allowed to do. We don't know if Ohio is going to allow tours and California won't. And, you know, so like it starts to become really difficult. We were, we were talking today over here at Sound Talent Group about like it seems pretty clear that like the red states are the ones that are going to probably be the first to open, right? Like, you know, because people, um, you know, those are the, the Trump states and, you know, um obviously trump doesn't usually uh make decisions with his brain um it's more just <laughs> whatever goes um so he's like let's just get rolling and so all the red states like we were literally talking today well do we book literally just tours of the red states and then maybe those get are able to play first and the blue or not um you don't really know but like um you know peter touched on something interesting you know he, he made the comment about like you know, like a band like August Burns Red, who normally could sell one to 2,000 capacity venues out pretty much anywhere, are they going to go play a 100 cap room? And I think what we're starting to see right now is that because bands need to make money, I'm starting to hear bands that we work with say things like, yeah, if that's what we have to do to go play a show, then we will. So instead of mm -hmm. doing a $27 ticket in a 2,000 seater, Let's go do a $75 ticket in a 200 seater. Maybe we do two, three nights there. And that way these bands can just get back on the road and start making a living, you know? Um, mm. So those are conversations that are happening. I think that the second shows are allowed to play. We'll end up getting creative and figuring out how to, to make it happen. Some bands are not going to want to do that type of thing. They're used to kind of playing to a certain standard in terms of production or crew and, it won't work in those scenarios. And other bands are going to say, yeah, we are used to that, but we don't give a shit. Like we got to pay our mortgage. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see. But I think the hardest part, going back to what I was saying before, is just not knowing. Like even if it was really far away, but at least we had a date to work towards, we could plan. You know, everyone on this call, whether it's when we work with Mike on Ice Nine Kills or him with motionless or any of our other bands we're really used to strategizing and figuring out okay like if we've got a record coming out during this time this is what a cycle could look like and right now like strategy's kind of gone out the window it's just kind of been like uh well we'll try to book a tour in june and then all right well that's not looking like it's gonna work let's try it in august and then let's try it in october and now let's try 2021 and um you know can, it, can i get strategic with you for a second and just put the august burns red states tour together with <laughs> right now <laughs> i like that that's, that's great that is great i mean i will give you credit when i tell them that idea <laughs> you worry. given my that's life awesome. motionless and white we're on the road when everything hit the fan am i correct in that yeah we were just at the tail end of a tour um yeah, probably one of the most successful tours we've had in the band's career. We were on a co-headline with Beartooth all of January, and it was right at the end of that tour that this news started to come out about COVID-19. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of information at the time to really know how that was going to affect anything at that point. 
And we had a, a break coming up after that tour for February, March. Our next tour was supposed to be in April, May, you know, festivals mixed with headline dates and, you know, a really great spring tour that we were looking forward to with a lot of great bands that we hadn't toured with before that we were really excited about. So when more and more information was coming out and we fell into that bracket of artists starting to look at that April, May timeframe, we thought, well, it seems like only March is questionable. We don't have any shows in March. We should be fine. And then, you know, obviously things weren't fine. And we became one of the, the artists that said, okay, we're going to take the spring and we're going to push it to the summer. And we'll be totally fine because the summer will, you know, everything will be back to normal. Um, now, even more information has come out and that summertime period has become very questionable. And um, we're starting to look at the rest of the year like we may not tour at all you know tour postponements and all that has suddenly gone out the window and you know we're trying to remain hopeful in that maybe in the fall and the winter we'll be able to make up for some of these shows or do something cool for the fans but we just don't know yet and we're also in a position where we're in the middle of our record cycle so we had all of 2020 lined up we you know shows are being booked more and more in advance so by the time it was january we had everything booked until the fall and all that going away raises the question well how do you start 2021 do you still start in the middle of your record cycle and make up for all those tours and try and do the june european festivals and everything that's getting moved or do you make the new record now and start 2021 on a new record cycle. Another ton of people are on the edge of their seats waiting for you to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. What is it that that your client is saying? I mean, it, uh, I mean, there's so much uh, confusion and fear and all that. I mean. Uh, is this one of those times where as a manager, you, you can still remain on the same page with your client? Yeah, you know, I think in some ways it's brought us even closer together than we already were because, you know, my, my job is crisis management pretty much all day long anyway. And here we are in a real crisis. And I'm very fortunate to work with a band and a team of people where we can have really meaningful conversations about this stuff and work towards a plan together that um, everyone feels really great about. You know, the band, they've been incredibly understanding and their position is like, look, we're gonna be okay. Like, we just hope that at some point we'll be able to make up these shows for the fans in a safe environment and, and go back out there and, and do what we love to do. I mean, I think we can all, on this call agree that the number one thing that bonds people together and gets them through really hard times is music. So we want to be able to go back and bring the live show to the fans again, but of course at a time where we can do that safely. And to touch on um, some of the other points about going into smaller rooms potentially, that's something we're discussing. You know, I think looking at the fall and winter time frame. I mean, the traffic's probably going to be insane. Everyone trying to play, you know, I'm talking specifically about the club circuit, but challenging those rooms and every tour going up and trying to make up for losses. And what does the ticket buyer look like in the fall of 2020? What does that financially look like for people? What do those um, restrictions look like on venues? So, you know, we're taking all of that into consideration and just trying to, to do our best to eventually get back out there and, and do what we love to do. Mike, can you talk about that? Also, you're coming from the manager perspective as well. If, if Just talk for a little bit about this idea that, you know, there being a lower capacity, it just seems like every venue is just looking to sell out every single show and do so uh, in as far in advance as possible so they don't have the, the headache anymore. I'm sure Peter and Anthony can speak to that. Uh, 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 much more than, than I could. But uh, as a manager, like, are, what are you thinking about strategically about how you get your 
client into the venues once this uh, log jam, uh, you know, opens up and, and the phones start ringing again. I'm thinking much differently after the first 10 minutes of this panel, I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that said, uh, I think, you know, back to Dave's point where like nobody knows anything, um, you know, or at least we all know the same amount of information. I mean, thankfully with Ice Nine Kills, I mean, we have a pretty solid plan um, and we've been out in front of it to a pretty good degree already. That said, you know, we had a tour much like, you know, Kim described, you know, we had an April, May arena tour supporting Five Finger Death Punch that you know, as of now has moved to September, October, November, you know, it would be really interesting. I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what happens if only the red states play, you know, and um, I'm actually, you know, as Dave was describing that, uh, I was like, okay, what do you do if, if you're trying to route something, right? Are you booking, you know, red states with a day off ho in hopes that a blue state is going to you know, open up during that period. I think it's just such kind of a crapshoot. And I don't know, I, I, I think we will change our perspective as information changes. But yeah, as all these guys just described, I mean, if we're not already thinking two steps ahead, once the information changes, if it changes in line with the way that the people thinking two steps ahead is right, then we're behind the curve if that makes sense. So um, as of right now, today, I feel good. Um, we'll see I, throughout the rest of this panel. I might, you know, might have to take a breather, go get a towel and wipe some sweat off my forehead. <laughs> well, Peter, you talked earlier about how information is so key and the decision on when venues can open and what their capacities are going to be. It seems like just the nature of the beast is going to be like, okay, tomorrow. You know, it's not going to be like in 30 days and therefore you can kind of plan, I assume. So like, what is the sort of low hanging fruit for you uh, as a venue operator and as a promoter that, that will be the, the, the methodology for people to contact you so that they can get booked and have it happen quickly? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, with the red state, blue state thing, I live in a blue state and I also have which is Colorado, and then I have Dallas. So, like, I'm looking for two different plans completely. You know, I'm, I've talked to my Dallas partners about how we're going to get going once we can. And, and, and also the situation in Dallas is interesting because Gas Monkey has a restaurant. So that restaurant will be able to open up in the first phase, but then will they let us put a band on stage while the restaurant is open, even if it's not like a paid concert where we could do local stuff? So there's a lot of... I mean, like, again, so many questions, but I kind of don't think it's going to be, okay, you can open tomorrow. They're going to be like venues can open on August 15th or whatever, right? So you're going to have plenty of time to see, and they might say, hey, we're going to see how phase one is going. And then by the time we get to phase three, this would be the plan. So I think since there's no national guideline, you're just waiting for your local governor to, to make the call. And I think the local governors have been providing a lot more information than the federal house, obviously. So once they give us that, you know, I expect, you know, I'm still taking holds throughout. I mean, people are still trying to confirm June shows and I'm like, you're crazy. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but I'm still taking all these holds and yeah. trying to confirm things through the fall. And, you know, fortunately for the most part, I do business with my friends for the majority like Dave and all the guys at sound and everyone I work with or I've been doing business with a long time for the most part. So, you know, we all work really well together and are always talking anyway, even if there's nothing to talk about, Dave and I will talk or Matt or Tim or whatever. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a grand plan here. Anthony, yeah, thank you. Go. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I, I was just going to say, like, I think, you know, to that point, um, a, I think that venues will start to come back online kind of the same way they went offline. Like, I'm sure you guys remember those first few days, certain cities were saying, oh, no shows, no gatherings of over a thousand people. And then it was no gatherings over 750 and then 500. So I think, I think it's going to come back online very similarly. Maybe they'll say, okay, gatherings of up to a hundred people are allowed. And then they see that that kind of goes okay. And okay, now gatherings up to three or 400 and it slowly rolls out. But the other point to that is that what I was saying earlier, 
about convincing some of the bigger bands to just go play really small just so they can get back on the road. The other thing that's nice about that is that if you have a band that can sell 300 tickets playing a 300 capacity room, you know, um, you need your two, three, four month on sale and you need kind of that traditional rollout of marketing to make that work. Now, if you have a band that sells 2000 tickets going to play 300 capacity rooms, we can announce those shows the same day. So like if, you know, if tomorrow they told Peter, you can have 300 people in your room at Denver and you know, we could literally the next day, that morning, announce, you know, uh, an August Burns Red show or a Wonder Years show or an Ice Nine Kill show or whatever um, for that night. And it'd be fine because, you know, so like that's another thing that kind of works with these bands kind of going and doing these extreme underplays is like we don't need any time to market shows like that. Like, you know, if, uh, if you're going to play that small for bands that big, you know. We'll, we'll book them on a day's notice, literally. And I love, I love Dave. He's always thinking like an agent that just assumes that the manager is going to get the band to Colorado that day. <laughs> That's right. Driving. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, when talking about something like what Dave's talking about, is there a place at all for local openers? Do, is, do you need to bother? Is it something that you want to do? Um, I mean, me personally, I'm always down to have locals, man. I'm always, you know, we here in Austin, especially, there's just such a large pool of talent. Um, I'm always in favor of trying to give them a shot as long as they're professional, carry themselves and, you know, hit those bulletin points, whatnot. Um, uh, I think that, you know, assuming that we open or are able to open sooner than later, that's fine and all, but I mean, uh, you know, like we're all saying, you know, these tours are getting pushed further and further back. So just because we may or may not be able to open, you know, let's say best case scenario, right? Um, they're saying the city of Austin can open as of May 8th. I'm sure they'll get pushed back. But if for some reason we're able to, cool, but every tour, every show has been canceled. You know, we now don't have anything. Uh, I think we have some small local stuff that we have in the books for like the end of May, but I think we're going to have to heavily rely on just filling the calendar with whatever we can, you know, like, Hey, locals, like, look, man, you've been wanting to get into the venue for so long. Here's your chance. Like you piece together some bills, you know, let's, let's just do whatever we can to see how comfortable folks are with coming out. You know, I think that's going to be a big test too. Peter had mentioned that earlier, even if bands can get out and get on the road and, and they give us a thumbs up, you know, are folks still going to be kind of hesitant? Uh, are they going to be afraid? We don't know, you know. Um, but the local stuff, I think, is going to be important for a while, you know. Just yeah. local bills, man, left and right. Yeah. I think, I think Anthony and I also know maybe a little bit of better position being uh, indie promoters that were a bit more live and we can do whatever we want kind of quickly versus mm -hmm. so when, if they open up, I can just be like, yeah, let's do some shows. And whether that's local or if Dave wants to magically, you know, <laughs> teleport one of his bands to my venue overnight um, versus, you know, the behemoth companies are a bit more clumsy and clunky and it would, might be harder for them to, to do that. I would suspect that they don't move that quick in their operation and they have a bit more corporate liability, uh, just mm -hmm. a speculation, of course, but... You know, I think that we're in a, a decent position to kind of grasp whatever that first stuff that is that can come through quickly and easily and, and work out good deals because it's just us doing our own thing. Can and Peter is just speculating because he never worked at Live Nation or <laughs> AEG, by the way. <laughs> Kim, a, a, a friend of mine and I were joking the other night about what bands would we die to see? Like, <laughs> like the idea <laughs> being that, like, you know, that we even if the governor of Texas in his infinite wisdom decided to open up the venues, uh, you know, perhaps we're not like uh, uh, the the right demographic, but we're going to be a little more hesitant to go to gigs than probably uh, we the venues would like. Um, so with Motionless and White, you guys have a very devoted fan base, not to suggest that if they go out, they're going to go out to die. But are you hearing from the fans that they want Motionless and White to be performing right now? You know, when we initially put up our tour announce or tour postponement for the April-May dates, we weren't sure what the feedback was going to be. And 
it was so overwhelmingly positive and the fans were so supportive and it wasn't about the dates being moved. It wasn't about ticket refunds. It was more so that expression of we're just so happy that you plan to come back and do the show at some point. And we would rather everyone take the measures that we need to take right now. And we look forward to going to this show in the future. Emotionalists, like, like you said, our, our fan base is really hardcore. And when it gets to the point that we can do shows again, um, easing back into it and looking at it in a way where we do go back into smaller rooms potentially, I think is a win-win situation for both the band and the fans because we love playing those intimate shows. I mean, if you look at our track record, we've done tours called Beyond the Barricade that were specifically set up to be in 250 cap to 500 cap rooms when we could be playing, you know, 1,500 to 3,000 cap rooms because we love being up close, up close and, and up front with the band or sorry, with the fans. Um, so, you know, we look forward to trying to provide that experience when the time is right. Those fans have been super supportive and are just excited that at some point in the future, there will be that opportunity again. And we're not really seeing a lot of, um, you know, demand for ticket refunds and things along, on, along that nature. Awesome. Yeah, I, yeah I, th I think that's going to be... Um, I think people are actually going to be pretty surprised by that. I think a, a, I'm hearing a lot of people say that, you know, fans are not going to want to be going to shows and, you know, uh, social distancing and they're not going to want to be in venues and close to people and all that. And and don't get me wrong, I'm not naive. And I think there's some truth to it. But I also think that there's a flip side, side to that, which is that people have been like just stuck in their homes by themselves for, you know, what will be months. And people want to get out, you know, like they, um, they just reopened the local parks here in San Diego where I live. And so we, you know, we take my wife and I, we go to the park with the dogs a couple times a day usually, and we haven't been able to go and they just opened them yesterday morning. And we've already been like three times. And every time we've gone, it's been packed. Like people are just so excited to get out of their homes and that they're allowed to go and do this stuff now. And I think you're going to see a lot of that at these shows too, where people are so excited that they can just get out of their house and go see their friends and go see bands they love. And while I know there wasn't a social distancing aspect to this, there is a bit of a case study to that, which is that back during the Great Depression, when people couldn't afford, you know, didn't have discretionary income, couldn't afford to do anything other than, you know, try to pay their bills, movie theaters at that time had the highest box office numbers they had ever had in history up till that time. And it was because people, you know, intuitively you would think, well, if people can't pay their rent, they're not going to go buy movie tickets. Right. But the reality was that people needed an escape from the difficulties and the stress of the reality of that point in time. And I think we're going to see a lot of that now as well. I do think it's somewhat demo specific. Um, you know, I don't think like the 70 year old Holland Notes fan is necessarily like going to want to like go out and sit close to people and all that stuff because those are the people that are most adversely affected by this disease. However, a healthy 20 year old Ice Nine Kills or Motionless and White fan or I Prevail fan. I personally, maybe I'm wrong, but I think the majority of those kids are just going to want to get the hell out of their house and go to a rock show and are not going to care. And so I think there's actually going to be a, a really big demand. And I think that we could see a really strong return. Um, maybe, maybe I'm being naive to think that, but, you know, and maybe I'm just being optimistic, but I think that there's some, so, some, some positives to, okay. to what we could see coming back out of this. I mean, if you're right, and then it seems like a lot of bands are uh, have the potential of uh, sort of uh, shooting above, uh, you know, punching above their weight when they walk into a venue where before they might have only been expected to bring in 200 and 250, and now they're bringing in maybe 50% more than that because people just want to see mm -hmm. a gig, you know, whereas before yeah. they were asked, you know, that sort of thing. So um, starting with, like, how are you 
uh, hoping to kind of cut through the log jam that is going to have that you know that will exist and and get the attention of promoters for certain artists over other booking agents who are also going to be p- pitching their artists. And then, can you also talk about like 2021 and festivals? And I would imagine there's going to be that much more demand uh, on the the booking side as well, right? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot to unpack there and what you just said, there's, you know, that, that's a lot of, a lot of stuff that we're all working through and, you know, going back to what I said before, I don't think anyone actually knows the answers, but I would speculate that, um, what I've been advising a lot of my clients is that if there's a new tour that we're working on, like, let's say we were originally booking a tour for the fall that never got announced, didn't actually go on sale before all this happened. Those tours, I'm now advising all of those artists to move their tours to 2021 because I think that despite the fact that I do believe people want to get out of their house and go to shows, I also think that there is still the challenge of how much money people have. And maybe before they were choosing which three or four shows they wanted to go to that month, and now they're going to have to choose which one or two shows they go to. And so what I've been advising my clients that we're going to put new tours on sale, move them to 2021. And then rescheduled tours are still, you know, potentially, hopefully, maybe going to happen later this year. But the logic there has been, if you have a tour that's already sold thousands of tickets, and, you know, you have a tour that sold zero tickets, I think it's a lot easier to convince fans to not ask for their money back once it's already gone than it is to convince fans to spend new money that's in their pocket when they have bills to pay and they're having trouble paying them. So what I've been, you know, really advising all my artists that have tours that were not on sale is don't go competing against tours that have thousands of tickets sold and already have tens and hundreds and millions of dollars in the bank when we have zero. Like, let's push those to next year where there's less competition. And then the tours that have already sold a lot of tickets, the goal is to announce new dates as soon as possible to re-engage those fans and not have them stressed about, is this going to happen, them wanting refunds, and all of that, but instead really trying to get the message out that this tour is happening. We'd still like you to come. If you want to get a refund and need a refund, we'll offer that. But we're hoping that we don't get that many. And I think what we're seeing a lot of is that the refunds are not flowing in as, as, um, you know, as heavily as some people may have anticipated. But time will tell because there's still a lot of time before all these shows end up actually playing. So see what happens. So wait, you're going to do an August Burns Red States tour of movie theaters in 2021? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Awesome. Mike, when you hear all this, like, uh, are you cha- um, changing or thinking more about uh, your client as a headliner than, you know, bundling with other artists, that sort of thing? I mean, uh, it's kind of tough to say, but I mean, what, what's your kind of perspective on the future of the, the package versus the, the, the headline? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things come to mind, you know, early on, if we get the opportunity to go play some small venues, I think that's surely in line, just as Kim described, you know, Motionless and Ice Nine Kills have done so much together over the years and have similar fan bases um, and dedicated fans. It'd be amazing to do. I'm also thinking about how half my gear for the band is still in Europe, trying to transit back to the States because, you know, we got interrupted on a tour with Papa Roach and Hollywood Undead over there course we can make things work um you know we've got guys scattered all over the place so uh those immediate things might be a bit of a challenge um you know what i love about being a manager and you know dave and i have worked together and you know the agent for ice nine kills works under dave is like he's the expert at this stuff you know i'm sitting here spending most of my time figuring out ways to continue to drive revenue for the band while we're off the road and allowing the agent who's gathering this intel, who's talking to these great promoters to kind of come to us with the advice. And thankfully, you know, so I've heard some of this, you know, it changes day by day, but um, I'm confident that, you know, I've got an intelligent agent that works for a great company that's going to come to me knowing all that we've got. When I talk to him each week, we're going to, you know, I, I don't need to change the opinion of what we're doing on this call as to whether we package or not. I mean, we've all seen this business, you know, uh, I think the bands that creatively package and are willing to put the egos aside 
build better experiences for the fans. And I think we're going to see a ton of that in 2021. Um, it's going to mm-hmm. be really hard to actually go and do things on your own, is my guess. Well, that brings up an yeah. interesting point. I, I, I want to ask this of Anthony. Like, as a promoter, if you are being uh, uh, pitched on, you know, there's two things being pitched for the same date, and one is just a, a, a headliner, and you've got to fill it with, uh, with support versus a package tour. How are you looking at mm-hmm. that, and how are you balancing – even ticket prices at the moment when you consider that sort of stuff? Uh, man, that's a good question. Um, I would think that right now, you know, kind of testing the waters and trying to see if folks are going to come out or not, providing something that, you know, uh, has more bang for the buck, you know, more bands, you know, already put together as opposed to one and, you know, some local support. I think just kind of, uh, you know, really sweetening the deal as best as possible is probably going to be, the best route to take. Um, not that I wouldn't want to do everything that we could to facilitate a date for that one single headliner, you know, because as we're all discussing, everyone is, is they need to get back on the road. Right. So um, we're all going to do everything that we can to make that happen. But I feel like those, those, you know, uh, complete packages are going to be a little bit easier to, uh, to solidify and get folks out, you know? Um, but then that kind of also, brings up the, the the topic of you know all these tours that we're having to reschedule you know they're being postponed and whatnot you know juggling those with these cool killer packages that are being put together you know and just this whole log jam idea i guess you know is what is being dubbed as um you know it's like man okay we want to do everything we can to facilitate this new date for a package but there's this killer complete package that's coming out you know now what do we do like we want to take care of everyone, you know, and, and I think that's going to be kind of, uh, we're going to have to juggle a lot of stuff and be pretty strategic about that as well, you know. Kim, uh, I, with all of these, the one thing that I'm thinking is almost a, a bit of a chain reaction in that you've got booking agents who are going to be trying very, very hard to get a hold of the promoter's attention, but I would imagine it's going to be also more challenging than usual for <clears throat> you as a manager to get your booking agent's attention because they're going to have all their clients ringing. So what are you thinking about as far as how to make the, that connection with the booking agent uh, or booking agents that you work with and, and what should people be thinking about when they think about getting the attention of anybody in order to get a gig? Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of traffic right now for sure. And look, everyone's trying to figure it out day by day. Um, I'm very lucky in that I get to work with Sound Talent Group and Dave and Matt Anderson and our, our team over there who um, – like Mike was saying, are, are very forward thinking. I mean, I I can't tell you how many calls I've gotten from Matt during this time where he's 10 steps ahead of me on where Motionless and White touring, you know, or how Motionless and White touring could potentially look for later this year and next year and how, you know, this continuous game of Tetris looks. Because, you know, some days I'm like, we're not going to tour for another year and there's not going to be any space and no one's going to go to shows. And I have those panic moments, but he kind of talks me off the ledge and, and, you know, sound talent talent group is so great at um, making everyone feel like it's going to be okay. And there's going to be opportunities. And I, you know, much like Mike said, rely on them to get that information and talk to the promoters and help come up with the best plans. And, walk us through why something makes sense and why we should change how we're potentially going to do a tour. Um, I think something that we're facing right now that is one of the more challenging points is the festival circuit and what that looks like in terms of rebooking because there are festivals we were supposed to be on this year that got canceled, um, several festivals, and those, some of them are, are being postponed, whether they'll happen or not this year, I don't know. Other festivals are just focusing on 2021. The conversations with those promoters has been so different across the board, where some promoters are approaching it with, we're going to give the 2020 lineups who got canceled the first right of refusal to play in 2021, and then book everything else around that. Then there's the other side of it where 
promoters are wiping the slate clean and saying we're starting from scratch in 2021 and our lineups are going to be based primarily on who's on cycle at that point. And you might just be shit out of luck because of the timing and not get an offer for a festival. But as we all know, those festival seasons, like those are anchors for a lot of bands and you rely on having three or four specific anchors to be able to route in between those and make a run financially successful, successful, you know, to, in terms of reaching a lot of markets and getting to a lot of fans. How does that work if you're only guaranteed maybe one or two of those festivals and some of the other shows? And that's something new that I, I think we're, we're starting to discuss how we work around that. Peter, how are you going to work around that from the promoter side? You know, just listening to all this, it just it reminds me that of something on my end where there's all these bands that are have to reschedule, and we're still rescheduling because you know bands moved it from March to June, and now June's looking bad, so they're pushing that, and then there's still new stuff, even though Dave's smart and pushing his new stuff to next year, which is I agree that is a good move, Dave. But it makes me have to like kind of take the A and B shows and place them in, and then the B minus to below shows. I have to say I can't even take your holds right now because there's this whole level of filler stuff that as promoters we do. Hey, I have an open Saturday night in six weeks. This band that I won't name any bands that that but wants to play. Okay, I'll book that on six weeks notice because it's an open night. But then now that band wants to push to November, which is going to be insanely packed. And I just have to be like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. You know, so on my level, it's just like there's a whole bunch of stuff I just am shoving to the side to focus on all that A and B talent to put in there to make sure that stuff is taken care of. So it's, it, it, it is interesting on the booking strategy there because you don't know if you're going to wind up filling all these dates when you push half of this other stuff to the side. But at the same point, I'd rather just have all the good shows and not have shows every single night because people don't have money to go to shows every single night or aren't going to want to expose themselves every, you know, five nights, of, five nights a month to potentially getting the virus or whatever, you know? Yeah, oh, totally. Anthony, I, I really want to ask you about uh, from the festival promoter's uh, perspective, because you had a fest festival you had to cancel uh, uh, just a few mm. weeks ago, or days ago, actually, I think. Days, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so heartbroken. Um, so I want to ask you about that, but Peter also brought up a real interesting point about like the those A shows, B shows. I would imagine the venues and promoters are all anxious to recover as much of their lost funds as possible. Do you look at things like expanding uh, the palette of genres that you put into your venue or um, that sort of thing as a way to um, uh, bring in more people and be able to be open more nights? Hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we're, we, we like to consider ourselves, you know, genre neutral, so to speak. I mean, in-house, lots of metal, lots of punk, lots of, you know, hardcore and stuff. But uh, we're fortunate to work with some other outside promoters that provide hip hop and, and uh, you know, EDM and stuff like that. But I think given these circumstances, I think uh, it's going to kind of light a fire under my ass to um, actively, you know, seek out more artists, more genres and things like that to, yeah, to kind of, kind of fill the gaps, but to do it, you know, like Peter's saying, do it strategically to where it's not just this whole, you know, just wave of, of shows and, and people have to, you know, they can't afford to go to all these events, right? You know, still try to be smart about it and still try to kind of pick and choose. But, um, you know, it's tough when it comes to, uh, like, the, the club festival stuff, you know. Um, fortunately, it, we had a handful of packages that had kind of merged to make that happen. And they're rescheduling, you know, independently, and we're able to make those packages work at different times. But, um, you know, the that club fest you know if it's it, it won't happen basically you know we can't line those packages up again <laughs> unfortunately but uh, hopefully the, the people that were coming out to see this band and this band and this band they'll come out for those individual shows Dave, uh, there's been uh, some news about uh, uh, venues looking to book residencies you know like three four five nights 
uh, you're thinking creatively about all sorts of things. Is that something that uh, you think could become more widespread as a way to uh, uh, make it uh, uh, more possible for um, your artists to uh, to tour? And then the second question that sort of tacks on to that is, is that something economically that the artist will want to do? Yeah, I think um, that's definitely something we're exploring, you know, um, for certain artists. Some artists don't want to do that stuff and kind of can't scale down to make it work. Um, and other artists can, you know, but in order to make things profitable, a lot of these artists are going to have to start making some sacrifices on production, maybe taking a little bit less crew. You know, everyone's going to kind of need to um, be a little bit more conservative with their budgets moving forward. because so everyone's got a lot of lost time and lost revenue to make up. So, um, and with the economy being what it is and what it's going to be, ticket prices are probably going to have to come down a bit, which means money's, you know, guarantees are going to come down. And so uh, without a doubt, I think artists, you know, we're exploring all that stuff, but it's going to have to come with uh, a large, um, a, a larger understanding from like the overall climate and situation out there from managers and bands. And, you know, that's something we're working really hard on is to keep, the expectations of today's realities, um, you know, kind of in line um, with all these bands. And I think most, most bands and managers, I think, get it because everyone's dealing with this. Like there isn't anyone that's not affected by it. And I think that there's the sad thing is that that's the truth. Like everyone's being hurt by this. But on the, uh, the flip side of that coin is that there's comfort in knowing that like no one's alone right now, you know, like everyone's in this together. And, and that's been kind of cool because I think that there's been a synergy with agents and promoters and managers and even agents with other agencies all kind of working together in a way that you've never really seen. And I'm really hoping a lot of that kind of continues even when all this is done. Like, I think that's been something that's been really kind of nice to see everyone come together and try to get through this because, you know, the only way we're going to get through it is by working together and figuring it out. Dave. Hey. This goes to you and maybe the promoters as well. I mean, I'm hearing rumors about the bigger companies totally restructuring deals uh, yep. for shows that are already confirmed. Is that something that you can talk about? And Peter and, and Anthony, is that something that you guys are doing as well? Um, and yeah, what does the future look like? Is it all door deals? Yeah, so um, so we've been approached. We've We had a long call with the head of global touring at AEG last week to walk us through their plans. Um, they are restructuring all their deals. They're basically considering every deal they've made prior to this as a deal that is kind of falls under force majeure and allows them the ability to renegotiate. And they're even renegotiating shows that were sold out because they have the belief that shows that are selling really well will get refunds and they don't want to be stuck holding that bag. And, um, and, you know, I've heard a lot of other agents, different perspectives on this. And mine is that um, I think we have to back their play on that because I think that a lot of people are not going to come out of this and venues are going to close and promoters are going to go to business and, and we all need each other to make this thing work. And so, um, you know, the idea that people can lose, you know, more money right when they come back after, you know, losing all the revenue they lost while being shut down. Um, a lot of people just can't afford to do that. So we as agents, I think, share a bit of a responsibility to try to also help figure out how to, you know, get, get them to survive that. Um, so that's definitely something that we're thinking about, um, you know, but Live Nation on the flip side, they're still kind of figuring out their deals and exploring what that's going to look like. They've run a few different models by, us and other agents and uh, but they haven't locked in anything um, they're still kind of making final determinations there and then the independent promoters a lot of them are working together um, there's like this independent promoter coalition that a couple people put together I don't know if Anthony or Peter you guys have been in any of those conversations but I know something I've been seeing on pretty much all my deals from the indie promoters is that um, you know if a show doesn't gross the guarantee then the guarantee changes to be 100% of the gross and some of the things like that, just to protect some of their downside risk. And 
again, like I'm not opposed to those things. And I think that my mentality with all of the promoters and with all the managers when speaking to them about this has been, I am open to helping them decrease their risk because I think it is important that we help everyone stay in business. But if we're going to help them decrease our risk, we need to increase our walkout potential. So I'm totally down to take deals to my artists where the front ends are lower, but the back ends have to be higher, higher because it's just simple risk versus reward. If we're going to decrease their risk, our reward needs to go up. And if you believe in your artists and you're going to book them smart and book it the right way, then ultimately you have the, bil- the ability to make more money that way than you did before. And I think that as long as we have that ability, um, I'm all for you know, helping decrease some of the risk and helping people stay in business. Um, you know, we need promoters just as much as they need us. And, um, we're all in this together and we're all struggling through it. So we all need to figure it out together. Anthony or Peter, you want to fight him on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, it, I, I, I'm fortunate that I am doing this a long time. I just deal with mostly people who are my homies at this point. Um, and so we have great relationships and we're friends inside the business and outside the business. So we all want to stay here and, you know, have our kids college funds stay intact and be able to not sell our houses and all that. So I I'm all about the creative deals on my end. I'm still giving guarantees to the bands that should get guarantees, but I am sending less, but I'm making it versus a straight higher percentage of the door than normally I would do on a door percentage because that is a very fair way to do it. We're all in this together. I can't be the ATM machine that's taken all the risk for everything because again, none of us know what's going to happen or what the fans are going to do or if parents are going to let their kids go see shows. So I'll give a little bit less risk for me up front, but a bigger reward for you to walk out with. If the business is there, by all means, make more money because that means I'm making money and we're all making money and everybody should be happy at that point. Kim, does that does this all make you happy? And will it make your client happy? Yeah, um, you know, we, we've touched on these conversations already with um, with my clients, and like we're all saying, we're all in it together, and we're moving forward with the thought that you know we're probably going to make less money on shows. There's probably going to be a lot more. Um, restrictions and parameters at least for a while when we when we do play shows and we want to see our our partners succeed so as long as we're all succeeding together we're all for the changes that need to be made you know they ma- it makes sense to me it makes sense to them and i think if we can get everyone on the same page where you know we take the losses together and we win together then that's how this industry survives and hopefully less and less people will lose jobs and hopefully less businesses will close and we'll come out on the other side of all of this. Awesome. It's a great way to kind of wrap up. I want to throw like one almost sort of like a left field question to Anthony, if I could, and then uh, pass along to Mike to kind of wrap us up Um, uh, because we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, developing artists and, and independent artists who will be watching this. Anthony, what is the way that you want those artists to be communicating with you and pitching you on gigs once the the, the doors are open again at your venue? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I, man, to be honest, the same way that I, I you know, would want them to do whether this mess was happening or not, um, you know, just... Um, professionalism you know proving their worth and so on but i mean you know just kind of having uh just an understanding for how things you know may or may not work out you know not to have um any kind of high hopes or demands and just to be able to kind of work the best they can with uh us as promoters and venues and other bands but to be able to kind of roll with the punches you know and understand that we're all kind of, you know, dipping our toes back into the water, just kind of see how things are going to, you know, progress and at what speed and just, um, you know, just, just want them to kind of be mindful of that and, uh, you know, work together as a team to, to make this as, as uh, the best that we can, you know, and just to kind of get that ball rolling again and, um, keep the shows happening. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, Mike, I, you said the first 10 minutes totally blew your mind. I don't think there was another 10 minutes that followed where I wasn't scribbling away over here to the left and all, the, you know, taking notes on everything. Uh, but yeah, can you kind of wrap us up? I mean, there was so much good stuff here. 
I'll do my best. I mean, this was an incredible panel. Thanks, you guys, for joining us. I mean, leaves. You know, I love that we've got so much to think about, and really that you know, as I think Dave sort of started us off. I mean, we're all in the same boat, though that boat is a boat of, that's sailing into the unknown seas. Um, so I'll continue to look to the stars to navigate me. And when I get in trouble, I'll call the aviator. And uh, thankfully, <laughs> he's got a relationship with the, with the other guys. And, you know, I just think we're in a really cool spot. And this is a lot of, this has been a lot of fun. This has been one of the more fun panels for me. Um, I love the touring side of the business. You know, and ultimately, I guess, as we finish, you know, for, you know, Kim and I are probably thinking, or at least I know I'm thinking, you know, in one of the other panels that we did with a record label owner, he was saying, like, you know, the business has been so skewed in terms of, you know, for artists revenue in terms of touring. And so as we come out of this, I think it's going to help us adjust a little bit, you know, in a certain sense, the touring, I think we can all agree was probably oversaturated. And I think, you know, there's going to be sadly some sacrifices of artists that might not uh, be able to make it through, whether it's because of availabilities or finances. But for those of us that do make it through, right, we're also in this time developing strategies to not just be so dependent upon touring. Um, so it's a really exciting time for the business. And one thing that I know, I mean, because everybody on here has been doing it as long as we have, you know, like we're going to make it through. Uh, regardless of, of what comes next. So thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Peter, Dave, us. Anthony, Kim, Mike, thank you very, very much. Uh, greatly appreciate yeah. your time. Yeah, yeah thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Thanks. Thank you guys all for joining. Greatly appreciate it. If I mispronounce a name, please yell at me immediately so I don't make the mistake twice. Uh, but uh, uh, I've got here uh, Mike Bowery from 10th Street Management. I've got Carl Hensel from Kings Road Merchandise. Ben Brennan from At Venue. Spencer Charnas from Ice Nine Kills and Cleaver Clothing. And Ian Dietrich from 10th Street Management as well, correct? Uh, thank you all for being here. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be talking today about merchandise and just all the... Uh, uh, yeah, how we can solve everybody's problems to drive revenue during a time when uh, touring has uh, gone ground to a halt. Uh, so, Ben, I was hoping we could begin with you, if you don't mind. Um, like, I'm sure you're always thinking in terms of short and medium and long-term strategies uh, for revenue generation for artists. What's your opinion on the short-term opportunities in merchandise right now? E-commerce. You know, um, you better have a damn good e-commerce strategy right now. Um, find creative ways to drive awareness, drive traffic. Um, you know, just chatting with everybody in and around the, specifically around the merchandise industry, it's, it's you know, we don't know. Like, there's just a lot, there's so much ambiguity as to when we're going to come back uh, to live events. And so buckling down and being ready for the long haul, uh, merchandise is a critical revenue stream for all artists. I'd say, you know, if you didn't have an e-commerce game that was on point, it's time to definitely figure out who your right partners are going to be, uh, come up with interesting strategies. And it goes beyond just selling stuff online, but what are some interesting marketing initiatives that you guys can, you know, come up with and limited edition and exclusive offerings um, so that you can build awareness, drive traffic, and ultimately, you know, generate some revenue during this downtime. You're muted. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. There Carl, we go. That seems to roll right into your wheelhouse. So like uh, live performances are almost a, like a pull model for uh, selling merch and online has always been more of a, a push model where you, you know, there has to be some marketing and that sort of thing involved. Um, so is there a, a, a pull model or a soft sell or a, a marketing free merch model for online that works? I mean, I think each band is different. Um, you know, from our perspective, like all the marketing you can do. And, you know, I'm curious to hear, especially from Spencer and Mike and Ian too. Um, but so much marketing goes in, like so many people talk about marketing. So many people are like, okay, we got to do these good ads. We got to do these boosted ads. We got to do this on Facebook. We got to do this on Instagram. And that stuff definitely helps. But for us, over 50% of our traffic day in, day out is either Google organic. So people just going into Google, like band name t-shirt 
or uh, through our mailing list, you know, so customers we had already reached previously that, uh, you know, knock on wood, we didn't screw their order up and, and they're already in, they've, they've already bought from us, you know, and they've opted into the emails. Like we, we don't email people who obviously opt out. And uh, so for, for a lot of online merchandise, I, I would say it's probably about 50, 50 in terms of push versus pull, you know, um, the greatest motivator is somebody typing your band name into Google they already have in their mind what they're looking for. You know, maybe they don't know what the actual design is, but they know like, I want to get a shirt for this band. Um, and I think right now, I mean, for the last two months, we're starting to change our strategies a little bit. We've gotten a little less trigger, you know, shy in terms of how do we announce? What do we announce? What's the best wording to announce it? You know, keeping in mind there's a, you know, global pandemic and borderline, you know, <laughs> catastrophic Great Depression style unemployment crisis happening how do you advertise band shirts, you know, in a way that doesn't make it seem like you're just totally tone deaf. And I think in a way, you know, for us, we've been pretty lucky in that every situation that we've promoted for the last two months has had some point or purpose that's relevant to the band. And, um, you know, I think all bets right now are kind of whatever we did, you know, April last year is totally different than what you would be doing now in terms of what's okay and what's, um, the right marketing message, you know, cause I mean, we, you know, Spencer, you guys were on tour with Papa Roach and uh, that tour ended before it really got to hit the home stretch. So there's a lot of bands that had excess merchandise in Europe. There was a pretty tasteful way to go live and go, Hey, this tour got canceled. We normally don't do this this soon, but people really did throw their support behind bands in a way that, you know, normally the joke, you know, with us is that tour merchandise, it's dead on arrival. You know, I mean, it sells okay, but if it's got a tour date on it and you're not selling it at a tour, if somebody didn't go to that event, they're not going to care, you know, but then we had a lot of bands who didn't actually go on the road. So they didn't want to announce anything for a while because they had friends who lost tours. They had friends whose tours got canceled right before they started. And so I think that, you know, each situation, whether you're, whether you're really putting out this totally compelling line or whether you're just saying, Hey, here's some shirts, here's what happened to us. Your support means more now than it ever has. Um, you know, and, and in a way, you just kind of have to do that to what feels right right now. I don't know that you can really predict any of the economic outcomes, um, yeah. you know, because they're changing so quickly anyway. But it's also just you have to do in the same way, like you write a song that feels right as, a, as, a, as an artist. You have to sometimes just put a message out that feels right, because it's not as simple as just like, hey, here's a collage of merch on a, you know, square panel on Instagram. Come by. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think anybody's really going to give a damn about that right now. Spencer, can you talk about that? How has, how have you been messaging your merch and, and, and to your fans and uh, especially in, uh, in the wake of uh, having a success merch at the, uh, after an abbreviated tour, have you massaged your messaging in any way? Like what Carl's talking about. I think for us, it was a combination of, of doing business as usual and, and trying to always make, an event out of our merch drops. You know, it's not just we're throwing up a shirt and a hoodie and check it out. We developed uh, a system that for me was inspired by the Supreme business model. You know, I would be eating lunch on Fairfax and, and just see hundreds of people lined up the street waiting to go to Supreme. And, and I'm thinking, what, what, what the hell are they selling in there? I don't know, is it crack? I, I don't know what they're selling. And just did a little bit more research and realized that it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's not, you know, rocket science. It's they're doing things where everything is limited and they've built a cult following around that. And that's really the business model that we adapted. Um, you know, we're fortunate in the sense that we really have a theme to our band and, uh, it all revolves around horror and horror films and, and these recognizable characters and, and us putting our own spin on that. And uh, we, we developed this thing called Nightmare on the Ninth where it's a limited drop every month on the ninth and people collect them. You know, we, we, we were pretty regiment about not reprinting those designs. And if we do, they're on a different item and they're in a different way and, and never again online. And so we've really built up that demand and uh, I always approach that stuff as a fan. You know, what did I want from my favorite bands or my favorite horror films growing up? 
and that's how we approach it. And as far as the, the pandemic and, and adapting to that, we definitely looked at what kind of items are going to be virtually useless to people. Like no one's going out to the beach really. And if you are, you're an idiot if you're watching this. Um, <laughs> um, you know, we're not going to pre be printing bathing suits. We're not going to be printing towels. No one's running out uh, to get it, get that kind of stuff during a pandemic. So we, we, we changed uh, some of the items. Like instead of doing a bathing suit for summer, we did, a blanket that you know people would have around their house and I think approaching it in the sense that you have to know your audience and you have to know the climate in which you're you're selling in and also you, you got to be philanthropic too we definitely didn't want to just come out of the gates and say gimme 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 uh, because everyone is, is suffering now so we definitely did a few drops um, where we were donating the money to a various uh, you know, uh, pandemic relief funds, and uh, we, were, we were able to raise some money for the band members themselves and for the crew, and I think it's just, uh, it's a combination of, of knowing your audience, uh, making things feel collectible, and and also, you know, as you, not being tone deaf, you know, being able to support uh, people who are in more trouble than you are. Ian, I love what Spencer was talking about, about making every merch item an event. Uh, is, how is that something that you might use for some of your clients or you've done in the past? What, what, what kind of like, you know, does, it, does that spark little spots off in your brain like it does for me when you hear that idea? It's the right idea. I mean, Spencer and Carl both have been 100% correct that if you're not making products that you know, create some sort of shock and awe and or the marketing that surrounds it creates some sort of shock and awe. You're not going to be noticed. You know, everybody's sitting at home currently scrolling through an innumerable amount of posts and, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ways to get at you, you know, whether it's Zoom or Instagram or whatever you're expected to do nowadays. If you're not creating items that are going to stand out and that also speak to your brand, you will fall by the wayside, unfortunately. Excellent. So when you talk about like items that stand out, is there anything product wise that for you is, is like, what, I'm surprised not every merch table's got this, you know? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it really varies from band to band. It's, we all, we all pretty much joke within our, our circles here, especially in the rock business that we're in the black t-shirt business. So, you know, that's the core item and you build from there. Um, as far as items that, you know, that every merch table, you know, should have, it's something that addresses your audience. It's your, it's something that you know, your audience, um, you know, your audience buys and, you know, if it, it, it's really just about understanding what your brand is and then creating an item that speaks to that. Ben, uh, uh, Mike, I got to get to you, uh, but I, I got to post this question to Ben. Real quick, <laughs> it seems like right up his wheelhouse. Like, like there's, there's got to be a fine line between those items that fans are going to love, and so therefore we got to have them, but also those items that just have got such great margins that you got to have them, even though you might sell less. Is there anything that you look at that just is like one of those like items that uh yet yeah, same sort of question like it's just the margin so great and the oper that the opportunity is so good and uh, kind of to what ian was saying it really depends i think on the band not to be ambiguous but it depends on the band and the genre you know um and there, there are the, the black t-shirts like you know we just did a industry analysis for 2019 that highlights a lot of the we did 125,000 shows last year what does the data say and what's selling and what isn't selling your top grossing items and it doesn't matter what genre you are it's the t-shirt and it's a black t-shirt period you know and that's just what the that's what the fans are buying you know and, and uh, beyond that it's the black t-shirt with the tour dates, right? It's your number one seller across the board. Um, and the top, you know, out of all the shows on the average, four items generate 75% of your gross merchandise. And, you know, those four items are t-shirts. You know, so you need to be strategic and smart about, you know, what it is. Now, you know, I always love to give an honorable mention to the koozie in the country genre, right? Because the koozie is the fifth, or the, I think it's the third most selling item 
at the merch table, it's, you know, what, what do those things cost to make? Like, you know, 10 cents, you know, uh, for a koozie and you sell them for five bucks a pop. I'll take the $35 t-shirt, throw that in here. Here's two twenties and I'm out the door, you know? So, you know, for, for each genre, there are those, those trinkets and those elements, but you know, we've seen artists go out with these really unique, um, uh, uh, merchandise items that are specific to the band and they resonate with fans. And I think you can do that and make money doing that. And it's a cool item, but know that that's not necessarily where your margin is going to be. And you're not going to sell a ton of those things. Don't overdo it on that. And I think that's where e-commerce, you know, lends a lot of creative opportunity and exploration on like what, you know, we were talking about before about these specific items and, and doing these exclusive, um, it depends on the item, you know, it depends on the genre, you know, um, but not to, not to put all your eggs in that ba basket, be strategic with your merchandise line, know what the fans want, you know, um, because that's a really cool item that can sit on my shelf. But as a fan, I want to wear, that band t-shirt to school, you know, I want to, it becomes a part of my identity, you know? Um, so, so yeah, this, but as we were saying, I think e-commerce, there's a, a bit more opportunity to be flexible and have limited runs and exclusive um, items for it. Mike, I know that like, you know, we, we've talked a lot about it. It's very specific to the band and there are things like, you know, a, a guy is not going to wear a picture of another guy's face on his shirt. <laughs> But a woman will wear a guy's face on the shirt, you know, that sort of thing. So, like, how do you as a manager get strategic or just be really sensitive to not only great design and making sure that it aligns with an artist's brand, but also it is something that will sell? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Thankfully, you know, the four others besides you and me are all guys when I'm helping, you know, in this case, Ice Nine Kills design their line is, you know, I talked to Ben about, you know, some of the broader picture global things that are happening for him. I talked to Ian who manages other clients at 10th Street and has a wealth of knowledge from working in the merchandise business, you know, before he entered the management game. I talked to Carl who I've known for a really long time, who's had his ear to the ground and, you know, works with uh, bands in different genres. And so my job is to really take the data back um, to someone like Spencer and say, hey, look, this is the report that I'm getting, um, you know, from other people. And then, you know, let's see what we want to do with this. And, you know, part of the beauty is, uh, you know, it's really nice to know from a guy like Ben who's, uh, you know, said whatever, I think 125,000 shows that he can analyze and say, hey, 75% of the, of the business is done on t-shirts. Now we, of course, in Ice Nine Kills Camp, always like to think that we're the exception rather than the rule. And because Spencer's done such a good job of creating, you know, this um, really dedicated fan base, that other 25%, we try to super serve with really unique items, right? With the idea that if we super serve them, they go and tell all their friends, who then puts them into that pool of 75%. And as that pool, you know, expands, the overall numbers increase. But um, yeah, I mean, it's really helpful to just have these, these resources to, to collect the data and share. Ian, I want to talk about something that Carl was, uh, uh, both Carl and Ben have been talking about in depth as well as Mike as well, um, about online sales and where the online sales opportunities are right now. Can you talk about third party retailers and where opportunities might exist, especially for artists who might not yet be at the kind of level that a, a King's Road, for example, would be interested in taking them on, but there's still opportunities. Is eBay still a thing? Is, is it Amazon or is it you really just have to build your own website? Yeah, I mean, honestly, my, my uh, suggestion to anyone who's trying to actively build a brand is to start with your own. The, when you step into third-party retail, what you're doing is giving that entity control of the experience. And that's what you re don't really want to give away. Spencer and Einstein Kills, tremendous job of controlling their experience. Every detail on the page is very succinct. The, you know, the skinning of the website is fantastic. The content that goes along with it is great. The, uh, you know, the photography on the website is incredible. It gives a really great experience to a consumer who has come there for a reason, right? They're coming there because they know the brand, they like the brand, they want to be further involved in the brand. Third-party retail for a growing artist 
doesn't make a lot of sense, right? You don't have any control of those things. You don't have that ability to, to suck people further into, you know, your scope of being an artist, which is not only merchandise, but it's the music, the videos, the, the experience. So, uh, yeah, it, you know, it makes sense when you're a larger artist to get into third party retail because that's what you're searching for. You're searching for mass and as many t-shirts and units as you could sell. So Spencer, can you talk about like how conscious have you been about the merchandise experience? And, and, and if you could talk about both the experience that your fans get when they do buy merch at your shows, as well as the experience that they're getting either being part of this, this, uh, not, was it the, the drops on the ninth or just the website in general? I think a lot of it comes down to the marketing around drops. When we're talking about internet stuff, we try to, you know, to branch off on the, on the event, we don't just make an ad mat. We make basically a movie trailer with, for every single drop. Um, and I don't see a lot of that done. I don't see a lot of uh, video content to promote, at least in the rock and roll world. Obviously you see brands like Nike and you know, that's their bread and butter advertising like that. But uh, I think once we started to adapt that and make that part of the equation, I think we start to see a lot more sales. So that's definitely part of the experience. Um, ma making sure that the website is really cool. Um, you know, subtle things like, again, we're a horror band. So whenever you scroll over a piece of our merchandise, like blood splatter comes out from behind the merchandise. And it's not just a regular cursor on our site. It's a butcher knife. So little things like that, I think, um, you know, make the experience a little bit cooler for people and also just never being afraid to learn uh, from more popular bands or other bands and see what they're doing. Um, but remembering not to copy them because they are special for a reason, uh, just kind of looking at, at what they do and maybe trying to learn from it, you know, especially bands that you aspire to be, you know, for us, like, you know, cult bands, like, Metallica and Slipknot that have those kind of devoted followings and I think you look at those bands and you see all of their promotion and how their websites function and, and you, you realize that you know they're where they are for a reason because they treat every detail you know extremely meticulously. When I saw you perform in uh, Dublin, uh, geez, it must have been a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, I went right to your merch booth afterwards just to see what was going to happen there, where that line that you had uh, to get to your merch, the kids that were lined up, it was an event unto itself, just standing in line waiting for the chance to buy your merch. Is that something that is conscious on your part is that something that just organically has happened as a result of the fans or or, or is it a mix what, what how did that come to be i think it's a it's a just a mixture and and the, the sums of those equations all sort of culminating in, in people being obsessive about the band i think that um the display you know when talking about live shows that's crucial too uh for me, you know, having a great merch guy that understands symmetry, I think symmetry is so important um, in every platform uh, and especially in a live platform, um, making it look like it's the wall at Hot Topic and not sort of a uh, just kind of, a, you know, mishmash of things uh, and, and, I, I do this less now because I have less time before shows, but I would usually come out and, and inspect the merch to make sure that things sit right. You know, if it's changing the design in the center to something else, or if these two designs are too similar, not making sure that, that they're next to each other. So I think it, it, it's a combination of all those things and, and creating that experience in, in every respect. Carl, what Spencer's talking about is UX, but in real life, like, but UX has got to be kind of your bread and butter on your website. The people who come to buy from you could buy from the bands individually, but there's a value to coming to your website that's beyond just being an aggregator. So what is it that, that artists miss or that should incorporate that are best practices that you guys use on your website in order to drive sales? 
I mean, I guess it's sort of a funny question. I mean, for me, I sort of, I mean, I think Ben, when we did our South by panel, however many years ago that was, probably one, but it was probably more like five. Um, <laughs> I always joke about it. It's like, look, any, like the whole thing about the merch company, the first thing I said on stage and I still stand by it is any idiot can print a shirt and anyone can start a big cartel. <laughs> that's the introduction to the merch company. Now what are you going to do? Right. Then that's, and I'm not, and I'm not necessarily putting down that aspect. It's just like, <clears throat> you know, I remember, you know, I mean, Mike, you probably did the same thing back in the day. Like, I remember printing shirts in our basement, you know, using a paint drying gun to dry the shirts. And then you'd get some, you know, random AOL message about how the shirt fell apart. It's like, well, that's probably because we used a paint dry gun, not actually like a real dryer. Um, and I think websites, it's a lot like web stores is a lot of the same thing. I mean, as a band is growing, there's not much of an expectation or even much of a demand that you have a really flashy web store. It's just a matter of, you know, the music is the driver. Like that's just, that can't be over, like that, that can't be estimated. Like you can't push that point. You know, I'm trying to think of the right cliche, but like the music is what brings people in. A end of story. Like you can have a great shirt. And we've had examples in the past of bands that, you know, had shirt sales that were far beyond, you know, back when Hot Topic was a much bigger component of some of those swings and merchandise. Um, we've had bands who sold t-shirts that were far disproportionate to what their actual sales were and even what their live sales were. Um, occasionally you could do like the one right lucky design and then just boom, you sold, you know, back in the day when you could sell 20,000 shirts at Hot Topic. Um, so we've had that happen, but in terms of the website and in terms of being a band, in terms of the website, I feel like people just need to do, like there's things that we put on the website, there's different items that we've done. We've done different customizing things where you can pick your name and number and, you know, do a custom hockey jersey and get like a proper twill applique NHL style jersey with your name and number on it. And there's all these different little, you know, twists that you can throw in there. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's just, if you're going to put up a website, make sure you are communicating clearly with people. So if you make a mistake, you communicate with them like, Hey, sorry, here's something, you know, we'll, we'll make up for it. Keep the other shirt. We'll send you this one. Um, I think there's a lot of that, you know, cause I think at the end of the day, if you love a band and you want to buy a shirt from them, if that says kingsroadmerch.com slash band name, or if it says bandmerch.com slash band name, or if it says, you know, bandname.bigcartel.com, whatever it might say, if that's the official site and somebody loves your band and they have the ability to buy something on, online, they're going to, you know? And I think like, you know, not to downplay what EMP or even Hot Topic can do, you know, because I think Amazon's a similar example. Amazon has their own little customer tower. EMP definitely has a very loyal customer tower in Europe. And I think that there's people who would rather buy from them. Um, and there's a lot of examples of that where that the, the, the vendor has the branding power and loyalty, which is totally cool. But there's no difference between why somebody's buying a shirt from EMP. Like why would somebody buy an Ice Nine shirt, Kills shirt at EMP? It's because they, they are an EMP loyal customer and they like Ice Nine Kills, right? But at the same point in time, there's going to be a lot of customers who just buy directly from the band, you know? Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily about creating the right website. I think it's just whatever you can control in your environment, do the best that you can in that environment, you know, and take advantage of those other opportunities when they present themselves. Um, but I don't know that having a big cartel or like, oh, you got to have the, you know, you got to have this feature, you got to have that feature, you need to have video in the actual listing. Like those are all things that we've done and, and, and built in. Um, but a lot of it is just more so because the band feels like that shows the item in its best light. It's never so much like, oh, this is, customers are looking for this. It's like, no, we want this because we have this really crazy box set and we can't show you all the components. We need the unboxing of the box set on the actual listing so people can see it. Um, and I feel like that drives a lot more of our decisions than necessarily like, oh, we were looking up on Amazon and these conversion rates go up, you know, half a percentage point if you do this. It's not, it's not done that way. It's just more so like putting your best foot forward of what feels right, you know. Um, and we have bands where, you know, like Papa Roach had, has video content on the top of the store right now. Um, when they did their interview series around uh, the Infest 20th anniversary, we had that hosted at the top of the page in addition to all these other outlets that they were doing. Um, so we just do different things like that because that's what the band wants and that's the way the band wants to present themselves. 
Very cool. Thank you. Ian, like there's a couple things that Carl brings up there. One, you know, just the, the, the website experience. And then earlier talking about just making sure that uh, you're findable through Google and, and perhaps doing some uh, social media advertising, that sort of thing. Um, having a great website is one thing. Getting people to that website is another thing altogether. What kinds of things are you doing and employing in order to drive traffic to your artist websites? In yeah, order to sure. It's, yeah, it's, it's intelligent marketing practices. So, you know, paid advertising campaigns, uh, making sure that, you know, your AdWords are all correct and, and, and your product is listed the correct way that your, you know, your SEO is, is done the proper way. There's a number of different ways to do it. Um, the, the simplest way is to, you know, use the, the current method, which is Facebook. Do, do Facebook advertising, you know, take the various outlets that you have. Uh, a lot of the bands that we work with have pretty robust mailing lists, customer lists, et cetera. Uh, you know, do Facebook advertising to those people, uh, use, uh, platforms, you know, some artists choose these platforms like Shopify and their remarketing tactics, uh, card abandonment, you know, uh, emails, et cetera, et cetera. It's super important to once you draw a consumer to your page, uh, to make sure that they are, you know, parting ways with their money, uh, and, you know, doing so uh, efficiently um, and if they are not you're reminding them that they haven't and super serving those people who have come to visit you it's hard to gain a click <laughs> oh good now now you've got me writing notes down i gotta have to do a video to show people how to do cart abandonment re retargeting on facebook advertising yeah. oh boy uh, <laughs> well uh, ben uh, kind of like, anything that you're hearing from these guys that like you know for you is is like something that from from sort of merch history just seems to resonate. And it's like one of those things where history should be repeating itself, but maybe isn't or it is and people don't even notice it. Well, I mean, these guys have just as much, if not more history than I do, you know, when it comes specific to merchandise. But, you know, one of the things that kind of along the lines of the last um, couple of comments uh, and topics is that, you know, while while we can spend a lot of time on you know design and creative and website there's a whole other side of this that can't be understated which is the service side right and finding the right partners and finding the right people and finding the right team that once you do gain that click it's executed and is a beautiful experience for the fan you know we're used to that amazon experience where i one click boom it's at my house the next goddamn day you know what i mean so um you know fans people human beings expectations on you know service is just at a certain level and i think that needs to be carried through also whether it's a live event or you know uh, e-commerce and the fulfillment who is your merch rep like spencer was talking about are they on point do they give a shit about their job you know do you care about the display you know these are really the the I would, it's like when you're out there on the road you know the merch stand is the second most valuable piece of real estate after the stage for an artist right you know it's like so so pay attention to the details and and again back to the ice nine kill scenario where it's like all those details about the blood splatter and the cursor it's it just shows that you care, you know, and and fans, re that resonates with fans. And so the merch stand should look like you care. Put it on body molds, have good lighting. You're trying to sell something here, you know, put it, same thing with the e-commerce side, make sure it's cool. And then once you get that click, make sure you have the team that can do the rest, carry it over the finish line. You know, um, you have a good product. You're, you actually care about the size of the shirts, you know, the sizing of the shirts and the quality of the shirts. Because the worst experience is buying a shirt from a band, you put it on, you're like, I'm never wearing this shirt again. <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's just, you know, uncomfortable or whatever. So I think that, you know, there's a lot and that's, that's just consistent. And so, yeah, anybody can print a t-shirt and sell it on a website or sell it at a show, but it's, it's the service side of this industry that needs to be, you know, highlighted and appreciated and given a lot of consideration because that kind of rounds out the whole fan experience in the, 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 the circle in and around merchandise. And we see it all the time. I mean, we work with, you know, a lot of different folks in different companies and, you know, we can, we can see the, the artists, especially when they're out there on the road, that are being super served by their merchandise companies and, and they're crushing it. You know, they're crushing it out there. So that's awesome. Uh, Mike, like when it comes to Ice Nine Kills, where they are now, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. 
that that was something that you and Spencer spent years building to the the things that like Ben's talking about just constantly having good quality merchandise and having a good quality experience. So what types of compromises or choices uh, or things that perhaps were a little bit more expensive when it, you really wish they weren't in the early years of the Ice Nine Kills story that are paying off now? Yeah, I mean, you know, Spencer's always been a big dreamer and wanted to do things, you know, some of the small stuff that we're talking about now, it wasn't an efficient use of our resources necessarily to get a custom website built, um, you know, to have blood splatter happen. So even though, you know, he ha has always had these kind of um, <clears throat> out of the box ideas, it, you know, new ones have opened, or the opportunity to implement them has opened up as, you know, the bands continue to grow. Um, you know, what I like about it is he, you know, it's been a lot of fun, right? As, as the band continues to grow, we just have so much that we can sort of experiment with and play with and, um, you know, pull in influences from other places. But, you know, I think early on it was, it, it still was, how do we, at, within the resources we have, find the best designer and you know part of ice nine kill success across the board has been a consistent reinvestment of profits back into the machinery no matter what it is but especially in the merchandise um component it's not you know not stepping over um a dollar you know now to 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 get a dime or whatever that one is stepping over a dime to get a dollar one of those you guys know what i'm talking about dimes and dollar oh you can get a koozie <laughs> for a dime that's the first one. <laughs> I, think, I think it goes i think it goes i think it goes for the first one yeah. um, you know, and, and, and that can be challenging to do you know um with developing artists it it's you know it's hard when you want some sort of payoff and sometimes just need some sort of payoff it can be really challenging to take the money. I mean, you know, we've invested pretty heavily in um, social media marketing and e-commerce and, you know, the team that we've hired has a really good approach. You know, let's go in and take a certain percentage of the profits and just reinvest that. That way we're not having to consume all of it and, and pull all of it back in, but let's take, you know, um, they've got some, you know, thankfully they work with a lot of clients, so they've got their own best practices and know what really works to continue to, to you know, move the, the, the level. Carl, uh, Spencer and, uh, was talking earlier about using video to make an event out of the merchandise. You mentioned uh, uh, one of your other uh, clients was doing that on King's Road uh, recently as well. Is there a level that an artist needs to get to before that type of event, making an event of a merch uh, sale make sense? Or is this something that is sort of um, uh, the, the biggest do it for a reason and it's, that's what makes them the biggest? Is there something about those artists who aren't selling perhaps the huge uh, 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 quantities on your website that it's not so much because of them, it's because of their lack of sort of oomph behind their, their marketing? Can you talk about the difference between those who are selling a lot versus those who are not? I mean, I think it all, I feel like a lot of that stuff kind of fits into the components of like the story of where the band is and kind of what they're focusing on at that time. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of bands would like to do more video, but I think, you know, the biggest concern, I mean, even pre pandemic kind of economy that bands are living in it really comes down to budget and time and honestly ideas too. Um, you know, cause I don't think every, not every band even if the band has a clear idea of what they want to see uh, or what they want to put forward in terms of how they want to market the, the merchandise or, how, or, you know, market anything. Um, there's a level of comfort, you know, in the same way, not every band feels comfortable doing VIP. Some bands kill it at VIP. Some bands are totally wired to that experience and that aspect of being a band where there's a lot of bands who, who grew and got to a higher level before VIP was even really a component of a band's income. I think video is a, a similar thing in a lot of ways because there's a lot of bands who just don't want to be in front of the camera or don't have video type ideas. And I think one of the worst things you can do when putting those things out there is to do it and then not do a good job. 
because there is a bit of a fine line on that where it's like, if you have a clear vision, you know, and I think music videos are a similar way, but I think specifically when it comes to like promoting merch, creating content for social media or just marketing in general, whether it's merchandise or whether it's a tour or whatever. Um, if you don't have a clear idea, less is more. And I think that works with merch. I think it works with merch lines. I think it works with marketing. It works in a lot of ways. Like if you're, there's nothing worse than like stretching for an idea that you're not either totally invested in or totally comfortable with or have a fully flushed out idea. Um, because sometimes you might get lucky, but you know, no, there's no examples that come to my head right now, but, but, but missing the mark on those kind of things, it's wasted money, mm -hmm. you know? Um, that's a couple hundred bucks or even maybe it's more than that, you know, whether, whether you have a person who does video and photo permanently on staff or not, just, there's a lot of bands who just don't even really want to spend the money because there's, you know, the margin of return on that where it's like, all right, if I'm going to spend, I'm just going to pick a number out for easy rounding, but a thousand dollars on a video, we're going to use it, you know, one bit a week. There's some bands where that budget makes total sense because it's like, well, you figure the royalty rates, you figure what we're going to do in, in, in sales, and this is going to generate an additional amount of sales. There's not a lot of bands willing to uh, put their money into those kind of endeavors. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just, I think each, each component just has to be a level of, it's a, you know, merchandise is a part of an, you know, the entire story of where a band is. And, uh, you know, right now, Usually e-commerce is sort of just, you know, Ian's worked at a merch company. You guys have, you know, being in bands and, and, and seeing the numbers. It's like live is, is the, the volume business of being any level of band, you know. Uh, if you're in a band that sells $500 a merch a night, your web store is probably not doing 500 bucks a day, right? It's just that those numbers are pretty consistent in that, like, if you're doing $10,000 in merch a night, your web store is still not doing $10,000 that day. Um, and so, you know, having that overall component right now with e-commerce being one of the sole areas of, of quick monetization for bands, um, I would still keep in mind, like, there will be a world a year from now and just spend your money in a way that, you, you know, feels right. Um, that's really the best way to do it. So, yeah, we've had some bands do video. We've had some bands do, you know, funny stuff. We've had bands do funny shirts. We have bands that don't like to do a lot of comedic stuff. Uh, or even get like tongue in cheek at all, you know? So it's just each situation is different. Some bands just kind of lay in the background um, and you could never get them in front of a camera unless you're pulling their teeth out, you know? <laughs> There's no, the, each comb, each band is different. And so I think if you have a true vision um, and you're at a level where there's actually a, a larger audience where you can do those kind of things and experiment and sometimes take a couple punches, right? Oh, that didn't really work. We don't need to do that again. Um, you know, I think that, I think that sometimes you just have to be willing to know what your your vision is and let those decisions kind of fall from that. Ian, can you talk about that a little bit? Like the idea of I love this this, this these ideas from from uh, the, there's idea and then there's execution. And I guess my question is, which is a bigger challenge for your clients? And then. Uh, when you know that there are compromises that will need to happen with execution, how do you tailor the ideas so that way none of these uh, attempts don't end up uh, either half completed or or just uh, uh, being unusable when done? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I see Mike chuckling over there because our whole lives are spent in that middle ground between idea and execution. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, look, and, and you have a perfect grouping of people here to do it. Uh, all of these guys here are experts in execution. Um, Spencer is an expert in ideas and execution. Ben's execution, Carl's execution, Mike, everybody, like, you know, we have a really good topic here to discuss because I think that the most important thing to do as a young artist is what we've been discussing here, really understanding the idea, really understanding the vision. If you don't do that, there's pieces that become gray, right? There's areas of the business that become gray and they become, you know, areas where you have to focus more effort on or bring additional people in to help supplement what you can't, you know, figure out on your own. Um, as a younger artist, you always want to, you know, understand your brand, your brand concept, what, you know, what your logo looks like, what your colors look like, what your social voice is, what your, you know, your musical voice is, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have to find people that supplement 
um, those different areas. Um, for instance, you know, I manage a band called Papa Roach, great band. They've been around a heck of a long time. They had a big issue um, probably about five or so years ago where from a merchandise perspective, they didn't understand who they were. They kind of knew what they liked when they saw it, but they didn't have a way to explain, you know, how, how to get there, right? So they, they knew that their fans bought a certain color t-shirt. It's black, no surprise. They knew that their uh, fans liked a particular type of music, had a particular type of lifestyle. You know, they have a great, huge, amazing history of, you know, millions of records sold and everything like that. You would think that a band of that stature really could understand what they visually could represent. They had a problem. Uh, we brought Carl in as a partner and Kings Road has been an excellent partner for us um, in kind of taking that, taking what the data says is great about a band like Papa Roach and taking the lifestyle of those fans and making consistent, concise, really well done, important designs uh, and profitable products. So that's just a, a small example of what every artist will deal with in any scale, right? If it's a small baby band who's just trying to figure out what their logo is up to maybe not Metallica, they know what they're doing, but you know, other <laughs> bands that, that sort of struggle with that similar identity crisis on a cycle basis, on a yearly basis, on a whatever it is. I'm sure Spencer can walk through those, those types of things too. Well, th thanks for that, Ian. And uh, uh, Spencer, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to transition just a little bit, but I want to stick with this idea of idea versus execution. Uh, at what point in your career did you feel like you could execute a really great VIP program? And in retrospect, did you do it too early, too late, or was it right on time? I think it's it, it all comes down to, to timing. And uh, as Mike said before, it's like you you can you got to make sometimes a thousand mistakes before something works. And uh, that that's always sort of been built into the DNA of the band. You know, let, let's try this, let's try that, and uh, kind of crossing the line sometime to define it. I think uh, goes a long way. And uh, I think just overall, we started to see uh, more success with merchandise when uh, we stopped following the trends of pretty much everything, um, music, um, merchandise. And I, I think that, that that's, that's the key. And that's like, the, that's the hardest thing to do, in my opinion, is finding your identity and, uh, and, and, and taking that to the next level because I think a lot of bands make the mistake of, um, of trying to copy. And I think that, you know, learning from other bands' success is a very different thing than copying what they're doing. And I think really pa paving, paving our own lane was what, when we really started to, to see that growth. And uh, it sort of coincided with when I think we found our unique sound and vision which was uh on the every trick in the book album cycle where we had a clear defined theme and and uh started to build that and and then i think really came into our own with the music and the merchandise on the on the last album because it had a, a a broader appeal and uh yeah that's when i think it, it kind of took that turn and what about a vip program i think you know, we, we've done VIP for, for years. And Mike, I think we started doing that maybe, I don't know, I want to say 2013 or 14 when we, when it was sort of becoming uh, the norm. I, I think we were actually a little bit of ahead of the curve on that. I think we started doing it um, before everyone was doing it. And uh, it's cool to see the growth there. I remember, you know, doing, doing a show and, Austin, Texas, where there's like, you know, three VIP and, it, you know, just having them in our, in our dressing room and being like, oh, we got three today. It's better than one. <laughs> um, and, and now seeing it grow to a point where I think, you know, we have to cap them out because they're selling out. You know, some of them, I think we had like over 100 on some of the last headliners. And uh, I think it, it's, a, it's a great it's a great tool. And I think everyone should use it. Um, I don't really know. If um, there's too early of a time to use it, because I don't think you you know until you get out on the field and start seeing what the results are. I don't know if it's like a bad look 
for a band to do a VIP and, and no one shows up, but you know, it could be, uh, but I think there, there, there are clever ways to sort of, uh, not hide that, but, you know, maybe say there's only three kids there, you know, say that that was capped at three. It's a great trick. <laughs> got a couple other think, people in the room I, envious of three people. I think you're doing all right. Yeah, yeah. No, and I think the point, I just want to chime in on the point that Spencer had said about like copying people because I can testify 100% from experience of being in a band that, you know, at the time we were playing in, you know, what I guess, what Mike, I guess metalcore world, I guess is the simplest way to describe it. Sure. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time with bands that, you know, grew well beyond our level. And, uh, you know, when you're in that moment and you're in the van and you're in Denver and you're playing second of four and the band that's headlining the show, it's like, hey, like you guys were the same size as us not that long ago and you see this band on this trajectory, it's natural just to be like, okay, well, what are they doing, right? This is what they're wearing on stage. Like there wasn't too much production at that point. You know, bands weren't like, the, the the level of investment into production now is much greater at a smaller level. Um, so at the time, you know, it was all house lights and, you know, you have a backdrop. Well, is your backdrop big? Is your backdrop small? Um, like, you know, oh, they have, they have some lights on them. They have lights behind the drum set. Like, that's crazy, you know? And so you go through this whole thing of just like, it's very easy to get sucked into that and just go, well, what are they doing? You know, and not, not and like you're saying, learning from other bands' success is completely different than like, well, they're doing this and got to them, got them to that level. You know, for us, we had nobody in the band that could sing. And there was a lot of bands that were singing and adding singing later in the game. And it's like, you know, you're chasing all these different things instead of just looking at your own road and your own focus. And I always say like, you know, one of the, one of the greatest compliments that I can give to, you know, Parkway Drive using them as an example is that they're a band who got overlooked, got, you know, looked over on tours, they might not have gotten the respect that they deserved, you know, at the time when they were kind of starting out. And now they're one of the biggest bands in heavy music. And there's never a point where they were, they were like, I guarantee you there are moments, maybe even internally, like I've never asked them, but like there's moments probably where they're like, should we be, you know, just in our, in our Hurley shorts and Hurley shirts? Like we're playing with all these bands that aren't in that. And we're not, we're a very heavy band, but they just always did what felt right to them. And that's like, you know, and it's gotten to them, gotten them pretty damn far. And so I think there's a lot to be said about that because, you know, they surpassed and, and toured with the bands that I toured with at the same time. And now they're at this level. And so much of it is just from them always trusting their gut and trusting the people that were with them as they've grown and never second guessing the fact that's like, I want to wear flip flops on stage. I'm going to wear fucking flip flops on stage. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, like I'm going to play these riffs. You came here for our music. I'm going to wear some flip flops. Now, were they <laughs> selling flip flops at the merch table? One of my first one of my first pre orders with them in this position was uh, was flip flops. It, <laughs> I had to do. Is it okay? <laughs> Ben, I feel bad to like, you know, to go from, you know, these two guys talking about like, you know, how you feel about whether something's right. What about that cold, hard data that tells you? When it's right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a really good question. And, um, and we take the position of not having an opinion, just sharing the data, you know, and saying, this is what we see, you know, this is not, Ben Brannon's opinion, you know, on what the state of the industry is. It's this is what it is. And you can do with that as you please. There's anomalies to everything, right? This is just the averages. This is, you know, a, a, a bar for you to, you know, rate yourself against your dollars per head. Are they above? Or are they below? Are, you know, when you're looking at genre based on venue capacity, gross merchandise sales for a headlining artist, how are you trending? You know, are these indicators that can help you tweak the dials a little bit to refine, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. And so that, that's our goal is, is we're not a merch company. We're not the artist. We're not management. We're not the ones making the decision, but if we provide some information that helps, you know, helps those folks uh, make decisions, you know, or, or lead people to a certain path. That's, that's what we aim to do, you know, and you know, the, the, you know, the debate that comes up all the time is do more items, make more money. You know, like, do I bring more stuff out on the road? And, you know, no, you know, the answer is no. And when we released that 
that, um, you know, the, the stat that four items generate 75% of the revenue, you have to think about every additional item in there and the cost associated with that, not just in cost of goods, but also the space in the trailer and the time to count it in. And, and, and we all know that, you know, the name of the game, especially on artist Ben shows is move the fans as fast as you can through there because, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's all about the transaction time, you know, and, and two, it's a shitty thing. If you have a line of fans still and the, the club's like, out, you got to go, you know, it's like, that's a bummer for the fan. And so the more items you have, the longer it takes them to make up their mind, you know, um, and they show up and say, can I get the ice nine kill shirt? Yes. Which one? The black one. God damn. But then you know that. <laughs> so, so the, you know, so seriously, I mean, there, there, there's case studies that we've worked on where the most more focused the, the uh, merchandise line is, the faster the transactions are, you know, you're helping the kids make the decisions um, faster and they're, they're rolling through. That doesn't mean you can't have diversity in that line. But, and, the, and, the, and it's different at different stages of each band too, you know? Um, so you kind of look at where are, where are you at? What does the data show you? And then, you know, when we released that, every merchandise company was like, thank you. We've been saying this for, God damn, how many years have we been saying this, <laughs> you know? But then it becomes a conversation between management and artists of whether or not that is what works for that artist, you know? And their vision of what that merchandise line is. So that's kind of our, our you know, our, our position in, in sharing some of this information with everybody. So like, like we, we all, like with data, you can almost tell any story you want if you just uh, augment it just the way you want it and where you look at this metric instead of that one. I mean, are you looking specifically at like item skews? Like this one is selling and it's doing its thing. And then sort of the, the, the second question sort of as a follow-up on that is how can an artist know when it's time to move on even for an item that might still be selling. I can't imagine there was a time where Metallica stopped selling tons of what was his, those plus head shirts back in the eighties, you know, but at some point they went, you know, we just got to move on and then brought it back later, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's, that is a very much a case by case basis. While we have all this information on the unique items that are sold on an item by item basis, we don't share that information. You know, that's private to the band and the merch company, and that's their data. Um, we aggregate everything and in, in an anonymous, uh, anon anonymous way so that we can share it with, with folks on trends, right? What are the overarching trends here? Black tour t-shirts sell the most, you know? Um, so we don't get into those details, but that's where, going back to my previous comment about service, you know, and the merch company and how they service their artists, it's looking at everything on a you know, skew basis for an artist to identify whether or not something is trending up or down. Is it time to put this item to, to bed? Or, you know, do we keep uh, rolling this thing out? And I think that for, for a lot of folks too, you know, the, the you know, it's interesting because we started this top sellers, you know, um, award for small and mid cap artists and looking back at each one of those artists compared to some of their brethren in that uh, range, they all have some pretty consistent themes, which is, you know, merchandise, tight merchandise lines. I mean, Ice Nine Kills, like you guys have a tight merchandise line. You know, it's, it's not, you know, I don't go there and see 30 black t-shirts sitting on the wall, you know, and it's consistent with a lot of the, the bands that we saw continue to evolve through the various size venues. They have, they have imagery that's great, great product. It speaks to them and their fans. It's, it has an identity and it's, it's tight, you know? Um, so I think it, you know, in terms of what the actual item is and when we swap things out, you know, that's up to management artists and the merchandise company looking at your specific trends, your specific data points, and also is it consistent with the next album cycle? You know, so that there's, again, like this is the data, but you know, it's not a rule for, that applies to every scenario for each band, I think is the best way to think about that. Awesome. And I want to talk about albums and, and the album cycle in just a minute. I hope you guys are willing to stay for a few extra minutes because I sure. know we're at time. Uh, uh, Mike, real quick, uh, uh, one of the things that Ben was talking about there was um, uh, just know, you know, knowing what, your fan, what the fans want. And with Spencer doing the drops for Ice Nine Kills, it seems like if, if I were an artist that doesn't yet have that kind of a fan base, I could do 
drops in the forms of pre-orders just to find out whether people are actually going to like a design or not without going through the expense of actually manufacturing it. Is that something that uh, artists at just a, at, a, at, a, at a lower level trying to get to Spencer's level, that stuff like that, what other types of like ideas should they be utilizing to discover before they go the, through the expense of production whether something's going to sell or not? Yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely a, an option. You know, the challenge that you've got to be cognizant of there is how long does it take, you know, from the pre-order to fulfillment? As somebody else indicated, we're in the Amazon economy and, you know, we can get away with quite a bit with Ice Nine, especially with that line because, uh, you know, we've got a trained fan base and we spend a lot of time on the quality of those items so people are willing to wait. But um, for a smaller band, that could be challenging. You know, one of the things that we used to do, we don't have to do it as much, was survey our fans, right? It was either through a direct survey or just a social media survey. You know, there's always a challenge between would I like to buy this and am I going to buy this? Those are two different things, as we all know. And as Ian, I think, stated, you know, you lose people along the, the journey of, you know, the purchase journey. Um, you know, we lose people, we study that stuff, you know, with Ice Nine to try to improve it. Um, because as we continue to, you know, grow the number of people that are coming in, we want to be able to convert each one. And then also, you know, Spencer, this, this is off of that topic, but one thing that hasn't been mentioned that I've been thinking about, you know, Spencer's merch guy is the master of the upsell, right? When Ben's talking about throw the koozie in with the shirt, you know, we've got a guy who knows every combination that you know, is really getting at least two items into the hands of every single person. And we've had people come back and say, you know, on social media, like, oh, thank God, you know, that guy convinced me to get this item because, you know, I don't know when I'm going to see Ice Nine again, or it was only limited on this tour, or whatever it may be. And we do that in the, in the online capacity as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for developing artists, you know, these tools exist. They're just uh, sometimes in a little bit of a different, um, medium and um you know trial and error and and uh, you know as we've talked about specific to the coaching platform is you know look the experts on this panel you know those are my resources to go to when i was in a band when carl talks about our bands playing with each other it's like yeah i would go to the dudes in other bands and ask them what works and what doesn't and um you know that's a way for for the developing artists to connect is within their own little community or in the online community. Hey, what's working for you? What isn't working? Yeah. Mike, I can't believe it's an hour in and I, I, I haven't asked anybody about upselling. That's, I'm so glad you brought that up. So is there anything strategic about the way things are priced at the merch booth that lends itself to those upsells? A $25 item next to a $15 item, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, I, if the question's to me, absolutely. Um, and we get to play with that. And, you know, the nice thing is we also, you know, have liberty and trust the merch person enough to swing and, and make deals and do all of the things that he needs to do. You know, Ben kind of made a comment of, I think, uh, you know, I can't remember what the term was, but, you know, the, the band selling, like artist sell, I think is what he said. Mm -hmm. You know, we've watched our experience when our artist isn't selling, right? When our merch rep isn't selling, we've gone in and we've got to turn that over to somebody that happens in certain venues or on certain tours, you know, typically uh, our conversion goes down, our per head goes down. Part of that is we're in different environment, other things are more expensive, the ticket itself, the parking, the beer, whatever it may be. But also it's, yeah, I mean, no offense to the dude who's selling it, he's just there to do a job, but he doesn't know right what things go together and and how to convince how to speak to our fan in the language that is so important carl tell me about upselling off a website how do you do it i mean <laughs> the cynical answer is what do we have a lot of <laughs> I mean, that's usually that's usually the answer i mean let's be honest uh, what's our, what's our, what's our most attractive mistake that we can put into <laughs> upsell? Um, you know, just each it's again, like I think again, the, 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 uh, the string of mistakes that you can make in times, like you just have enough successes to outweigh those and occasionally you just have to get creative and, and, um, 
you know, I think the merch booth upsell is totally different than the online upsell. I mean, we've had items that we've done upsells for, we've tested it where it's like, Hey, did you know that this existed? Uh, check this out. It's, you know, for you, it's like, we just kind of like a dollar, you know, but just like putting it in front of people's faces. And it, it, it's like, because people don't like to click that much. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of reminding people something exists. I think at the, uh, I think in a, a live setting, you know, um, for smaller bands, especially, because I feel like, let's say, you know, hypothetically, most of the people watching this aren't going to be in, you know, bands that are playing 3000 cap venues, wondering what they can do differently. I think there's a certain level of just having, um, you know, two things that go together, you know, the shirt and the koozie, like that's mm -hmm. always, this our shirt and a tote, you know, a shirt and mm -hmm. something to carry the shirt away in. And you have those kind of things that go together um, and have it round up to be two bills. You know, if that's the best case scenario. Now, granted, you can credit cards. It doesn't really matter. And credit cards are becoming more and more prevalent thanks to Ben's constant pushing of them on everybody. <laughs> but, like, the, uh, the, the ability to get a square reader and a venue reader is much easier now than it was, you know, say, even five years ago. And so, you know, having things that rounded up to 40 or having things that rounded up to, you know, 30, but just don't price your stuff in $2 increments. You know, don't, don't create a lot of change. Don't create a lot of time for the, for the seller. Cause as much as the, the people in the line, like the people that are there, they're going to be fine giving you $30 if the price was going to be 28, you know? And it's just, it's a, it's just not even so much like nobody's retiring off of that $2, but it's a matter of the speed, the ease and the ability to go, Oh, that, you know, I'll take that $20 shirt and get a, you know, a tote, you know, or a $25 shirt and a $5 koozie. Um, and I think that, you know, again, it's just a matter of what makes sense at the time, you know, given the situation, because you can't do a lot of upselling in a venue. sell. you know, they're not going to be there and go like, Hey, you buy this shirt, I'll give you this for five bucks. Like that's not their, that's not their game. Yeah. But I, I just get, this isn't a question. I just want to make sure that everybody watching this knows you must be able to take credit cards at your uh, merch booth. You just have to because I never walk around with cash and I want your stuff. Um, uh, Ian, all right, so we're talk we've been talking about the upsell. The next version of the upsell is the bundle, and I had hinted at wanting to ask about album cycles. The billboard rules have changed. How are you going to better utilize bundles so that it is either advantageous or just not as bad as it uh, uh, could be <laughs> for your artists uh, after the billboard rule changes? Uh, I, great question. Um, I might uh, piss off a lot of managers when I say this, but you know, for me, the billboard charts don't necessarily matter. We're in the business of creating revenue for our artists and, you know, having a billboard chart number that's slightly higher or slightly lower isn't going to make or break our artist business. So we're focused on, you know, values that, that create, um, you know, bundles that create uh, value, perceived value, excellent products for the fans, great, you know, pieces that all make sense within the, the marketing of the artist scheme because you're trying to create a fan, you know, I mean, creating fans happens in that place. It doesn't necessarily happen if, you know, I see your name in the top 200 of billboard. Um, so in my opinion, I would focus on great value, pricing your products correctly, creating perceived value by, you know, adding details like incredible packaging or, you know, throw ins, it's, uh, you know, that kind of stuff, I think, really moves the needle more than like, you know, putting a big number up on Billboard, although it is important and record labels really like it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Spencer, what's your perspective on bundles? I mean, you got this thing wrapped up great. Uh, how do you approach what goes into a bundle and how you price it? Yeah, I think that w when we use bundles, it's usually, and Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, we usually do that pretty much only when we're dropping a new record uh, and bundle that with, with the record. But uh, we've seen great, great success with it. And I think that it's all about not overwhelming the customer with too many options for bundles. You know, I, I think that less is more a lot of the time, uh, and especially when it comes to, to that idea with merch, uh, but making sure it's clear that there is a price break if you, if you, 
buy this bundle, you're going to save money as opposed to buying each one of those items. I think um, some of the cooler items, making those only available in bundles is sometimes that sort of icing on the cake to, to seal the deal for someone buying that bundle. And it, it, it comes down to a lot with consistency. You know, it's something that we haven't touched on too much yet is great artists that you work with. Um, and I think uh, we're in a position where I don't know how many bands are like us, but we basically only use one artist, pretty much only one guy. Uh, his name's Mike Cortada. And uh, he was strategically chosen because I thought that what he did with bands like A Day to Remember, with bands like Pierce the Veil, you know, he really, I think, um, had a lot to do with building their identity and branding. And uh, he's our go-to man. And, and sometimes Mike and I will see a design someone else did and uh, we'll think it's great. But then, you know, bringing it over to Mike, he's got that, that extra, he's got that third eye, you know, where he can, he can see that, it's, you know, it's not fashionable, it's flea market. And uh, I think uh, having someone on the team like that um, is, is incredibly valuable, and uh, especially when it comes to bundles because they have that eye for what items work together. Um, and also we've got, we've got a great team at uh, Absolute Merch that uh, we've really sort of established, established like a checks and balance system with everything. There's, you know, six to seven people that everything goes through when we're, we're deciding uh, about merch drops and bundles and all that stuff. So it's, it's a cool, uh, very open dialogue between our team. Um, and I, I think that for us, at least texting is the best way having those group texts. It's not email where you don't have to go into your email. Cause I find, you know, the way Gmail is set up in the last few years, just is a nightmare to find things, find attachments and stuff. So, we have a very open dialogue uh, about that stuff. Awesome. Uh, ben, like uh, we're going to wrap up really soon, but there's been a whole bunch of ideas here. And so I wanted to ask you sort of two questions. One, is there anything that, you know, that we haven't covered that to you screams of a missed opportunity that we definitely need to address? And then uh, sort of second, and it's a, almost a whole nother question. We just had a panel recently about booking, and we had promoters and booking agents and everybody talking about how they're bracing for the live experience to change. Is there anything about the live merch experience that you think may change in the wake of lockdown and coronavirus? Um, the, well, first part of that question, I don't, I don't know that there's anything obvious that we, um, you know, that we've missed on this panel in terms of, you know, the, the things, especially for the audience watching, you know, that you just need to be uh, focused on and consistent with and meticulous about. And there's a lot of really good expertise and advice that has been shared here for, you know, any young artists and any artist to, to take away and, and, and apply those, those uh, lessons to, to their career. In terms of live, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're in constant we're in constant con uh, communication with all of our merchandise partners, both on the venue on the venue side, the festival side, the uh, merchandise artist um, side, and uh, the best the, the short answer is nobody knows. You know, nobody knows what's what this is going to look like. Nobody knows when this is going to come back to life. Um, but there is a, uh, there's going to have to be, one thing for sure is there's going to have to be some quick and immediate adaptability to the environment, you know? And so what that means is when venues start coming back on, on board, are they trying to implement social distancing? If they are, what does that mean for a merch stand now? You know, um, a lot of the venue operators are talking about going totally cashless. You know, we're not dealing with cash. We don't want to handle cash, uh, you know, for the safety of our fans and for the safety of our staff. We're not dealing with it. How does merch, the merchandise stand become as contactless as possible? So that, you know, whether it's Live Nation or AEG or, or you know, the Troubadour, whoever can go to their city officials and say, these are the measures we're putting in place to keep the staff safe and the fans safe. And that's gonna have to do with parking. It's gonna have to do with concessions. It's gonna have to do with the merchandise stand. So we're all learning in real time, adapting in real time. That venue is certainly, you know, 
He's feeding information from the different merchandise companies to the venues, the venues to the merchandise companies. Can we come up with kind of a general consensus of how we can play ball? A lot of the venue then operators are, you know, hey, can we consolidate the merchandise line? So you're not coming in with 30 items. You're coming in with whatever the appropriate amount is so that we're moving the lines faster. We're also not counting three times as many t-shirts as we need to count. We're not handling more boxes, you know, every day. So, so again, nobody knows for sure, but these are the themes and the trends that we're hearing from all of our partners on how do we make it a safer environment for fans and for staff. Um, and, and at the same time, maybe introduce some new opportunities for contactless payments and, and et cetera. So from a technology perspective, we're certainly looking at this as, you know, how do we how do we encourage that transaction to go faster? How do we encourage, you know, fans to potentially purchase from their phone and pick it up at a different location? You know, we've done some of that on the festival side. Bottle Rock has an example where a VIP suite holder can snap a QR code, place their order, and somebody comes bring their merchandise to them. Are there ways where we can adapt? Not that that's the model that's going to work, but are there ways where we can, you know, adapt some of that technology into these different environments? So, um, it's, uh, and it also depends on timing. You know, when are they actually going to let us come back to work? When can we actually start to have some shows and rock and roll back? Um, but I think that some of those things, everyone's just going to have to, um, uh, you know, uh, absorb information in real time and adapt to whatever the situation may be. Yeah, cashless uh, merch booth finally means that that I think that's going to be something we're we're definitely going to see a big push for is the cashless merch booth. So, Mike, besides Ben's suggestion that you use a t-shirt cannon as your delivery system, <laughs> <laughs> what else? I mean, if, uh, what else uh, do you want to wrap up? Uh, this is for me. I my mind's been blown <laughs> a dozen times. So, thank you guys all. But, Mike, a couple uh, takeaways. Can you wrap us up a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as we're wrapping up, I mean, so much good advice from all of these guys. You know, um, to me, the real takeaway is how do you, how does somebody out there that's trying to do some of the things that we've talked about build a team like this of people that can influence them, right? You know, at Venue, I can call Ben, but Ben's a busy guy, so I can go to his website where he publishes things about best practices. You know, there's other resources that guys like Carl, you know, go sniff around at the various um, fulfillment places. Um, you know, uh, whatever Absolute Merch, as Spencer mentioned, Kings Road Merch, our friends at Merch Now. There's Second City. There's tons of other ones, but like, you know, we go to places like Rockabilia.com and go to amazon.com and look at where people are, you know, Spencer mentioned Supreme and things like that, but I'm, I'm talking about bringing it a little bit more close to home. Um, and, you know, establish a relationship with people that are in each of these roles. That way, when you're trying to, to you know, make some decisions, um, you can get some, some really strong and valid opinions. I mean, you know, the beautiful thing is, you know, it's, been an exciting time to be a developing artist because as you can hear from an artist like Spencer who's no longer developing you know so many of the tools are still in his hands and that's kind of the beauty is if you're willing to take the advice of guys like this build a team around you and you know do some trial and error and just be persistent um, you know the chances of figuring out a model that works for you um, are are actually pretty uh, they're pretty simple, but require a lot of work to do. Guys, uh, if you don't mind sticking around for another six hours, I got a few more questions. Um, <laughs> the sun I, is set in most people's houses I'm, by now. Yeah, I'm trying to block the, <laughs> the west window. I didn't quite plan that. Yeah, Spencer's getting hammered over there, man. <laughs> <laughs> only, only Ben has sunlight whenever he wants it. <laughs> right. Good grand. <laughs> Thank you all very, very much. I really greatly appreciate all of your time and, and sharing your wisdom. Really, really appreciate it. And hope we can uh, get a chance to, to uh, uh, spend some more time with you again in the future. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Appreciate right, it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Really appreciate it. This is an amazing panel. So I'm just going to introduce everybody real briefly, and then we'll dive into questions. Today we're talking about uh, the sync world, placements, video games, movies, TV shows, TV commercials, anywhere you can get your stuff. Uh, so first, just want to introduce, uh, let's see, we'll start with uh, uh, Jake versus Lewis. Versus Lewis? 
sorry, Jake Versluis of uh, Position Music. We got uh, Michael Kaminsky from KMG Management, correct? Uh, uh, we've got uh, uh, artist Evelyn and uh, Naaman Snell from uh, Space Cowboy Music and Mike Mallory from 10th Street Entertainment. Everybody, hi, thanks so much for, for being here. Uh, Jake, let's start with you if you don't mind. Um, first question is, uh, is, is sync licensing the jackpot that it seems to be? It, 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 it helps with uh, uh, building a fan base, it pays, you don't need to get in the van, and it uh, gets your industry attention. Is it everything? Is it like the bonanza it seems like it should be? I'm trying to think of a downside to it, and I'm not coming up with any. Uh, you know, it first came on my radar in the early 2000s uh, when I was in management. And, yeah, it kind of ticked all those boxes. It's all the things you said. It's um, it's a revenue generator. It's uh, marketing and credits for the artist. Um, it's fun to do. Uh, if you're not a fan of the road, it keeps you off the road. If you are on the road, it's supplemental income paying for the things you need on the road. Um, and yeah, quite frankly, there's a number of artists who've done the traditional artist thing, who've um, kind of stumbled into the sync world and found some real comfort there and have chosen to kind of alter their career path to more or less do that full time. Uh, I've definitely seen a lot of success stories coming up through the sync world in the last 15 years that I've been doing this. and um, like I said, I, I've yet to see a downside to it. Michael, is uh, our placements and sinks, is that even more about who you know than even the rest of the business already is? Oh, that's a great question. Um, a lot of it is, right? A lot of it is, I think. Um, there's kind of the uh, uh, piece that's gone around the industry of like, there's uh, the handful of gatekeepers who really. Um, have ingrained themselves as uh, being wonderful at their job and they really do have a lot of decision making power uh, with that said you know I think if you are an artist who works very hard and uh, really refines your approach um, you'll find your way through to it right and I think actually some of the most successful things we've had come from a very non-traditional background and then uh, you kind of figure out your own road in Evelyn, my understanding is that you've you found your road in. So I would imagine that getting your first placement is the hardest. What's happened for you after that first placement? Does it get easier after that? Yeah, I think getting my first first placement was with Jake and was at position, and it um, it meant moving out of my mom's house earlier in my twenties and. I kind of had been from the Cindy background and suddenly was like, oh, holy, holy hell, this is incredible that there's money to be made. Um, I think it doesn't always get easier, but I think you suddenly realize what works and you can take that to different projects you're working on, whether they're sync oriented or it's something you're doing for a smaller up and coming artist or your own personal project, like whatever you're doing then moving forward, I think you're more aware of how sync plays a role and how you can hit that market and how you can use elements of kind of things that work really well in the sync world to enhance what you're doing because then it becomes a huge part of you know i think every every musical piece you're working on so Evelyn, sort of building on that idea of like you know who, uh, who you knew <laughs> how did you know to get to jake in, and did you have placements in syncs as something that was your ambition even before you met Jake? Yeah, I think it's something that had been on my radar, uh, but that I hadn't paid a ton of attention to, to be honest with you. It was kind of this elusive unicorn thing. Um, and then actually, uh, I stumbled into it. I, I really lucked out. I was working really hard on a solo project, and I ended up working with um, two of actually Michael's artists. Um, and we kind of pieced together some stuff, and they had mentioned that they were kind of working on a lot of sync oriented material at the time. and. I kind of had this moment of like, let's give it a shot. And uh, from there is kind of, I think it was actually artist to artist, really exploring it with another artist who was already rooted in that world and kind of building off of that momentum from there on out. Gotcha. Thank you. And Naaman, are, when you're getting material from artists or for people who are trying to place music for artists, are you getting like a catalog of music and then 
looking for the right opportunity or is that backwards? I, I mean, for me, it depends a lot on the project. Um, as far as a catalog of music, um, for example, I download just about everything that is sent to me. It might take me a while to go through it, but uh, catalog wise, for a search going through my own catalog, my own super ridiculous uh, organizing strategy of playlists for what I might need. Uh, but a lot of times when it comes to specific searches and projects, rather than it, depending on how much time I actually have, which a lot of the work that I do is in promos, trailers, video game, advertising, uh, uh, marketing in general, the timetables are normally extremely quick. So I might not have time to like deep dive through an entire catalog, especially when I want to kind of explore as many options as quickly as possible. So I'll reach out to people that I know and trust in their catalog and their knowledge of their catalog, like Jake, and just be like, hey, I'm working on this new Call of Duty project. I need this type of stuff. Send me what you have. And I'll do that with like a handful of people to start with. And then if I need to broaden out from there, I will. So, uh, Jake, it sounds to me like, based on what Naaman's saying, that they're, you're just one of those gatekeepers that uh, uh, gets great music to these placements. It, are there any hacks or workarounds, especially ones that you employed perhaps early in your career, that independent artists who haven't yet developed a relationship with you should be thinking about or, or finding a way to get past you and get their, get to name and so that uh, they can get a placement. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think the ultimate, if you talk about gatekeepers, the ultimate gatekeeper it probably is a music supervisor for some, so someone in, in a name and position. And then it's really about <clears throat> the best strategy and tactic, whoever you are, to get the music um, to name in or, or even a director on a film or a showrunner on a TV show. Um, that can be accomplished through going through a publishing company or a sync representative or an artist um, on their own. And um, it all starts with incredible music. Any other step after that is pretty much useless if the, if the music's not in my estimation, you know, major label caliber. That's what we strive to do, that's what I strive to do. Given that's the case, then there's, yeah, I mean, there's there's tactics and things you can do. I've been in the business for a while and I, I know I have a number of friends like Naaman, so I've been able to kind of get in the inside and figure out kind of how they operate and how they receive music, um, you know, how to present it to them, uh, how to email, how not to email, what programs to use, um, what alts and edits to send, how often to send, how to cater things to them. So these, these, there's these nuances that you can kind of learn. Um, and there's courses out there and there's blogs and such. I've even done a course on it. Um, and there are certainly nuances you can learn to help kind of tee your music up to get it received um, the best way. You can also be doing homework, probably like any artist should be if you've sort of targeted what media you want to be in like go research when, what the release dates are for those things and, and read through the credits, go on IMDb, see who, see who the music supervisors are. It's not genius stuff, it just takes, I mean, it just takes some effort and some organization. But the, the information's out there. And <clears throat> while most major labels may not be super accessible to an independent artist, um, there's, you know, there's a fair no number of mid-level and boutique type companies that, again, if an artist does their homework, um, there's, there's the company I work at and there's competitors in that space too. And um, you can generally email them and, and, and call them. And it's like, that's a lot more accessible than a major label. Now to Naaman's point, you may not get a response when you want it that week because we are all extremely busy and it's only gotten busier, honestly, in the last five or 10 years, you're adding on Netflixes and Apple TVs of the world and eSports and the amount of activity and the speed in which it goes is, <clears throat> is really impressive. Um, and same for me as someone who spends most of my day listening to music. I may, I might not be the ultimate gatekeeper, but I'm very likely not getting back to someone submitting that week. I'll put it in the queue behind the week's worth of submissions I already have from last week. 
And it might even take, you know, might even take me three or four weeks. In fact, I just had to email someone yesterday who sent me a link, I think a week ago using WeTransfer, nothing against WeTransfer, but I had to nicely write back and be like, hey, I finally got around to downloading your music and there's nothing there. Like, can you do me a favor and go ahead and upload it to a non-expiring link? That would be my first, actually be my second tip after having incredible music. My second tip would be no matter what else you do, make sure you put your music in some sort of non-expiring link. So when the person finally has time to listen to it for like three and a half minutes or 10 minutes, they'll actually listen. Because if you have that opportunity and there's nothing there, most likely they'll move on and you won't get that shot again. Um, Mike, Paul. that story sound familiar to you. <laughs> familiar to you. <laughs> Uh, Paul, I maybe just wanted to bounce off something um, yeah. uh, the panel's been talking about a little bit, because I think we're, we're talking a lot about like the entry points into this world. Um, and I'm an artist manager, and for a long time, you know, I had a lot of trouble getting into this world myself. Um, I started kind of in like, uh, for those familiar with like the Warp Tour, kind of like pop punk scene, um, all of my bands, you know, wanted to get synced and figure out publishing and placements. Um, and it's not a super big market for punk music, for pop punk music, for metal music, for hardcore music. Um, Jake, I I've gotten to work with most people on this panel in some capacity, right? And I can say Jake is a very brilliant a r person at a publishing company. I really love working with him. I think it might be surprising to a lot of people that a publishing company has an a and person, right? Because you generally think as, as a manager, as an artist, you generally think um, there's an a and person on a record label, right? And their job is to like find bands. And of course, an a and job at a record label is much more involved than finding bands. Um, there's an a and person at a publishing company and their job is much more involved than finding artists. Uh, Jake's job, and he's very good at this, is understanding the pulse of what people are looking for. Right, and being able to communicate that now to the clients that I represent and to say, hey, you know what? Um, we need something that's like kind of uh, bright and cheery right now. Or you know what? The mood of advertising or whatever is um, uh, moving a little bit of a different direction. So why don't we dial this back and let's make something a little indie or a little grungy or something like that. Uh, what I've actually found is that my most successful artists now in this world are the ones who have come from, you know, the pop punk background where they've just been in studios. They've made five, six, seven albums right through the record label system and have now come out of that system and gone, well, wow, you know what? We're just really good at collaborating, at uh, being able to go into a studio, at being able to take direction. Um, and kind of the end point for them has been now moving more into um, the publishing world where they can sit down and they can talk to Jake and they can collaborate on a song and Jake may send, you know, three or four versions of notes through before that song even makes it um, past Jake to the next person because now as a team, we've really dialed that in. So it's kind of been a very long process for a lot of my artists. And, you know, we talk about like, is it the Holy Grail for it? Yeah, it certainly is. Um, I think there's a bit of a caveat of like, yeah, it's the Holy Grail for um, a lot of artists that kind of work in this space too. Right. It, it, there's a lot of artists that just doesn't work in this space. And that's where our emphasis is on like touring and streaming. I was a very different route. No, I don't know, Jake, if I described that all right for you. For you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, look, it's nice to hear someone I work so closely with talk about it and me in an objective way. Um, I think it's a really good point about, I think it's actually not common knowledge that most, that most publishers have an A&R person. Um, that kind of is a revelation to a number of people because the, the big idea out there is a record label, but there's quite a number of stories where if you go back and f research how a band got to where they were, in the very first or second paragraph of them telling about their story, it's how they linked up with the publisher. And that publisher opened all these doors to them, and one of those doors ended up being ultimately a record deal. But people kind of gloss over that and get to the sexy part of the record deal. I don't personally think the record label side is super sexy I, I i mean it's there are things attractive about it but for for pure gratification um the the publishing a publishing company is is completely my speed developing acts and um and just watching the immediate success and this is not an exaggeration when i say 
I've been involved with artists who have gone off. I mean, Evelyn hinted at it by moving out of out of her apartment, but some of the successes we've had, artists have gone off and writers in multiple cases bought houses, bought cars. I mean, there's any number of examples of when you get it right, it can be fire. Like it can be really impressive. And um, not to get off on a tangent, but I think to answer your question, Mike, that uh, pointing out that even the a &R side exists on the publishing side and helping really craft your songs is an important thing for an artist to know because I believe that an artist needs to figure out what the end line is and how to target their strategy to kind of get into the business. And you have a leg up if you understand who the fundamental kind of movers and shakers are within, I don't mean myself, but I mean that represents the roles within the business and who you can target. And if you can literally make a list of like, I want to know those five people in the business. Okay, now I have a target. Let me figure out how to get there. Like having a blueprint is much more important than being like, oh, I'm going to put out great music and somebody will come find me. Like that's not a strategy. There's, um, sorry, I just want to add one more thing to Jake, if that's okay. Um, so there's a lot of artists, and I'm, I'm not judging this in any way, right? But there's a lot of artists who like to turn in a song or turn in an album, and they go, this is my creative expression uh and this is the song right um and that's uh in my experience the very opposite of how um, a smoother process for this world works this is almost creating something for someone else right in in a lot of cases so you're kind of sitting here taking direction from another company going hey can we create music you of course have your artistic fingerprints all over this and some of why my artists get very excited to live in this world um and this is more maybe more artists who work exclusively in this world who are not necessarily like touring artists who then do this there's a lot of um clients that we represent who are just writing right in this um capacity um where uh, uh you know they like to sit down and they can sit down and write an indie rock run song one day and the next song they could be working on a super rhythmic, you know, very energetic type of song. And both of them are successful and both of them are really cool creative outlets for them. Michael, you've brought up like four things I cannot wait to ask about, but I, I, before we get there, because man, this is all like really great. Thank you everybody so far, by the way, this is awesome. Naaman, um, is there, for somebody who's trying to read, you know, find music supervisors and connect and make those kind of connections for themselves, is there a big difference between music supervisors working in video games versus TV shows versus films versus uh, TV, uh, commercials, or is are you guys doing all the same stuff? Are you working across all these different, we'll call them platforms? It's it's a mixed bag, really. I mean. In my experience, uh, like for trailers, for instance, there's everything from independent music supervisors like myself uh, to music supervisors who work in-house at big trailer houses. Uh, for TV and film, a lot, uh, unless they're in-house at a studio or a network like an NBC or a Universal Pictures or something like that, um, a lot of the independent music supervisors that work in those spaces uh tend tend to kind of cast as big a net as as they can but if if you've kind of come up in tv you know the contacts for tv and maybe you've done some films so you have some producers directors that you've worked worked with in the past and you know maybe you pick up a, a film or two a year and vice versa if you do mainly bigger films but you you know pick up a show here or there Trailers and marketing seem to be a little bit more siloed because they are a little more, I don't know, they're, in my experience, they're a little, little more different from the TV and film world. When you, when you start dealing with marketing, uh, you start dealing with the marketing firms and um, ad agencies are even their own thing when you get into brands. So there, there is a bit of segmentation, uh, but yeah, music music supervisors, especially independent ones, like me, for example, I try to get my hands in everything just because I enjoy the nuances of all the different areas. I will jump in real quick and say that Naaman and I are both kind of gamer geeks anyway, and so we uh, part of my job is pitching our catalog to the video game space, and I know the 
publishers and developers pretty well. A lot of the same ones that Naaman works with and does business for. So um, in that respect, the video game world can be a little bit more nuanced than the standard sort of film and TV. And it makes Naaman and myself particularly well suited for that space because we spend a lot of time playing video games and I listen to podcasts about video games and I read books about video games and Naaman and I have played VR games together blowing shit up. So um, we're just sort of well dialed in with that space anyway and what those audio directors are looking for and because we, li we live in that world. And um, that can be a different world than the sort of constantly, um, the constant output of TV and film and trailers versus like a maybe four or five year, six year, you know, game development cycle for some of these, for some of these publishers. Evelyn, can I ask you when you uh, are being asked to write for a placement, how is that different for you creatively? And is it something that you are challenged by? Or uh, is it something that you go, oh, I can't believe I'm doing this? What's your impression when those types of opportunities fall in front of you? Yeah, um, I, I think it's there are a couple ways to approach it. Sometimes there's something very specific. There's a brief or something that it's, it's a target. And I think that can be a creative challenge, uh, a really unique one. Um, I actually tend to do more kind of broader uh, sync writing um, and then kind of go after, uh, Jake will go and target certain, you know, opportunities with that. Um, and I guess this harkens back a little bit to what Jake and Michael were saying earlier about the A&R process is I think the one thing that across the board has to be done is is the, the quality has to be really high, whatever you're doing. I think sometimes people think you can write something jingly or something that is just kind of, you know, open-ended and it will, it will land well for whatever you're doing, whether it's a video game, whether it's a target ad, something like that. But I think the truth is, is it has to be really high quality and really well written. And even the simplest stuff has been really thought through. And so I think it's always a creative challenge. I think it's always really fun to stretch new creative muscles, to do things in different genres, to, you know, to plan for a certain target and work, you know, with a new kind of soundscape. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I'll jump in real quick too and say, having worked with Ellen for a number of years, that um, this space has become a lot more competitive in the mm -hmm. last five to eight years as well. And so when Evelyn's referring to, um, you know, and needing to make sure the quality is really high, there might have been a time where, like, you could demo something out and be like, play it for someone and be like, okay, now imagine this, like, and, and will that work? We're way past that. So there's so many people in this space now, and you throw in all the, you know, the, all the record labels and publishers as well with indie artists that pretty much the first time Naaman's going to receive a song from me, it's going to be a completely written, completely mixed, professionally mastered, ready to like be commercially put out song. And um, that's the kind of stuff that Evelyn is referring to. Anything that passes through ultimately the end zone from me to any client will be something that, um, I mean, heck, we've, we've upstreamed um, a number of artists we've developed at the company I work with to major labels. Um, they're paying attention as well now. So the point is simply that it's a really competitive space. If someone has a snapshot in time of what they thought it was 10 or even five years ago, it's evolved since then. And so it really, it really um, requires operating at a professional level at, at, um, each, at each sort of stage of, of creation all the way to delivery. And just assuming that you are in fact going up against the new developing artist on a major label who will probably take that, um, who will probably take that sync for the same fee that you will be offered, but you have to be better. I mean, you have to be better than they are. So Evelyn, did you, did you know that your music was already cinematic, already ready for this world? How did you know that you were creatively able to do this? Um, it definitely took some time to, to kind of, you know, get my feet wet and really get, get into it and feel confident in the space. But I think that I, um, have definitely done a, a fair share of sessioning in LA doing kind of pop writing and pop writing is in a different way also very simple but very very like 
evocative and very well thought out. And so I think there's a translation between the two. And then I think what's cool about getting into the sync space is the first project I really worked on was a blues rock project. And I think at the time I was just geeking out over Kay Flay and she was having a huge moment. And I was also watching her songs sink like hotcakes, like everywhere, everywhere. She was everywhere. And every cool show I watched, she was on. And I think I realized that so much of what I was consuming on television was really be like the soundtracks were really cutting edge and the coolest stuff. And so, you know, it was a really interesting way for me to kind of take my songwriting chops and my vocal ability and kind of dabble in these worlds that I've kind of was really inspired by and was really seeing be so amazing on television and that people were getting so into and be able to kind of dabble in that, even if it wasn't necessarily my solo project. Excellent. Awesome. Michael, uh, uh, Jake had mentioned earlier that, it, you know, it's, a, it's getting to be very, very competitive. Are there any trends that are happening inside sync or things that media is looking for that you and your artists are able to take advantage of now that to help you kind of cut through some of that uh, competitive uh, competitiveness that's going on now? Uh, that's actually what I call and ask Jake every week. Um, <laughs> uh, because I, I my job is, um, you know, to uh, to trust my team, right? And Jake is a very integral member of the team. Uh, one of the things that certainly helps, right, um, along the vein of this is when my artists um, have learned production and are very good at doing production on their own, um, have built their own studio, are able to go work on something where if we get a call in the morning that goes, hey, I need a song by tonight, right? Can you turn this around? And you're writing a song from scratch and producing a song and getting it mixed and getting it mastered and delivered within a day. Um, that's, that's kind of where we need to be at for most of my clients. Um, and, you know, luckily now they've been in a position where they can do this. Uh, I think, you know, one of the hardest parts for me to tell a lot of my clients and to remind them is that it's a lot of times in this world it's almost like how I picture actors feel right so you could be a phenomenal actor and you go out for a casting call and you go out for a casting and you're going to a call every single day and maybe you're going to two a day and maybe you're going to three a day and uh, you just get told no all the time right every single time and you get that one and that one is a super big win and you end up on a sitcom or whatever that is. And that's, that's wonderful. Um, a lot of big writers in this world, you know, their percentage of songs that go on to, you know, be used in some capacity um, is still very low, right? In, in the broad scheme of things. And I think it's very hard for an artist to spend a lot of time working on a song and turning in a song and feeling very proud of a song. And, knowing that there's a very good chance that song is going to sit on someone's hard drive for eternity and that's the extent that that song will be used right and so part of this is we're talking about tools part of the tools is just you know kind of the morale of going uh hey you know what? this is a battle of attrition and you're going to get out there and you're going to make a bunch of songs and i've had plenty of cases where those songs a year later people go back and go oh you know what now this is kind of a hot artist or the sounds changed a little bit and we need something that's whatever a little darker and your songs from it and we can go out and pull that stuff right but um yeah to wake up every day and work on these songs and then you know no no no, no. but you get that one big win and it makes it all worth it right and and even developing artists are are very much in the same boat sometimes as very big established artists so does that impact positively or negatively because i would imagine at least just the 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 practice of needing to create something today and then balance that with the challenge of uh, uh, being told no over and over. Does that impact the rest of your client's career, the, 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 the side of the career that, that uh, fans are seeing and, 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 and that part of it? Um, you know, I think this will be a really great question for the rest of the group too. My, my two cents here is that a lot of the artists I work with are very diverse in um, how they, um, you know, approach uh, their day, their year. Um, so I, I no matter what, try and schedule in breaks um, regardless. So if that means, uh, hey, you know what, you're taking two days off and then coming back to this with a fresh perspective, okay, so be it. 
If it means you're going to take a month off and go on tour because you're a maybe more traditional artist, then that's, you know, a, a wonderful outlet for you to go out. I think sometimes the trouble becomes, you know, you're working on something and you're working on something and maybe you get told no, and then you don't add life experience to your songwriting. Um, that can become a very difficult place to, to keep going because you may just like keep working on songs and keep working on songs, but like, something has to be different. Right. And very often that thing is just living, right. Having experiences, having something uh, to talk about, having a different perspective on something. So part of my role is I, I very much encourage that with our clients. Jake, do you find within the artists that you are working with that, uh, uh, there's that a sort of a, a dividing line between those who want to do the touring, the traditional route as songwriters and performers versus those that uh, want to stick with, pre, you know, predominantly doing syncs and placements. And, and does, is there a transition that happens with artists where they start in one place and end up someplace else? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think of it as much in terms of a dividing line. I think of it more as, um, an almost eventual transition and you know I, I think it it kind of hap it can happen slowly and it can also be pretty closely aligned with um, the artist uh, you know they're how do I put this hitting new milestones in their life and maybe not wanting to be on the road as much so whether that's represented in and, you know, getting married and having a kid or two and maybe hitting your 40th birthday and like having grounded out or your 30th birthday, whatever, having grounded out in a van for 10 years and been like, that was a really important part of my life. And I'm kind of over that. And like, in the meantime, the last year or two, I've seen some cool things happen with some songs I've been writing that were kind of for fun. But like, that's becoming more important to me now. And the other thing that I thought was important, it's not so much important. Uh, you know, because it's, and I don't know, it's, you know, if it's 20 year old artists that'll be watching this or 25 or 45, but um, things that used to seem important in life can fundamentally change um, as you get older. And then other things come into light or you think of things differently, or you see things differently. And, and it, and you don't know that that's going to come necessarily. So um, there are, will always be artists who are stars and they should be on an arena stage and they should be crushing it, lighting up millions of people's lives. And they can be doing um, this either supplementally or the, the, the songs that they're writing anyway are just such bangers that they're, that they're going to be going out and getting licensed, whether it's the Imagine Dragons of the world or, or whatever. Um, and then there's a good chunk of, of artists and writers who are like, yeah, I put in my time. That was a really important time in my life. Things have fundamentally changed. I'm really enjoying writing and being part of a community and staying home a lot more and getting a cup of coffee with a friend at one o'clock and not being in like Jacksonville, Florida on, on the way to my next night. And so there ends up being this transition that, that can take, eh, it usually takes a couple of years for someone that it, that it really strikes a chord with. And then they settle in and they're like, yeah, this is a, this is a really good change. Um, and then if you really throw gas on that fire and they really double down, then, then it can be sort of a game changer and a life changer. Um, and, and so th that's the best way I can put it from, from the many artists and writers that I've seen go through that. I'll put it this way. Very few who've had a fair amount to a lot of success in the sync world are then like, ah, screw that. I'm going to go get back in a van and drive around with four other smelly people and like, you know, for six months and play to like 90, 90 people. Mike, he, he's telling the story, I think, of Ice Nine Kills in <laughs> almost like real time. I mean, you got that awesome placement during the World Series with the Yankees for the song Savages. Like, how did that come about? And how has that or or has that changed uh, uh, Spencer's perspective on placements and sinks and, and in, in the same way that Jake's talking about here. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Michael touched on it earlier where, you know, we kind of come from the same world. Maybe my rosters have been a little bit more hard leaning on the metal side, um, but a very similar process. And, you know, you mentioned the song Savages, which I think kills has a song called Savages. And that was really, I don't want to say, I mean, it was kind of a freak thing, right? Like, I think the somebody from the Yankees organization 
or somebody called the Yankees savages, right? And really our artist is the one who tipped us off to it. I mean, the guy's from Boston, but he said, look, I mean, you know, I believe that sometimes things happen for a reason. There's a song, you know, these, they've used this term, they're going into the playoffs. I don't think the Yankees actually made it to the World Series. You know, all hands on deck, let's figure out a way in and, and figure out a way to pitch. And, you know, thankfully, even though, um, <clears throat> well, you know, the record label who, who doesn't own, you know, the, the composition side of our music, they own the master side, they had some ins and, you know, got it into the right hands. And lo and behold, you know, I think there was a number of, of songs that were up against it. And for whatever reason, they probably didn't know the band was from Boston. Uh, they chose the track. And, you know, it was a real highlight for, for him, you know, for this artist that's been grinding it out for a long time. His dad lives in New York, got him tickets to the game. He went and saw it up on the Jumbotron. And, you know, yeah, that's a really exciting moment for an artist. And um, I can see how... You know, the process Jake describes, it's interesting because though I haven't really had that with many of my artists, you know, it's the same that I see a lot of people like myself who were once a tour manager, then move into another realm of the business. You know, it's like, eh, do I really need to be out on the road anymore? And the hardest part, right, is trying to figure out what during that interim period, um, you know, if you're doing well on the road, transitioning off the road, no matter what, you've got to have uh, a way to, to have some income. So really fascinating discussion. Yeah. Uh, Naaman, uh, we, there's been some talk about genres and, uh, uh, you know, the punk metal and uh, all the rest of it. Like, are there certain genres that are more appropriate for sinks in general uh, or maybe even specifically for video games that you keep an eye out for things, genres that you just like don't bother with at all? Oh, man. Um... I mean, obviously for music supervision as a whole, it runs the gamut completely from classical to <laughs> black metal, you know, it just, it goes all the way. Um, for video games specifically, I keep my ears open for a lot of um, hip hop, electronic, rock, any combination of those three works really well. Um, yeah, it just depends on kind of the genre of the game. If you if you've got something more action oriented, you're gonna want you're gonna want more action upbeat kind of stuff. Um, sometimes there's fun ways to incorporate um, other sounds. Like uh, one of my, fortunately, I didn't get to work on this, but one of my favorites uh, in recent memory is um, The Last of Us and The Last of Us Two, using a lot of like. Uh, the composer Gustavo's uh, really like kind of calming, but it also comes off as a bit eerie um, acoustic guitar uh, licks. And it's, yeah. That's awesome. I, I'll throw this question, Jake and Michael, if one of you guys can really jump on this. It just seems like, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in placements in that there used to be just three TV channels broadcasting. Now there's tons of narrow casting and maybe even some opportunities in new digital media. Uh, you, Jake, you had mentioned earlier that there was a lot of, uh, 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 it's competitive because of uh, so many people wanting to get these placements, but are there also more opportunities now than, than before? I mean, yeah, hands down. So, I mean, there's there's more people listening to music than ever before in history. There's more music than ever before. And there's more opportunities for it than ever before. And we could break down all the different media and all the different avenues within all that different media. Just know that there are a lot of opportunities, whether it's because there's more media or there's more Netflix and, the, you know, there's, you're adding these. But, but also if you go into advertising, I mean, Facebook has their own types of ads. Instagram has their own types of ads. You know, TikTok. This you can break it down, and that's part of Naaman's job. Is he's too? He's he's having to probably determine how does call what what properties does Call of Duty want to use for this advertisement? Is it going to be um, is it going to be a swipe up campaign? Is it going to be a storytelling campaign on Facebook? That stuff's all all new, and there's things going on. We still we get inquiries into our company of things that we weren't even aware of. I was researching a, a VR company today that just sold to, to Facebook six months ago. And I'm like, how are they not on my radar? 
and what are their needs? There's another conversation I had with a, a, a company that will be huge in about a year and a half that have some really big heavy hitters that are reaching out to some other really big video game and sports companies. And it's, and, and the whole game takes place. It's hard to describe. It's like a, a festival for different brand properties that you and your avatar live in as you pop around to different brands. And those are all going to need their own music and their own genres. And it needs to feel like it's, um, I don't know that it's, it needs to be compelling music and it needs to feel like it flows really easily. Anyway, point is there's a lot of different opportunities that people aren't even aware of yet. And that also opens up the type of music that will be needed as well, which Naaman sort of alluded to, but you know, there's areas that need ambient music. There's other areas that, uh, or media that needs, I mean, Mike, you know, referenced the Savages song that kind of runs the gamut right there between almost exper experimental ambient music all the way up to, to hard, you know, to heavy metal type music and anything in between. Um, the nice thing about a lot of these networks is, uh, and even YouTube and, and whatnot, is it's allowed for the real growth of niche sort of programming. And when you get niche programming, that means they know, the, those programmers know what kind of music they need. And, and that kind of need may not have existed five or 10 years ago. And now because there's an outlet for it and a demand for it, um, that, you know, there might be like light piano music that nobody really cared about that. Now there's a massive YouTube channel for that has hundreds of millions of, of, um, of followers and they need to be pushing content through and content ID is generating money for all everybody involved, which is just a different type of licensing really. Gotcha. And Michael, uh, with your clients, are you, uh, are your clients identifiable with certain niches, either creative niches or uh, uh, as far as uh, the music that they're creating, or do they, are they flexible and are they, is it dependent on artists? Should, is it make it easier for supervisors to, and publishers to identify an artist with a certain sound rather than being able to say, we can do anything you want? Yeah, it's, those are um, great questions. You know, when I started working more with writers and producers um i actually started on the side where we were pitching to other artists right so there's a few kind of different categories that this all breaks down into but if um uh you know you have a team of people and they're like hey we want to pitch this song for Katy perry or demi lovato or whatever right um sometimes artists take outside songs and then put their own fingerprints on them and sometimes you know they don't want to take outside songs and they only want to do their own but there's enough that want to take outside songs that we um, we were starting to work with artists who were becoming very well known in their own space um, as artists. So we said, okay, why don't we you know have them work a little bit for these other um, these other artists? Makes sense. Um, I think the problem we were running into when we went that direction, right, is if you're writing for a very well known specific you know pop artist, you have the spectrum here and every song that's going to get pitched to that major label artist is really going to go from here to like here, right? Everything's going to fall within this zone. So you have all this out here and you have all this space out here that's just not going to be um, even looked at. And especially when you're in this space, right, you're competing against some of the biggest and best writers and producers in the world. Right, so you're working against Max Martin. You're working against Benny Blanco. Like you're working against these people. So for us, um, as a management company, said, well, you know, we we either have to get our artists to a point where they're going to be better, right, than Benny Blanco. And um, we had the good fortune of working with with Benny on some of my artist tracks, and Benny's phenomenal, right? He's like he's one of the best for a reason. So how are you going to be better than that? Um, it's, very, it's very tough. So um, the route that has worked, and um, we've seen this with some of our peers, is they said, uh, you know what, we're not going to go head to head, right? We're going to go find this other route. We have to be different enough and either start um, a new sound or a new style, or um, there was a big producer who came in who really rethought what a chorus was, 
right? And a lot of the choruses became instrumental choruses in pop music uh, that kind of had the own hook within the instrumental, right? So that was their unique take on what pop music would look like. When we um, start to look more into this space, um, for me as a manager, I'm, I'm sometimes more interested in what are these genres and niches that are being overlooked, right? And so I think this, this plays very much into Jake's point. Um, I think one of the most successful projects we ended up ever having is we had a, a, a phenomenal writer producer who didn't fit into a traditional box in any sense. And, um, you know, before they were working with us, they were pitching for these big, you know, top 40 type of things. And they were kind of so far field that they weren't landing um, with these places. And we ended up finding, I mean, literally like a violin player on YouTube and connecting them. And um, their first album together, you know, like went, uh, I think it like went gold in like 20 countries or something like that. No one would expect that to happen. Um, but if you're able to sort of like a big part of what we do, and I think everyone on this panel would agree, is like matching the right people. And there's just like, when I came more from the touring world, there'd be artists that you have never, ever, ever, ever heard of who are out there selling 5,000 tickets a night, right? Anywhere in the world, they can go somewhere and play 5,000 tickets in there. They're like, I've never heard of this person. How is this possible? And yet it's a, it's a massive big business for these um, like niche type of artists. And I think that does still exist in this world. Some are more common than others, but I think getting creative and figuring out um, how can I take what I'm really good at? Maybe it's not traditional pop music or traditional alt pop music or whatever that is, but how can I take that and study what is working and combine all of this together and try and find success on my own terms? And I think that's very exciting for everyone here. Yeah. Uh, Evelyn, with the, your perspective on it, uh, coming from the creative side, uh, how are you uh, approaching what you do as far as genres and moods and that sort of thing? Are you trying to stay within a particular range or, or are you feeling creatively uh, 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 capable of, uh, of being more sort of uh, flexible? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think I'm trying to frequently stay in a certain energy. I think that I'm trying to create music that carries a certain feeling about it, um, especially things, I, I do a lot of up-tempo. I think I see a lot of up-tempo working places. And so um, things that are either driving and intense or feel like very powerful from a female perspective or that feel kind of, yeah, they just, the things that can create a mood and an energy, I think work really, really well for me. Um, I don't usually feel inhibited by genre. Uh, I just really try and be cognizant of how the writing works, how the lyricism works, um, and how, you know, it can feel commercially viable. Cause I think that's things that feel maybe like they're pushing boundaries in a certain genre. Uh, but if they're, but if at the same time, if they feel commercially viable, they're going to, I think they'll perform well in a sync kind of world. That's kind of what I've seen. Um, and also, I wanted to jump off what Michael was saying too really quickly, which is that I've definitely come from that world a bit too of wanting to pitch things and then seeing that kind of transition over to the sync side. And I think that's true for a lot of people who end up in sync who are really good writers. And I think a, a reason why that is, is because you're honing your craft so hard and you're writing things for a specific format a specific reason and that works very well in sync too if you have that understanding and I think simultaneously you can still kind of do both you know I tend to work with a lot of other artists um, on their projects and I hone some of the same skills in that world that I do in sync I'm kind of embodying whatever that project is and figuring out what needs to happen to accomplish a song that will work for them or in that world you know sonically and I think that they actually really kind of almost work well together. They improve your skills. And I think that it's, you know, the best part about it is if you can make money in sync, you are not as hell bent on, you know, every single time you pitch a song to an artist, having it land so you can feed yourself. I think that's why they're very well suited to kind of work together. I mean, I'll add on too, having seen it from a lot of different artists is that, I mean, even talking to Michael or being able to, you know, I am Evelyn, like I did today, telling her that she's got a couple more confirms coming her way for some TV shows. It's just, I feel like it's 
a lot more gratifying for an artist uh, with a, a lot more wins coming in and getting those gratifying wins can sort of really keep the um, overall vibe and, and just positive versus like, I imagine going out for writing for a number of pop sessions and just really hoping maybe one of yours connects somewhere that could change your life. It's kind of like swing, trying to swing for a home run every time. Um, instead of like, you can just step up and just keep on hitting, you know, hitting singles, hit, hitting doubles and, and hearing back like in, in an Evelyn case or, or in some of Michael's clients cases where I'm emailing them very often being like, Hey, we got two more coming your way this week, two more, three more this week. And just, you just keep on getting these wins and it's just very gratifying to know that you are, you know, that your music is connecting on some, on some creative level and then the, the money component too. But to me that, that feels like, I mean, I, we get emails back from the artists and you can sort of get a sense of um, how well it was received and, and how it kind of can like change their day or change their week. Yeah. And oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to quickly say to, to people who are watching this, who are kind of interested in this lane, but in general, kind of trying to figure out where they might, find an entry point stuff like this i think a lot of what it comes down to is working your ass off and diversifying and doing you know everything you can but doing it the best you possibly can because like me i didn't expect to walk into a career in sync and i i did and i think part of that is because i was diversifying and doing a lot of different things and doing them as well as i possibly could and that's kind of how i think sometimes it works out I gotta admit, I was hoping you were gonna say, "Just stay out of my way," but uh, <laughs> but just stay out of my way. But yeah, <laughs> if it works out, it works out. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add in just real quickly that Evelyn's a really hard worker, and I, I get to peek into all the spreadsheets she makes, and all the records she keeps, and all the follow ups she does. And this is the other half of being a professional songwriter. That song, well, maybe I don't want to give away your tricks. Sorry, Evelyn, but that a lot of songwriters don't really put on the hat that they need to 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 really step it up and take it to the next level and mm -hmm. she's as hard of a worker as she is creative and so it's kind of like a double threat and um that's what starts piquing the interest of people when you can deliver um from from beginning to end and uh, someone can have a level of confidence and you not question whether you can get it into the end zone or not. So I just didn't want her to skip past the, the fact that she's a really hard worker and it wasn't luck. I, I mean, I see what she's doing on a daily basis and she's booking a lot of sessions on her own, even though I'm her publisher and we're helping out a lot. I mean, she got it off and running on her own and all I had to do was, was pour, pour fuel on it. That's awesome. Jim, can you talk about the money side? How do you value a placement? Oh, that, I mean, that's a good question. There's a real art to that there there's there's um i mean there's ranges you can pull someone aside like go to coffee with name and probably get a range out of what something you know but but fundamentally there's there's different variables i mean quite honestly there's there there's the song itself there's the profile of the artist and the writer um and what action is involved you know the how much activity they, the artist has around them but then there's the basics too like uh, the the terms the terms that are being requested for the song should you get that far in the process which is you know what's the territory what's the duration uh, you know what's you can go down a checklist of five or six different things is it the main version is it the, is it the instrumental version um do you know do you need it for all media for for just the u.s is it geo locked is it so that there's those kind of basic items you go down each box that you check helps you sort of bring the range down into um kind of a more finite quote because ultimately um, these aren't these aren't fees regulated by by the government this is an actual negotiation uh, where where the you know the owner of the composition and the recording have the ability to get into a negotiation and charge what they think um, it's worth and and quite honestly this is one of the trickiest parts of the business and and, and it would be for an independent artist too because if you don't have the information, you just, how do you know how to value your own work? Or if I was my first year into trying to represent art, how do I know how to value? If someone's going to offer me $5,000 all in, which we can either cover later, or you guys can Google it but for those who are watching. Um, but actually you could have gotten $15,000 for it. Then that's like, there's a disconnect there. Now $5,000 is a lot of money. Like, let's be honest. 
$15,000 is a lot more. And, and, and that's your value. And like, I work at a company of 30 people who, who've, you know, collectively got a lot of years in this business. And I'm thankfully able to rely now on other people. Um, in a few cases, uh, when a request comes to the owner of the rights, there will be a fee in there. And it's either that is the budget, so you're actually taking that or you're going to lose it. You know, no disrespect to the artist. That's the, that's the bottom line. Like, you can take it or we'll find something else. Sometimes it's negotiable. But oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll receive a quote request for the use and then and then it begins begins a negotiation. So there's no hard and fast rule there. It is an art. Naaman, as the music supervisor, I imagine there's times where you your mind latches onto a song that's just perfect and there can't be another one. It has to be this one. Does that happen or is and, and does that influence what we're talking about here, the 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 ability for an artist or the their publisher to negotiate a higher rate for uh for its use? Oh man. I'm trying to think of the best way to answer that. <laughs> uh oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I mean some sometimes there is just you, whether it's myself, the director, somebody else involved with the project has just this, this lightning bolt idea. And it's like, that's the song. So they or myself will, somebody will come to me and we'll all be like, oh yeah, that's the track. So we need to go out and I need to go out and figure out who owns, you know, the publishing splits, the master, possible master split, all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and just get a quote. Ultimately, it's all going to come down to what it what can be done with the budget. And 99.9% .9 of the time, at least from my perspective, I will always try to get a straight answer on what is our absolute ceiling budget for this. And there can then be some negotiation there, but I, I don't usually mess around with haggling like if if i know how much money we can spend on something normally i'll just go straight to the approval parties and be like this is the money that i have can we make this work so and i can just say because name and i just went through this a week and a half ago together that is um a breath of fresh air from our perspective because it sets in motion a lot of other things i now know what i can pitch now i now know what i can deal with and to make his life easier because now i won't pitch things that are twice that cost so when he texted me the, the other week and was like, I have a project I want to put you on. This is the budget. Can we make it work for that? Then I can flip through my brain and be like, yeah, I definitely have high quality people that can make it work for that. If he'd shot me a different number, it might've been a different group of people or different songs, but it just makes the whole process easier. And luckily he had the flexibility to do it in that case. I don't know if he, I doubt you always have that flexibility name and I don't, I don't really know. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, and I mean, more, more times than not, I'll actually have to, it'll, it'll go the other way around where uh, the producer on the project will go, you know, my daughter loves Imagine Dragons and we have to have them in this. So they'll come at me with some, you know, eight year old's favorite Imagine Dragons track. And I will already know the answer is going to be you don't have enough money but I'll, I'll jump through the hoops, I'll get the quote, I'll take it back to the producer, and they'll be like, oh my God, that's 10 times more money than we have to spend. I'll be like, cool, I'm gonna call up some people with some really good replacements. And you know, that, that's then where I can go, here's the amount of money that we actually do have. Jake, what do you, what do you have for me? So Michael, you're the one with uh, with the client clientele that any one of them could be that Imagine Dragons. How much effort are you and your clients putting into increasing your profile to make these kind of placements lucrative? Or is it just, uh, is it more beneficial to just uh, uh, invest the time into getting the placements and not worrying so much about profile? Um, I think it's a mix and my really boring answer is it depends. Um, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, you want to be working with artists that, um, you know, you really respect and that you feel like are going to do a really great job. Um, but part of my job as a manager is identifying artist strengths and honestly, sometimes identifying 
the opposite of their strengths, right? And um, you know what? Most of my artists aren't going to be a good fit for an, an Imagine Dragons replacement. Uh, and that's okay, right? I, I know where their strengths lie. Um, one of the projects Jake and I worked on together early on was a band that I had managed uh, for 10 years. And they toured all over the world. They played super high profile festivals. They did, I mean, they did as much as they could do as an independent band and were very happy with that. And after 10 years said, you know what? Um, it's time to move into the next phase of our lives. Um, and the two primary writers from that band uh, said, you know what, we've been in the studio so many times, we made six or seven albums, you know, as part of this band, we want to learn production. And as part of learning production, uh, we want to get off of the road and focus just on becoming really great songwriters. And so we're going to start a new band. And it is a, you know, it's a real band that we're starting. Uh, but the emphasis is not going to be on touring and doing band stuff. It's going to be more about creating music. And, uh, I, you know, as a manager, you go, okay, well, how am I going to work with this and understand this and build the team around it? And I introduced them to Jake and they really hit it off with Jake. And so we sat down and Jake started to give them some direction as an A&R person, not in the way they were used to as a label A&R, right, but as a publishing A&R. And, um, you know, we did our, we still did our band photos and we still did our videos. And we did all of this stuff. Uh, but Jake was um, helping to guide the music a little bit more into this sync world. And what ended up happening was that the songs, um, you know, the, as a manager, how do you get your music in front of people? Well, you put your band on the road, right? Uh, maybe if you're a pop band, you hope that you get some kind of mass media. So you get them on the radio, right? Or you get them on TV um, or you get them right in, in syncs. Um, so they had come from a world where they're used to touring, playing in front of people, physically standing on stage, right, playing their song, uh, to now designing songs a little bit differently with a slightly different audience in mind. Again, still as a band, still their own creative uh, background. And they started to build enough syncs up that uh, people would hear a song and go, oh my gosh, who's this band? And that kept happening and it kept happening. And kind of the ironic thing through all of this is uh, by sort of taking a step back and being like, whoa, we don't want to be this like touring band and, you know, do the whole thing. Uh, what happened was the song ended up getting to a big enough point that um, a radio station added the song and then the labels came and the labels ended up signing the band. And we sort of had to go back to the band and be like, we know, you know, we asked you to sort of not, or we suggested and advised you, right? Like, don't be a touring band. Uh, but you're going back on tour <laughs> we're gonna do the whole game again and it was you know it was actually a nice refresh and reset for them because a lot of the pressure was off uh creatively they were exercising all different types of creative muscles um and so you know they believed in the team and we had you know people like jake and stuff surrounding them and that one ended up working but the most interesting part about this business is you never know what's going to happen that day right like you could literally get that phone call that changes your life or that one thing that happens that completely upends what you think is going to happen in your career. Uh, and those are just very exciting moments. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Jake, can, I, I'm so sorry. We're going a few minutes longer. I hope you guys don't mind sticking around just a, just a few extra. But Jake, can you walk through peop uh, for people the publishing split, the reason why being the songwriter is so vitally important when it comes to syncs and placements? Why being the writer is important. Um, I mean, for, I mean, I guess for a lot of reasons, but if you're talking about sort of brass tacks in terms of income and whatnot, then, exactly. um, you know, as <laughs> this could jump off into a whole other panel, which I'm going to avoid doing because that is a lengthy road. But I guess the short answer is, um, Traditionally, when you're writing a song, you uh, you have a writer's share, which you and if you co-write, the other writers retain that writer's share. And there's also a publishing uh, share co component to that composition. And you can look at the publishing component as essentially an asset that can be bought and sold. And both the writers and the publishing um, are both designed to... Um, 
to create income. I mean, to basically receive income coming in for that composition. By and large, the writer's share doesn't ever change hands. That's sort of put in place so that the original writers, even if they don't even know what's happening around with the publishing and the record and the recording, will always have a stream that pops up in their mailbox or in their computer because of stuff happening. The publishing side is an asset which can be bought and sold. That's the business that we are in. Um, you know, we dive a lot deeper in that we, we help generate um, and sort of focus the writing to, to best suit what our needs are and where we think we can, artists don't generally like this word, but exploit the composition and the copyright, which is essentially what, what we're doing. And um, so the writers can choose any number of avenues for the publishing portion of the composition. They can retain it if they don't want anybody touching it. They can get into a co-publishing deal where they're lit literally splitting the portions of the publishing with another company. They can sell the entire publishing portion if they want. Those are all at the discretion of the, of the writer. And the publishing portion, which generates income as well, um, you know, that's, that's how publishing companies are in business because they, they sort of, they find a composition or they create a composition that's of value. They exploit it and go find homes for it, sync, radio, retail, um, whatever, uh, that generates income. And, and if, you know, they oftentimes publishing companies tend to do co-pub splits. So then they are retaining some portion of the income that comes in the publishing side. And then some portion of that publishing side is also rerouted back to the writer as well on top of their performance income um, of, of the writer's share. <clears throat> so that's it's an attempt at a simplified version. It's actually much more complex than that. And it doesn't even take into account the master and recording portion, which also needs to be licensed. If someone's going to in fact license a song, they need to license the composition, which is the music and the lyrics, and they need to license the recording, the actual tangible recorded. And, and those are when you are licensing both at the same time, um, you know, that's, uh, that's considered all in, which is the term I used before. If it's not all in, then you're referring to licensing one segment and also the other segment. Um, uh, Paul, if I could have 30 seconds to pay you back off there. Um, so uh, uh, from a manager's perspective, right, I think we have a similar view as a, as a publisher, but at the end of the day, I'm hired to um, protect my clients, right, and that they are doing the work in a room uh, and getting compensated for it, right? And if we're talking about splitting up a song, right, the way this works is at the end of the session, everyone decides uh, kind of, okay, I did this much on the song. And sometimes these things get really ugly because if even one person disagrees, no one gets paid, right? So one person can step out and say, well, I think I did this much of the song. And if you disagree, then we're all gonna, so you might as well pay me the extra bits. Uh, or you're going to get paid zero, right? So you can either get paid zero, or you can get a reduced amount, and they can get pretty nasty. They get so nasty, it's actually gone to court, and the courts have said, "Look, if you if you played the drums on the song and you did the drum parts, that's worth you know five percent of the song, and if you did the lyrics, that's worth you know twenty something percent of the song." So the courts have a system, um, but at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't go there, right? Generally, you're doing so many sessions, you're getting to the point where you're saying, uh, "Okay, well, if you did the music." and I did the lyrics and melody, right? Maybe that's half and half. And if I have someone help me on the lyrics, then I'm gonna have, I'm gonna give my 50% uh, cut in this other person and they're gonna take, and if you did all the music, then you keep your 50% even though there's a bunch of people. I might have 10 people help me with the lyrics. You still keep your 50%. I'm gonna split up my 50% 10 ways. Generally, the way we've done these sessions is if there's three people all in a room together, then everyone just gets an equal amount because you're kind of all coming up with ideas together and maybe someone, and it keeps it clean and simple. I have seen a lot of sessions where at the end of the session, uh, you know, sometimes it gets very particular of like, well, no, I did this and I did this and I did this. And, you, and that's also a very fair way to split things up too, as long as there's an understanding among everyone of how this is going to work. I think the difficulty becomes, um, and hopefully this answers your question and, from a management perspective is, you know, if you have a writer and they get uh, maybe a large personality or they have someone who really, who absolutely feels like they contributed um, the key component of why the song got synced. And even though it's just this tiny, 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 tiny little piece, 
Uh, maybe it is the reason it's the most memorable part. It's a tiny little riff in a song or something like that. How do you equitably decide how much of the song that's worth? Because once you decide on these numbers, you get paid an upfront fee, right, to use the song, but almost always you get residuals, right? And so this money just comes in forever and ever, and that money is divided up based on these percentages that you've agreed upon. So um, part of the nuance, I think, as a manager, as we're filling this out, is like, how do you figure out the teams where everyone works together creatively? They're sort of like-minded in their approach towards things. Uh, there's like so many layers on top of like, how do these teams work, right? And then you add in Jake's perspective to all of this and you potentially add in the label's perspective and you could have, I mean, I've been in situations where you've had 10 different perspectives of how something should operate and it's not that any of them are right or wrong, right? They're just very different approaches. Awesome, thank you. Evelyn, uh, as a musician, when you hear all that has been talked about so far, if you can try to imagine being a musician before everything happened for you, how do you hear this and, and get excited, don't get intimidated, and what would your advice be to people who, as you were talking about earlier, want to get into this lane from zero? From zero. Um, I mean, I've, I've come from zero to get into this lane, and I think it's just a huge part is it's doable. And also a little tiny bit to touch on what Michael was just talking about when it comes to splits and stuff like that. Um, a greater thing, like a piece of advice I would have to say is be cool, man. Like this is an industry of collaboration. If you are an artist, a writer, an instrumentalist, a producer, an engineer, you be yourself, have, you know, a little bit of the ego that got you in that room to begin with, but also drop some of the ego and be someone who's known not just for the great work that you'll do, but also as being someone who's amicable to work with, someone who is interested in the music and how well the music's going to do, um, not just you as, you know, a solo entity. I think that's super important. Be, be a little bit of a team player, even if you want to be the next Billie Eilish. Like, I think, have a, she's awesome. She's kind. And I think people should know that that is a huge, huge aspect to this, is being able to, like, really work well because, you know, a lot of it is getting in the rooms with people that you work really well with over and over and over again and, and being fair about your splits so that the songs you create get better and better and they can wind up in better and better homes. And all I would say to anyone else who's trying to get into this lane is really stay focused, do your homework for sure. Um, pay attention to what you were uh, hearing on shows like Euphoria, like all these cool shows that are really cutting edge with their soundtracks. What are you loving? What's working? And then I would also just say, again, diversify what you're working on. You never know what's really going to hit. Um, so, you know, doing a couple of different things and, and, and then just working a ton, doing a ton of sessions, being willing to kind of work on whatever you can get your hands on and paying attention to what makes really good people really good and kind of working toward that. Thank you, Evelyn. That's awesome. Yeah, Mike, uh, wrap us up. I, I, I got to say, my mind's blown. I don't, I don't know how you keep on bringing these people in <laughs> and then they're better than one from the next. Thank you all so much. I don't even know how else to say it, but this is such a demystifying of uh, an area of the music business that there's just such, uh, so rarely a light shed on it. And I feel like you guys have done, you know, there's still so much more, but man, I, I feel so much smarter than I was <laughs> five, an hour and a half ago and a hell of a, a, as smart as I should have been 25 years ago. So this is awesome. So thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'm very humbled to even just listen in. This has been a great, yeah. great group. And, you know, much like the, I think the recurring theme in here is, you know, persistence and being nice and figuring out who you know, and, you know, really through these connections is how this panel came together. And that's, you know, been kind of marvelous. As you said, we've, we've touched like very top level stuff, um, but incredibly insightful. I mean, how great is it to have, you know, though Jake does wear a manager hat, which is part of why I think I really love the position, no pun intended, that he holds in all of this. But, you know, we've got a, an artist, a manager, you know, uh, a supervisor and a publisher. And then uh, I'm not sure what I do. But um, yeah, really, this is fantastic. And, you know, I think these guys 
did such a great job of explaining your question about, you know, why it's important to, uh, you know, whatever uh, the, the component, the asset, as Jake indicated, that's a really complicated subject for many people, uh, even that, you know, friends of mine that have been in this business a long time, and even myself, that's probably the last part that um, really started to, to make sense for me as I did more and more of this stuff. Um, and Evelyn, what great, uh, what, gr what great words of advice, be cool. Um, I think that's really where this industry is going as, you know, these guys talked about with the being more and more opportunities, you know, we sort of talk about, you know, when you're all fighting over one slice of pizza, it's really, you know, it gets pretty particular. I want the pepperoni or I want the, you know, the onion. It, Evelyn seemingly has not only created her own pizza, but you know, presumably has her own pizza oven to bake it in. So you just don't get into those petty arguments anymore. Um, I like pizza. What can I Yeah. Think? Awesome. All right. That's all I got. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So we are here with a new revenue panel, uh, just an amazing panel of people. Uh, and I want to introduce each of them to you. Uh, we want to talk about those amazing new opportunities for revenue for your music career that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of, uh, aren't taking advantage of, or just, uh, uh, yeah, that uh, we need to, to learn more about. These guys uh, know it inside and out. So I have Mike Mowry here from 10th Street Entertainment, manager of Ice Nine Kills. Uh, Crystal Torres is here also from 10th Street Entertainment. She manages Bad Wolves. Cody DeLong from uh, uh, SoundRank, which is VIP fan club and uh, uh, live streaming services. Uh, Matt Devine is here from Cameo, and I can't wait for Matt to give everybody a real good in-depth. I mean, Cameo is like the buzz uh, uh, thing going on online now. I hear about it all the time. So if you're not aware, I'll look forward to Matt to introduce that to you. And uh, I want to start with uh, recording artist uh, Wax. Uh, uh, Wax is also a, a brand new cameo celebrity, right? Are we allowed to announce that? I mean, I... Ce celebrity is a strong word. <laughs> well, uh, Wax, I wanted to start with you because you're an amazingly prolific artist when it comes to uh, the content that you put out online for your fans and to generate new fans. At what point in your career did you begin to value monetizing more than just your recordings and live performances? And, and what do you look for in terms of new potential revenue streams? Um, I don't know exactly when I started value. I mean, I probably started valuing monetizing when I first learned what money was as a little kid. You know what I mean? That it pays for things you need and whatnot. But uh when I first started, when I first started really digging into um, uh, having a fan base and making money on my music in probably like 2008 ish, uh, I always tell people the best way to do it is just to have a bunch of revenue streams. Whether it brings you a cent a year or it brings you a hundred bucks a month or whatever, just get as many as you can, and then slowly uh, each one of them may build up individually. So it's good to just have a bunch of different kind of fishing. You know, the more fishing lines you have in the lake the better chance you have of catching a fish you know so uh yeah probably like 2008 ish and then you know i kind of i kind of got started when when youtube really became a popular thing i was kind of early on the early on the on the youtube uh that's kind of what got me to where i where i eventually got to you know what i mean absolutely i got a whole boatload of youtube questions for you uh what do you look for in terms of uh, like when you're looking at new products or new services like something like Cameo? What do you look for when you're d uh, deciding whether you're going to try something or not? Hmm. Uh, I look. I look in. That's interesting. Cameo. When uh, when I first heard about Cameo, somebody actually reached out to me about Cameo from Cameo, and uh, when I first heard about, it, I was like, uh, I don't know about this because it seems like a little, you know. Hey, I'm hey, I'm wax. Uh, give me some money so I can say hi to your kids. You know, it seemed a little, it seemed a little bit much. But if you figure out a way to make it so it's not only something that makes you money, but it's something that is a fun for you, but more importantly, b fun for your fans. Uh, I think that that's an important thing. So it, it, I don't, I don't like to look like I'm just doing stuff for money. You know what I mean? So, I, so I kind of make it so I just don't 
anything I do has to have some level of fun and some level of advantage, not just to me, but to the people that are that are paying for whatever service that is, whether it be cameo or you know, as simple as watching a video or coming to my show, you know. Yeah, or buying a branding iron. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Crystal is touring, and uh, recorded product revenue has uh, grown challenged. Uh, revenue for artists seems to have grown more diverse, almost out of like a, a need for it to become uh, my, more diverse. So, so how do you balance new revenue with your client's brand? Well, um, once touring stops, uh, we had to look to new creative ways on how we can uh, create streams of revenue for our artists. So one of the things we looked at was creating a Patreon um, for Bad Wolves. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's basically content um, creation and people pay monthly subscription and sign up for that, create um, the content that's being created. So um, yeah, we basically just decided to take what we're doing on social media and expand on that and put everything up on Patreon. That's cool. And has it been effective for you? So far it's been pretty successful. Um, we launched in April and we're up to almost 1,500 patrons. So it's, it's going pretty well. We have two different tiers. We have a $5 tier and a $10 tier. Um, and on those different tiers, we pretty much launched the Patreon with having an acoustic live stream performance. So that was like the big driver to help push traffic and help people sign up. So it was separating what the band normally puts on their normal social media and what they're gonna start creating on Patreon. And in addition to that, we keep putting out new content every week. So like the guys are putting out vlogs or covers of different songs and um, just like day in the life pieces. So it's basically what people see on social media, but more in depth. And it gives uh, the fans a more insight into the guys' daily lives. That's awesome. Uh, and that sort of feeds into what I was going to ask you about, Matt, like the daily lives. And that sort of feeds into the idea of personality. It seems like uh, Cameo is a place where a really strong brand and a really strong personality really ends up being to someone's benefit uh, on, uh, on, a, on a platform like yours. Um, so can you quickly introduce Cameo for those who might not be aware of it uh, or, un uh, or uninitiated? And then um, uh, talk about uh, the investment that artists make in their brand, in their personality early on in their careers that ends up paying off for something like uh, what you guys do. That's a really cool question. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to give props to Wax. Wax has been an adopter came in we love him he's he's killing it um nice to meet you in person brother hey thank you man i appreciate that i'm really really proud of what he's done on cameo and yeah quick quick overview of what we do is that we are uh an app or marketplace where um fans pay celebrities pay their heroes um in exchange for short little personalized video shout outs so a lot of people have seen these out there where a husband will get Snoop Dogg to wish his wife a happy, <laughs> happy birthday or something like that. Um, generally speaking, they're just about 30 seconds long. And um, yeah, but the company's about four years old. I came on two years ago with headquarters in Chicago. Um, when I came on, there were about a dozen of us. Now there are about 150. Uh, we have a crop. Music is just one of our verticals. We also have athletes and YouTube YouTubers and movie stars and everything else. And yeah, so we have about 30,000, over 30,000 talent currently using the platform. And yeah, it's, it's very simple. They just, they set their price anywhere from a buck to Caitlyn Jenner's 2,500 bucks. Chris D'Elia is 50,000 bucks, but that's a joke. And <laughs> until a Sultan books him on Cameo, I don't think he's going to get booked at that price, but, um, but yeah, so they they set their price. It, it works with, with their their lifestyle. Um, they have up to four days to respond to the cameos, so it works really well with the with the lifestyle of artists who are on tour and they're, or they're in the studio. Or in this case, they're they're often home, so it's even um, better suited. But yeah, you, you get, we have a lot of examples of 
you know, someone at the Snoop Dogg, Snoop Dogg level are earning $2 million in their first year. Um, personally, I'm, it's fun. You want to talk about emerging talent. That's the tier that I get most excited about because that's my background. So I was a singer of a band called Kill Hannah. We were on Atlantic for a couple records and Roadrunner, Motown. And I, I spent 10 years on the road um, as the principal songwriter and singer of a band that was quote unquote successful. And I was living hand to, hand to mouth my entire life. So I personally take that, that plight of the artist very, very seriously. And I get really excited when I could help be a part of their journey and help practically uh, extend their runway so they don't have to give up music to go bartend. And um, yeah, so we have example. you know, I just saw Pierre from Simple, Simple Plan came on and made $10,000 in his first month and he didn't promote it at all, use it very, very casually. And because like I mentioned, the average cameo length is so short he um that breaks down to something like 15 minutes a day for him so i think he, he i think i think pierre took ten thousand dollars in his first month using it for 15 minutes a day which as we know touring after all those expenses and your overhead and your crew and everything you don't really net much more than that even as a successful band sometimes so um well, there are more and more examples of that and and to your to your question about uh Branding as an artist, I, I've always believed that's that's critical. We we've noticed for early on the talent that first came to Cameo and the the most successful talent on Cameo were not necessarily the most relevant, but they were the most like biggest personalities that owned their lane. You know, there's only one. I think. I mean, damn. I don't know what we do if there's more than one, but there's only one riffraff. You know, so if you want riff raff, you got to go to riff raff, you know? and and that's that's the same across all genres. So yeah, we're seeing that in in, in the warp tour bands. It's exactly who who you'd expect. It's the kind of larger than life, really really strongly branded personas that 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 tend to do the best. And and yeah, to your question, I don't know if it's leading or not, but I I would always I I art I manage artists for a few years in my life. I was not great at it, but. At that time, a big emphasis, uh, I put a lot of emphasis on identity. And um, it was for exactly that reason. You know, we've all, Kill Hand and my band, we wanted, we knew it was a good sign when people started making, fans started making action figures of us. And I remember talking to Gerard Way from My Chemical Romance about that. He was, he was like, can't switch up your outfit now. You got to wear the same thing, you know, for this entire tour. And I, I agree with that. I think that's essential. And I, th I think it leads to, you know, um cameo is just one of many byproducts of that so long as you're good to your fans and your fans you know you show your fans that you love them and um you you are accessible and you you know you reciprocate their devotion to you then you're going to be in a better place to earn however and it's really cool to hear wax say that he throws he casts the net really wide because that's really really smart and um yeah, it just it just shows like DIY and hustle, and that never stops. Wax can attest to that. Like I don't think that hustle yeah. mentality ever stops. That's awesome, Cody. I think if uh, if Matt had met you when he was with Kill Hannah, perhaps we wouldn't be here today. So uh, <laughs> can you talk about uh, what you do with Sound Drink and talk about VIP packages? How that differentiates from just say bundling, and uh, uh, yeah, and what you guys do, and then how brand and personality and persona uh, really make VIP packages successful in the same sort of way for you? Yeah, definitely. So we're a VIP ticketing company or a VIP experience company. And I think our biggest thing is putting together unique experiences for the, the fan um, from the touring artist. So for us, um, you know, we put together experiential, um, you know, ticket bundles along with whether it's meeting the band, um, having pizza party with the band, um, we've done lots of different things. And, and the big thing we try to stick that sticks out is trying to do something different. Um, the huge tour that we did one year, it was, uh, it was, we based the entire tour around a food concept. And so we spent hours and hours reaching out to local uh, food places and getting free food for all of the patrons and putting together like this just experiential thing that was 
a long lasting memory for all of the artists fans. And I mean, it ended up being why just hugely successful. It was kind of crazy and um, just a big undertaking, but the worthwhile fact of it is we still have people that talk about that one, that one experience. And so for us, I think as it's, it's leaving a, a lasting impact for an artist um, and their fans uh, when they go out and, and do these VIPs. And so it creates another avenue where they're able to connect with their fans and, and really have a targeted, is really targeted towards the, um, I would say, the super fan, the, the, the 10% that makes up 90% of your revenue. You know, and, and that's who it's targeted to so they can have a, a deeper connection with those people in person or now with everything going on, whether it's, you know, doing online, uh, some type of online um, chat or video. Um, so for us, I really think, I agree, like the branding of an artist and just their person, just them as a whole is a huge part of it. Um, you know, the big one I can think of is Mike is Ice Nine Kills is their persona and just what they, you know, their whole everything with the horror and everything we've done with VIPs with, you know, down to it with masks and just everything. We, we try to gear everything towards what they are about and about like how they are viewed by their fans. And we kind of capture that within the VIPs. We've done that with a lot of different artists and, and kind of trying to, I guess, brand the VIP around the brand of the artist um, and what they're bringing to the table. Um, so we do a lot of that. And one of the big things we're doing now is, is the live streaming and um, bringing fans and doing a lot of Q and A's for free, doing, uh, doing live streams with artists that are doing Q and A's and kind of branding that as, as something different and something that fans don't have to pay for. Um, and kind of having trying to still offer some sort of that experience that fans are currently missing um, with the band not on the road and, and not being able to provide you know the 30 minute to an hour Q and A session um, for the uh, for the fan while they're on the road. Awesome, thank you, uh, Wax. You had alluded to YouTube and your success with YouTube earlier, and Cody kind of he kind of he he's got me going another direction. I wanted to ask you two things at once, if I can, about YouTube. The first thing is building on what Cody's talking about on building super fans out of you know sort of casual fans just the people who uh you know stay off of my facebook right who just give you clicks and nothing else versus those who really really love and will be uh you know or the ones who will buy vips and packages and really support you financially how does youtube play a role in that even indirectly and then if you could also talk about youtube as a direct revenue stream for you and your career uh <clears throat> man i don't i don't know exactly what makes somebody from a a fan to a super fan i can tell you that uh, a lot of people that are just fans that aren't going to go to your shows and buy stuff they kind of get in on the hype you know what i mean so a lot of artists have hype for a little while and people are like yeah i've heard of him yeah i've heard of them i've heard of them but uh you know there's the long lasting the 10 percent that cody was talking about uh, are the people that watch all your stuff what how how you come about that uh I don't have, I don't, I don't know. I don't have any formula for, for that to like the, con the conversion of the regular fan to the super fan. I don't know if there's anything in that besides just doing stuff they really like. From my, ex from my experience, there'll be certain songs they take, a song will take somebody from a fan to a super fan. Somebody will be like, damn, that sounds like it happened to me. Or people come up to me after the show and be like, I never met you, but I feel like I know you. You know what I mean? When people just, I think that's more that that aspect of it is more just the art itself, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Uh, because, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's a, a formula for that. And as far as YouTube being a revenue stream, it's a pretty decent revenue stream with the Google AdSense, and it's also a good, obviously, a good way to promote anything you're selling, to promote your tour. You can make video promotional videos. Um, I probably should have made more money on uh youtube but there was a certain amount of my content got censored or certain amount of some of the content i actually made like little i've made deals in the past where kind of like other people might own the rights to some of my songs so i can't monetize them etc cetera, etc cetera. but but it's like it's like uh last i checked if you have a monetized video it's somewhere in the like 1200 bucks per million views or something like that 
but uh, you know, Spotify is like four times that for for stream, and you don't even have to put a video up. So I I, I don't know. Um, so but, I mean, I I, I wouldn't want to you know pry, but uh, like, do you do you take the the uh, uh, revenue that you can earn from different streaming platforms into account when you're putting your stuff out? Or try not, to decide whether you're going to record a song or make a video. You know, is that sort of ever play into your mind as well? I mean, I mean, to a certain extent. Now they have these. Now they have DistroKid and TuneCore that kind of put them on everything for you. With the, I mean, they put the audio on everything for you. And uh, you know, as a, as a listener and music fan myself, I I tend to use Spotify for everything. So uh, I kind of I kind of look at Spotify as my my main thing now and I think that's just a, that's just because I have a habit as a, as a listener of listening to Spotify myself and honestly in the last few years I've been slacking a little bit on uh, on making music video music videos you know like like well-made uh, high budget not high budget but you know medium budget uh, music videos but um, yeah I don't I honestly I don't I don't take it into that much of an account of an account but I just you know I hope I hope that whatever you know, if I make an album or something, I hope that when I put it out, I can I, I'll make the money back eventually. Whatever I whatever I spend making it, you know what I mean? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, th this idea of the you know ninety ten rule or eighty twenty, the Pareto concept in business, which is that twenty percent of your uh, customers are going to make you eighty percent of your money. How applicable has the super fan been to? Uh, Ice Nine Kills career and you know the financial streams and how much do you guys take that into account when you're pursuing new potential revenue streams for the band? Yeah, I mean it's been uh, huge and you know you sort of alluded with a little bit of a joke in regards to you know Kill Hannah and and presuming got it you know dying out as a band uh, before the VIP explosion really happened. I mean you know Cody has been a longtime partner for Ice Nine Kills and really has helped us cultivate experiences, as he said, that, that, you know, whether people were fans and turning into super fans, it's such a good question. And I can imagine it, it is really hard to answer. Right. But I think some of those types of things um, are what has taken fans into that super fandom. They might not have had to be a super fan to buy a VIP ticket, but once we gave them something really unique, both in terms of experience and, you know, limited edition merchandise that's helped, you know, fuel that, and continue to grow it. Um, right now, so many of our decisions are, are taking into account, you know, who is willing to spend money with us, uh, where have they spent it in other places, right? And then what can we mobilize them to do? Um, and there might be super fans that, you know, whatever, they, they don't live in places that we play. Right. So like Crystal's done with Bad Wolves is then we can create something where there's a paywall that content sit, uh, sits behind. So we're not relying solely on, you know, the ability to be in, in, you know, the markets that the people live in or in these times, of course, when no one can play. So, yeah, it's a huge determinant into the things that we have done thus far and the things that we will continue to do. Awesome. Crystal, with, uh, with Bad Wolves, it's a relatively new band. I mean, what, 24 months old or so. Like, uh, was launching your Patreon the first chance that you had as a manager to discover who these super fans for Bad Wolves are? And has there been um, sort of early in the career as the, the things exploded so quickly, uh, sort of a, a, a extra attention on either developing or uh, uh, recognizing who these super fans are? Yeah, I would say I would have to agree with that um, because they are a newer band. It was something we definitely took into consideration when we were thinking about starting the Patreon page. Um, you know, we didn't know how many patrons were actually going to pay money to see additional content. Like how many super fans did, did we have that actually wanted to see more than what was free content that was be, like being pushed out on Instagram or on Twitter. So um, it was really interesting to see who the super fans are. And we just want to make sure that we're constantly super serving them. Um, you know, so we just continue to push out unique content every single week. We created a schedule with the guys. And so each guy has something that he's putting up or doing for Patreon every single day because this has now become their full-time job while they're in 
quarantine. So we just want to make sure we're super serving them since they're paying for it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Matt, you touched on a couple things with, um, with Cameo earlier that I wanted to circle back on. Uh, for the uh, artists who don't have the massive, massive uh, uh, numbers of, uh, uh, of fans, you know, they might be, uh, you know, b well beyond the developing stage, but not yet, uh, you know, superstars. How uh, are they leveraging Cameo really effectively to increase their revenue for themselves? And is it just a matter of identifying price point or is it more than that? Yeah, the, the price point is important because you can scale it, um, you know, it, it can scale to pace with your popularity. So, or it can just be a regulator of the volume of requests that you want to get. So there are some emerging artists that come on with, they're at the stage of, um, probably, probably stage even more nascent than any of the artists that were just mentioned, where they... It's just another tool on their tool, tool belt where they'll set the price super low, but they'll make sure that, you know, and I mean like $5 um, because that's what a fan would pay to probably for a meet and greet for them right now. And they make sure to go above and beyond and really show the value to their fans. And it's just um, like to Crystal's point with Patreon, which is awesome to hear also. Um, the, yeah, they start, they basically, they bake it into their, their schedule, you know, the fabric of their, of their promotion. So consider it, especially since each one of these has a life of their own once they make it. Um, and it's really special to the fans and then the fans share, download them and share them on their socials and everything else. And that drives demand. Um, they just, they make them really personable. They make them really sweet. Um, the tone of the whole thing is, uh, is very positive and it's uh, on in the case of like um mike and and, and spencer and ice nine for example and, and to wax's point like really showing what it is like just quality i think wax's answer to what leads to a super fan is just doing shit that's awesome <laughs> it's kind of true like and, and it's the same it's the same with cameo so you see you see Spencer's fans are just such so devoted and and he shows the love and it, and it matters so much to them so yeah it's, it, it is a cool tool for for the emerging talent they just set their price really low and um, and then I you know then I take it upon myself it's cool when I have those relationships like I do with um, you know with Mike and with love and seven where it's like in 10th Street where I have an interest in their success. So I would love to plug them into something cool. You know, we did a, we did a big Valentine's Day marketing blitz where at the time there's an, there's an R&B singer named Major who no one really knew, but he was awesome to me. His manager was awesome to me. So I put him in this right alongside big A-list names. who's the only non-household name in this really cool graphic that went out. And then he ended up winning a, uh, a Grammy, I think, was at least nominated but he's since blown up and it was just cool for me to look back and just say oh cool like that's i want to be doing more stuff like that where i can i again uh, i'm coming from from that artist side and i know by hook or by crook you've got to everything everything helps so yeah we're seeing young bands even blast out their albums and their singles on their cameo profiles and a lot of them yeah patreon i would if i were starting right now i'd have a patreon account 100 percent and probably roll a cameo into into those patreon offerings at different oh, cool and, and i love that story that you tell about the uh what major he said his name was it's, yeah. it's that that idea of launching above the line of credibility where the first time people see you they're already associating you with other artists that they already know and love and trust etc so that that's a, it's a really cool concept i like that um, Cody, uh, uh, with the VIP stuff, uh, you know, it, it's, I asked this question to Spencer and, and, um, so I'm kind of curious as to whether you'll answer in a similar way. Is there a time where it's too soon to do VIP? That's a good question. Um, I would say in this day and age, if you look back nine years ago when I started SoundRank, I'd probably tell you yes. I probably would have told you, unless you're playing X amount of sized rooms, you really shouldn't be doing VIP. 
um, as time has gone on, um, you know, our biggest niche is those mid tier size acts. And we've grown with a lot of those smaller artists. We've grown with an ice nine kills when they were playing hundred cap rooms. We've grown with the dance Gavin dances as they were playing hundred cap rooms. And I think we started out with both those artists when they were playing really small venues. And I don't think there's too small. I think if you are a band that's touring and going on an actual tour, I think there is an option for you to offer that. I don't think you, are, you offer a very expensive option. I think it's one that's economical. And at the end of the day, you're maybe making 3 or $4 really off of each of those consumers, but you're gaining and you're essentially making it known that that's what you're going to be offering from the beginning as an artist. And so your fans, as you're gaining them, grow to know that you're going to be offering a VIP on your headlining tours, on your headlining dates, when you come around, when you're playing in front of a hundred people and when you grow into a band that's playing in front of thousands of people. And by doing that from the get go, it's going to help you gain some of those super fans and really kind of just have those, um, have those interactions with them in a more intimate setting because everybody can say, well, I could have those interactions with my fans after the show. And it's like, yeah, you can, but it's not as like when you're, especially when you're a younger band and you're touring and say you have 10 people at a show and you do a VIP session an hour before doors, that is an hour that you have with those 10 people. That is more of an interaction than that fan would get with just shaking your hand after the show at the merch table, signing something and talking. I mean, some of these people have really strong connections with their fans because of the interactions that they have during the VIP. And the artists that are younger that do that, they are, we, we really suggest that to not charge a lot, you know, to, to, to upcharge the ticket, maybe $15, include a poster, laminate, and the album. And your profit on it is not huge, but the goal isn't for it to be huge. It's to build it into a money maker and to build it into another revenue stream for you to again, you know, whether it's pushing a new record when the new record comes out, when you're now headlining 500 capacity rooms, it's building that strong fan base that you have. Um, it's selling merch. It's, it's all those things um, that you can go ahead and do with the VIP. I mean, we're even talking, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about how can we, you know, lengthen the VIP buyer and those, those different marketing hits to those, to those super fans that want different things. Maybe it's pre-buying merchandise um, before the tour even happens and having that available to them on the road. Maybe it's releasing, ex releasing an exclusive poster um, to just those VIP fans to purchase before the tour. Um, so they're not going ahead and having to handle it at the, you know, at the show and spill beer on it or whatever, you know? So it's like, how can we have all those different touch points and offer this to bands? Um, so as you grow as an artist, I guess back to the point, like as a smaller artist, I don't think there's too small. I think if you're able to go tour and eat, like I said, even if you're playing like hundred capacity rooms, I think there is room for you to offer some sort of experience and um it's not going to be like 30 people a night some we've had ones with like five a night but it does grow into other things i mean when we start doing ice nine kills there was ones where we had five or ten a night but i mean now you know we're doing 100 you know over 100 it's that time so it's it's you know we're selling out of different artists selling out and having to really limit it when I remember starting with Dance Gavin Dance, we were doing like five to 10 a night, you know? And then now we have to limit it because there's just so many people that want to do it. And so for us, it's like, it's like our whole thing is growing with an artist. And I don't think now looking back at it and looking how, when we first started, I think the bands that we were, those smaller to mid-tier bands weren't really doing the packages. I think now it's, it's kind of a common place for people to do it. Whether they use a company like us or they decide to sell it on their own site, you know, um, I think that it's definitely, there's a place for it, you know. Um, and we definitely have had some bands recently that are smaller that we've done. And I think it, it actually turned out, I think, better than we, ex you know, we thought it was going to. Um, and that was a great, you know, that was an awesome thing to do. So Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Wax, I wanted to segue a little bit to international because, uh, 
you know, I think a lot of artists, they focus on whatever country they're from and try to just grow there. I mean, you had a top 10 single in Europe and Scandinavia uh, just a few years ago. Was developing an international audience and making something like that happen something that you were very conscientious of uh, leading up to that? Or was that just like now taking advantage of just a, a good opportunity? It was no that it wasn't conscientious at all. It was the exact opposite of that. Actually, it was just it was a fluke. You know what I'm saying? I just I put out a video, and it had some uh, music video. It had some viral success, and I actually got a you know a record deal in Germany. And it, I'm basically like an underground underground rapper in America, and I'm a one hit wonder like Rico Suave guy in a few countries in Europe. You know what I mean? So it was actually super fun to live both of those experiences. Like, I'd go over there and do, like, Good Morning Germany. And, like, I did a bunch of, like, MTV Spring Break shows. Like, at you know, it was wild, bro. But uh, it was completely at 100% un zero planning. There was no planning. Some things in life and some things in this music stuff, you can't plan. You know what I mean? You can't, you can't be like, you know what? I want to have the number one single in Austria. Yeah, I've never even been to Austria. You know what I mean? And, uh, and... Uh, it was just like some, you know, sometimes you just got to put the stuff out. I tell a lot of people you got to put stuff out and sometimes flowers will grow that you didn't even have the right seeds for or for whatever metaphor you want to use. But uh, the good thing about the good thing about it is, um, you know, it did it did ex that expands to this to this day. That's a, a, a hit over there. So people still stream that song. People still watch the video. People have learned about my other music from that. You know what I mean? But um. Yeah, it was it was completely uh, unplanned. I, I mean, I wish I could, I wish I could con continue that, but I, yeah, I haven't. I wanted to say with um w with what Cody was talking about with the VIP packages, and uh, Cody, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm kind I'm kind of like a like a relatively lower level touring artist, and, and basically this is my point. I have enough time after the show to pretty much meet anybody who wants to meet me, but I have friends that like. They got past that level where if they did like an after show meet and greet, it would take five hours. So I feel like is that almost like the point where somebody would lo logically do a VIP thing when they don't have really have you couldn't you wouldn't have you don't have time to meet a thousand people at a, at a meet and greet for everybody after the show. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's definitely a good point for it. And I think some artists still don't want to charge for it. One of our very mutual friends, Mac Lethal, does not charge for his. Uh, for his VIPs, you know, and like, he'll sit there. I mean, actually it's funny. I booked him for, for many years, even for the That's tour that you guys just did name. together. Knew, yeah. And I booked I knew, Spose I I too. Spose is my homie. Right. So funny. yeah. So like the biggest thing with that is like, he'll not, you know, he doesn't charge, but he'll sit there for like four hours. Like he could realistically charge if he wanted to, but his, he doesn't want to. So like, I think it, you can, I think what you, I don't think it, I think it just matters like how close and what like offering an experience, you know what I mean? Like is the big thing. Like we have people who will bring an N64 and play super smash brothers with their fans. Like you wouldn't have time after a show, you would have time to meet fans, but to set up a whole TV and play super smash brothers, that's like the offering that an artist that's maybe like, you know, playing not huge rooms and again, has the time afterwards, but still wants to like give people an experience and, and still be able to put a little bit more money in their pocket. Um, that's like the type of experience that you would offer in that in that situation. I feel like we like it's more than just like a handshake and hey, how you doing? Thanks, you know. And people, it's like really offering something that somebody's going to walk away from and be like, that was completely worth the money. That was freaking awesome, and I would do that again. Um, and then they'll come up after the show and still shake your hand, but at least you know that they got their money's worth and that they feel like what they paid for was exactly that. So I think it's definitely like you have to be, I want to say tread it, but you have to be like, it, you have to just make sure that what you're offering is an experience if you're at that level where, you know, you do have the time afterwards to shake everybody's hand and you may not feel that it's worth charging your fans just to shake your hand because you're going to go ahead and see them anyways after the show. So I mean, yeah, let, me, let me ask, yeah, yeah. ask one, 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 one yeah. thing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. From And this is from a, a touring artist perspective. You said, you know, they have, you said they have the experience and when they walk away, they feel whatever. But this, the reality of it is how do you tell them when to leave? You know what I'm saying? 
I val I value my fucking alone time. A, a good I, tour man, a good tour manager always helps. I don't want I don't want to uh, do a pizza party before every show when I got fifty shows on a tour. You know what I'm saying? Like I start I, I want to start working at one certain time. And I I, I I don't know, man. Maybe I'm socially awkward or whatever. But like when there's this pe I mean. God bless anybody who want, who would pay to meet me, but it's awkward. It's it's a strange interaction with essentially strangers, and then and then that it's like how do you how do you tell them well well now it's over you know what I'm saying it, it, that to me it's just it's it's not only that I don't want to charge people it just seems like an awkward interaction that's why like my homie Watsky he, he does a VIP package where he does a poetry show before before and it's like when the poetry show is done they know that that's the time where they go. You know what I'm saying? So, but, but like, I don't know if you, if you're like, yeah, cause like my other homies, they do like a, they'll barbecue backstage with the, or outside on their bus with people. And I just always, am like, how do you get people to leave? You know what I mean? It's, yeah, it's, I mean, I it's I, like I, a good tour manager, like Mike said. <laughs> well, I think you look, I think you hit the point, not only with uh, VIP experiences, but with anything, right? It, it, it needs to be genuine to you and you have to feel as if you're willing and able to give, something um to it i've had many artists that we've asked to do them and they felt very awkward and then once they they got in there they realized what a profound experience it is because the fans aren't i mean some of them are awkward but some of them are just so you know gracious to to get the chance to meet you what i was gonna say you know before you asked that question was really with all of this stuff to me it's going back to it does need to be genuine but simultaneously it's all about how you market it um, and I think that's one of the reasons why Ice Nine Kills has had success in it is is we've taken just a unique marketing approach to to make it you know something that's that's unique and individualized. And you know, Crystal's done such a good job of that with Bad Wolves. I'm sure uh, you know with the cameo stuff, it, it's all the same. I mean, so much of what we do, no matter what the stream or revenue, if we market it correctly, we've got a much better chance of it impacting. Well, Crystal, can you talk about that? Like, is there a different way to market the, 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 the stuff that you sell to more casual Bad Wolves fans versus these super fans? Is there a different approach to uh, how you get to them? And, and I guess, uh, actually, I asked a question before I wanted to ask it, but is there uh, like a, a differentiation between, well, our casual fans uh, we get to on social media, but our Uber fans we can get to via email and SMS, things like that? Yeah, we, ne we never want to make the fans that aren't patrons um, of our Patreon feel like they're not a super fan because they can afford or don't want to pay the, you know, the, the subscriber fee. So we definitely are cautious of that in all of our language um, when we post things um, because all of our fans are important across the board. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll put up a lot of teasers or we'll put up like short clips, you know, of the stuff that we are putting up on Patreon. So people do get a little taste of it. Um, we don't want them to feel left out. And we've also just really ramped up the social media um, for the band because we don't want all the content to only be created for Patreon and have the people that are only followers on Instagram feel left out and feel like they have to pay to see anything that the band is doing. So we've definitely, um, found a really good balance between both of those. So it's just really walking a fine line to make sure that people don't feel left out and feel like they're not a super fan because they're not paying for it because they're all important. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Matt, uh, on Cameo, are there opportunities for music artists that other celebrities can't take advantage of? Is there something special about musicians, the musicians that we love? that uh, uh, is just a sort of added bonus that should be make a cameo an even more attractive platform? Yeah, there are all kinds of cool new use cases. Now that we're, now that we're out there, it's just fun to see how the, the artists have made it their own. And whenever I learn about something creative and unprecedented, I always get behind it. And if we can get PR behind it and get some visibility around it, we like to because it then it inspires other artists. So. Um, I don't know, yeah, there's a lot of examples of that. Uh, Tom from Plain White Tees, for example, with Hey There Delilah, he he wanted to customize or personalize a version of Hey There Delilah for your girlfriend where he'll actually sing her name in the chorus instead of, you know. 
Um, uh, yeah, there's, you know, we get involved with a uh, promotion around singles or on releases. Sometimes, uh, Aaron Watson is a, is a big indie country artist and his album was called red bandana. So we worked with him for, you know, tying in other talent that we have to shout out his album and swing a red bandana in their cameos. You know, there's all, all kinds of examples, uh, f for music. Yeah. And, and, and specific to music. That's, that's what I get, uh, really excited about. So yeah, we're, we're even actually just prior to this, I had a phone call with, um, ICM and, and interestingly they are a lot of these agencies now are basically creating task forces looking for these, new revenue models you know and and so cool to be part of those combos and um we're just you know we're we're open to getting as imaginative as anybody wants to get so there there are examples where um i mean beyond just what you can do in the cameo which is yeah sky's the limit you can dedicate like natasha bedingfield is dedicating her song unwritten to your graduating class of 2020 things that there's of infinite number of really cool examples over there but then on the promo side it's like uh, we have examples where people are tying in cameos to as incentive for fans to pre-order their single or let's let's give them a half off cameo promo code to the fan that won this contest or who shared this instagram post most often so matt is there uh, sorry to interrupt but is there a way in which um uh you know, sort of the, the, cause you mentioned this with that bandana thing, which I think is a cool idea, the way that, that cameo can act as not just the, the cart, if that makes sense, but the horse where you can, it, it can drive other potential revenue streams just by identifying who the super fans are for an artist. Is, is that right? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. More and more, it's becoming more reciprocal. So we're seeing streams go up when people are active on cameo we're seeing it was um ronnie radke was one of the first to really demonstrate this where we noticed that his and his manager pointed out to us you know the there's he there's a bump in all of his business for the certain month and the only difference was that he started using cameo and he re realized that it was driving merch sales it was driving streams it was driving engagement and you know ticket sales back when there were ticket sales and there yeah we're starting to see that more and more so and i like i like to do that so whether it's even just within their profile or through uh even even digital blasts on our socials so so if there's a talent that we're really stoked and 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 we're seeing that they're bought into what we're doing and we're bought into what they're doing i don't i'll have them do a, a swipe up on you know on our official cameo instagram that'll just more shouting out that they have a new single that we love with you know it's it's awesome fully altruistic and just just because we dig it so yeah and and the more we see that then the more we'll be able to actually measure that and that'll that'll be a big day for me when i could say hey come on cameo it bumps your streams you know 10 percent or something like that well cody i mean your your sound rig is offering something uh obviously very different from what cameo is doing but it's still got that live streaming uh a component uh, softball question here, but how are you differentiating SoundRink live uh, to the live streaming that we're seeing as we're recording this during the uh, coronavirus lockdown, a lot of artists doing on their social media platforms. And then like, is that something that you think can be effectively monetized? And if so, how? So for us, we're doing it different because we're actually you know, going ahead and moderating it ourselves. A lot of these artists are going ahead and they're looking at like, they're looking at their Facebook feed and they're just kind of answering questions. What we're doing is we're capturing those questions and actually moderating them and putting them on the screen for the artists to, to answer. Um, we're doing a lot of different graphics for them. I mean, some artists have figured it out and they've been able to do that, but we've kind of tried to put together a platform that allows us to kind of take over the streaming aspect of it and give the art and give it a very professional look for the artist, um, bringing in all the band members, um, into one stream, you know, doing all of those things to make it look as professional as possible. And then also pushing it out to multiple outlets. Like, you know, so a lot of the streams we do, we goes to 
the band's Facebook, the band's Twitter, um, the band's YouTube, the label's YouTube, our YouTube, our website. It's basically streamed across probably anywhere from five to ten different platforms as at once. And then we pull in all the questions from all the different platforms and moderate that to them. We also have the ability, um, a little bit different, is we built the website to list out the streams and host the streams, um, but also the ability to on-screen tip to these to the artists. So whether it's directly to the artist or it's to a cause that they are supporting during this time, people can go to SoundRank Live, watch it on SoundRank Live, click a button and tip on screen and not even leave the screen and then literally less than a minute be able to tip the, the artist. I mean, they, if they're on their phone, they can Apple Pay and tip the artist. There's no, the big thing I'm seeing a lot of people like, hey, tip us by Venmoing us. On our platform, there's no Venmo. There's no, oh, what was their Venmo? What was their PayPal? What's, you know, their PayPal.me slash what, you know, band name. Is there you click the button and you tip the band right there and it goes to them. And so for us, like, the big thing about that is you're capturing data. So our huge thing is capturing that data from the fan. With that tip, they can sign up for your newsletter. They can ask to not be signed up to your newsletter. You get their information, their email. The band can email each one of them and thank them personally for the tip if they'd like and have that sort of interaction. We can send out a mass email saying thank you for the tip. Um, you know, unless you sign up for the newsletter, you won't get any other emails from us. Um, you know, we can go ahead and people can leave a message. We've done contests where, hey, whoever you know, tip us now, whoever out of all the tippers will pick two people to win uh, a, shirt, a shirt from our new merch store and somebody will win a piece of vinyl that we're putting out, you know? And so we're doing contesting that way and really trying to push, push that aspect. So we've had artists that have raised 500 to a couple thousand dollars for what their, what their initiative. And we've had a couple artists that have made that for themselves to, to put towards their bills to help them cover what's going on and, and we've had some very gracious you know people so yeah would it be inaccurate to say that like a lot of people have grown used to that idea just through what twitch has been doing for gamers that sort of thing where you're tipping as you're watching and, and just keep on clicking that button sometimes i watch people uh, to do that on twitch is that would that be a similar type of concept Exactly. And we actually, speaking of Twitch, we actually use Twitch to embed on our site for the free ones because it's just, it's naturally, I love Twitch. I think they have an amazing product. It's great. We can embed it directly on our site. We're able to reuse that content on our end, how we need to, we want to reuse it. We can download the video and re-upload it to YouTube. Their servers are great. I mean, I don't, I've never had any issues. Their latency is amazing. So I, yeah, I mean, it's similar to that. And people can do the same thing on our Twitch. And we've done enough of these now where we're a partner and an affiliate. So people can do the tipping on Twitch as well. And we're gaining this experience. And, um, you know, it's been a great thing. I think the next move for us is really going to be uh, and what we're working on right now, we actually have one playing on Saturday, is a full band live stream in a venue. So we had two bands that are playing on Saturday in Connecticut, full production, full everything in a venue, four or five camera stream, direct audio, all mixed and everything live. We're doing two local bands and, and that's going to be our first just foray of how do we do this? Because everybody's been playing at home. Everybody's been playing acoustic. And so for us, we're like, that's only going to last so long. But once people are able to get back together, how can we go ahead and create somewhat of a experience with a full production? And those, those are the next steps we're taking, I think a little bit further than maybe some like other people who are like, Oh, stream at home. We're like, what can, can we go rent a soundstage in Nashville and hire a video crew and sell a full show? Um, for two hours of a band playing full band once this thing gets together. And those are the steps that we're taking and the things that we're doing and already have in place. So. That's awesome. Uh, Wax, I wanted to transition a little bit to uh, physical merchandise. So we had uh, uh, Ben Brennan from At Venue on a recent panel with us. He was talking about the, the four t-shirt concept, where it's just four shirts are going to be what – you know, is the bulk of what you sell. Your web store uh, is is filled with just really cool products from ping pong balls and uh, branding irons and things like that. Like, uh, uh, how of uh, I guess um, how helpful is alternative physical products to your physical product revenue stream? Uh, and 
do you differentiate between what it is that you sell in your web store versus what you would sell at your merch table when you're on the road? Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's part, it's kind of part of who I am, or I guess part, part of my brand or something like that to kind of make some wacky stuff every time I come out with an album or sometimes just that random, you know, take the branding irons, for example, I made wax branding irons. So like, you know, you heat it up and then you get my logo, push, press, push my logo like you would on a cow. You know what I mean? But, uh, that people, people love the idea. Nobody bought them. Hardly anybody actually bought those things. You know what I mean? But sometimes the idea is just, is just fun anyway. That said, mo a lot of the other stuff, stuff that has more utility to it, stuff like lighters, stuff like rolling papers, obviously t-shirts and, uh, the music itself in the form of CDs. I mean, you know, now that's just really just a souvenir too but uh what else have i been selling uh i sell like little coolers and stuff like that but uh it's not really it's not skateboard decks it's not really, it's actually that what i'm selling now is actually a lot of it is left over from the tour i'm actually marketing my current thing as a, a spring cleaning sale and it really is shit that's in my garage because to be frank I, I was using a merch company i didn't really like what they i don't i didn't think they were that great so i just had them send me the stuff back and i was thinking about just selling it out of my garage for a while and then this quarantine hit and it kind of was the perfect time to just to just do it just do it myself i've been spending a lot of time doing it i've sold three things since we've been on this this chip thing you know what i mean and uh it's it's actually i actually like doing the work i actually enjoy doing kind of like real regular regular work like packing stuff up you know what i mean but uh kind of went off on a tangent I, I forgot what you were actually asking me but no no that's it I was just like I was just curious whether like you know you ever come across a product that like oh man nobody's ever thought of this before and it just takes off but it sounds like the rolling papers and things like that are the I, I guess that leads to the next question is how often are, are those sort of like really low priced items the kind of items where people just well I'm gonna get the t-shirt so I'll get that as well so that way I come to an even dollar amount you know the, the add-ons yeah, that's that. That is a lot of what it is. You know, I do guitar picks, and you know, if you if you add it, it's like a dollar extra to your order. So a lot of people, if they're going to order a T-shirt in a way, they'll get a they'll get a guitar pick. And I just think I just think you know I, I'm oh I just think it's cool that people have guitar picks with my name on. It. I, I I I'm I just think stuff like that is cool, you know. And um, yeah, I. I don't know. I don't. I don't really have much else to say about it. It's a. It's a good way to make money. It's a good way to, to market. It's a good way to. It's another interaction if you have fun with it. Every time I put out an album, I make a pack. You know, I make. I make a pack with a theme, that that all the all the pieces of merch will fit together, and you can buy just the album. You can buy the album with the T-shirt, or then you can get the uh, working up just like you would with a crowdfunding thing. It works up to the biggest bundle where you get the skateboard deck, the T-shirt, the cooler, the branding iron, the rolling. You know what I mean? So. Uh, I, I think it's I think stuff like that is fun to do uh, and you can kind of make it humorous and, and make it um, interesting in your own way you know yeah excellent uh, well crystal he uh, uh, wax brought up crowdfunding like has the patreon model completely replaced the Kickstarter model or is uh, uh, is there still a place for for uh, crowdfunding platforms like uh, Kickstarter for uh, for for music artists. Um, I think that there's still a place for it. We actually just ended an Indiegogo campaign um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so what we did for that was our current single at radio is sober, and we were raising money for Rock to Recovery, and we created a special merch item um, with the the, the words uh, sober on it, and. It, it's an exclusive item that was available only on Indiegogo and that was just used as a way to raise money for Rock to Recovery and help people in recovery. So I think that they're being used in different ways. Um, that's like a one-time campaign that has a set date when it's going to end and the money we use to donate to charity, whereas Patreon is a reoccurring um, subscription. So it's not like a one-time thing where they sign up and then the campaign ends. These people are being billed every single month. So it's a subscription. It's a subscription model, and I think that they're being used differently now. Um, some people may still be using the crowdfunding uh, model, but I think that Patreon in the long run is probably better in the sense for 
making money for the band themselves and then maybe like an Indiegogo would be better for funding money for charity. Yeah. At least that's how we're using it. Gotcha. Excellent. I, I, I'm sorry we're going just a, a couple minutes long, everybody. I hope you'll just hang on for just a, a few minutes more. Uh, Mike, uh, uh, we've talked about, like, I, I feel like we're, we're just scratching the surface of, like, all the different revenue, new revenue opportunities that are there. And I know even, like, even behind the curtain, there are things that you're pursuing with Ice Nine Kills. What is it that uh, you see as the opportunities for not only Ice Nine Kills, but other artists that you've worked with over the years as like the sort of low hanging hidden fruit in new revenue in terms of like what things that we talk about, the super fans versus casual fans, international versus domestic and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think right now the main strategy is to streamline any existing revenue source we're spending time streamlining it right we're making sure that our margins which maybe we weren't so concerned with uh when you know touring which made up 70 percent of our income was the main thing the margins on some of these smaller things weren't a big deal now they're everything so we're going in and taking a look at those so and then we're saying okay what exists as far as you know the new revenue streams and you're right i mean if we've got a proven track record, which we do with Ice Nine Kills. We do some limited merch drops. Um, obviously, the stuff with Sound Rink. What will immediately kind of translate to, presumably, to that similar sort of behavior, right? So people are willing to pay for things that are limited, that you can only get once for a unique experience. So are there other things like that? You know, there's a ton of other stuff that can still be talked about and developed. Twitch, of course, you know. The, the band Ice Nine doesn't really play video games. So though I know it's not exclusively used for video games, it's something that didn't really make sense for us to pursue today. Doesn't mean that we won't be doing that in the future. Um, but yeah, I think any artist that's out there, you gotta really look at what exists and then what is, is easily transferable uh, based on your current super fan behavior. And how are you finding these new things for Ice Nine Kills? Uh, you know, these uh, search and destroy missions that uh, we go on. Um, I mean, the good news is for me, right, like I've been a fan of new revenue models since I started managing bands. I mean, as somebody who develops, um, you know, who works with developing artists, we always had to be, you know, cognizant of every opportunity that was out there. So I've spent a lot of time in the trenches figuring out how to do Patreons, how to do Indiegogos, how to develop, you know, I mean, Cody just mentioned he started his company nine years ago. I mean, we were, you know, I was working with him from day one, um, you know, and then cool things like Cameo where, you know, sometimes the artist is bringing it to us. Spencer signed up for Cameo on his own without us even, you know, having to, to push him in that direction. Um, even though we had talked about it, you know, at some point in the past. So, you know, what we do, what I do as a manager, right, is stay connected with other great managers. Thankfully, I work at a wonderful company where, you know, look, Crystal, you know, took it and ran with this Patreon. And I was like, whoa, super impressed, you know, and, and there's other things like that that are happening within our company. Um, but yeah, just spending time in quarantine and connected with Matt, you know, we hit it off. I think the, the cool thing about everybody on this panel is it sounds like we all kind of come from the same background and have the desire to help our artists. And I think, you know, anyone who's got that passion and is sort of artist, you know, um, artist friendly and artist facing is trying to help one another by sharing whatever's working for us. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Wax, I'm hoping that you, you can sort of wrap us up if you don't mind. Uh, like having a career in music, one that lasts is more than just being creatively prolific and, and, and you know, excited to make new music. <laughs> Uh, years after you last were excited to make new music. It's also about being financially viable. So do you have any advice for artists who are early in their career on how to develop a career in music that is financially viable? Uh, well, first of all, you know, I've had my, had my ups and downs. I haven't had to have a real job since in, in a long time, since probably 2009. So, that, so that's good. I'm not rich. I'll tell you that I'm not rich, but I do okay. I got a, I live in a cool place. I got a home studio. I go on, go on tour. I got a car, shit like that. And um, 
I think, I think everything that that's been said already is, 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 you know, is there's some things that are kind of obvious, you know, if you tour and you make albums, that's, you know, run of the mill. I think cameo, Patreon, all these things are very valuable. My advice, if I, if I had to wrap up what I would say personally to any uh, young people, the best kind of money that you can make in this is money off of stuff you already did. You know what I mean? So any, in any business that has something where, you know, you quote unquote publish something, a book, a painting, uh, like something, you know, it, point is I'm, I'm like, I'll get a phone call and, and I'll have a song I made 10 years ago and it just made some money on some, on, on some random way. And forget, forget like stuff like that syncs and getting your money on, uh, getting your music on TV and music and movies, just the Spotify streaming alone. You know, people listen to my old stuff still. People discover my stuff that's 12 years old today. You know what I mean? So the best, the, the best way to make money is money that you make now off stuff you did 10 years ago. That's the beauty of this. Uh, that's the beauty of, of music. It's, it's like, you know, you, we still watch movies from the seventies. We still listen to the wall. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, I think that, I think that if you put out a lot of stuff, you might, you might find that, you know, somebody might discover your stuff later. So all I can, all I can say is make good stuff, put it out, you know, try to make your connections and all that go on tour. Touring's fun. You know what I mean? But, uh, if you, if, if you have stamina, you'll you'll make it because I, I might have told you that 2009 was the last time i had a real job but people don't know i'm old you know what i mean i had many many jobs after that i didn't i didn't wasn't able to do this till i was 30 you know what i mean i'm 40 41 now so it, t it takes i made albums and did tours where nobody came i did i got booed off the stage i got the microphone cut off on me you know what i mean i did all that stuff and most a lot, you know, Jimmy Iovine's famous quote, he said that he's never met anybody in the music business that failed. He's only met people that gave up. And I actually am, I, I am a subscriber to that belief. Oh, I love that. And I love the fact that you just slapped me with a panel on new revenue by talking about old revenue. And I, <laughs> right, right, right. That's so awesome. Well, it's the best it's the best because you don't have to do anything. You already <laughs> did it, you know? <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for being here and, and for sharing your wisdom. Uh, I really can't express uh, how appreciative I am. So thank you very, very much. I wanna introduce everybody to this amazing panel that we have today. We're here to talk about band longevity, how you keep a band together for a long time, how you have a long sustainable career and things that, decisions that you're making early on in order to make that possible. So let me uh, go around and introduce to you the people who have joined us. Uh, first, I wanna start with Metal Blades founder, Brian Slagle, uh, metal icon, uh, first round heavy metal hall of fame inductee, Brian Slagle. So Brian, thank you for joining us. It's, a, it's an absolute honor. Tim McTague from uh, Under Oath, uh, uh, one of the greatest bands in metal in music today, uh, owner of my album of the year for 2018. So I'm really glad that you are here. Uh, I got Tim Bohr here from Sound Talent Group. Uh, booking agent, correct, Tim? That is correct. Excellent. And I've got, uh, let's see, Biggie, uh, one of the founders of Good Fight Entertainment, manager and uh, extraordinaire. And I've got Mike Mowry, manager of Ice Nine Kills uh, from 10th Street Entertainment is here as well. So I'm going to start with Tim McTague, if you don't mind. Tim, Under Roth has managed to keep the same lineup for almost 20 years, 17, 18 years, something like that. Uh, it, it, and you guys weathered a hiatus period in the midst of it. So what do you guys know that other bands don't? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, obviously there wasn't a lot of prep for this conversation, so I don't have a lot of like pre-booked lines, but thinking about longevity and the idea, it was really hard for me to kind of grasp that even in our own circumstance. I think we got lucky. Um, we had a massive member shift with our first singer, Dallas, leaving, which actually I've known Biggie since before Spencer was in the band. We were touring together. Mm -hmm. And when Spencer joined the band in 2003, that kind of set the tone for what Under Oath would become and what we still are. And um, yeah, that was 17 years ago. I, 
I think for us, we had to go through a lot and be willing to fight stuff out. And you have to be willing to go through a couple of rough months, a couple of rough record cycles. I mean, Tim Bohr, who's also on the call, was our booking agent for many years. Um, and I mean, he could probably speak to that as well. But yeah, there's so many dynamics in there. And you're in a marriage with not one person, which is hard enough, but five other people in our band's case, because we're a six member group. And, you know, things started to fall apart for us as a unified unit when people had kids and people had other interests and certain guys want to go back to college. And, you know, Biggie could probably speak to that because he manages a bunch of bands, but it's like managing a group like that with so many different needs and how to service that's really difficult. And I think we've been gracious enough to have the same manager for the, this entire period. So we're really like seven dudes that have, you know, know each other, know when someone's, you know, off the rails and not saying what they mean and be able to see through the lines and get to where they want to be and just have the respect to kind of work through that instead of get mad. And I think a lot of bands fall apart um, because they need everything to be a specific way. And when you have six people with 100% of an idea of a band, uh, that's 600%. And there's only 100% of the band to go around. So you have to understand your place in the orbit and the solar system of this entire unit, rather than feeling like you are the earth and the sun and everything revolves around you. And I think, you know, a few of us in Under Earth over the years have all had our turn being the sun and it's fun and then it's really tumultuous. And we, we've all kind of landed on a more balanced, uh, less stressful scenario. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Sometimes it feels like compromise. Sometimes it feels like we're finally working together. Uh, but overall, I mean, 17 years in, uh, we're still touring. We're still happy to do what we do. So we're excited. Would that uh, I don't have any secret sauce, but. Would that longevity have even been possible without the early lineup changes? Did you learn from those experiences? I mean, in 2003, I was literally 20 years old. So I think we all, the first four years of the band, even before I was in the band, there was two EPs, like everyone was 14, 15, 16, 17. And then we all kind of landed on what we were at 20. So I don't know if the member changes were necessary or just adult puberty, so to speak, was necessary. And we just happened to be in a band while we were going through who we are as adults and leaving our houses and living on our own for the first time and dealing with roommates and dealing with conflict. Um, I'm not going to say that member changes are necessary to have a successful band, but I think in our cases, the member changes that happened were necessary for us to be the band we are today for sure. And there's other bands that start at 16 and still are the same band. I mean, I think between the barrier and me, one of Biggie's bands is a great example. Uh, I don't know much about it, but I know that we played shows with them when I was literally 17 to my knowledge, at least well over half the band, if not all of the members, maybe aside from one, are still there. So every band has their own story. And, you know, you just have to be respectful. And it's like, I have three kids. I can't tour nine months a year anymore. So do you want to kick me out? Do we want to break up? Or do we want to find a compromise and maximize longevity with scarcity and making a smaller amount of time every year more special? And, you know, try to create the same opportunities by working less. And, and then you find by working less, the opportunities you do do are bigger because you're not around every three months, like some bands that are always in a van, always in a bus. So we found a happy medium. Um, and I think some dudes would love to tour more if we all decided we wanted to do that. And some dudes would love to tour less, but we've all hit a compromise and all six of us run as one unit, knowing that everyone else would have it their way a little bit different if it was a sole proprietorship, but it's not. Brian, your roster at Metal Blade, I mean, first of all, the, the roster that you've got, some of those bands have been on uh, working with you for decades. Uh, what has been your role or what has Metal Blade's role been in retaining that kind of longevity for, your, uh, for, for the bands on your roster? And then do you guys have any influence in the internal mechanics that we are talking about here, like with an example like Underworld? Yeah, I mean, I think Timothy makes a lot of great points about what it's like to be in a band and, and the decisions you have to make as, as a group to, to continue on to do this for a long period of time. And clearly, you know, you need to have everybody on the same page as much as seemingly possible for that to happen. And, you know, our role as, as the label is, you know, we just try to be as 
kind of making it a, a, as safe a home a, as we can for the band so that they feel comfortable and if they have any problems or issues, we can help them as best we can and just make it a, a fun a fun place to be around. I mean, look, we're all fans of, of the music. You know, everybody that's involved in this business is. So we're all kind of on the same page in that regards. And, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's, you know, we've got some bands that have started out with us that obviously have been there their whole career, you know, for 25 25, 30 years, I've been mean, doing this 38 years, it's kind of crazy to say that, but, uh, and I don't know there's a real secret to it, other than, like I said, I think we, we try to do things the right way, we try to have a really good relationship with the bands, I mean, most of these guys are, are very good personal friends of, of mine and, and other people at the label, and, and like I said, just, we, our job is to kind of have that foundation there where, where our job is to just make them comfortable and, and make them happy as much as we can. And, uh, and usually that pretty, pretty works pretty well. And then it, it's also the component of working with the other people around, the managers, the, 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 uh, the booking agents, the lawyers, all those people. Because, you know, my analogy is always, if you have a car has four wheels, if all four wheels are going in the same direction, that car is going to go pretty fast. If one of them isn't working, it's not going to go at all. So you know, we try to just work with everybody else in and around the band to make that side of things good for the band because that's also another thing. If, if they're happy with everything else, it makes them happier. So it's just a lot of, a lot of different ways to do it. And every band's different. You know, there's a different dy dynamic in every band. You know, I, I, like I said, I think Tim made some, some really great points about how what it is like to be in a band and what it, what it takes to work. And that kind of foundation, I think, is pretty similar to, to most bands for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Biggie, uh, is there something you look for in band personalities uh, or something you encourage your bands to do early in their career when you first start working with them uh, that keeps those lineups stable and, 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 and leads to longer careers? Uh, I try to get people to, as not fun as it is, start to look at things as a business as early as possible. And I know that's kind of the big bad B word in music, but at the end of the day, no matter how you look at it, every band's a business. Uh, and the more decisions you make based on whether it's good or not for the business of a band, I think in, long, in terms of longevity will help. And, and that's the less times you go to Europe and get your ass kicked and lose 40 grand, the less times you, you know, accept some bad deal, whatever it is, not everything has to be, you know, financially based. But I try to get people to start thinking financially because at some point, hopefully, you end up like Tim and Under Oath that are doing this with kids and with side businesses and wives and all those things aren't a tragedy if everything has been uh, smart economic decisions from the get-go instead of just like, well, we got to tour 10 months a year because that's what it takes to be a band. That's fine if you're 19, 20, 21, 25. I, I toured for 10 months a year for 10 years, so I get it. But as you get older and as kids come into play, as wives come into play, as bad backs come into play, whatever it is, the, the, the touring has to be condensed. You have to tour smarter, not harder. Uh, and whether it's, like Tim mentioned, just making sure the tours you do do are impactful and scarce and, and making sure everyone knows, like, they're coming around. They only come around once a year. I got to go. And you'll probably be surprised that – 30 big shows will probably net you more money than 90 okay shows after all the costs they're incurred but the managers and booking agents and business managers and crew and transportation everything gets their cut before the band does you'd be probably be surprised that you can get by a lot with less is more and uh, i think creating certain properties for bands has been helpful in that too you know whether for the band that i started with and still manage every time i die we've started like a uh, string of boat shows out on the East Coast, a big festival in Buffalo, things that like they'll literally play six shows and make more money than they, they do doing a whole work tour. And that's like, at this point, it's like, what? Like our whole year used to be based around work tour. And now if we get the work tour, what, you know, not the work tour, the equivalent thereof, it's just a bonus. But they can know that, especially since it's towards the end of the year, Christmas is paid for, like the end of the year is always going to be sorted because 
you know, 10 years ago, we started booking these smaller shows that grew bigger and bigger and bigger into more like festival events. And I think if more bands did that, started thinking along those lines, it doesn't have to be about live shows. It could be merch drops. It could be, you know, now God with the whole Twitch world and everything uh, online, like it's really limitless that the smart, the, the way you can be smarter and uh, make a lot of money without beating yourself into the ground physically and mentally, especially when you have a family. Awesome. Tim Bohr, we were talking about the road. Uh, the road seems like the perfect place to strain these personal relationships inside the band. Is there um, anything that your veteran acts uh, have done over the years that uh, you encourage the younger acts to try to adopt in order to uh, make those strains a little, a little less uh, uh, destructive? Uh, well, there's a million things, really, but before I even say that, you know, I know Brian and Tim and Biggie all pretty well. And uh, because of this thing we're all going through right now, it's been a while since I've talked with each of them or heard them speak. And these are great guys. They're brilliant people. Listening to them talk and explain their position um, in, in, in the role we all play, it's, it's awesome to hear these guys talk. and. Um, we're all really lucky to be able to talk with them today and learn some stuff from these guys. Um, but, you know, back to the question, um, you know, yeah, look, I, I think the burnout factor, that's a big deal. Um, Biggie mentioned something about and making sure this isn't a tragedy at the end. Um, that's a big deal. Um, being weary of vocalists and blowing out their, vo their voices when, when, these bands go on the road for the first five times. Some cases, maybe give or take longer than that. You can't put enough shows on the books for them to be happy. Uh, but it's not to their, it's not, it's not, it, it doesn't build to their longevity. That's for sure. And past whether or not their vocals can physically take it, you know, just the craziness of the road. Um, you know, it's it's taxing. It put miles on the body. It put, puts miles on the brain. It puts, you know, miles on relationships. Um, you know, I, I've often said, you know, you you put basically when you talk about the crew uh, involvement as well. You're t oh, poor we crew. Lost, we lost Eight, first month. Did I lose you? Damn, yeah, we you're, lost your first second. Back. You're, you're uh, talking about the crew. Well, okay. So that'll be an edit later. No big deal. <laughs> Whether you, you talk when you start talking about putting, you know, eight, ten, twelve people on the road together, you're basically putting craziness in a canister. A, a, a small traveling canister, whether it's a van or a bus, you know, and, and, and everyone's gotta try and figure out how to survive each other and everything that's going on in their own individual lives. And it's you know, it's not, it's no joke. And whether, you know, you're a band member and a partner in that relationship or you're a manager or a label or, or an agent, you know, we've all got to be mindful of the craziness that ensues in that scenario and try and be smart with our opportunities so that we don't suffocate, you know, this thing that hopefully has got the potential for longevity. And there's a lot of factors you know, to Tim's point, he said earlier, I think we were to some degree lucky. These guys are smart guys, but they're also lucky. Uh, and, and it takes a little of both, I think. And, and there's plenty of bands out there that are busy trying to be lucky. That's not a good formula. I think you got to try and be smart and lucky at the same time. And then maybe you got a shot. So is it about uh, being aware of what's going to happen, what could potentially happen out there interpersonally, that sort of thing? Uh, while out on the road that that is sort of you know as they say the cliche is that's half the battle knowing's half the battle i think that that, that that's asking a lot of 20 somethings that are out there but certainly that's part of my responsibility that's part of you know brian and tim's responsibility and as the bands grow up um that that becomes more and more of their responsibility i think you know, as tim said you 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 kind of grow into respecting and understanding that you don't always understand that from the get-go um you know but i think when we're building strategies 
around those special bands. And look, I think when, when you're an agent or you're a label or your manager or whoever in the, in the, you know, in, in the ecosystem that you're working with, you think all these bands are great, but you know, only a few of them in the end are going to actually have all the magic around them. And, and all the magic can be scalable on different levels. You know, every, every band, there's plenty of bands that can, that can last 30 years and not be the biggest bands, but still be really relevant and still be super important, you know, but you know, if we don't build into, if we're not careful from the get go with all the decision making, and it's not just about getting them on a great show. It's about all the other little nuances that don't, destroy the thing as long as you, as you go. It's all, it's just all part of the, the stew. Mike, did that uh, answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, when, when we've talked before, we talked about how important it is to have a charismatic front man, how important it is to have some sort of business savvy inside the band. Um, can you talk, and I, was, I should say, like, both of those are, are personified really, really well with Spencer and Ice Nine Kills, but can you talk about the importance of leadership in a band? Uh, does a band need that one person that within the band uh, a dynamic is the one who sort of, you know, steers the ship, as they say? Um. So it's such a good question and you know to piggyback off of Boris comment it is so nice to just hear everybody and their experience and I mean you know Timothy with Under Oath uh, you did such a good job of describing all of it it was really it really set a great foundation for this and so I mean I want my inclination is yes because the band that you know I currently manage that's doing well that's been around for 17 18 years there's only one remaining you know, original member. So he's always had to be a leader. And, you know, we saw, and ha having had a lot of experience, you know, developing artists, you know, they typically fall off. There's, there's a few different phases where I've watched artists, you know, kind of get out of the game. And it's, you know, if they skipped college, right, which many of them do, or even if they complete college, like Tim was saying, he started, you know, he got in the band when he was 20. Usually their parents give them about a three, four, maybe five year window, right? You can sleep in the basement, you can sleep on the couch till you're 25. And then the pressure for most families is what the hell are you doing with your life if you're not making money, right? So that's one thing that, you know, Biggie talks about the business. You have to be making money in order for almost any of this to work. You know, the second phase is usually 29, 30, and that's when all of their friends are getting married, starting to have kids. And again, it comes down to if you've got the money to support a family and you can attract somebody that's willing to stick around, you know, because you you guys can can have something great, then you can get past that. But those are the two key points where, in my experience, I've lost a lot of members from bands and a lot of bands. Um, but leadership, absolutely. You know, there's got to be somebody with like this crazy focus and crazy drive to keep it going. Um, I love the analogy with the with the car tires. I hadn't heard that one before, Brian, but that's fantastic. And you know, I'm trying to imagine under oath with six tires like cruising down the street. <laughs> but you have to have a driver. You that's do. They're look, yeah, you got to have a driver, and that's where you know, with, with young artists, you know, Biggie and I as managers often play that role. But we don't do it alone. You know, if we've got a great agent or a great record label or a great attorney, we absolutely lean on them to kind of back us up because in some senses we're almost like the cool parents and no matter what, no matter how cool your parents are, at some point you just, you know, you can't just take their word for it. You've got to go out and experience things on your own. But if you've got the cool uncle who's the record label and you got the cool cousin who's the booking agent and they're all telling you the same thing, right. As a way to keep this thing on track. Oftentimes I've found artists are more inclined to, to listen in that sense. Yeah, I definitely, Tim, Tim uh, Bohr will attest to this. It's pretty rare, but every once in a while, I'll be like, hey, agent, I need you to tell the band this directly because I, I love being the funnel, label, booking agent, lawyer, crew, and I'm in the middle, and then I go down to the band, you know? That's great, but every once in a while, it's just like they hear me on everything. They hear me about a merch design, about the payment, about whatever. It's like you're going to hear this directly from the agent or directly from Slagle because then it's like, I'm almost like the cool mom and I need the cool dad to come in 
and be like, yeah, this is what's up. And then I use that card so seldomly that if I really need to like drive a point home, it's just kind of hit, hitting a lot of traction. They'll just be like, well, I mean, Slagle said it's shit. You know, he's got, you know what I mean? You talk about, talk about being lucky also, as Boris said, it's like Slagle seems to get lucky a lot. So does Boar, you know what I mean? So if I need to pull the card, I pull the card, but absolutely that team mentality and, and you're kind of in their face so much about everything that every once in a while, like whether they need to experience that on their own or you get to call in, you know, dad and get bore, you know, who looks like a psychopath right now, usually much more handsome. Everyone watching Tim Bohr, usually much more handsome than this. <laughs> sometimes you to David Letterman. Uh, sad. <laughs> well, Peggy, does that, I mean, sort of building on that idea of leadership, is there that four musketeers uh, mentality? Is that, you know, all for one, one for all, is that really effective in a band environment or is that naive? Uh, I mean, every band's so different and I, I don't know if it's the, like the environment I set up or I just happen to get to them, but I'm in all democracies, you know, bass player dude that no one really knows is just as important as singer dude in most, in most of my scenarios. Um, and it's, it's, everything's an ebb and flow. Like some things at some time, like, this is my point man and then it kind of phased out and now this is my point man and now these two guys want to be on it for merch only and these guys only want to talk money and only talk to me about recording so it's just an ebb and flow and generally and i think tim from the band's point of view will probably agree that like the whole group has to be at least somewhat on the same page if it's some weird scenario where it's like we're six members of under oath and we put it to a vote and it's four to two and we win, these four win, these two are pissed. Like there's only, for a t-shirt design, yeah, maybe. To discuss like doing a European festival run for six weeks, like you have two or one third of your machine pissed, it's not good. So yeah, I, yeah go ahead, Timmy. Oh no, yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off with that. You were done, but I, I agree with you. And you're saying a lot of good points. It's like, you know, even as a manager, like, you know, like Biggie said, there's label, there's lawyer, there's agent, there's all these people, there's publishing companies. And then he's this, you know, uh, bottleneck, so to speak, that can filter everything and go, you can't talk to this dude in the band like this, but I'll take that information and talk to him in his love language, so to speak. I know how to explain this directly, but also effectively. Um, and then if you only have one point person in a band, you have all this to a manager, and then you have another gasket, and it's just the one guy in the band. And then you have these five other guys down here that aren't communicating, aren't getting communication funneled to them. And as long as like boss guy, lead singer or whatever signs off, it's done and it's executed. And that's actually not how Under Oath works. Like we're like Biggie's bands, like a democracy. And there are some people that weigh in heavier on their expertise. Like if it's financial, our guitar player, James, is a legal accountant. So, I mean, he's the guy that we go to for like what should we do about this budget if we have a question from a business manager if it's creative like there's three of us that are the creatives and you know if it's seven weeks in a europe tour to break even or lose money but we have one good slot in a festival and it's all for this one look that's all six and it's not a five to one vote like sorry bud we're dragging you to europe for two months because we got a headlining slot on a B stage, but we're playing with Limp Biscuit somewhere in Sweden and the rest of it's a complete disaster. There has to be levels. And I think I would argue personally, like for longevity's sake, you know, we have a lot of brilliant people here in different fields. Like the longer you're with a person, like I think the longer Biggie's with Etid, the longer Etid will succeed. The longer Tim Borer's booking Clutch, the longer Clutch will succeed. And so like, it's this, thing where once you have your team outside of your band they can then manage things like label changes and agent changes or publishing deal changes because they're almost fused to you and so i think it's really important to not only pick your band members correctly and then know when you didn't and do what you can to either remedy that or pivot but then also pick your admin team very very carefully because ideally they should be married to you for the life of your band. And, you know, we've only had two labels in our lives. We've had three agents in 20 years, which is, you know, probably more than most bands. We've had one manager. So by and large, we, we have a long streak of, of loyalty that lasts half a decade, at least most times our whole career, if it makes sense, we've had the same lawyer. So it's like, 
now those people know how we operate and it just saves time and money and it's efficient. And it's like, I know Tim, he'll never go for that. I'm not going to call a five hour, five hour band meeting over something that I know is not even in his wheelhouse because that's his kid's birthday and he never misses his kid's birthday. Those types of things actually matter long term. And being heard as a band member from people like you guys, the manager, the agent, the label, that makes me go, if they're bringing something, it's already filtered through our preference checklist. And these are opportunities that make sense within the framework in which we operate currently. Not 10 years ago, not 20 years ago, not this is what my five other bands that are making more money than you do, so you should do this. It's a custom tailored thing to every single member's needs. And then as a band, we decide where we bend and where certain people have to take a hard stance. And then it's manager's job and label's job and agent's job to work within the ecosystem that we create so that we can always do this year over year. Rather than having five great years and kill ourselves, let's make millions of dollars over decades rather than having one great million dollar year and scrunch three good years into one because we were on the grind and then burnt out. And I think that's really important for longevity. By the way, these are really, really great points that, that these guys are making as well. Uh, because you, a couple of things, first of all, is, is you do need to have the team around you. And, and the, the more the team's around, I think the better it is. You know, we, all of our bands that we've had for, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, it's same thing, same manager, same label, same lawyer, for the most part there. And that breeds a lot of success because everybody knows how everybody works. Also, I think it's really important to know that everybody in the band has to be on board as well because – like Biggie said, like you don't want to have four guys say, we're going to Europe. The other two are like, oh, we don't want to go. And that's terrible. But but I, I will say one other weird thing about that is that we have a couple of bands that we've had for a very, 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 very long time who are run by either one or two guys in that band, and they make all the decisions. And luckily enough, the other three guys go along with them. Uh, I don't know that that's the healthiest way to do it, but these bands have been pretty successful doing it. But ultimately, everybody does get on the same page. I, I do agree with what Tim and, and Biggie say is that, you know, you, you want to have all five guys on the same page and, and really be into it because that's or six guys or however many there are uh, that makes it work. And one other point I want to make, too, that I think kind of was intimated there, I think this is really, really important, is that the label – the manager, the agents, the lawyers, we all work for the bands. I think a lot of times bands think that they work for us, especially label people. They work for us like, no, 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 we work for you. Like we're here for you. The band is, is the driving force here. We're, we're basically your employees, not the other way around. And I don't think a lot of people re really understand that. And that's, I think, a, a super important point. That, that and I say that to bands a lot and they go, really? I go, yeah, we're working for you. It's not the, not the other way around. I know it's a weird, like, it's pretty rare that you pay somebody to tell you what to do. So <laughs> it becomes that weird thing where like, well, he tells us what to do, but then we pay him. And it's just like, yeah, I'm straight. I mean, not kind of like I a hundred percent work for bands. Like that's it. There's no two ways about it. If they fire me, that's it. I don't have a, like, it can't, I mean, I can quit or whatever, but there it's a, it's a weird point for, I think most people to wrap their heads around when you really think about it again, in terms of like that business analogy, like they're the boss. And I might be like CFO or whatever, whatever fancy term, but like they 100% call all the shots and I'm here to guide them with the help of my team of labels, booking agents, you know, helpful band members, lawyers, everything else. But it is a, a funny point that I think a lot of bands forget and they're just like, oh, our manager made us do this thing. It's like, don't do it then. Like, what are you talking about? You know? Yeah. And there's also the idea of, you know, a lot of bands want a manager that's literally just an executive assistant. Like I want merch designs, send an email. Okay. We're going to get merch designs. And I think there's like an access point where it goes from like, whatever I want this person does. And I pay them for a service to make my load lighter to where their relationships and their experience push back and like, you know, get to a spot where our manager, I, I like, to think that we pay our manager and our agent this much money all of the time to see white space and to see opportunities that we don't and then to also push when they're like i understand you don't want to do this but i'm seeing it and you're not seeing it and you have to take a closer look and like biggie said like if we don't want to do anything in under oath it doesn't matter if the label or the manager or the agent or the lawyer is like guys 
you have to do it. It's like, no, we actually don't. But there's also that long-term trust where instead of just being a do boy and a facilitator for all of my vision as an artist, I want you to be a facilitator for what we need that we can't do, but also push back on us when you see holes in a ship because we're lost in our own sauce, as well as seeing new opportunities and going, this doesn't make sense, but I need, to, I need you to give me at least a week and a half of trial run so that you can see what I see and then let's decide. And a manager that can intellectually and very carefully and emotionally, sensitively, like, push a band and not demand things, but just go, I just need you to, I need to lead you to the water. And, and if you don't want to drink then that's fine, but you're not even seeing what I'm seeing. And I think that's worth the money. That's like, we would have never been on MTV if our manager didn't tell us, you have to go to dinner on your day off and do this and that. And it's like, we didn't want to do it, but he said, no, you have to go. You don't have to sign anything, but at least take the meeting. And then all of a sudden this whole new revenue stream or new opportunity comes out. And I think with labels, and agents and managers, like your jobs are, yes, potentially to serve us or, or help us and you work for us, quote unquote, but we, we sign to you or we're managed by you or booked by you because we trust what you know that we don't and we wanna hear back from you as well. And as long as a band's not taking a hard stance on I'm the boss, I'm the singer, I'm the whatever, and a manager's not going, I manage Nine Inch Nails 25 years ago so you do everything I say, like those are the polar, you know, extremes, but the real rub where the magic happens is like that kinetic energy right in between where it's like, I am the boss and yeah, you're paying me six figures a year to tell you when you're being an idiot. And then you respect that. And that's like a, a beautiful collaboration of like, we're all going the same way. We just see different opportunities in white space because we all live different lives. You're on one coast. I'm on another. You're in London. I'm in New York. It doesn't matter that you don't see it, but you have to at least allow the trust that we have to let you try it. And then let's decide. Tim, I think that's really I, important. Before I move on from you, you've opened up like so many cans of worms. I got, you can't yeah, see it. Yeah, sorry, I might have gotten off topic. I, I know, no, all, every can is great. Every worm is good. Um, but first of all, like you, uh, you mentioned love languages earlier, and that was like a sheet worth of questions that I have, but I never believed that anybody on this call would be interested in that book. But can you talk <laughs> about like, how to communicate both inside the band and with the team that you've surrounded yourself with in order to preserve longevity? Uh, I mean, I, I think like Biggie said, with like how bands work on a management side, it's like every band's different, every band member's different, and even every band member's different every year based on stresses. Um, so it's a revolving thing. So if you think you've nailed the target, don't like close the book and put it on the shelf. Like that story will perpetually write itself for the rest of your lives as band members. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, there's people in our band that I can be direct with. There's people in our band that I can be really crass with. Like, yo, you, you fucked up last night. And someone goes, yeah, you're right. And someone goes, you were, you were a pile of whatever last night. I'm like, totally. And then there's someone else that you have to be very delicate and it's a it's 10 10 ounces of sugar and one ounce of salt and you, it's a longer process but if you go in all salt and direct based on how your personality perceives information you just damage and push them away so it's like everyone's like that and our manager has learned all of us as well so when i see a text personally i know what he's saying but i see how he's packaging it because he has to wrap the package to all six of us and he's pinpointing all of our communication skills or yeah. our lack of communication skills and like that I, I i think that's a hand off to biggie because i mean i know half the bands he manages and they're all different and and i think he could speak to that instead of me from the band side projecting what i think managers deal with but it's i can't they're they're godsends it's insane it's so tough <laughs> we are doing the lord's work so thank you uh, <laughs> i do think uh, he nailed a lot of things on the head there and, and a lot of what it sounds like a lot like man How do you know like who's the salty one? Who's the sweet one? It's like it's just time and that's as we're talking about longevity You learn exactly who needs what and how to how to wrap things and sometimes it takes a side text like preface Like I'm gonna say this thing that I know you probably don't like but this is my thoughts behind it Before I just throw it to the group in an email or a text and it explodes, you know, just learning that 
sometimes sneaky navigation through things is it's all just from time and you know who's who and like i said it evolves sometimes it's this guy and sometimes now it's this guy it changes yeah. based on a lot of stuff um but uh i just think when the band gets older it's just very interesting how you have to word things and how you have to preface things and how like i use the um what was it? I think Brad Pitt or no, 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 George Clooney used to say like one for me, one for them, you know, like I'll do like this whack love story and then I'll do something like cool and artsy, whatever that was his thing. And I use that with my bands all the time. It's like, Hey, one for you, one for them. If, if it's something they don't like, you know, try to like explain the balance of things when necessary. And some bands don't need that. Some bands it's, it's rare, but some bands just like, yes, sir. No, sir. Tell me where to be. I trust you. I don't want to think about it. Tell me where to be and when. And, on one hand, it's like, dude, this is so great. And on the other hand, it's like, well, shit, now, like, it's all on me. <laughs> like, but if the merch spread shows up and it's terrible, I can't even blame someone else secretly, you know what I mean? Um, but <laughs> the vast majority, you know, it's a lot of group effort and learning how to navigate, just like any relationship, you know? I don't know who's married or not. You know exactly when and when not to say certain things. Same thing with the band member, except there's five of them. And there's a lot, there's sometimes six. Poor Randy has to deal with six of these idiots. <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, it's, it's all time. And I think going back to the whole longevity thing, it just gets easier with time. You know, at first it might just be this, I, it's always right when you get a band and it seems like, why did I get another band? It's just this constant influx of questions and I've got to do and switch this and this is messed up. But then it all chills out and then it gets back to normalcy where like most of the time, especially with older bands, they're not thinking about the band all day, every day, like they used to, you know, they don't want to. God, like I, at one point I know under oath was Tim's everything, living, breathing, everything. And now it's up there as a high priority, but I know it's not, you know, the only thing anymore. Um, and that just changes with time. And so the, the whole whole deal with longevity, I think it, it's, it's, you know, like Bruce Lee, just being like water. Sometimes we're, you know, sometimes we're hard and crushing. Other times we're just flowing through. It depends on where you are. The band is a career, not even like their whole career. Like right now as under oath is just this river. It's, it's just, it could be, based on the week of their album drop or the months of their album drop. Like it's, so they come and go and, and, you know, Bob and Weave and Evan and Flo, you know, and that's, I think the smart bands and smart uh, managers know when to do that. Like if I was just injecting myself all day, every day, like bands would probably be like, dude, relax. Like the pandemic, you can't do anything. How many merch designs do you want to get up, get up right now? You know? So it's really and, every, and Yeah. Sorry. And every band is different too. You know, some like, like Tim said, every band member is different. Every band you deal with is different too. And we find, you know, some bands you approach a certain way. Some bands you approach a different way. You know, we have bands that don't have managers. We also have bands that didn't have managers for many, many, many years. And we finally <laughs> convinced them to get managers. It's it just, it's so different. And the one thing I've learned in, in doing this for so long is just so many different personalities and different ways you have to deal with people and, and like, like Tim said, you know, some you deal with sugar, some you deal with the other way. It's, it's reading psychology books. It's very helpful to for dealing with all this stuff. But yeah, every, everything's different. But I think the one commonality, though, that bands who have a lot of longevity have is they're they're all, in addition to obviously being incredible musicians, they're all very smart. Definitely. Excellent. Well, Tim Bohr, uh, we've talked about leadership and we talk about roles. And uh, I guess my question is, um, it, it seems like uh, a band that has those hired guns on the, ro uh, on the road, that could be a real opportunity because at least the, the, the people who are in those hired guns roles, that role is very clearly defined. There's a real limit as to what they are allowed to influence for the rest of the band dynamic. Uh, do you have any sort of thoughts on the advantages for an artist taking higher guns out on the road for those reasons? I, I really think that there's too many, there's too many variables to answer that definitively. You know, um, you know, look, you know, we got, we got two very different situations on this call between Mike with Ice Nine Kills and, and, and Tim with, with Under Oath, both highly successful bands, both bands proving to have a lot of longevity, and I think it has a lot of lot to do with the personality makeup of, you know, of, of certain members of the of the of the band. I think it has a lot to do with 
who's re- driving the creative content. You know, t- Tim Tim mentioned it. You know, with Under Oath, there's there's three creative forces in that band. You know, that that band's probably not the same band. It might be an equally successful different band, but they're probably not the same band if there's just one. You know, create a force in that band. On the other hand, you know, Mike's got Ice Nine Kills, and 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 there's one main creative force there. But I don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer that question specifically because I, I do think there's just a lot of variables there. But I, you know, there's there's this is kind of one of those situations where there's no wrong answer. Um, you know, and I I think look if you, if you've got create if you've got You've got hired guns in the band, and they're supporting the end game the right way. Then, you know, no shame in that game. You know, there's no, um, you know, if that if that doesn't interrupt the process of trying to get from A to Z, uh, and doing it in a non-stressful or a less stressful kind of way to to meet those goals, there's there's no there's no there's no wrong answer there. I don't think. Cool. Thanks. Mike, uh, uh, it, you know, communication is one thing and being skilled communicator, but uh, what about band agreements, especially like, you know, when you talk about where people everywhere in all walks of life had trouble communicating in all relationships, it usually comes down to money. Are there band agreements that you encourage your clients or you have in the past to have with each other in, in, uh, in terms of money and how money is going to be split? Yeah, amongst other things. I mean, some of the stuff Tim is talking about, uh, Tim from Under Oath, it's like even the decision-making process can go into a band agreement. Uh, It doesn't have to, however. Yeah, I think, um, you know, typically most bands, I presume, start off as friends and they're doing it for fun. Maybe they've got some aspirations, but really they've got to go out and see if there's any traction in any capacity. They've got to do it. They've got to create the couple EPs. They've got to lose a member. They've got to do any of that before they need to really worry about whether or not somebody's going to run off with, you know, the 10 speed bicycle that the singer has, you know, when it all falls out, there's got to be something to agree on. And so my experience has been, however, once you've got to that point and as Tim Bohr just said, there's no definitive point that I can tell you other than when you're starting to get to, uh, yeah, you're starting to get to a place where the asset, whether it's the name, the logo, uh, you know, and the underlying music and the splits that come with it and the money generated from it, once it's worth something, right? Then, yeah, there should probably be some form of agreement that, you know, navigates what happens when somebody leaves. You know, how is it that somebody leaves? Um, There's a lot that goes into those, but I would recommend them as opposed to not recommending them. Absolutely. Tim McTague, uh, were there any best practices that you're glad that you were introduced to you and Under Oath early in your career when it comes to what we're talking about, the business side, uh, the money, the, uh, the, 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 the assets of the band? Yeah, I mean, for us, like, we don't have a contract with our lawyer. We don't have a contract with our manager. We don't have a contract with our agent. And we have actually no internal agreement as a band. Uh, The only thing that we actually have legal contracts for are obviously publishing and record labels because we can't produce music and do that without those contracts or or a merch deal or something like that. Um, We've always operated on good faith. Uh, And that was obviously put to the test when we had our hiatus and we had, you know, one of our key members, Aaron, our drummer, left in 2009, came back in 16 when we uh, kind of went on hiatus and came back. And, you know, the way we dealt with that without going super far into everyone's business was like, if you're here, you're here. And if you're gone, you're gone. And the records you played on, like we get royalty checks were good, but it's not like, yo, I left in December. But then after the show I played with you on December 31st, you got that big, you know, ETID festival show without, without my work, you wouldn't have gotten those opportunities. I want residuals from that. Like we just don't play that game. And so like when Daniel, our friend came into the band, even that wasn't a hired gun scenario. It's like, dude, you come in, you know, let's do a tour together. If you want to stay in the band, like you're just, you're just one six. I don't think that that's actually 
correct business wise. I'm sure like everyone else on this panel is literally like, oh my God, like these freaking rednecks don't even know how to run a business, you know? Um, but I think I, for us, that's worked. But if I was a natural manager or someone consulting, which I, this call is, I would say you should have exit agreements because, you know, what happens when I, I see this a lot with bands, like bands go off tour, bands write songs together. This even happens in our band, but we just don't care. But then like you see lead singer X or Y doing full record that we all wrote acoustic for profit solo, like on a solo tour. And it's like, how does that work? Like, is that something that's legal? Should that be cleared? Should we share in that revenue? Uh, what does the merch look like? Are you using record assets? There's so many sticky things that if you don't trust the people you're with, it can go really sour really quick. And for us, like we allow everyone rope and we also have everyone's support on like, yo, this is a little close. Let's, let's try to massage this to where we're not chopping you at the knees, but you're not abusing our brand for personal gain. And I think a lot of bands do that. And like, you know, Anthony Green does that. And, you know, Anthony from Bayside and, you know, Adam from TBS, like ev all, all of the super creatives, especially the front men can have side streams of revenue with also my work as the guitar player that wrote that riff that you're now playing without me there. You're on tour without me there. And so that, if you let that get to you, that can be a rub. And I think it does rub a lot of people and it rubs people not because they're selfish, it's because I think if you look at it that way, it, that's actually not that cool. Oh, so it, there's gotta be some sort of clearance. Like, yo, I'm trying to do this, is everyone okay with it? Maybe it's like, yo, I'll cut you guys in, or if anyone wants to come on the tour. I don't know, Biggie probably has more, uh, you know, uh, insight into multiple bands with multiple, you know, uh, varying famous personalities monetizing individually based on the band's brand. But I mean, for me, it's like, we don't really have any of that. And it's like, you know, the big problem is like, you sign a merch deal, it's a two year merch deal. This guy quits because he wants to go to law school three months in, but there's this recoup, but you have the advance. So now what do we do? Do you give me your money back so that we can put it back towards the advance? Do you stay in the band until the advance is you know, paid off? And we don't really do a lot of that big business where we get really deep in debt and underwater, uh, ideally. Um, so we've never really had that rub. And again, we've had the same lineup since 2003, aside from the few years when Aaron left and Daniel came in. So we're all in the wins and the losses long-term. Uh, but it would be really sticky if someone just decided today to quit. And it's like, but we have some debt that we have to pay back. Like the record advance, you're on the record contract. Like how, how do we even get you off of that? And so for us, that would be a bit chaotic if someone just went bananas uh, because we actually don't have any legal uh, structure there. And I know Tim, that's not right, but can, that's how can we Can I it. ask you, Tim, uh, about just, you, you had said earlier that you know, there's three of you that are the, the, the creative force in the band and you've got songwriting credits that do have revenue that's attached to that song, those songwriting credits. How do you guys navigate that side of thing, the, the publishing side and, 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 and the work that goes into being creative. And do you allow those who aren't putting that work in to uh, enjoy the benefits of it? Yeah. So aside from our last record, Erase Me, every record that we've ever written has been like a dollar on tour. We're all here. We were all in the studio. You know, if XYZ dude didn't write any songs and just played along or didn't even play at all, but he was there. It was equally split. Uh, again, I don't necessarily recommend that, but for me being in a band with friends, like Mallory said, now we have something to agree or disagree about. Um, and now we need an agreement. Uh, by the time we got there, we were so happy that we all got there that we're all like, why would I want to start bringing lawyers in to tell my friend, like, I happen to be more skilled than you, or I happen to be a vocalist, you know? And then, and, and when you start carving those things out after a precedent has been set of we're one family, what you run the risk of is people not caring about the art. And I think Under Oath has had the longevity we have because we've always put music first. But if someone says, unless you write it, you don't eat it. Then all of a sudden I'm like, well then I want to start singing then. I want my lyrics on there because that counts towards publishing and I want to get my cut and it's mine and it's yours and no, what about this? But I told you to change it. So I want to cut of that. Like it gets so convoluted in my personal opinion 
that it's not even worth it when the record is just a selfish endeavor of trying to shove your shitty riffs and ideas on a record so that you can take a cut. Well, you know what's better great. is yeah. having a great record that sells half a million copies and going, yeah, man's over here kind of balled out and he didn't do a lot of work. But like extrapolate that over 20 years and it's like I wouldn't have anything that I have if we ran our business like a business in, in that moment in 2003, 2004, personally. Right. And I think if you, if you really dive into that, the, the, the issue, I've got very similar situations as Tim where all my bands for the vast majority, there are five pieces. So it's easier math for all of us, but 20% across the board for every member. And at, you know, you get to LP six and seven, it's just like, fuck, man, like I'm home, I'm writing these albums, I'm writing these songs yep. day in and day out and day in. And this guy doesn't, it's not like he's an asshole. He's just not writing the record, but is it worth going from 2020, 2020, 2020 to 20, 20, 25, 35, that 15% that goes from bassist to singer, bassist to guitarist, whatever, is changing no one's life. I promise, no matter what everyone thinks about publishing, there aren't gonna be any, you know. Million dollar deals flying around. Yeah. Songs in a fucking Nissan commercial. So it's just like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And if you ever lose that member and have to reteach songs and reroute, you know, deal with a leaving member agreement if they, if they have one, whatever, it's just not worth it in the end, most of the time. Obviously, it's hard to speak in absolutes, but especially in the underground world that most of us live in with hardcore metal bands, it's like, 20% of something versus 30%. It's just not worth ruffling the feather and then having that potentially slow but definite burn start that could blow up something that does matter and build up spite that the guy just says, well, I don't want to do this tour or this one-off or whatever it is. That's like the less fun thing for that person at that time. It's just, it's so hard to deal with five artists in a general, in a general scenario as is to start it with like a, whether it's unintentional or not, but, archaic way that the business is ran of like percentages and all that you're essentially telling them i'm worth more than you in this business which is fucking true probably but it just creates a, a very tough scenario when you're all living in a tin can you know six seven months a year it's hard to have that not build up into spite well biggie yeah. i would imagine like with oh, you sorry, real, real, oh, sorry, yeah, 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 real quick i may have to pop off for a phone call but uh hopefully we'll be quick i'll pop back on so sorry about that I know it sounds terrible. A real busy guy, Brian Slagle. <laughs> Today's like the busiest day. Normally it hasn't been that bad. I know, everyone's like, everyone took yeah, Monday day weekends, yeah. yeah. I got to do all the work. <laughs> Biggie, real quick, like, I mean, with the heavy music genres, while, you know, no one's expecting, you know, a, a big hit song on the radio to make an impact financially in people's lives, but there's a lot of money to be had in instrument sponsorships and the, the, you know, the different like uh, sounds and stuff that you can sell online. And, sure. and, you know, and now you've got a drummer who's got a revenue stream, a guitarist who's got a revenue stream, maybe a bassist for the revenue stream, you know, the vocalist has got to be left out <laughs> out of that. Right. And okay. that actually is significant. So is there an argument to be made in sharing those revenues as well? Yeah, I mean, of course there's an argument. It all depends on each band. Like, if that's a real revenue stream, talk about it. If it's a thousand bucks a year, I mean, do you think Singer Dude needs 200 bucks? If so, get a different, wrong business. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, you know, it's probably incremental in the grand scheme of things. And if you're a cool band, like, take care of the singer another way. You know, if, when it, when it does every once in a while, when like, you'll watch, like, if a band does split everything up into fifths and like, everybody gets new road cases like that's expensive and the singer's like i guess i'll get a new shorter 58 mic that's sick it's just it's a give and take you know maybe that's a, the singer doesn't have to load in you know what i mean but i think when you start really breaking it down that small you're losing sight of the big picture like the big picture should not be the tone thing that you did and and, and if they did that if guitars did one of these like cool new programs out there it's work they have to do stuff to do it and understand you, you might be borrowing assets but at that point I feel like a band like Under Oath would be able to negotiate something where it's like, hey, I'm doing this thing. Everybody cool with this? You know, similarly to if someone's an artist, if, if someone Under Oath's an artist, 
it would be weird to tell them like, well, stay away from all under oath art. Don't use my lyrics in any of your art because whatever. It's like, yeah. Let me ask a real that. quick question regarding that. Cause I, what's happening now is you're seeing a lot of, especially during the pandemic, you're seeing a lot of uh, individual artists, uh, guys and bands going on, for example, Twitch. And, you know, we've got a couple guys going on there and some guys making some serious money on that. Yeah. So as a manager and a guy in a band, let's say guitar player A goes on Twitch and he's making 10, 15 grand a month on that and clearly he's you know he's doing whatever he's doing and that's related to the band how does that work how do you guys feel on your end about where that money should go yeah, yeah. that's tough yeah. i mean we're actually doing that right now i mean uh jordan from every time i die one of biggie's bands was on under us twitch channel we do a twitch every wednesday night let me know where eight. i collect the payment on that I just <laughs> yeah yeah so like the only reason why people came is because biggie's band so he's gonna get like five percent revenue of the thirty-eight dollars we made, uh, <laughs> no, but we're, we're breaking down the record, right? And you know, at first it was like, well, you know, I have this idea of like I want to go in the studio with Josh Scoggin and write like a one-day song, and it'd be fun. And it's like, should that be on my personal channel or my personal Facebook Live or Instagram Live, or should we try to funnel that to the band? And I think there's two arguments, right? Like Aaron, our drummer has a web shop that's only his; all the money goes to him, and it's like, have you know, it doesn't say this, but in reality, it's have Aaron from Under Oath play on your record for X amount of hundreds of dollars. And if a thousand bands go, dude, play on my song, there's an argument to say the only reason why those people want you on their song is because you play with us and you're in our band and our band actually made that money, not you. Um, the other side is going down to Biggie's thing. Like, is that what we're gonna talk about? Like, we have, all this history and now we're mad about like your drum lessons or the work you do sidebar with the status you have because of who we are as a unit um i just don't think i don't think that's relevant and i feel like you know there's singers doing cameo and if the bass player goes to do cameo guess what nobody's gonna buy it but the only reason why the singer's big is because the bass player and the drummer locked in and wrote the record so now they have publishing more and this guy's cameo or is it all split like Every situation is so unique. I mean, for Under Oath specifically, like a lot of our dudes have side stuff that is only because of being an Under Oath. And honestly, all of us do. And so to penalize people's next, next, next opportunities uh, because of the stepping stone that was built by all six of us, at that point, we're saying, you know, I want a piece of everything you do because Aaron only got in Paramore when he quit Under Oath because of Under Oath. So I want his Paramore money now, right? Like that that cycle can go on forever. And and it's like at, cer at a certain point, you just have to go, what do we want to do? And even talking to Grant, our bass player, who's actually the head of our Twitch stuff, he's the only one that's actually actively pursuing Twitch and we just show up because we don't know anything about it. And at a certain point, we're like, if the thing doesn't actually do what we want it to do, like, how do we just allow you to have that? Because that's your passion, you know? And like, you know, Under Oath will post about King State, my coffee and beer bar in Tampa. And like, we all help each other and we all are aware that we're using our platform sometimes for, for personal side shoots. But as long as we're all communicating about it and someone doesn't wake up with me you know, Tim's taking over Under Us Instagram Live and I'm just pumping my personal web store and my personal this and selling guitar lessons like directly and pocketing all the money. Like that's when shady stuff happens. But like, I think as long as everyone's up front and everyone's aware and everyone respects what everyone's doing, like it's the band's decision to get behind it or just allow it to happen in the background or respectfully have a conversation about modifying or stopping it if it's way too infringement, you know? And so it's like, I'm with you. Though. My suggestion, like, my suggestion has always been to just take a vig off the top and kick it back into the band as a whole. It's sometimes fallen on deaf ears and sometimes it's welcomed. Um, but that has always appeared to me to be like the really easy solution. And that way nobody, I think I that's mean, fully fair. Yeah. And I think you guys are such a unique case and I love that you, you're, you're willing to share all the stuff that you're sharing Tim. but it, it, and I'm glad it works for you guys. And I think one of the reasons, again, it, so much of this does go back to money. You guys are all eating a full pizza every night. I mean, not literally, but when you've got bands fighting over a piece of pizza, this argument becomes much more challenging when all of a sudden one guitar sure. player is e eating his own pizza or the singer is the only guy that's starving. Um, Cause I've been in those situations. 
but um so i figure you kick a little bit back in and that that sometimes i, I do helps. find that the, the bigger the band is the less issues they have like that it's, it's generally the smaller bands are the ones that fight over all this little stuff that makes no sense and the bigger bands just like yeah whatever it's all good well, Brian, with, with, you know, it's funny because like, we talk about the idea of these bands as if they're punching a clock and getting an hourly rate. Like every year, every month is very different from the last one. And, uh, you know, we've been talking about a lot of different revenue streams that didn't even exist for a lot of these uh, artists just months ago, years ago. So how are the best of your clients able to navigate they're uh, sort of like the, 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 the times when the revenue isn't what they were expected or when uh, all of a sudden now there's kids involved and now the expenses are bigger than what they were before. How do they navigate all that? I think, well, every, obviously, like we said, every band's a different story. But what we, what we try to do is, you know, you try to plan everybody's lives out more or less two or three years in advance. Because you know, you know, when you go through cycles of things, you know, okay, here's our, our next three year cycle where we're going to tour this amount, we're going to make this record at this point, we're going to do this and this. So you have a pretty decent understanding of, of what's going to happen. And obviously, you know, everybody chimes in about, you know, what they think that, you know, the tour is going to make and what the band's going to make on this and that. And obviously, you know, we try to be very, I mean, we don't try, we are very transparent in, in the amount of money that comes in uh, for all these different things. Because, you know, now there's actually real revenue coming in. We actually are giving bands, you know, six figure checks again, which didn't happen for a long period of time. So it, it's a good thing to have. And, and we, you know, we definitely tell everybody what, what's happening. And, you know, our level is we, we work with the bands and kind of give them a bit of an indication of what's coming in on our level as much as we can. Um, but you just have to plan everything out. And then, you know, every time, uh, every cycle is going to be different. Like, yeah, you'll have a guitar player like, hey, I'm having a kid. So I can't tour from this time to this time. And I'm going to need a little bit more money. So you know, you're always trying to figure out ways to, to make the band money. And our job, I think, more than anything else, is I look at us as like brand managers. We try to, you know, we have a huge IT team. We have social media. We do all these things. And our job is to, is to take all of our people and build the brand, which sounds super corporate and lame, but build the brand of the band as big as possible. And my attitude is like, look, is they selling a ton of merchandise or if they're selling huge amounts of concert tickets? You know, we don't necessarily make money from that. That's fine. But if we build the brand up big enough, then eventually we'll get our little, little piece of it. And, you know, record labels now play probably a more insignificant role now than, you know, 25 years ago when every penny that the band made came from record company. And I kind of prefer the way it is now where there's different revenue streams for bands and we're, you know, hopefully 25 to 30% of that. And then they're making a lot of money elsewhere. We try to make, try to make the band make as much money as possible because the more money the bands make, the happier they are, the longer they're going to be around, the more they're going to be creative and making good music. So that's kind of sort of what we're trying to do. And Brian, like, uh, I, I mean, I think you're underselling uh, how, <laughs> how uh, significant your label is to your artist here even today. Um, so, like, how do you balance for yourself as a business owner your need to have a calendar, record cycles that fall into certain times versus the artist who might be like, look, man, we only got two months of runway. We need to get this next album out. You know, how do you balance that? Well, I mean, look, we, we, we tried for years to try to make it all work where, you know, we have one major album every two, two months, but artists are artists. And, and sometimes it comes up where we'll have three artists that are going to put out their record, big artists that are going to put out their record at the same time. But we'll be very honest and say, look, look, we can't really put out three big albums at the same time, but we can maneuver, maneuver it this way and maybe touring for one artist makes more sense for them to do it a, a little bit different than the other one. So we, we, we try to make it work for everybody. And I think, you know, our job again is to, is to make sure that they're happy and comfortable with our decisions. And certainly every decision we make, we talk to the managers and the agents and the bands and, you know, Tim and Biggie can certainly, you know, we work with them enough over the years can, can, can even talk more about that, about, Hey, I want to put a record out this time. Well, it's not so good for me, but maybe we, cause we have this other thing, maybe we can do it around here. It's just, but we all work together and, and make it work. And, you know, generally 90, 
95% of the time, everybody's on the same page and totally workable with, with all the solutions. And it's, it's pretty rare that we've had a, a time when we're like, oh my God, you know, there's, there's too many things all at once and then nothing else. But that happens sometimes too. And, and as a label, so for example, let's say we have six big records coming out in a, in a four month period, uh, which is a lot. But then we don't have any major records for a four month period after that. So what we try to do is we have a gigantic catalog, which is the, the uh, luckiness of us being around for 38 years. And we'll just, you know, try to do a, lot, a bunch of stuff with the catalog, reissues, vinyl, which also is good to help with, you know, the bands that, that maybe aren't touring uh, to get them a little bit more income. So there's a, a bunch of different ways to do it. Thank you very much. That's awesome information. Uh, Tim Bohr, can you talk a little bit about morale? I mean, the road is where morale, you know, a good tour is great for morale. A bad tour can be crushing. Uh, you know, how, how, how do you find a, 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 how do your clients find a flow with morale in order to, you know, extend uh, and last long term? Morale is probably the hardest at the beginning. You know, artists have to, and have to really kind of be willing to go out there and 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 fight against the current to be recognized. And I think that that is often the hardest conversations to have with the bands early on because it's it's tiring and it doesn't feel like you're winning a lot of those times. And 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 for the for the bands that are great, you know, you just kind of have to encourage them to to hang in there. That there will be a turn of momentum and that hard work that they put in will turn into you know it'll it'll translate into people responding to them and the momentum will come their way um and that that that's really part of the artist development game and i think you know morale later um you know has to do with listening to to all the small details of a veteran band that's been out there and knows what that game is, knows how they operate with each other and, and know, you know, these things are going to make us not feel great after a long period of time. And these, and if we can think about these things as part of the strategy in the program, you know, we're, we're going to be okay with the situation and, and, you know, trying to balance the beginning to the end in that way is it, it, you know, it, it's not, it's not really hard. Um, but you have to pay attention to it and you have to be willing to, you know, care about the people that you're in business with, um, meaning the bands and the managers and, and hear those things out and try and bake that into what we're trying to do. And it, it, morale is a big part of it. I mean, you know, if, if you aren't being, you know, aware of how the bands are feeling, you know, from the small band to now they've built an audience to now they've become a big band and now they've been a big band for and they've been around for a while if you aren't paying attention to the morale through that process they won't make it to that point there's no question about it and you know tim brings brings up a really great point here about morale too and you know a lot of this times you know when bands are out on the road you know some bands have it difficult and others don't and it, it, i think it's We've seen on, on our behalf, some of our young bands have been on the road with other bands and maybe they've struggled and, and morale is bad because something's happened. But the other bands have been on the road who have been around for a while and say, hey, you know, we went through this, it's gonna be okay. And to give a quick shout out to one of the greatest human beings of all time, Andy Williams from Every Time I Die, he specifically, we had two instances where we had bands on the road with ETID where a couple of things that, didn't go right for them. And, and Andy sat them down and said, look, this is going to happen. Everything's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. And that, you know, certainly made my life a lot easier. So, and, and that's a big thing out there too, because you know, I think the older bands that we, you know, same thing, our bands that headline do the same thing. You'll talk to the younger bands and say, hey, look, it'll be fine. You know, we went through this. There's always ebbs and flows. So it, it's a, it's a big thing for morale, I think. There, yeah. There's almost always, uh, sorry, Brian, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but you're just saying something that really kind of triggers like a thought. There's always like this moment with a band that's starting to get somewhere where they always, where they almost break. It's almost, it happens almost every time. And it, it you know, sometimes the bands actually don't make it through that process, but having people that have been around, whether it's the headliners or the managers or the agents or the label that have seen that moment happen before, and being able to coach them through that moment 
and get them to the other side. It, 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 it takes a couple of brains and a couple of conversations to help artists get through that moment for sure. Yeah. So, and I was going to say with Tim, like uh, Tim Borer, I mean, he was our agent for years and you know, Tim, not to go on a personal tangent and we can just start and stop this real quick. But like, I think one of the harder things from a longevity perspective is like recognizing how hard your team works and then being the agent. Like if we have the smallest show on a tour and we do 900 people in a 1700 cap room, like we're pissed. And all of a sudden now it's like, call Randy, call Tim Borer. Why'd you put me in a 1500 cap room in St. Louis? You know, there's only 900 people here. And you know, the proper response is, dude, there's 900 people in St. Louis. <laughs> Like chill out, right? And then on the on the adverse, you put up a twenty five hundred cap room in LA, and it goes in a day. And all of a sudden, you're like, "Why didn't you put me in the five thousand cap?" Like <laughs> you, you're, you're you're making me look like a fool here, and now you're losing me money over here. And yeah. and you know don't, that's not that's not my personal opinion, but those are those are the frustrations when your morale's down and you're having a terrible show. And the reality is, dude, there's a thousand people here. It just happens to be in a 1700 cap room. And what your agent and manager missed was that, you know, last minute there was a radio show that got canceled. So three bands just your size took up the whole city. And now there's a mini South by Southwest and we're all splitting people. All it takes is a phone call to get a logical reason why this is happening. But in the moment when morale's down, like as a manager or an agent or even a band member, someone has to be the cooler head. Because, you know, screw you, Tim Borer, screw you, Randy, well, screw you, Tim, tell Spencer to screw himself. And like, you know, Eaton's on here, you told me they're worth a thousand tickets, but they're worth two tickets, so screw Biggie. All of a sudden, we're in this, like, chaos, and none of it's real. It's like a lack of morale mixed with no sleep, mixed with frustration, and all of a sudden, I just want someone to blame because there's no way my band that I spent my whole life building isn't worth this someone else messed up who who do i get to lynch and like that's something that i see a lot of bands do a lot and i'm sure tim and biggie you can extrapolate on that from the admin side but it's like it's so hard to manage that but like as people that have all had decade-long relationships with labels bands you know agent manager like those things happen and then you have to figure out a way to diffuse it or yeah you pull the pin and if you don't put the pin back in it's gonna blow and it's not gonna be good for anybody you know well, you just have to have perspective. Yeah. Can I post this to you? Like one of the things I used to talk about was always trying to have two things on the horizon and for everybody in the band to be looking forward to this and that. It could be like the, the, the tour of Europe and uh, the TV appearance or whatever. Like, is there uh, any strategies from goal setting or anything like that that you use to kind of keep uh, your bands together through those tough times? Uh, absolutely. I mean, hopefully it's a lot more than two things. You know, we're planning 16 months out and, and hopefully they're like, moderately excited about s some of it, you know? Um, but yeah, using that same, like one for me, one for them. If we're doing a headline tour, I'm not going to come in and just be like, these are the bands worth tickets, like suck it up and deal with it. You know, it's got to be like maybe the new young hot band is there and then you pick one of your bands that is credible and cool to, you know, balance out the bill. And I don't, I don't want to act like, I know more than my bands. Like I'm not in the band and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even the most creative guy if I'm being honest, you know? So I, I lean on them to be creative uh, on that side of things or lean on board and Slago to be like, what's going on out there? Like to round out this bill, we're putting out under oath for this 400th tour. You know, we can't just put put out our, our friends again and again and again. Um, so to keep them excited, I, I think keeping the bands they tour with, um, things they like, you know, a nice balance. It's not going to be all things they like probably because then, you know, we wouldn't have the turnouts we would want in most cases mixed with who's the right choice. And then same thing with everything else, you know, with we keep mentioning every time I die a lot, which is fine. They're an older band, but I mean, we stopped sending them away from Buffalo to, to make records. And while it doesn't sound like a big deal and fuck who wouldn't want to leave Buffalo, but apparently them, uh, <laughs> it makes a big difference when they're writing and recording and the ability to like shoot in and out. And now that there are kids and wives involved, you know, like they don't dread recording now, which, you know, it doesn't happen every, every six months, but when it does happen, it's not like oh, I'm dreading this thing nine months from now, like constantly focusing on it there, you know, that's like in one band, one example of 
adjusting the situation instead of going like, we got to go with this guy because if he writes this record, we're going to get on this. And after, you know, six, seven, eight records, you go, we kind of know who we are. We want someone to be a collaborative effort with us, but we don't need, no one's going to write our songs. No one's going to like rework the hook in the chorus for that band. There are bands that do that and God bless them. But you know, for the band we're talking about, uh, the, uh, the weight that's been lifted and the, like the angst towards recording has, has been lifted, you know, and that, that can go in anything really, but touring is like I said, the same thing. Maybe, maybe the band just needs to realize that like, maybe they're not going to break in Europe. Maybe it's just not going to happen. And you only need to go there once a year and rattle around three big festivals and the places that work and don't get, you know, sad that it's not a seven week festival that you can brag on Instagram about. Um, that's not real. You know, and a lot of the bands that do that are losing money and will have shorter careers because they said, wait a second, we just did a tour and lost $20,000. And that means when we tour in the States and make money, we're paying back that $20,000. So we just toured four months without making money, you know, and like, that happens once or twice and you're either fired as a manager, band breaking up or signing bad deals because you need loans or whatever it is. You know, it's just a, a very bad snowball. I think I went off topic, but you get what I'm saying. That it, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a, it's No, that's good though. And it's true. I mean, like getting to that spot where, you know, I think perspective going back, it, we started with morale and then we kind of jumped to like morale within camps and not, blaming people for misses because there will be misses and now we're on to another thing which i think is worth talking about is like you're always going to see another band that has something you don't you're always going to go your third from last but the fifth from last band the band that's two bands before you that you should be bigger than has pyro how did they get pyro why didn't our manager think of that like why didn't our agent negotiate that how'd you get pyro we just asked for it they said it's okay why didn't we ask for that who's not caring about it like all of that you know goes into that and then you realize like no pyro is in the deal and biggie being a, a good manager is like i didn't even bring it up because we're already breaking even and we're building and we're not here for your friends in europe to think you're the coolest band we're building a business and we have this budget and we're sticking to it and yeah you feel smaller but you're actually smarter and you'll be here when them and their pyro and their led wall are sitting at home in 28 months because this is not sustainable and they're, they're faking it till they make it and they're spending all of their money. And the other thing you forgot about is they live three hours away. We're in Sweden, they're from Sweden. You're from America, there's all these other expenses. Like all of those logistics are key and just having a clear and low key head about Europe hates us, you know? Germany loves us, UK loves us, Austria. Let's stop spending three weeks trying to break Austria. It doesn't matter. Like whatever it is and just playing to your strengths and knowing that your friends will win bigger in these markets and you will win bigger in these markets. And it's not about you winning bigger than your friends or your competition. It's being the best version of you and being excited when, you know, someone smaller than you that's only been around for three years does better than you in a different country that you don't care to be in anyway. Like well, it doesn't have to be this thing. Oh, sorry. I mean, to cut you off. No, you're good. Finances too, which I'll, I'll relate a, a fairly funny story, and I don't think I'll get into too much trouble on this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. So back in I forget when this was the Family Values tour, which was Corn, System of Down, somebody else, and Rammstein opening. It's when Rammstein kind of first coming on. So Rammstein, they that their whole, their thing is their show. So they. We're able to get all this pyro and crazy show stuff happening. And they were the opening band. So all the other bands started seeing this and started adding in elements of production into their show. So this was a, a, a tour that sold out every arena in, in North America. And the, the very last show was the Forum. And my buddy was the, the, the overall tour manager. He was the tour manager overseeing everything. I was talking to him about how the tour went. He goes, you know what? It was the weirdest tour I've ever been on because we sold out every single show and yet no bands made any money because yeah. they all were trying to one up each other on the pyro end of things. It had nothing to do with anything else. And it, I mean, look, they're successful bands. They all, I'm sure, didn't mind losing any money or not making any money, but eventually I had to make it back. But just that's you see that cycle happen sometimes. It's like you got to remember, keep the eye on the prize a little bit at that stuff or sort of stuff. Mike, sure. despite the fact that like you know there's every single band is different i feel like out of this there's so many like like best practices that 
every band should be like subscribed to and at least using them as sort of like you know we use the word before tent poles in which to build all the other stuff that that uh, is uh, more personality dependent like I, I, I mean, wrap us up, I guess. That's, that's what I'm asking you to do. Oh, man, does it have to end? I can listen to these I, guys I, forever. I'm so sorry, this guys. This has just been <laughs> such a gem. I, I mean, I've been sitting here thinking, like, there's probably 150 almost years of music business experience on this one call, which is why wouldn't you be able to put some tent poles out and learn from that? And, you know, I think... There's so many best practices here, but what I really heard, you know, amongst everyone is you got to be genuine. You know, it's got to come from a genuine place. Sometimes you got to sacrifice your individual effort for the greater group of, of the band, or as a band, you've got to sacrifice your individual band effort for the greater group of your career. And that to me was taking into the account all the expertise that each of these guys have is kind of the underlying or like recurring current that I've heard. So hats off to these gentlemen. This has been really amazing. The only downside is we can't hear from each of them for another hour or two. Yeah. Well, awesome. guys, thanks for having us. Thank appreciate you. It. Definitely Very an awesome yeah, call. Thank, thank you. This was awesome. Really oh, super Thank awesome. you. Really appreciate it, boys. All right. Love you Take all. Care. Peace. Well, thank you everybody for joining. I want to introduce you to uh, an amazing panel that we have today. Everybody is interested in how they can uh, be great with social media for their for their own careers, for their uh, for their bands. And I don't think I've ever seen a panel like this one of social media for music. Uh, uh, Geez, nothing like this, this much expertise all in one place. So let me quickly uh, go around and introduce everyone and then we'll start to dive in. Uh, I have, uh, let's see, Rohan Ocean here from Rock Tees Shirts. Rohan, all right, good. So everybody can see who you is. Uh, I'll throw names underneath everybody and all that sort of jazz. Uh, I got Jeff Funk from Double X Artists, uh, social media manager there. And I got Finn McKenty from Punk Rock NBA. Almost everybody on YouTube knows who he is already. Uh, I have Mike Mowry, of course, from 10th Street Entertainment. David Puckett is here from Hyperculture. You may also know him from We Came as Romans and the drum kit, which sits behind them. Uh, so fantastic. Thank you all for uh, being here. Jeff, real quick to get us started. Um, as a fan, I get upset when the bands that I love only start tweeting and posting and Instagramming about a few weeks before they want to take my money. And, uh, but I also understand that like Facebook likes don't pay the rent as they always say. So what is the argument for having an evergreen strategy on social media for bands? Well, I mean, for example, like if you look at <clears throat> from an algorithmic standpoint, you know, for on Instagram, for example, you know, frequency is a massive part of, you know, it's an ever-changing algorithm, but it's still a massive part of, of the current in, in, um, algorithm. So if you are maintaining that consistency with, with posting, you're working with the algorithm versus against it. So you're, in theory, getting more visibility. Um, you know, and it's just, and consistency is, is such an important thing across all socials for for artists um, and just to work with their each respective algorithm. So you would be saying that like just having an evergreen strategy is what's going to be an investment in uh, that'll pay off once you get to that album cycle or that tour that you want to promote. Yeah, it's important to have a combination of both evergreen and reactionary, like reactive content. Um, so you're also paying attention to what's what's happening, you know, currently um, and, and heightening your the potential virality in your posts. Um, so I think it's important to have a combination of both. Awesome. Cool. Rohan, how do you differentiate uh, strategies for either growing a following or generating income uh, or marketing, I guess, uh, as far as like a, for a direct sale or for a direct uh, uh, purpose? Um, I have a somewhat of a slight advantage where I look after bands that have had quite a uh, extensive career um, and it's sort of by design and it's sort of uh, by luck I guess and and a few other things but uh, the bands I have are probably 30 year plus acts 
uh, part from one. Um, that allows the language I use even when I'm trying to take someone's money, even when it's a merch drop, even when it's, it's pointed towards specifically click here and buy this, is I find the language to be paramount. So if I was to go in on a particular artist and say, sale starts now, no one gives a shit. If I can link it to some key point of history, even as simple as a hashtag, which, which these days says a lot, communicates a lot. If, if I'm able to, and I try to do this uh, across the board all the time, if I'm able to explain to whoever sees that, that, that whoever posted it or, or it comes from the band's official account, that they are aware of their tribe, of their group, of their friends, of their fans. Uh, I find it has a, uh, a more of an impact than the normal just bashing stuff out. Um, yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, and, and with the language that you're using, sort of to combine it with what Jeff was talking, does any of that language, uh, do you find it helps the algorithm or is it really just focused on helping the community? It helps the algorithm in the fact that, uh, as we all know, at some point, I don't know when this was, I call it a snowball algorithm where the more people that see it, the more people get hit by it. Uh, it works with that because you've got the scroll effect. People can just keep going. Oh yeah, oh yeah, whatever, whatever. They see something that you that you've said, or they see something that just hooks them for that one extra moment. Um, then that opens it up to more and more and more people. So it certainly does. And and then that has a longer term effect. So there's the instant effect of uh, we're we're getting people to notice the post. The uh, extra effect on that is that more fans are noticing that this is the real deal and are following. So it's the two, it, it's beneficial for both. Got it, excellent. Mm -hmm. Then uh, of all these different platforms that exist, are there demographic or engagement or, um, uh, sort of like level of fandom as in like, you know, casual versus, you know, super fan and all the range in between on each of these platforms that artists really should be aware of and so that they can take advantage of them? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the answer to that is going to vary for every individual. I think that there's typically going to be one platform in which you have the broadest audience and your relationship with the people there will probably be less deep. And then there's going to be other platforms where you have a deeper but uh, less, you have a deeper relationship with a smaller number of people. For example, um, you know, there's people who like, for example, mine is YouTube. You know, I have 200 and 18,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is, you know, and maybe a million, million and a half people a month see that stuff on YouTube, but I have no idea who they are. Like, I can't really, I mean, I respond to comments and stuff, but it's, it's a, a fairly shallow relationship with them. On Instagram, I have like 38,000. So that's the 38,000 people who have chosen to follow me and engage with me and can be a little bit more personal there. And then my podcast gets maybe 5,000 downloads in, uh, of, of every episode but the relationship there is the deepest. Now, not, now that's for me. There's other people where their main platform could be Twitch. They may have a zillion people on Twitch and then it's about using that platform to build relationships with your audience elsewhere. So uh, I, I think it's not so much about any one platform. It's just about that idea of understanding which of the platforms are you using to reach a broad audience and, uh, uh, and, and build and grow that audience and which platforms are you using to deepen your relationships with the people who care about you the most? So for artists who are just getting going and, you know, they're not, they're not hiring a social media manager, they're just rolling up their uh, sleeves and trying to do it themselves, like, uh, what would you advise them as to where to start to find the platform that's going to bring them at least that 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 initial swell of followers? Uh, is it artist dependent, or are there some two or three that you would recommend? You just got to start here. 
Uh, yes, I think it's artist dependent. I think you should start with the one that you know best. That's always going to be the right, well, not always, but it's usually going to be the right answer. Uh, not Facebook. It's strange to me that a lot of rock people are still interested in Facebook um, for organic reach, which uh, I, I would say is a thing of the past. But, you know, there's somebody that's making it work. So even, even that is, uh, even that can, can work. So I would say just start with the one that you understand and you're passionate about the most and go from there. It's, you know, there's no one right answer. David, there's a, a balance, I would imagine, between artists who want to share enough in order to, to uh, uh, you know, deepen that relationship that, that Finn's talking about with, uh, with their fans while still protecting their privacy as much as they can. Uh, what, uh, how do you think the best bands out there on social media, the, the ones who do it best, what is it, what is it that they do that, that uh, to separate, to find that line between yeah. privacy and sharing? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I think first and foremost, you know, continuity is, is unbelievably important, not only when it comes to developing like your delivery algorithm and kind of conditioning your social followers to have a certain level of expectation with your uh, content, but it also creates, you know, a brand identity or brand ethos. And that's something that kind of takes your, if you want to sound super salesy and use the term like um, brand customer relationship or whatnot, uh, it, it takes it to a secondary level to where it's no longer just, oh, I like this band as a band, but I like this band and everything that they stand for as a person. And there's a plethora of ways that artists can do that down from color schemes um, you know, and if you ask anybody, like, what was Beartooth's color scheme for the last album cycle? Even if you don't know who Beartooth, like, or even if you don't like Beartooth, I can almost guarantee you that anybody who dabbles in the hard rock world knows that it's black and orange. Um, and so all of a sudden, there's a statement that's made there, but it also starts to kind of bring you into almost the psychology of the brand or the ethos or the identity of the brand that's being uh, presented. So we do something with with a lot of our clients, be it in the media or the entertainment space or bands, or be it in the small business world where it's, you know, if you were to have to write down, um, you know, a personality profile about your brand, about your band, about your business, what would that be? What would its name be? Um, where would this person like to hang out? What would their friends look like? And as cheesy and as corny as it sounds, getting some ideas and kind of personifying that on paper and then using that to reverse engineer your social media strategy makes it uh, actionable. You know, and I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is, crap, we don't know what to post, we're running out of content and it can get so overcomplicated. Um, and so it also kind of presents you the opportunity to detach from personal life, uh, which, you know, I think there's a lot of artists that, for artists that are in the public eye, like 21 Pilots would be a great example, you don't really see Tyler or Josh posting much about their personal life or what goes on behind the scenes, because they do have a massive uh, cult following and, and, and a semi, in the best way possible, aggressive fan base, and they want to have a level of privacy. But the way that they've branded themselves is they create an experience for their fans uh, to engage with them on a personal relational level that is outside of their actual independent personal lives. I love it. I, I, so just to recap, just so that people understand, like you're, you're talking about developing like a fan avatar almost. Yeah, absolutely. That, absolutely. That everybody is, should be speaking to. And then once you've identified that fan avatar, you're able to then uh, figure out what it is that you need to say and when you need to say it, how often you need to say it. Okay. I, exactly. I love exactly. So to follow up on that, like for so many bands, their personality is a huge component of their brand, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, are there um, uh, times where, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've shared too much and you got to figure out a way to pull them back without disturbing the brand? And then how would you find that balance? Mm, that's a good one. Uh... I, I think there's either either two ways to go about it, slow and steady, and consistency is the key. Like you could, I'm a, a big follower of Donald Miller, if you're familiar with him and kind of his uh, approach on marketing and, and narrative-based marketing. And a lot of it boils down to kind of creating the path of least resistance. Um, so you almost kind of have to create a narrative, uh, you know, so 
we'll explain it this way. If someone's walking through a jungle, there's, are we allowed to cuss on here? Can we cuss? Is that fine? Should I not cuss? Does it matter? Okay. If someone's walking through a jungle or a forest and there's not a path in front of him, there's all kinds of shit that they're going to have to cut through and move out of the way, right? In this uh, kind of explanation, that's going to be your, your customer, your user, the prospect fan you're trying to win over. You as a, as a brand, right? You're marketing. When you're posting on social media, when you're interacting with someone, you're trying to create a path for them to follow. So when it comes to kind of, you know, say someone did um, get too far into their personal world uh, as far as like the artist posting or whatnot, and they're wanting to pull back. If you suddenly, you're leading people down this path and then you suddenly pivot, it's going to shake those users a lot. It's going to incite maybe some, um, I don't know, some negative curiosity. Uh, it could incite some kind of insecurity or, or less confidence in the brand itself. So being able to assess and say, okay, I went down this path too far. Now we need to veer left, but there's a whole bunch of trees and bushes and shit here. So let's start shopping at that bit and try to make this a seamless transition. If it's something like for a band moving from one album cycle to another, you can absolutely do a hard reset. Um, you know, kind of going on the delete your social profiles always makes a big statement, gets people talking, gets people curious, but you have to have actionable content to follow through on. And I think that's where a lot of bands get lost in translation um, is they first and foremost don't create enough of a brand I brand identity or brand consistency for the users to really um, have a, like a foundation to exist on. And when they try to switch it up, they just lose people and lose people and lose people. That's awesome. Thank you. Mike, uh, uh, David brought up a couple things right there that are, are really cool. Awesome. Uh, uh, obviously, like the, the, um, uh, the brand and how you can, uh, uh, you know, stick to colors and things like that that are really, really important. Um, but also that hard reset that comes with an album cycle. Can you talk a little bit about how in your experience, uh, the artists that you've worked with in the past, what is that like branding that happens for uh, a, a particular album cycle and how that is communicated and planned for uh, social media? Yeah, of course. Um, and it's a great question. I think so much of it, you know, really stems from, uh, of course, what the music's about, what the album's about. But most of the artists that I work with, we then, you know, hire an experienced designer uh, that really can get the vision um and go along with that and create something that yeah makes sense and then it sort of i mean i want to say it all follows very naturally um and that's just because i've done it as of these guys you know countless numbers of times but for me and that's part of what this panel is you know i've worked with every single one of the people on here it's finding you know people like this that you know, if if I was going into a new album cycle and any one of these guys was on the team for social media, I would consult them in addition to the artist, right? In addition to not only the artist that I'm representing, but the artists that we're hiring to create all of the graphics, just to see if it makes sense, if there's anything that they can can give input on. So that's typically how it's done. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I and you know, really, this is like a a great side effect. I think of of this kind of panels. I can just. I can hear <laughs> musicians listening to these people and go like, I, I, this is all stuff I wanted to know, but there's no way I could do this and do this well. And it ends up being a great argument for why these roles exist and why uh, you know, bands, once they have some sort of budget are taking advantage of it. Um, Jeff, uh, you know, like another thing that I always hear from, from musicians who are trying so hard to do this DIY is say, hey, I need to be a great songwriter. I need to be a great performer. I need to be great at this, that, the other thing. I got to be a great accountant. You want me to be great on 12 different platforms too. So are there any third party uh, SaaS tools that, that either you use or you recommend that your artists use to try to uh, streamline the process of being great at social media in general? Yeah, for, I mean, for creating more, you know, DSP type contests, I like Tone Den is a great third party app. Uh, Gleam is another great for contesting integration into social media. Um, for, um, you know, like tweet to uh, follow to tweet is another great one for it's a third party uh, Twitter app. Um, for, you know, for live streaming, personally, you know, we've been doing a lot with bands in town lately. I really enjoy working with them. And I think the infrastructure that they've created surrounding 
the live streaming atmosphere has been has been great. The same with with Veeps. They're another um, uh, third party that we work with with doing live streaming, and those are um, those are paid live streams, but they're you know it's a great they do a great job of it of uh, of gating that and the productions you know it really can work on any level. And do you have any sort of recommendations for artists who are trying to do this DIY and they're just absolutely overwhelmed by you know Twitch and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and, and every single platform has got a different image size. Gosh darn it! You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you know, and really in order to be on the forefront, you know, as I'm, as I'm sure these guys can attest, it's, you know, you really need to be paying attention to blogs. And, and the beauty of, of YouTube, you know, it's the second largest search engine in the world. And really, there's an answer for everything. So if you hear someone, you know, talking about, you know, shadow banning, or you hear someone talking about, you know, the, the Facebook algorithm and components of, you know, like search components for, you know, whatever, like for Twitter or, or anything, you can just Google that or look it up on YouTube and, and be able to find the answers for yourself because it is a lot. I mean, that's one thing about digital, you know, I've been doing it for, for, for 12 years, you know, working at an agency and it's the thing that's never changed is you're never really done. I mean, there's always something that you can be doing. There's always new technologies, you know, algorithms are, are, are forever changing so you know they're ever changing algorithms so it's you know everything you can never really be completely done you know there's always something you can be doing um you know even just starting like you know youtube if you wanted to now's a great time to be optimizing your videos so if you're an upcoming artist or a label you know just looking through youtube or, or google search to find ways to to youtube or to optimize your all of your youtube videos there's there's so many ways and there's always you know they're always with partnerships they're always continuing to, to build more and more well finn i want to ask you about optimizing youtube because that seems to be an awesome segue but before you answer that if you don't mind like i'm thinking back to 22 years ago last time i was in a van there was the guy who drove there was the guy who wrote you know who had the map and you know that would be like my social media strategy now someone would be the instagram guy someone would be the facebook but I wouldn't want to give any of those guys passwords. Like who, who, how, do, yeah, what do you suggest as far as like, you know, who gets the passwords to the social media platforms in the van? Yeah, well, I, I mean, mean if, if oh. but sorry, you're asking me or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, well, I guess that's up to you guys. If you don't trust each other, then there's a problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Like if you don't trust each other at that level, then somebody, you probably made wrong call with who you let in the band uh as far as optimizing videos goes there's a, uh if anyone's interested in this there's a guy named brian dean who has a site called backlinko if you google youtube marketing hub it'll tell you everything you need to know but the main piece of advice i would give everybody is uh don't think that an app is the answer or don't think that you know tweaking some technical thing is going to give is going to like open the floodgates i wish it was that simple it's not like you need to make you need to be more creative you need to have a, a stronger point of view you need to have something clever and interesting and entertaining or informative whatever you got to have something to say if you don't have anything to say if it's just another picture of a bunch of dudes in a warehouse or whatever some guy with a guitar all the optimization in the world it's multiplying zeros you know nobody is going to give a shit uh, and I don't buy it, the excuse of people saying they don't have time because they have to be a you know, a musician, a performer. Like, there's tons of like 19-year-old rappers that crush it on social media and make all their own shit and you know, distribute all their own music that do it all themselves. It's a bullshit excuse. Sorry, I've got to unmute myself. So, uh, so you're firmly in the camp of quality over quantity uh that's one way to put it um but i mean i would say both actually um i, I just you just it, this is you're you're trying to do something very difficult i mean if you're looking for shortcuts you've already kind of lost yeah you know there's there's things that may save you a little bit of time but if you're looking for a way to make it easy you might as well give up now because it's not easy yeah well, Ron, you mentioned earlier about hashtags. Those seem to be one of those uh, best practices that you know help to move things 
forward for to find those uh, uh, connections, that sort of thing. What what are for each of the platforms that are some of your favorites? What are some of these sort of best practices that that DIY musicians really should know about? Um, I just uh, want to add something with the with the DIY musician approach on this is that um, I kind of co-manage a couple of of artists as well. One's a, a guy called John Five, guitar player, very unique uh, look and feel and everything. And, you know, all the time I'm saying to him, look, you do your thing and leave this to, to like, so you can, a band can worry about all this stuff and who's got the passwords and the, sh the right ratio of the different platforms and their, and their songs are shit. So it's going to not mean anything if you can collect people that just instantly leave day two after they've heard what your, your offering is. So, you know, I always, um, U2's manager and Led Zeppelin, they, they always made a point of saying, I don't mess with the music stuff. You guys just do. I never once gave advice on, the, on a drum solo or anything. And then the same for, for us. So is, I think our job is to just get a picture of who this artist is, what they talk like, what they sound like, what the brand is, what the image is. And then we translate that in these little bits. Um, that's why we're around. And that's why they, they do what they do. So, you know, I think the DIY, like there's a band, um, I'm going to send it to you guys. I'm having a blank as to what they're called, but you know, their video is 30 or 40 million views on YouTube. They're just young and their video is so terrible. It's probably deliberately terrible. They're squinting. Like no one thought to bring sunglasses. They're wearing terrible clothes, the songs, but the song is amazing. It's just some guys on a pier. Um, the hell is their name? And that to me is a great example of that. If you just worry about what you're doing, take some photos of it. Great. We'll take care of the rest. Um, so the DIY approach can, can work for that because if they've got a solid offering, they've got a solid product and they've got somewhat of a look just amplify that same as you do your guitar just amplify what it is that you already are or want to be or want to look like or you know like finn's example of the rappers they have a lifestyle already entrenched in the way they talk the way they dress the way they look everything about their world is established and they're just coming into it they're not reinventing it so they understand what the fan would want to see or hear or they should talk like or they probably don't even think about it. it's really subconscious and that's like what i was saying before about some of the bands i work for i just have been a fan since i'm a small child so it's subconscious what i'm writing um so I don't know, the ha a hashtag might be something like an obscure B-side that some people are going to get, but other people are going to be like, well, why did they put that? What is that? And they might have a conversation about it. If you can get a conversation going in the comments, you're, you're way in front. If you've got people passing and liking, that's like, driving on the road and seeing a house on fire and you just slow down a bit you keep driving you you don't want to get involved in that but if you can get them stopping and talking and like hey what, what's happening over there what, what is this that's when they're coming in the rabbit hole that's when they're they're coming on board awesome i love that thank you and uh, david can we uh, wormhole a little bit on uh uh, what Rohan's talking about, this interactivity with the fans, like wh what are some things that, uh, you, you know, Rohan's got one example, but other things that, that more new artists who are trying to get to new fans, 
how do they inspire engagement in their posts? And are there certain platforms that are better than others for it? Yeah. Um, in regards to the platforms, I think it's really important to understand that different platforms are, are used for different levels of engagement, right? Or different ways to interact with people. So Instagram's the time killer app. Um, a lot of people will sit there and scroll through it for hours and that's great, but it's also a platform where, dude, someone will pull up at a red light or pull out Instagram for 30 seconds, look through stuff, light screen, and they're going to be going again. Um, Twitter is kind of the viral destination. That's where a lot of brands can kind of showcase uh, humor, which also incites a little bit of like brand vulnerability. Um, Facebook, as, as shitty as it is right now, as far as organic reach, it's still a conversation destination. Like no one pops on Facebook for 30 seconds while they're at a red light. People go to Facebook with the intent to connect and there's a great opportunity for bands to capitalize on that. I think I Prevail is one incredible example a lot of bands that are in the industry now, um, especially, not, I will say three years ago when I Prevail just kind of took over the metalcore market out of nowhere, a lot of bands were so pissed off because they just paid their way to the top, which is absolute bullshit, dude. Like absolute bullshit. Those dudes worked their asses off, but just in a new way that was really disruptive. So you have a 29 year old like metalcore guy who was relevant five years ago and now his band's struggling. Um, but that dude used to go to Hot Topic and sell tickets all day. He'd sit at the mall for eight hours, move tickets, move tickets, move tickets, drive to the other Hot Topic two hours away to do the same thing. And now, just as tech and social media has grown so much, I Prevail was just the first band in our market to realize, oh shit, people don't go to the mall anymore. People are on Facebook. And now there's a huge resurgence where Metalcore is coming back, and I am a 100% firm believer that I Prevail had a lot to do with all of the new metalcore fans that are flooding in. Like, can you, David, can you real quick, can you recap yeah. for those who don't know, what did I Prevail do? On yeah, this? so so I Prevail put out a um, the same week that Taylor Swift's Blank Space video came out. They, they put out a really shitty, um, or shitty music video for it that they filmed like on their iPhones or whatever, like a cheap household camera. It wasn't great, but it went viral. Um, a lot of people don't know that what they did following that, which was they realized that, okay, we just got so many eyes on this. We need to stay in constant communication with these people. And so Brian, the singer, um, would literally for like 20 hours a day, sit there and just respond to every comment, message every single person that liked the Facebook page and keep a conversation going. And that built such a firm foundation for them that a lot of the metalcore bands that started blowing up in like the early 2010s never really created um i love rise records i love artery um i love uh, dave shapiro but that was the trifecta in like 2010 you get all three you're headlining a 500 cap room in a year and a half and you're going to have a great six-year cycle and then you're washed up um because a lot of bands didn't actually take the time to create this foundation what i prevailed did is the same thing that a lot of bands were doing in hot topic in the, in the early 2010s they just realized we have access to way more people now, and it's way easier for us to carry 20 genuine conversations at one time instead of me sitting in front of the freaking Dunkin' Donuts at the mall talking to one person. And so I Prevail just got really focused on doing that, and every single person that watched that Taylor Swift video, they would retarget them with a piece of original content, so a single that they wrote that sounded like the song, but now it's original music, and then they would maintain conversations with those people. Dude, okay, I hope this doesn't come across an arrogant in any way, shape, or form. We Came As Romans is not the biggest metalcore band on the planet by any means, at all. But if you're a metalcore fan, a lot of the time, like you've probably heard of the band, whether you've listened to us or not. You've probably heard the name, because we've been around for a long time. We supported I Prevail in 2017. We were direct support. The Word Alive was two of four, and Escape the Fate was opening all bands that have been around for a decade or longer. I'd go back to the merch table every night with our merch guy, and I kid you not, I would get 15 to 20 people a night asking me, I've never heard of you guys before. Is this your first album? All of I Prevail's fans are new, right? And that was the, created a massive resurgence in the metalcore market. And there's other you know, um, um, people that were involved in doing that, but I think they finally, a lot of people in the industry just, despise them for so long and now they realize like oh these guys are actually really cool they're genuine guys who just work really hard and they worked in a way that wasn't being capitalized on by the rest of the industry and now everybody's playing catch up um but dude i think that was that they're such a great example of being ahead of the curve 
and looking at what opportunities are on the table for bands to take advantage of. And dude, I think Finn nailed it. The reason that SoundCloud rappers blew up isn't because it, it was the most um, groundbreaking music in the world. It's they just, they did something new. They engaged with people consistently and they were coming from a genuine place. Um, you know, like whether they're conscious about it or not, their brand identity is so locked into who they are and they genuinely don't give a shit about if people liked it or not. And it created a whole new culture that blew up and blew up massively. Not to mention they were already capitalizing on um, really making sure that like user consumption was optimized for people. You know, SoundCloud, when, as soon as that platform was created and it kind of put the ability for artists to release content whenever they want, it disrupted the whole album cycle strategy. And so that genre was kind of the first to just get on, you know, screw doing an album cycle and risk putting a hundred grand into something that could get disrupted because of bad PR or another artist coming along and doing something at the same time. Let's just focus on putting singles out every week and shoot, if it's crushing it for eight weeks, then maybe we just don't release a single. If people hated it, no worries, I'll release a single a week later. It allows you to adapt to the market and become so versatile that it, it really eliminates so much of your risk. I'm look. I'm so looking forward to that uh, stretching well beyond that genre, but that's yeah, beyond the agreed. scope. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, uh, great content done consistently over time. It, it's social media as well, right? Um, it's difficult to call what I Prevail did uh, a hack when you spend 20 hours a day working on something. It's hard to say. Oh yeah, he hacked it because the word hack seems to suggest they you found a way to do it easy, but. Uh, in terms of how to do it well, even that seems to be a challenge uh, when it comes to social media for a lot of bands. So um, uh, when it comes to the hard work, what have you uh, expected from and demanded from your clients in the past in terms of social media and what they create there? Yeah, I mean, a bit of what Rohan attested to, which is with the artists that he manages or, you know, the ones that he's hired on to consult for, I expect the artists to create that content. And we, you know, I'm not the expert, but again, I go to guys like the experts that we've assembled here to be able to get those strategies. If the artist wants to participate in it, and in fact, I encourage that as often as I can, because if they can get educated, if they're interested in getting educated as to what Will it will what will then happen afterwards? Like what these guys will do with that content, it might help them, you know, tweak things just a bit in order to to make that content even more marketable. So, um, yeah, that's really it. <laughs> well, thank you. No, uh, Finn, uh, genre and brand uh, are really important to most artists' careers. Uh, what are some best practices for finding a balance between the quantity and quality that you were talking about earlier uh, when it comes to the brand itself to circle us back to the very beginning? Well, I think what you want to look for is what is the sort of core thing that your audience responds to in terms of, you know, the content. So do they like it when you do silly pranks or do they, like it when you share behind the scenes stuff or like what, what are the sort of, you're going to come up with, I don't know, two, three, four things that reliably people like. And then like, how do you execute that in the most efficient way? And I think there is an incorrect belief that um, budget and results are correlated. And I don't think they are because I'm sure all of us have worked on things that had a huge budget and flopped. And then we have all worked on or seen things that had no budget and did really well. So, uh, you know, with, with the understanding that, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and we can't all do everything, there's something you can do that people will respond to that they'll engage with that takes, you know, very little effort. There's something you can do, or very little time, I should say, because it's about like the thinking. It's not about the, it's not about the production and the execution for most, for most things. I mean, there's some things that do legitimately require a lot of production, but if if the constraint is time, you know, for example, I know if I if I ever tweet about attack attack, it will get a ton of engagement. I can I can press that button as many times as I want and people will like it every single time. I don't mean that in a cynical way. I just by experimenting, by putting stuff out, I've realized that's the thing people care about. Um, people are nostalgic about Tony Hawk Pro Skater. I can talk about that 
as much as I want and people will engage with it. And that's true for artists too. There's something that you're going to like, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but like for a lot of artists, if they've been around for a long time, for example, we came as Romans or, or Joey Sturgis. Those are good examples. So our, I'm sure most of us know him. Anytime he posts stuff from the old days, some picture of him when he used to work in his shitty, you know, uh, garage with, you know, the devil wears Prada or something like that, that will crush. And it doesn't take him more than 10 seconds to post that. And that's, you know, sort of capitalizing on some history that, you know, younger artists may not have. But the point is find that thing, whether, whether you're pulling a, pushing on a nostalgia button or some sort of current events, or, you know, again, maybe just people like seeing you do something silly. Once you figure out what those things are, then the question is, how do we execute that in the most efficient way possible? Uh, can we save 30%, you know, can we do that 30% faster? Can we do it 50% faster? But that to me is how you, sir, how you solve the quantity versus quality thing is you, you start by finding what people like and then how do you execute that in the quickest way possible? I think I follow up with you on that. Like, you know, with a platform like Instagram, you're limited by an image. Uh, tweet, uh, Twitter, you're limited by a number of characters. YouTube seems to be like it's wide open. You can do a 24 hour, seven day a week, uh, uh, data bots, uh, uh, YouTube stream, sure. you know, like, and, and, but you could also post up something that's a few seconds long. Are there any, uh, challenges, uh, that are unique to YouTube or is it just psychological on YouTube as to how often you can or cannot post on that form? Uh, I would say YouTube has the biggest potential upside of any social media platform, and it's also the most difficult to sort of build an audience on. And the reason why is because you're competing with a lot of people who are really, really, really good that already have really big audiences, and that's tough. Uh, and YouTube sort of rewards people who, you know, my videos get recommended a lot because people watch them, which means more people watch them, which means they get recommended more. So... It, it, it sort of rewards established people. And that's true of every platform, but I think it's especially true of YouTube. Uh, so to me, the the most challenging thing about YouTube is that it's probably going to take you, unless you're really good, uh, it's probably going to take you six to nine to 12 months to really get anywhere there. Uh, and once you do, it's very valuable. Um, I mean, if I didn't put out a video at all this month, I'd still probably get half a million views in the next month. Um, now that wouldn't last forever, but so I think YouTube in particular, the challenge is like putting in, being able to commit the time it takes to build up that kind of first initial bit of traction because it's hard and it's demoralizing and you're going to invest a lot of time and energy into something that feels like it's going nowhere. Yeah, let me take a moment to say hi to everybody watching this on YouTube. Uh, Jeff, uh, when uh, it, as far as YouTube, it seems like I, I, I totally agree with Finn on that idea that like this is a, a just a, a a really awesome opportunity. To me, it seems like a really great opportunity to also deepen a fan relationship to try to you know turn a, a casual fan into a, a the type of fan who's going to do a VIP package sometime in the future. That sort of thing is is that. True? true or am i mistaken is is are there uh, is there a better place to develop a fan from a casual fan to a, a a super fan than youtube well i mean you know like facebook they offer top fan options so it's, they're able to identify fans for for me um during a touring cycle i see the most this is a broad statement but i see a lot of conversion when i'm when we're doing a co-headline and we use like geotags and looking through the, uh, the additional artists through their <clears throat> posts um, using their tags as well. So that's where I've seen some of the, my highest conversion for, for YouTube. For me personally, it's great because there's a lot of covers, um, you know, drum, bass, guitar covers of artists that I work with, or they're doing press or, you know, like various archival interviews because I also work with similar to, to Rohan where I, I work with a lot of artists who have had 20, 30 year careers. So for me, the, that platform is great because I'm able to engage with people who have uploaded that archival content over the last, you know, 20 plus years. Um, so that's great for conversion. Um, but I still, you know, for me, it, for my demo, you know, Facebook is still, I know the organic reach is, is much lower and 
you know, like one out of every five posts is, is basically an ad in, in your feed, it's still great for me because they were so highly populated when the artists, you know, started, you know, a decade or so ago. So that was the first network that we that we built on other than like MySpace and Friendster and that, so. Gotcha. Rohan, can you uh, sort of pick up from there, like uh, when you're working with uh, artists and there are the platforms that are, are now getting a little long in the tooth, are there newer platforms that are just uh, exciting and, and that you think like uh, are the, the, the place everybody needs to be uh, in focusing on going into the future? Um, honestly, no, not really. I've got uh, the band, the bands themselves are, di I find it, uh, I separate them from the band members. Um, now that's an interesting distinction because the band may represent something that a fan has an image of and then the band member can go off and do what it is that they do. So I've got a bunch of guys on um, uh, Twitch, I think, and um, I'm going blank is there's too many for us to keep track of here. Um, TikTok, they're loving TikTok right now. That's um, the traction on that is just completely enormous. The views on that are enormous. The engagement on that is just out of control. And I have a few band members from the bands that have their own name, their own personalities as well, that have now shifted over to that um, because they get to be funny. They get to be, it gets a, it's a little short clip. It's a, maybe a joke or it's a, you know, day in the life type stuff, which people love. You just cannot get enough of behind the scenes in, in terms of, letting people into kind of what you do for a bit. Um, so for me, that's the one. And I, and I think when, when um, the, a band member themselves has something to say, it's almost at the point, depending on the size of your following, where you do branch off and become your own, um, you become your own personality. Because that's an important thing too. You've got two, three, four, five different people in a band all of them see the world differently. All of them have a different opinion. Um, there may be a management decision to stifle that initially in, so that the representation of the band doesn't get derailed in a different direction. That's important for socials. Um, but I think once you get a, a solid base, uh, that's when you can start to branch off. So, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe TikTok is, is probably the, the one at the moment. Excellent, thank you. David, I, you were nodding and thumbs up and everything as soon as the word tick, TikTok came up. So what should people be doing? I've had oh. this app on my phone for like a month and I stare yeah. at it, like, oh, I don't get it. So we were, we were late to the TikTok party, right? Because we're all 29 through 31 and we're like, no, that's dumb. Which is the same thing I said when Instagram came out. And it's the same thing I said when Facebook came out and I was on MySpace. <laughs> and I said the same thing about when MySpace came out when I was on Zanga. And I said the same thing about Zanga from LiveJournal. So I've constantly been late to adapt out of ego, right? Um, and so as soon as I was like, okay, I looked up social metrics on TikTok and it's like, okay, 41% of all the active users are between the ages of 16 and 24. Looking at this as a 10-year band, right? Meaning most of our fans uh, found us around our third al album cycle and then phased out. Um, and then during our fourth album cycle, we had to completely, you know, redo who our fan base was. Now about 60 to 70% of our fans are all new. They found us in the last four years. That was a very intentional move, but it took a very long period of time. Um, so wanting to figure out how can we, you know, essentially grab a younger fan base who are going to become uh, lifelong fans. We really want to assign like LTV or lifetime value to those people. Um, so 41% of all active TikTok users are between the ages of 16 to 24. And then on top of that, the average daily usage for TikTok is like between 53 minutes and an hour. So all of the people that are on the platform are on there consistently throughout the day. And the way that their algorithms deliver content is it's not chronologically, which is great, 
it's all based on user engagement. So you could have something that you posted three months ago that all of a sudden goes viral. So it allows you to keep every single post or every piece of content that you put out to be leveraged as an asset rather than just something that you posted that was relevant for a week or two weeks and then the engagement bottomed out like you see on Facebook or Instagram because it gets so buried or Twitter because it gets so buried in your feed. On TikTok, there's an opportunity at any moment for all of those to just organically go viral depending on what's going on in the, in the marketplace. So it's also really easy to put content out um, because automatically you're going to see what's going viral that day. And you can be like, oh, like this band member is goofy. I'm going to tell them to do this 20 second skit. Um, and all of a sudden you might get, even if you only have 200 followers, you might get 30,000 likes on it. And all of a sudden there's all new people coming in. We just created our TikTok that we came as Romans TikTok like a week and a half ago. It's not verified yet or anything. We only have like 3,500 followers on it. Um, but and, and we can't implement the law of large numbers, looking at like overall massive social analytics trends. But based off the metrics we're seeing, it is unlike any of the other social stats we see on any other platform. Normally about 60% of our followers, uh, or, or of the followers that are engaged with us are male, 40% female. It's 69% female, 31% male on this platform. I got excited about that because I can look at all of our purchase metrics and see that even though we sell more units in volume as far as merchandise to men, women spend about twice as much per transaction that men do. So if there's an untapped market here for us to build a new fan base with women who, based on these other social metrics, spend twice as much as men do, this could become a major profit center for us. Um, not to mention, it's the easiest way for us to engage with people. It's built around um, what's the word I'm looking for? Collaborating with other people. You know, you can ease, someone can easily take a post and say, oh, I want to do a duet with this. So we actually built an entire social campaign that we're starting to roll out this weekend built around duets and trying to get people to duet with the band. Um, also, since it's a new platform, they haven't minim like minimized any delivery. Like there's no paywall for access to your reach right now. That'll probably take place in, a year and a half to two years maybe. Um, and then also in the hard rock metalcore market, there are no bands doing it right now. None, none. It's like us, Crown the Empire just made theirs a few days ago. All Time Low has been on it for about a month, but like Beartooth's not on it. I Prevail's not on it. Three Days Grace is on it and they do like a fan share every Friday or something. But it's an untapped market. And I think that there's a massive opportunity for a lot of bands to become the I Prevail of kind of the next wave who really capitalize on that platform like I prevailed did with Facebook. It's awesome, David. You had, I was counting in my head, seven wormholes that I really wanted to go in and I got to avoid all that. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like no, a dog chasing like, the wind. But. Each of them is, is just like, oh, oh, because all I want to do is turn to Rohan, Jeff and Finn and say, okay, talk to me about this, but I can't because I got to circle back on something Finn said probably like 35 minutes ago. And thank you so much, David, on that summary on TikTok because now everybody's running. Oh, at absolutely. <laughs> well, Finn, you were saying earlier that just don't bother with Facebook, which surprised me or something along those lines. Perhaps I'm putting words in your mouth. And it surprised me because it seems like um, Facebook events is so powerful for marketing live performance. And the Facebook ad engine is so well-developed, the AI is so well-developed at this point. So uh, can you talk about Facebook events and talk about the, the uh, I guess, all of these platforms in terms of advertising and where the great opportunities are for, for uh, musicians at this point? Well, I can't really talk about Facebook events because I don't promote any live events. So uh, that's a fair point. That's probably useful. Uh, I guess my point is that uh, I hear a lot of rock people kind of obsessing about getting very precious about organic reach on Facebook, on Facebook and, you know, caring a lot about how many likes their band page has, which is, is just kind of, you're five years late on that, you know? Uh, I mean, if get the likes by all means, that's great, but uh, I would not go out of my way uh, to emphasize that. And by the way, there's no reason that like, if you have a good piece of content on Instagram, it'll do fine on Facebook too. I mean, there's, 
you know, it, there's, there's no reason that you can't repurpose it. Um, as far as ads go, I mean, yeah, Facebook, I've tried so many times to get, I mean, you know, David would, would have some good input here too, but I tried so many times to get, the results on Facebook. And when I say Facebook ads, I'm referring to the Facebook ad platform, which as some people may or may not know, will distribute your ads into many places. Facebook.com and the Facebook app is one of those places. Instagram, WhatsApp, the ad network there, you know, I don't know how many placements there are now, like 25 or something like that. Um, so Facebook ads offer the best ROI of anything I've been able to find. I've tried many times to duplicate it because I don't want to be so dependent on one channel, but they're just so damn good at it. I am interested to see where TikTok goes because I know they've been investing a lot in their ad tech and they seem to be avoiding a lot of the mistakes that uh, other companies made. And the big one being like with Snapchat, they were never able to, well, not never, but they've always struggled to monetize their users adequately i mean that's that's the problem with snapchat is that for a long time there the the value of a user was negative relative to the amount that it cost them to acquire that user uh, it seems that tiktok they seem to have a good management team you know they just hired the former ceo or their new ceo was the former head of disney plus so it seems like they are doing a lot of things right and i'm optimistic about the future of their ad platform but uh, i i don't think it's there yet um so point being the way I think about Facebook is, or really any of these platforms, like if you want to move, if you want to move product, buy ads. That's what they're for. Uh, if you want to create engagement and build an audience and a community and stuff, that's what organic content is for. Uh, not to say that you shouldn't ever promote your stuff, like you should, but it, it's use the things for what they're meant for. If you want to sell shit, buy ads. If you want to talk to people, make content. I think it's the number one mistake I would say that people in all kinds of business make is they promote stuff too much yeah. and nobody wants that. Like, you know, it's like the punishers that hand that stand out uh, outside of a show and like shove their CD in your face. And it's like, I don't want that. I don't know you yeah. stop trying to sell me something. Um, and that's the same way people feel about their, uh, about their social feeds. So I guess in regards to Facebook, Sure, if you get some likes, that's great. Use it. But if you are putting a lot of energy into building up a Facebook page in 2020, that's not a smart use of your time, in my opinion. Gotcha. Rohan, I know you've got to run. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you before you do uh, about the same thing, uh, advertising on platforms, best practices. One of the things that I'm always wondering about is how, like with the, in particular, the Facebook ad platform, for example, you're able to really hyper target when you've got people's email addresses and yet so few bands bother with collecting their email and keeping an autoresponder, that sort of thing. So can you talk about some best practices for advertising that you recommend and, and that you perhaps utilize in places where it works and where it doesn't? Um, well, amazingly, our company is talking to David's company about uh, him doing that stuff for us because, uh, man, I have no idea about any of that. I'm so, like, old school. You know, um, we know it's there and we know we need it, uh, but when you have specialists that, that look into it, it's just amazing that the the very person that we're all talking to is is here right now. So, um, so I don't want to divert, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, look, guys, I'm so sorry I have to leave. This is amazing. Hopefully, we can do it again. But um, I kind of feel like we should talk about this stuff once a month anyway, and uh, share things that we're we're picking up along the way because it's you know how often do you run into another social manager who's sitting here trying to figure this thing out. So yeah, it's been great. Thanks Mike Paul for, for uh, setting it up and it's great to Thanks meet you. Thanks for home. Great to connect with you, buddy. Don't we'll see stay you in soon. touch. Bye. I hope I can hold the rest of you for just a few more minutes if that's okay. Uh, David, this is a great segue to you. I guess uh, do you want to <laughs> pick that up from, from wherever yeah. I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people don't know, and I'll try to keep this short. Um, a lot of people don't know what all data is floating around, like from a band's Facebook page, from their Instagram page, et cetera. Um, Facebook will never allow D2C data direct to consumer, right? So you're not going to get their first name, last name, email address, zip code, IP. You're not going to get any of that stuff, right? If you have a good CRM platform, 
um, and I recommend Clavio, um, which I, I'm new to the platform, but it's incredible. That's where you can upload all of that content. But Facebook does allow you access to anyone that's been to your Instagram page, whether they follow you or not. Anyone that's been to your Facebook page, whether they follow you or not, you can even segment it down based on their level of engagement. People who engaged with this specific post, but not this one. Um, or people who saved this post, people who commented on this post, you can do the same with all the video content on both of those platforms as well. And you can segment that based on seven varying levels of engagement. So you can retarget people that watch three seconds of the video, 10 seconds of the video, 15 seconds, 25%, 50%, 75%, 95%. Um, like you said, with the, um, the email addresses for bands that do have a newsletter, you can export that as a CSV or comma separated value file, and you can upload all of that. So when it comes to, um, and my background in doing this isn't for bands. I was doing this for tons of different companies in tons of different industries. And when I joined We Came As Romans, it was like, oh shit, let's just do this for our next album cycle, because if we don't, we're fucked. Um, Because our fourth album cycle tanked. We went from like 1,200 cap rooms to 300 cap rooms. And we immediately knew like, okay, we need to get this new album directly to all of our core fans that loved us from the first three album cycles. And uh, so I got CSV files from our old label and from our merch company of anybody that ever bought a piece of We Came As uh, Romans merch in that time frame. And for the initial uh, release of the album, every single dollar as far as paid efforts went to just retargeting those people to essentially say, hey, our fourth album sucked and we know that. And uh, here's an album that doesn't suck that we think you're going to like. So we could rebuild that trust and rebuild that foundation. Um, Meanwhile, all that new data is coming in. We debuted the videos on Facebook exclusively before getting them onto YouTube so we could keep everything inside of our digital database there. And all these audiences update every three to five seconds. So as users start to engage with the content, they're compartmentalizing or segmenting themselves into those various audiences that you've created. Now we can just look at a broad view of of the 100,000 people that watched this video. um, We had 80,000 people that watched 10 seconds of it. Well, why did we lose the 20,000 people? Maybe the first 15 seconds of the video is not engaging, or maybe they just didn't like it. But the good news is, as long as they watch three seconds, you can retarget them and follow them around the internet. So the ads aren't just going to run on Facebook or Instagram. They'll pop up on whatever apps the user is using, whatever other websites they're visiting, and you're only paying for impressions on those. So it's, it's a very cheap way to stay in touch with those fans, but it, al- it allows you a macro view of, here's all the people that are the least engaged with our content, And here's the people that are the most engaged. These are the people that watched 95% of all three music videos we've released. It's probably time to target them for a pre-order bundle or something along those lines because we can see exactly how engaged they are with the content. So, David, my brain wants to ask you about abandoned cart retargeting, but I'm not going to do it. Oh, I love it. I love it. I'm not going to do it. (laughs) But I do want to ask you about how effective YouTube ads can be. I think they can be great. Um, We have hyperculture. The way our business is structured is we have three different specialists that have three different backgrounds. So I'm familiar with the AdWords platform. I've done a bunch of campaigning on it, but Tanner is normally our our go-to guy in that regard. Um, To my knowledge, which is much more limited than him, and as Jeff was saying, like YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world behind Google. Um, And YouTube is owned by Google and it's exclusively video-based content. So the fact that it's the second largest search engine is just absolutely unreal. The retargeting possibilities there, as well as like the ad placement there, it's really easy for, let's say a band wants to have market share with Wage War, right? Great. You can go just drop your music video as a pre-roll or a mid-roll ad on Wage War's YouTube channel or on the Fearless Records YouTube channel in that case. And you can retarget video viewers who saw that ad with original pieces of content. Um, They don't allow the same sophistication of of data segmentation that Facebook does. Um, So I'm always going to be biased and err on the Facebook side. Um, As long as you have a good strategy, I think that your dollar is going to go a lot further on Facebook. But I think that YouTube has way more importance when it comes to longevity, which is where Finn's expertise would come in and like really building brand culture on your channel there and really making sure that you're putting, you know, not only uh, quality content out, but that it's 
being delivered consistently. Um, not only as far as like the timeline of when you're getting that out, but it's that it's also kind of in alignment with your overall brand ethos. So I would say, you know, there's so much, there's so many free resources out there. Like all the shit that I learned was from experience. I never went to school. Um, I learned through trial and error from starting my first company for digital marketing stuff. And I hired a lot of coaches and made a lot of mistakes all the way, but most of it was listening to a lot of great podcasts and reading a lot of great books. So I would say, put one of your band guys who seems to be the most like detail oriented or data driven person, put them, make that their field and then give someone else the responsibility of YouTube and make that their full-time thing in the band for six to nine months. And you can see quantifiable improvement, not only in the audience that you're building, but if your band is already cash flowing even a little bit, you can scale that pretty drastically. It takes a long time to get your band to a point where it's cash flowing. Um, and that's something with Hyperculture, we have a developing artist program that we are insanely strict on because most bands come in and they're like, oh, we're going to hire this agency and they're going to blow us up really quickly. Fuck no, we're not. Um, we can compress the amount of time that it takes to get there, but I never want a band coming on and thinking, hey, we're going to hire this agency and it's going to start paying for itself in two months. No, people can become curious about your band but they won't become a, a raving fan until they have some kind of emotional experience. Most of the time, that's going to be they see you at a show. And we yeah. can get more bodies in the room for you the first time you play there, sure. But it's still up to the band to win those people over. Sometimes it can be your song got someone through a, a very difficult emotional time in their life. Um, and that's incredible. But that's, that's the anomaly. Most of the time, it's you've got to get your butts into rooms and you've got to play. I don't get why bands that are starting out now aren't playing as many shows as possible. It just seems stupid to me. That's the only uh, right place now, you're going to win fans over. Right <laughs> now they're not, and it's understandable. But even but is, your, is your experience that 90% of the time that data-oriented guy is the drummer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's normally the singer. Okay. Wow. Yeah, huh. it's normally the singer or the guitarist. I don't know if that's like going against anything y'all have experienced, but normally drummers just care about drums. Jeff, I, I, I got a segue because I, 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 you know, I'd ask you about a self-liquidating funnel and a whole bunch of other stuff that I, I'd love to also dig into. But what, but one of the things that like I uh, that I have in mind is just that it's uh, Spotify is such a huge. Thing for every artist, it seems to be so freaking important to get those followers, to get those uh, those streams. Spotify itself is almost a social media platform. Do you look at it as a so as a social media platform, or is it incidental? And how do you work on increasing streams and increasing follower counts on Spotify for your artists through social media? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, and it's, you know, progressively become more and more of a social network in itself with Spotify for artists. And, you know, when I'm creating assets now, in addition to creating for all the, you know, all of our primary socials, I need to create Spotify canvas and headers and profile images for Spotify and all the, the various um, optimized graphics and, and video content respectively for, for that. So, um, it's also a great way too to encourage band members to create playlists that you can curate across socials and to <coughs> you know reach out and communicate with playlist curators to get placements for your band because you know we we get radio sends us updates weekly and those you know account for a, a large percentage of where plays plays are coming from you know through playlist curators and whether it's Spotify branded or, you know, more independent, like that's, we're seeing, there's a large portion of them coming from both, so. Awesome, Finn, can you talk about like, uh, how you use Spotify, if you use Spotify? Is there uh, advantages inside the, the data that you can get from Spotify? How, does, how do you look upon Spotify in terms of social media? Well, you guys all probably know more about Spotify than I do, uh, since I don't actually distribute anything on there. So you guys would be a better source of information than I would. 
But what I do, uh, as, as, uh, as, as you said, it is more of a social platform all the time. So what I do, I realized people were always, when I make a video about, say, metalcore, pop punk or something, some particular flavor of it, people would ask, can you make a Spotify playlist of all the songs you mentioned? And so I started doing that. And, uh, you know, they're not huge or anything like that, but I have like, I don't know, I think the biggest one I have is maybe 10,000 followers or something, which isn't bad. Uh, and so to me, that's just, uh, I'm not really aggressively trying to grow those playlists. I'm just using that as a way to deepen my relationship with the audience. Just another way for them to have a playlist. Like every time they open up Spotify and they see they have one of my playlists saved, they just remember me one more time. Uh, and also it's nice that some of them actually, I guess are popular enough. I get a lot of outreach. I have one that's like emo rap stuff, which is not the biggest one by any means, but for some reason I get hit up a lot for that one. Um, I don't know why, uh, but it's, it's cool that they're getting out there enough that people care. And, uh, I've actually gotten hit up by a couple artists and, and I generally speak, this probably make me sound like a dick, but generally speaking, I absolutely hate it when people hit me up about my playlists because it happens so often and it's almost always garbage. But that one in particular, I've gotten hit up by a lot of like pretty cool, like good and substantial artists. Uh, and so the way I use Spotify is it's just sort of another, I would think of it as like the seasoning on top of the main course for me personally. Um, and uh, those playlists, man, people care about them. That's the big thing I would take away from it. So if I was in a band, I would make a playlist about the genre that we are in with my band on it. You know, knowing that people care about these things, that's what I would do. Yeah, not to mention uh, how you trick the algorithm, as they say. Uh, David, uh, Spotify. So I, I've been in a position where, like, you know, I started touring full-time in 07. My band, my first band, The Crimson Armada, signed a very shitty, we were a tax write-off and didn't know it, you know, to, like, a big label. And uh, we learned that later on. But um, I've never had to deal with submitting on my own. Because um, any band that I've been in has been signed to a label. I, I do believe, hands down, I know that anyone in, in a, anyone who's in a band thinks Spotify or DSPs suck. Because we're all pigeonholed in contracts that pay us jack shit on them. But for any artist that's out there that's independent and owns their music, you can make a terrifying amount of money off of streams right now. Finn and I are both really close with Johnny Frank, whose project is Bill Murray. Um, he, he and I grew up K through 12 together. Our dads were in bluegrass bands. Um, and then Finn, I don't know how you guys connected. Um, if you guys have just known each other from like being in the scene or back in the attack days or something. Long story, Columbus, friends of friends. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I forgot you lived in Columbus for a while. Okay. Yes. So, um, Johnny is doing great and I can't get into specific numbers or any of that stuff, but like he owns his music independently. His brand is goofy as hell um because he almost has that like he just doesn't care and does it because it's fun mentality um and he makes a living off of his streams outside of merch outside of touring outside of anything else and there are so many artists that are doing that right now i think spotify creates more of an opportunity for bands this day and age um that has existed in the past seven to ten years realistically but how, but how about like utilizing it as a social media platform or using right the way to social media gets people to. so so the making it accessible is going to be one thing whether it's link tree whatever make sure you're copying the url from your actual page like don't put it through a bit url or something if i put an artist url through like bitly then all of a sudden when someone clicks on it it pulls it up in a browser um but if i pull it up uh just directly from the artist profile and then paste that say into a link tree or something along those lines and you click on that it'll pull it up in the user's native app um which eliminates you know two further steps for the user to make if it pulls it up in a browser they're going to have to close out of the browser or log in and then pull up the app and do it it's all about the path of least resistance and making it accessible as possible something else that i i think a lot of um developing artists overlook is the metadata in your tracks are unbelievably important when it comes to securing any kind of playlisting. Um, metadata is basically just the, the text information that you're putting in about the song, right? So who wrote the song? What BMI or ASCAP affiliation is there? Is there a, a guest vocalist? If so, what band? Um, 
and whatever it's essentially the product description for your track when you're entering it a lot of bands will skip that over spotify won't consider a song if, if the metadata is inaccurate or if there's no metadata um to my knowledge the other thing that a lot of bands mess up on is they'll submit the song for release like three or four days before the actual drop date which doesn't even give it enough time to get in the spotify uh, playlist curators queue to listen through the music. So it's recommended that you submit about four to five weeks out. And that actually puts the song in queue, which there's you know actual people, the curators are actual people who sit there and listen to all this bullshit, most of which is probably bad. And then they think, hey, this one slaps, I'm gonna put it on this playlist. Um, but if you don't give it enough time to get through the queue, it's not likely that someone's going to happen to listen to it right away and throw it on there. So um, as far as like increasing your chances for organic playlisting, um, submit it four to five weeks out and make sure that the metadata when you enter it is as accurate as possible. Awesome. Mike, can you take us home? How about um, this? Here's a question for you. Like during that album, uh, that album rollout, you know, there are the social media posts that try to get people to go to the YouTube. There's the social media posts that direct to the Spotify. How are you as a manager trying to balance uh, where those posts go to? Or do you just not care as long as it's just getting out there so that people can, uh, can, can uh, get exposed to what the album that's being promoted? <laughs> No, I mean, we uh, are focusing on what's immediately in front of us and then how is that going to allow us to leverage our long-term goals. So if we're putting an album out, most likely we're going to want to get eyes and ears on videos, whether that's on YouTube or streams, whether that's Spotify or Apple Music. But inevitably, how are we then taking some of that data, as David describes, and then parlaying that into something because he said most bands I manage are signed to labels. That's not direct income back to us. So then we're focusing on things that are coming directly into our pocket, pocket typically in the genres that we've been discussing and Ice Nine Kills and, you know, is t-shirts um, or something else of that nature. I mean, the beautiful thing about this panel, and I'll try to wrap it up is, you know, I, I, I See, it's so hard to actually do. To me, I couldn't go it alone, and I really couldn't do it without at least two of any of these guys that have been on the call with us today. I've got to have the band that's creating the content, right, where it's originating from, having that story that Finn likes to tell. Um, then I've got to have somebody advising, or, you know, at least on what the best content is for whatever the goals are. And then I've got to have somebody that's helping maximize that. Uh, you know that data to reach the people that unfortunately aren't aren't always reachable because of the way that the you know the the platforms are set up so the good news is i don't i don't find any fault in that i think the business models are the business models and i try to always encourage the artists let's find a way to utilize you know the the, the expertises that are out there and again, I'm in a fortunate position. I haven't had to go watch all the videos and educate myself on the capacity that these guys have because the artists I manage, we can actually afford these guys. But prior to doing all of that, right, I spent years and years doing similar things, just, you know, it wasn't really for the social media componentry of it. So, um, yeah, to me, the takeaway for any developing artist is, and, and really any established artist is, if you're willing to do the work and or have the resources to to get in in you know in cahoots with any of these guys you really can start to see returns that are so much greater than uh than you know would be if you weren't doing any of this stuff so that's exciting yeah jeff david finn mike Thank you all very much for being here. Really appreciate it. I mean, the information is just fantastic. So thank you so much for your time. Really, really. Great. Really appreciate it from all of you guys. I'll follow Thank up. you guys for, yeah. for having me, man. It really, really, I'm honored to be here. Same here. Rock and roll. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Dave.
Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, for me, this is going to be like my favorite topic. I love nerding out on data. So I wanted to talk to, uh, to these guys. We've got an amazing panel, so I'm glad everybody's here. I've got Bill Meese from E1 is here. I've got Randy Nichols from Force Media Management, Ryan Downey from Superhero artist management, Vivian Wang, who is a adjunct professor at USC, and Mike Mowry, of course, is here from 10th Street Entertainment. Uh, so, uh, Ryan, uh, let me start with you, if you don't mind. Uh, what's the big opportunity with data that most developing artists, at least, uh, they miss? Um, well, it's really, I mean, metrics and data it's really the only tangible evidence we have of what's effective in terms of what artists are doing to reach their existing audience, to nurture them, develop them, and to ultimately broaden what they're doing. I think, you know, in years past, prior to say, maybe that long tail idea that came around in, you know, the early 2000s, mid 2000s, the idea was, just total blanketing of everything, right? Like just an all out blitzkrieg with your marketing where you're just trying to get to as many people as possible at all times. And I think as media became further and further diversified and, you know, when it became a situation where if you were really into cooking, you had three different satellite channels you could watch about cooking the idea that you were going to penetrate mass media with an artist became even more of a, you know, one in a million shot, right? Like it, it got, it got to a point where the, by the mid two thousands where the number one song, most people probably didn't know just like the number one TV show, you know, when, when I think most of us who are probably all of us who are on this, when we were kids growing up with three networks or four networks, the number one rated sitcom pretty much everyone had seen. You know, all the shows that were in syndication, we had all watched. And that's changed so dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years that it's much more about kind of laser focusing and, and to target the people who are most likely to be responsive to what you're doing. You're not trying to reach everybody anymore because it's virtually impossible. You're trying to reach, you know, a very specific demographic that is going to be turned on to your movie or your book or your, or your band. So I think, <clears throat> you know, the constant uh, chasing and refining of data is really the only tool that you have to know what's working and what isn't working. You know, you can, it's tangible results about uh, the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of different strategies. So I think it's, it's probably the most important thing aside from the number one most important thing, which is making something that you love and feel passionate about that other people might connect to. Bill, I see you nodding there. Uh, have you seen a growing acceptance at E1 of data, uh, of data and using it, and uh, what, what, uh, how are you guys um, uh, using it today? What's something that you're doing now that you weren't doing, say, five years ago? Well, well five years ago, I feel like in our world is is a lot is a lot longer than it feels like, right? Um, but five years ago, we literally weren't doing anything that we're doing now, and you know, this stuff moves so quickly that you know, even six months goes by, and you know, certain things can change, certain trends can change. Uh, certain um, bellwether data points, as we talked about, uh, will change. But I was nodding because Downey hit it on the head. It's, it's, it's not so much about, you know, slicing data for the sake of data. It's slicing data for the sake of the audience and, and, and segmenting out that audience into, you know, hyper-segmentation, which you then can hyper-target. And, yeah, that's, that's it. Well, Vivian, I know that a lot of people get scared when they hear that they're being narrow casted to, or that people are are uh, you know, was it the uh, uh, the the uh, Facebook ran into trouble when they turns out that a lot of their data was being used to really, really target micro target individuals. Should people, as fans, should they be frightened of this, or is this as beneficial as it is detrimental? Well, I think. 
speaking personally, it is, yeah, I think fans and consumers should be wary of their data online and how it's being captured and used. And I, I do want to pull on like that thread that Ryan and Bill were referring to is that absolutely data is supposed to help you target the your fans. And just to, again, like pulling a thread a little bit, it's all about increasing a consumer's willingness to pay, right? So you have a threshold of what a person's willing to pay, like say for a concert ticket. And then you have uh, what it costs for that product. And that gap is your profit. So it's not only just about using data to like target and find those people, but how can you bring more value, like push that threshold of that consumer's willingness to pay so that you could not, it's not about like find everyone's grabbing at a dollar. It's about creating more value using data. So there's a hundred dollars that everyone can split. And I think that's what we're seeing the level of data we're able to collect and use help us create more value, not just find the value, but create more of it. You know what I mean? So is that, uh, would you say that it's, uh, from your experience, and, and perhaps you haven't seen this firsthand, but would you suspect that getting a fan from, say, spending $25 to instead spend $75 is a lot easier or more difficult than getting someone who wouldn't spend anything to spend a dollar? Right. I, I think, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Gotcha. <laughs> and, and so, like, would you would you look at data then as a, an area of opportunity for maximizing an artist's already existing fan base and that being more valuable than, say, trying to develop a fan base? Well, I think developing and maximiz maximizing are like the two sides of the same coin, right? So for a developing artist, like using, especially when it comes to the streaming data, what Spotify is able to provide, and I'm sure you're going to touch on this, Paul, so I don't want to like go too deep into it, but it's it can absolutely help you see what's working, what's not working, and again, provide more value in, the, in terms of music that not only the artist loves to create, but their fans love to listen to. Awesome. Randy, uh, do you need a lot of data for it to be actionable? Yeah, I, you don't need a lot of data. You need the right data. Like, that's, that's what's most important. And, like, I've just recently, as an example, was launching some new t-shirt designs for an artist working with a merch company that doesn't have a great data portal. And it's really frustrating for me when I'm launching something, I want to know which platform it's performing on because that's the platform to focus more on. You may want to start spending a little money against that advertise against those social posts to fine tune and hit those fans even closer. And so it's just, it's always about what data, because in that sense, it's literally, I just want to know where people are coming from, like what platform is most important to me. And without knowing that, it's useless. So it's not a lot of information in that scenario, but it's, it's the right information is what's super important. And you can overwhelm yourself looking for every data point, and every data point isn't necessarily important. Like knowing how many fans you have from 50 to 60 years old versus 30 to 40 years old there's, there's less uses for that, most likely, than knowing what social platform they're coming from when they're buying your merch. Well, can you go into that a little bit more? Because I think that's really interesting. Like, I guess my question would be, how often is it that the data that you find useful comes directly from the place where you're looking to sell or looking to spend or looking to you know what i mean like is facebook the best place for facebook and instagram data is uh, uh or is it a question of like well you can leverage data that you get from one source and it's going to be much more it could be as useful or even more useful someplace else yeah, I mean, one of the things I love at looking like using Shopify as an example, looking at your analytics dashboard within Shopify when you're launching a new merch item, it's so interesting because you can look at it and go, okay, that Instagram story is what's driving traffic. But sometimes it, it changes depending on the app, depending on the message, depending on the platform, how engaged people are on a certain platform at a certain time. Like, we've gone through moments where doing messages on bands in town drove more sales than Instagram, and make no sense to me. I couldn't believe it, but 
it happened. And then, you know, looking at Shopify again, one of the really cool things is it'll tell you where your traffic's coming from everywhere. And we got some press about, I think we we're doing um, like a new tour and it was VIP packages. I honestly don't remember what the item was, but I was able to tell which publications were driving the highest revenue for the band. So that when I'm launching my next merch item around a specific event or tickets or whatever, if I give that exclusive story to the publication that's driving the most sales, I should in theory then see a higher level of sales on our next tour if we gave a, you know, an advance notice to that publication in exchange for higher coverage. And I, imagine I, have the, I have the same example, if, okay. if I may. Um, yeah. uh, the Shopify dashboard is, is something I think we're all familiar with. Um, but one example I've done on my end is that uh, I noticed an increased traffic from South America. This is a couple months ago, like a serious increase of traffic from South America. And, we, and we, I could not figure out why it was not, we weren't running ads anywhere. There was no touring. Like there, there was no indication why those metrics were going up, but I had the idea. I was like, well, why don't we do a commercial in Spanish and run it and, and target each of those countries that, that are performing the highest, you know, um, among all the different countries that, that were, you know, hitting in South America. And it was successful. It, it turned out oh, to wow. be, you know, something that, you know, I mean, it wasn't, you know, something that, you know, was setting off alarms anywhere. But point being is that we took that data that we otherwise would never have known and turned it into another actionable item that had fruitful outcomes, which was cool. That's great. Mike, is there any, like, are there any, like, data sources or particular metrics that for you are just, like, at this point, they're just, uh, you need to see them every day. You need to see them once a week. Um, I mean, for me, with the artists, I mean, right this second, I'm focusing on what drives revenue and what I've got control over. Um, that's what I'm looking at every day. So, like many of these people, you know, I'm trying to sling T-shirts for our artists. Um and that involves looking at the Shopify stuff. You know, we have a pretty robust campaign that that we're running on, you know, the Facebook ad manager. So I'm looking at that data uh, with the experts that we've hired to, to do all of that. That said, I am going to the record label quite frequently to talk about what's happening with the Spotify um, and all of the streaming data. Um, so those are really the main ones that I'm looking at um, each and every day. Uh, Ryan, so uh, what are the tools generating the most data on fans that uh, that you, you look at and you're you're using? Oh, we got to un unmute there. So sorry. I was trying to take Myra's advice about the mute button. <laughs> um, I'm looking at a lot of a lot of different data actually, um, and, and really trying to still narrow down what's most important because there are new opportunities and new platforms and new places springing up all the time that are offering data and figuring out ways to kind of condense it. And I think uh, one of the reasons why I'm on this chat is uh, because of the industry newsletter that I've done for the last 10 plus years. And that really began at first as an email that I was sending to people in the bands that I was managing at the time that was really trying to provide context because everyone then was specifically focused on record sales and there was an increasing focus on first week sales. You know, what's our album going to do the first week it comes out. And I started sending that around gathering up record sales from comparable bands that were traveling in the same scenes as the bands I was working with as a means of saying, okay, you know, in our little circle of the music business, it's not doing you any good comparing yourselves to massive pop artists or hip hop artists or legacy rock bands. Um, here's more of an apples to apples. You know, these are your peers and contemporaries and bands you're on tour with. This should give you and me a better indication of kind of where things stand for you. And that developed over time from maybe 15, 20 people that I was sending that email to every week to, you know, more and more people were saying, Hey, I heard there's some kind of email you send out. Can I get on that? And then as that, as that grew, I started looking at different data as pure out what they call pure sales has become less and less relevant. You know, I started adding 
different things that I was throwing in, whether it was social media and, and so on, and, and even as that was kind of taking off. And it was actually a conversation that was led by Mike Mowry somewhere around 2012 or something. We were at a show in LA and Mike and I and 10 or 11 colleagues who were booking agents and record label staffers and tour managers and just various people from our corner of the industry were sitting around a table and something about my email newsletter came up and I made kind of a dismissive comment about like, ah, you know, I spend a couple hours on that every week and, uh, you know, it feels like pissing in the wind. Like I'm, you know, nobody's paying me for it. Um, and everyone around the table kind of erupted with like, no, 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 don't stop doing it. Like we love it. We depend on it for this and this. And people started telling me about, uh, how they had used it and how they keep it on file and how those, you know, uh, one of the booking agents that was at the table was saying that when she was trying to figure out which band should be where on a tour in terms of like, who's the main support and who's the opener or whatever, she would type my name into her computer to pull up my email and look at first week sales and social media numbers and all that. So it was around that time that I, I really started to recognize that the value in not only data, but in the specific data that's tailored to a particular group of industry professionals that care about, um, you know, X number of bands that fall into whatever criteria. Because that, that's something that as time has gone on, and obviously I'm talking a little bit ancient history, but it, it's only proven to be increasingly true how important it is to be able to tailor the data right to because i you know like randy was saying there's a lot of information out there that we don't necessarily need like when, when people talk about youtube views for example for me i'm interested to see how many people have watched this video and and what time you know what amount of time did it take to get to that many views and where are the like i don't know five or ten countries or cities that these views are coming from. I don't need necessarily how many likes, how many dislikes, how many subscribers does the channel have versus how many, you know, it's great to me that all that data is available, but I know that the hard and fast stuff that I want to look at to get a sense of where things stand is, is really more simple than that. The problem that I run into is working in a very genre specific area a lot of, you know, whether it's the Rolling Stone Artist 500, which they started recently, or the YouTube music charts that they that they provide, or services like Chartmetric, you know, a lot of great platforms that are out there, they're, they're doing everything, you know. So Spotify, for example, every week you can go look at a Spotify chart and see the biggest songs and the biggest artists, but because rock and metal music and punk music, which I think most of us work in, doesn't compete with the bigger stuff it doesn't even make those charts so something i've been really focused on is fine tuning and, and really specializing and focusing on data that's relevant in our corner of the industry and i feel like whoever can solve that problem for all the different diversified genres out there is going to be a, a big help to all of us well, Bill, can you build on that, that idea that, uh, uh, you, you know, there, there is good information to be had from generalized data, but can you actually make decisions on it and does that provide context and then filtering it down to it actually being something that is useful? You had a great anecdote of very specific data that is very um, uh, helpful, but is there anything more on a broader scale that you're looking at regularly that does help inform decisions? Yeah, um, especially when you're trying to develop an artist, right? I mean, I, I've had many situations where, you know, we start working with a, a very young artist and I go, okay, let's, let's see where we're at. And I go, okay, we got a lot of work to do. And then over the course of a couple of years, you, you have more benchmarks now than you ever had before because then you can turn around in six months and say, well, six months ago we were here and now we're here. You know, there's this much progress in these certain areas by this much percentage up or down. You know, we didn't have that back. You know, and you know, what Downey was saying about how when he was, you know, I remember when he was, you know, thinking about kicking that uh, newsletter away and everyone was like, no, don't do it. And everyone said that because 
believe it or not, I mean, I mean, you know, not taking away from what he was doing, it's actually good that he did it because for a lot of us, that's all we had. And to think about the tools that were just not at our fingertips then that are now, um, you know, that, that just kind of speaks to the music industry writ large that, w that has always knee-jerked against technology. And I feel like now we're at a point where we're finally starting to uh, embrace it more than ever, which is, you know, something everyone that's call has probably been doing for a long time but you know the whole our whole world hasn't um but as far as you know parsing out different you know pieces of data to, you know to meet certain goals it, you know over the course of a campaign or even a, a, an artist's career your goals change every day or every week and what i like about chart metric and spotify for artists and youtube music charts is and I, the fact that they do cast a very wide net amongst data points i like that because what what I need today might not be what I need tomorrow. And, but just knowing that it's there in case I do is good to know. Are you looking at that data inside those tools or do you extract the data from it? Me personally, I, I use a large tech stack, if you will, uh, just, you know, of all, all this, all this stuff, chart metrics and, you know, is probably one of the biggest ones, you know, music connect. I know we all look at cause that's all we have as far as, you know, parsing out sales. But yeah, I look at all of them and, you know, sometimes it's for my own, you know, internal mental notes. Sometimes it's for external reporting or, you know, or trying to make sense of an event or uh, a portion of a campaign. But I like having all that data spread out. It's you know, almost like a giant cupboard in a way where you can go in and pick out the ingredients you want to try to, you know, make something. Vivian, are there any particular tools that you recommend for the industry for uh, looking at this data that they're getting from YouTube, Spotify, and everybody, and social networks and everything else? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Bill, you're still using Music Connect? Because uh, Spotify, I think, is no longer reporting, right? Um, I remember hearing about that. Um, like a huge, like, yeah. why, why am I paying for this now? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. But that, again, that's to my point to that, the tech, you know, the, the tools that we all have access to and use sometimes go outdated and, you know, sometimes people don't even realize it and you have to you know, retool what yeah, they're doing. Like all of a sudden your total albums for a week just drops. Right. It just doesn't make any, right. Okay. Uh, so in my USC class, like we teach chart metric. Absolutely. Like everyone that is in one of my classes, Lawrence gets an account. We actually had the Trimetric CEO come in and talk to us, and that was really, really cool. Um, for social, CrowdTangle is pretty neat. I don't know if anyone's checked that platform out, but that's a pretty cool one. Uh, and then Music Connect, or used to be, I mean, I guess it's still useful for radio, but like for anything that, anything else, I like, don't really see a ton of value in that, unfortunately, anymore. Um, and yeah, Spotify for artists when I can get my hands on it. That's always great. I can send you a list, Paul, if I come up with anything else later so you can share with the group. It's all good. I, I mean, it seems like, and this was a question I was going to ask much later, but you have segued it to it really well here, that a lot of this data seems to be... Um, uh, uh, the, the uh, people in the industry don't have direct access. It's behind gates that industry needs to uh, purchase their way to get through if they even can. Right. Uh, it seems like it's been a missed opportunity. Are there any places besides like say putting um, uh, cookies on a website where the industry can do a better job of getting data directly from fans and utilizing it? And I mean, this really, this part makes me really upset. I don't know if you can tell, like it really breaks my heart that independent management companies, like smaller artists, like are unable to get access to their own data in a scalable way, because frankly, it is expensive to build ETLs to ingest the data. It is expensive to have a data analyst, like clean the data and then m make it useful for the decision makers like you. So that's why it's historically like large corporations um are the ones that are able to build these tech stacks and actually like utilize the data unfortunately like the only thing that i can think for the indies the independent management companies out there to be able to scale the data is just to 
in like export the data out of Spotify, put it into a Google Drive, build your database in Google Sheets. Like that's the only thing that I can think of that you guys could use, which is really kind of is what it is. I don't even know if Google Sheets do pivot tables, but uh, it does. Half, okay, good. About half the audience just said, I'm out now. Pivot, he said pivot tables. I'm out. Yeah. So, Randy, uh, like, uh, what tools are you using to aggregate all of these various data sources? Or are you? Are you just looking at, like Bill's talking about, having a, a, a cupboard where you just pull the ingredients that you need? Yeah, Vivian kind of nailed it, me being one of those indie managers. I'm just kind of hacking my way through, logging into each individual platform, digging through it when I'm working on a project that I need information on, and just trying to extrapolate whatever data I can from my years of experience of working in the industry to decide what the best actions are to take. So un unfortunately, I, I don't have you know these great stats that, that are going to give me this amazing report. But at the same time, I've found that, you know, Thankfully, most of my artists are involved with, like, say, a Live Nation or an AEG when it comes to touring. And I open up our platform, let them pixel our pages and do everything else they can to help track our fans and work hand-in-hand -hand with the promoters. And then I'll work hand-in-hand -hand with the labels and in the same way with merch companies. And ideally, if I'm working with the right partners who are managing their data correctly it's not as bad of a situation as Vivian was describing, but it is frustrating that I can't do more. And this is something I don't know where everyone else stands in this group, but I absolutely tend to choose partners based on how they manage our data. And, you know, obviously sec security of our fans data, but beyond that, how I can view it and how they act on it is extremely important. And again, I mentioned this earlier in the call, I work with one merch company for one of my clients who I don't want to name because they're good friends of mine, but I don't have access to a dashboard even to see what our sales are. And it's, it's a major company that's out there today and it's, it's mind blowing to, to see something like that still today. And you know, that, that one's based on relationship that you know, I, wish, I wish it wasn't, but the scenario is there and it needs to happen. And I know for a fact that my client is seeing less sales because of it but it's a decision that my client and I made together that some things are more important than the data, unfortunately. Randy, do you have an estimation of, of the discrepancy in sales based on the platform? Like, do you think you're losing 20% or do you think it could be as high as 50%? It's so hard to put a percentage on it because some of it is just becoming unmotivated to work more to promote something when you don't know if you succeeded or not. So you, it's very difficult to know why you have a win or why you have a loss on something if you can't see any information at all. So it's, it's so hard to even give you a percentage because I, I just have so little information. Randy, just to follow up on that, are you, are you expressing this to your clients? Like, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and in this, in this scenario, the company that will remain nameless over the call is working very quickly to rectify the situation and is actually asking me to be a beta tester of their platform they're finally oh, rolling yes. out that should have been done sooner. And it's, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar corporation that, that is involved in this merch company. So it's not a small-time merch company by any stretch. I can echo Randy's sentiments because I've, I've had a very similar very similar situation in the years past uh, sounds uh, almost identical and it was a big reason why we moved on yeah uh, i mean staying on that yeah staying on that merch topic for whatever reason and i think some of it comes from where the merch business began years ago and the original leaders of merch companies were all the bootleggers who were in the parking lot in the 70s and 60s selling bootleg merchandise and ripping off the bands then they realize they can make more money partnering with the bands, but also ripping off the bands at the same time. And these people are still a lot of the gatekeepers, although it's beginning to change over the last couple of years. And they were incredibly resistant to proper sales data being available in the merchandise industry. So they're, they're behind even the recorded music industry in sharing information with their clients. And Shopify changed the game ultimately 
where people realized how much they could see. But it's 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 taken time for an entire segment of the industry to update. But it's it's a lot closer than it was two years ago. Mike, I, I, in my head, I'm thinking it would be awesome if there was some sort of like music industry data lake where all of these various streams can all go to and people could extract what they need when they need. But just from a manager's point of view, how are you de-siloing all these different data sources from the record label to the merch to the social media manager, all that sort of thing? Are you able to get these different people to collaborate at all with the data? Yeah, we are actually. And I mean, I think that's part of the, the key to something like Ryan or Randy or myself who, who manage artists. That's part of our job with where the data is at this, this point. You know, I've got to be that central piece that knows what I can get, what I can't get, what I need, and then who needs all of that information. I love the idea of the lake. I mean, you know, when Ryan first came up with his you know, industry email, which has continued to develop and is such a resource, you know, I think that's a start. It's somebody like that taking these points. But as you can see, there's so many. And, you know, one of the things that I've always wanted, right, when SoundScan was such a big thing, as Ryan was alluding to, you know, I was managing a lot of bands that weren't selling CDs yet, but we were selling merchandise. So I always hoped that we could develop something called Merch Scan. But inevitably, that requires getting the data, which is becoming more and more available, though it's not nearly as available. And then, yeah, compiling it. And then how do you get everybody to kind of go to the same lake, right? So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely. Ryan, sort of to build on that, I mean, you've got a, you've got a long-term view and a long-term data collection plan. As an artist manager, a lot of that long-term data is much more valuable than it probably is for, say, the new guy that you just hired to do the social media campaign for. So um, what is your perspective and how do you collect and is there value in that old data that, uh, that you're able to utilize? Um, yeah, and you know, to, to jump off from something Mike just mentioned and something that Vivian was talking about and, and all of, you know, was brought up a little while ago, and you brought up, uh, it was very cost prohibitive to get access to this data. Um, I remember, you know, starting out as a manager, the labels that the various bands I represented were signed to, and not even all of them, but some of them would send me our sound scans every week, like individualized for the band. But that was it. And I, you know, being somebody who was just interested in general and you know, those numbers didn't really mean much to me if I didn't have any context, if I didn't understand like, okay, uh, you know, bleeding through did 19,000 first week. But if I don't know what every time I die and under oath are selling, like, what do I, who cares? Like, cause I don't, I don't know if that's good or bad, you know? So then you, then you're like, well, how do I get a sound scan account? That'd be fun to be able to go in there and poke around. It was so expensive. I mean, like I, I can only assume by design, right? To to be a gatekeeper, to uh, you know, make sure that the layman didn't have access to that information. And I always was frustrated by that. And that's continued a little bit with Buzz Angle and Music Connect and some of these services that have come along to try to replace what SoundScan was doing. So the service that I'm providing, and this is something that I've realized, Bill, and one of the reasons why I thought it was so important to have Bill join us on the Zoom thing. He's a data nerd, even more so than I am. Like it's someone that just loves all of these emerging technologies and keeps track of them. And, and you know, he, he's uh, constantly telling me about productivity tools. He was doing a productivity podcast at one point with another friend of ours. So he's, he's the first person I think about when it comes to where do I go to get this stuff and what can I find? However, in my experience, the vast majority of people who subscribe to my newsletter, even if they, even the ones who are aware of all the tools that Bill is aware of, they aren't, they either don't have the time or won't make the time or don't have the interest to actually use them. So they're not, they're not logging into all these different platforms and tailoring it and typing stuff in and, and looking things up. They seem to prefer 
having someone like me sitting around and doing that and assembling it all into an easy to read format. That's just the basic facts for the week of like, here's a bunch of bands and records and videos and tracks and social media accounts that you care about. Here's kind of where they all stand this week. And certainly for managers, labels, you know, that do their own internal stuff um, in terms of trying to reach and develop their own audiences, they'll continue to do that. But in ter- you know, going back to your thing about a lake where we could have all these tributaries, you know, arriving. Yeah, no one's no one's really figured that out. Um, and I don't know that there will be a monolithic thing because, you know, much like Vivian brought up with Spotify kind of pulling their data from Music Connect, like everyone's so tribal and everyone's so proprietary that it's going to be hard to get everyone under an umbrella like you used to have with Nielsen and SoundScan. And, you know, and that's probably good. There's probably a lot of reasons why it's good to not have a monolithic gatekeeper of data. But I do think that there will always be a need for something like the small service that I'm providing, which is grabbing a bunch of that information that makes sense together and contextualizing it and, you know, putting it, really plainly in one place to look we, at. We, we just need another tier, which involves your commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that, I don't, I, I don't mean that in jest. I mean, that no, Mike's been saying that to me for years. I'm just, yeah. I'm, a, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, Vivian, so- like all the, the talk that we've, we've had so far about the data has been like talking about it in terms of like, um, uh, we'll call it the rear view mirror. Right. But, Data also has the ability to be predictive of front windshield. So is, are there any sort of opportunities with using data in a predictive way that are getting missed or that just aren't available yet but will be? Man, I can't. There's so much of this I can't talk about. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, short answer, yeah, like we're definitely, I mean, there are definitely efforts being made to do cool things, uh, machine learning, neural network models to predict a variety of KPIs, right? So like streaming, um, I would imagine Spotify would probably be working on that. Um, Yeah, a a number of things that, yes, they are. And I think a really cool resource for those people that are interested in that is Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E. They have data sets there for you to pull and um, places uh, it, it, there's even like step-by-step guides on how you would start building something like that. Um, I suggest to my students data camp as well. Um, data camp like machine learning for in R is something that can definitely do and there's just not enough people in the space that are interested in doing that and also these people are very expensive and only the biggest companies can afford someone to do those types of things. Uh, I always tell my students, I like I always poke them for their final project. They have to like come up with a problem in the music industry and solve it with technology. So I always tell them that there's such a gap here. If you wanted to start a company that could ingest different sets of data, create connections so you can contextualize, like there's an appetite out there. If someone wanted to start that company, like happy to consult. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, how do you utilize data during a release rollout in order to iterate your marketing so you have that that like Brian mentioned the the first week the first few weeks boom uh, is that something that you're able to do or when you have a release rollout designed it just it, it's written in stone and you're not gonna gonna sway from it no no and, and honestly it's it, it's not, it shouldn't be as difficult as it really is to parse together all the numbers, it, particularly U.S. versus global data. Um, I, I know that's one of the biggest things a lot of us are, are, are kind of, you know, put our hands up over. It's like, okay, this, we got all this data, but this was just North America. But, you know, the band has toured Europe for 10 years, and they've done X in Germany and X in France. Like, how does that correlate into one big picture, right? Like, that's, that should be way easier than it is. Um, but, but as far as parsing the data during a rollout, you know, me personally, I, I've taken it from a, a, you know, a week by week lead up campaign with, you know, a goal by goal kind of strategy. Whereas, you know, like, all right, for the next 10 days, 
is we're going to do this and do it this way based on the past data that we you know that we've got you know gathered from the previous campaign and then see where we're at and then what ryan alluded to in the, uh, early in the call is okay you know let's keep doing what worked and stop immediately what isn't working and that's kind of the whole point of all this right it is to parse out the data and you know take what's working and, and leave what isn't um you know it's, as far as what Downing was saying about tools like tools are great and, and tools will, will will get you you know it's like tools at anywhere else like a, a good table saw will work better than a crappy one but you know it's the archer and not the arrow and what you do with that data and what you do from you know with those tools is is really what matters um but the, the thing is too is like you know we, we, for, for people like us, we all talk about, you know, gatekeepers and, you know, high, high barriers to entry as far as, you know, cost, which is true. But on the flip side of that, if you're a young emerging artist with no manager like, like Mike or Ryan or, or Randy, and you're doing it by yourself, there's more now than there ever has been to get your hands on and dig into, a, you, know, you know, multiple sets of data that, you know, guys like, you know, us when we were all in bands never could have dreamed of. Um, you know, especially through the platforms themselves. Like I know like the Twitter analytics on their own um, is pretty damn good from my experience. And yeah, you can spend money on a tool that, that digs deeper, like, you know, uh, like CrowdTangle or, or Sprout Social or Buffer or something, all great tools. But, you know, the stuff that's cost-free is still there for young artists to grab. I'm so glad you brought that up because that's, that's where I wanted to go next. I mean, I, a number of us are, are former musicians ourselves. And so, you know, from the 90s, I mean, for myself, I remember going out on that first tour and we had no sales numbers had come in. And, you know, we were going out like the week before the album was even coming out. We had no idea if anybody was going to show up or not because we weren't big enough to sell advanced tickets no matter in where, anywhere we were. Nowadays, anybody can look at Facebook and see how many likes they've been getting for weeks and weeks and weeks or uh, 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 shares on, uh, uh, on Twitter or Instagram and everything else. Uh, Randy, how important has social media gotten to you and uh, your clients in measuring uh, the potential successes of your releases and, and, and album cycles? I mean, ultimately, it's the, the most important thing. No, no question about it. Social media is where I would say probably like 90 plus percent of all the commerce comes from. It's how we're educating fans. Even if you have a song, you know, I, I primarily am managing stuff right now that's rock radio bands. So if you're rock radio and have a top 10 song, social media is still more important than that top 10 song at rock radio. Just to kind of give, give a vision to a young artist who thinks being on the radio is the end all be all. But social media is still going to be your primary piece. And then from there, it's just, which platform is driving the most. And you know, one of the things I always tell younger artists is have some kind of presence on every platform, but just use what speaks to you and speaks to your fans because not every platform is going to be right for every artist. Some artists, you know, Pinterest may even still be right for. Not many, but some may. And you, you shouldn't rule out any type of platform that may be right for you. You may be, you know, you may be a TikToker or even Twitch. Like there's so many different routes to go that, you know, you, you, you shouldn't just focus on one social media platform. It needs to be where your right fan base is and focus on that. Mike, I'd seen uh, a thread on Twitter just the other day where they were, uh, I think it was Blasco was asking, you know, do you uh, do you want do you care to get signed? And you know, everybody's like, oh no, I never want to be signed. <laughs> the stage has never been offered anything. But the thing to me that that like I read that and I go, wow, you. If there's one thing that labels and 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 other industry um, uh, uh, stalwarts, I guess I don't know how else to put it, that the advantage the unfair advantage you get at this point are the best practices that bill is talking about that come from learning from the data from releasing stuff over and over and over again um is that the big advantage now that you get from signing to a big booking agency a big record label and so on and so forth it's one of them for sure. I mean, leverage is a component, but if we're talking specifically about the record labels, of course, I mean, part of it is they've built up their own 
social media platforms to give you a leg up by just launching whatever it is that you're doing. Um, but of course, I mean, part of what made us even remotely valuable with this coaching platform was, you know, my 10 plus years of experience of managing tons and tons and tons of super small baby bands, working with all of the relevant labels, you know, within the genres that I kind of specialize in and taking those points from each and every one. And throughout that entire time, I would take, oh, this label is doing this. Let me take it over to this other label and see if it makes a difference with the artists that were working there. So, um, but again, as Bill said, I mean, I, I just about to pick up an artist who has had monumental success online on their own. And these guys are data nerds. They're, they're hungry for it. They're excited about it. They're even digging in and saying, okay, what is it about this song? that's reacting differently than others? Is it the beats per minute? Is it the chorus came in at a certain time? Some of the stuff that we've all kind of trained ourselves to think, but they're actually looking at it with, within the parameters of what data is available. I mean, this is kind of what you put in is what you're going to get out. You know, one of the reasons I asked Randy if he kind of could estimate that discrepancy is, you know, uh, I feel like with what I'm doing with data right now with, you know, Ice Night Kills is all icing on the cake, right? Like we already have a pretty great business and now we're going in and honing in on data to see how much of a difference it can make, right? And in a short amount of time, we really, really, really started to dig in during quarantine. We're three months in, I'm seeing a spike. I'm curious to see how far that can go. And I really love what Vivian said. I hadn't even really come at the data with, how do I get that, you know, bridge that gap that she was talking about between whatever, you know, what somebody's willing to spend. I hadn't even really thought of it in that capacity until this panel. So thanks for that. <laughs> Ryan, uh, there's, there's a few things I would love to ask you, but we, we, we're, we're running short on time. But like, is there, when Mike talks about like uh, uh, using data to do to what ultimately affects even the creative process for your uh, for artists is that something that artists are should be doing more of or is that like sacrosanct you just don't go there i would say it varies artist to artist in terms of what they're comfortable with and what they feel like is part of their expression i mean you know the punk rock part of me that i think probably all of us on here share to some extent is thinks that's anathema but at the same time, um, one could certainly argue that it's not any better or worse than looking at any other kind of metric. Uh, so, you know, it would be difficult without taking a fan poll or something to really determine those kind of specifics, I think, about what's connecting on a creative way. I still think there's still some magic to that and some chance and different stars aligning. I mean, you know, you mentioned Blasco a moment ago. I actually did an um, hour and 40 minute long Zoom with him today for something different. And we were talking about a band that he was in in the early 90s that was had a development demo deal with AM and then ended up signing to Elektra and, you know, spent $350,000 making a record and had the same managers as Pantera and White Zombie and big producers and you know the record came out and flopped and they were dropped and like and the story of so many bands from the 70s 80s 90s and you know in those instances for the metrics and the uh, the sort of juice that you could get around a record or an artist there were so many examples like that where they had everything you know they had everything in place in terms of the right label the right team the right marketing the right producer the right songs, and then sometimes it just doesn't happen. So I think all of us, for all, I mean, given this is obviously a data-centric conversation, and maybe it's awkward to bring this up, but we should all probably, myself included, remember that some of it's just, it's, it's out of our control and it is intangible, and sometimes something works despite itself, you know? And you mentioned like, you know, just having a, a very, very large budget uh, data seems like a really great opportunity, not only for like what Vivian was talking about earlier about maximizing how much income can come in, but also as a way to minimize expenses. Is that anything that you've 
uh, work with or face with your clients are utilizing data in order to keep costs low? Yes. And in fact, something I just thought about that speaks to your creative question as well. Uh, so the band Demon Hunter, who I've worked with for the last 15 years or so, we, uh, a couple of, a couple of years ago, I guess, I had pulled all of their Spotify data. I, I mean, it, it's been a while, I guess, so it would have been right around the time Spotify for Artists was really coming out of beta, and you could actually go and look and see cities, countries, towns, demographics, and which songs were doing best. And we figured out, looking at Spotify and, and Apple's metrics that came out, I think, a little bit later, their number one track was a B-side. Uh, that was, you know, just vocal and keys that, uh, yeah, was, wasn't issued on an album. And, and they had never performed it live. They'd never even thought about performing it live. And I went to them as the manager and said, like, this song is not only your most popular song on streaming services, it's your most popular song by a wide margin. Let's just try it live. And it's their biggest song live <laughs> now. You know, so, I mean, that's, like, very, like, you know, nuts and bolts, brass tacks, like using metrics to find something out that we wouldn't have known that has been beneficial not only to the band, but to their audience, because their audience is super psyched to hear that song they were all listening to that we never would have dreamed they were all listening to. So yeah, those specifics can definitely help in the creative sense. And it's really up to the individual artist to determine whether or not to go, oh, well, since now we know that was our number one song, maybe we should write 10 more of those on the next record. And that, that's kind of up, I think, to the individual to determine whether or not they think that's uh, appropriate or, or uh, ethical. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's no shame in it if that's, if that's the way you want to ha handle it. But so I'm, I know I'm getting away from your original question, but I just remember oh, yeah. that anecdote from your question. Great before. story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and uh, reducing costs, anything there? Oh, yeah. To, your, to, to that point, um, yes. That's another thing is... Uh, when it comes to reducing costs, <laughs> we did the last couple of tours that Demon Hunter did. We did the evening with format where it's just, just the band. They do an hour long acoustic set, 30 minute video intermission, hour long heavy set, end of the show. And a nice long fan meet and greet thing happens after sound check. And, you know, this, this is coming from years of building touring packages. Here's your headliner. Here's your co-headliner. Here's your main support. Here's your, and all the um, arguments and back and forths and battles that happen between all the managers and agents and labels and all the competing agendas and trying to determine the value of one man over another and who's going to get what and then dealing with catering and all of those people and trying to find parking for three buses every day. We, we were just like, you know what? We're going to do a tour with no one else that's going to be just them. There'll be no padding or inflating of the numbers because that's another thing I'm, I'm sure all of us as managers and have, have dealt with, right, where uh, <laughs> when, you, when you make a great package and you have sold-out shows, the headliner always gives themselves the credit. And when the package goes out and does poorly, the headliner goes, look at all these crappy bands we got conned into taking as support. They were supposed to draw people. And we were just we just decided like let's let's not play that game. Let's not get into ad mat wars about whose logos next to whose and who's on the left side and who's on the right side. We're just gonna go out by ourselves. And if no one comes, then we know we're worth no one. You know, it was just we just went for it. And it was obviously I wouldn't be telling the story if it didn't have a happy ending. It was our most successful run, you know, in the band's career, certainly in many years, and merch was great and there were no headaches. But we used data to go into Spotify and figure out uh, our biggest cities, our biggest markets, and went to our booking agent and said, here's the cities we want to play. And we went and played in all the cities <laughs> in the U.S. where the most people are listening to them on Spotify, and we had very successful shows. Yeah, it's similar. Uh, I think I'd heard the story about it this. Is, it is very it does have a very tangible benefit in that sense. And that to your question of yeah. keeping costs low, um, we kept costs low by not paying a support bill <laughs> and making sure that every town we went into was going to be somewhere that the band would be more successful than towns where we didn't have as many listeners. Vivian, I hope you would let us be a little bit of a fly on the wall in your classroom. Are there any 
music industry problems that you hear over and over again from your students that you think better use of data can help solve? Uh, kind of, I think basically the one that we've all been skirting around today of like, how do we make this data accessible to everyone? How do we like make data equality? Because the more that we expose everyone to data via tools, the more, the sooner like our industry is going to pick it up and be more fluent in it. But I think it's like a cause and effect. There's not any tools out there really for all the indie managers, which is the majority of the music world, Spotify, you know, is going to be producing a lot more club and touring acts than giant arena acts, just with their initiative of, you know, however many million, I don't remember a million artists on Spotify, but like that to sustain on that platform, it's going to be a lot of the smaller acts. So it's, I would hope that you all as managers are pushing on your ends to get these tools built um, so that this data can be made more available to everyone. Bill, what's your biggest pain point? What's the thing that you wish you had in your arsenal? Um, well, the, like I said, the U.S. versus worldwide thing is, is a big one. Uh, but maybe, maybe not, you know, in addition to data equality and data access, um, is, is kind of data education in a way, especially for young artists and young managers who, you know, have no foundation at all. Not that we had any foundation. You know, we, we all learned trial by fire. But learning which data is viable and good and in what situation and learning what data isn't. And uh, I'll just, one example I, I deal with all the time, and I'm curious what the rest of you guys think, but Spotify monthly listeners is one that I run into quite a bit. And, you know, my personal opinion is that, you know, your monthly listeners can, it, it's, it's volatile, right? It, 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 it rises and falls based on playlisting or, or this and that. And I wish there was more of an education base. Uh, and maybe that's up to the labels and larger companies with best practices. And, and, and maybe that's one of the, the benefits of signing to a label, right, is to get that education to begin with. Um, but parsing out data, which is good, or, or not even good or bad, but maybe on a sliding scale of what's very, very important and what's you know, maybe not so important. Randy, how are you parsing that out? I mean, you talked earlier about trying to stay focused. I think for you know any of us who, the first time we learned that you could do a mail merge on Excel and Microsoft Word, all of a sudden we're spending hundreds of dollars in stamps that we never had before <laughs> you know, 20 years ago. Similarly, that can happen with data as well. So how do you pick out what's important and what's not? You know, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. And to be honest, it would be great if there was a platform out there that took all this music data and educated people. These are suggestions of what to do with this information. So, you know, if you look and see your Spotify streams grew, you know, 20% this month, if it can, you know, you know, kind of going back to what Vivian was talking about with machine learning, it would be great if it could tell you that because of these three actions that happened on other platforms that drove your Spotify plays, that kind of information would be priceless to have to better understand what to do with it. And I know that wasn't exactly your core question, which I've kind of forgotten, but no, that's even better. I love yeah. that. Uh, yeah, because, you know, Spotify and these other tools are using AI and, and why can't the, why can't the managers, why can't people in the industry, uh, you know, as fans, we get suggested songs and bands should have suggested fans. Yeah. And I mean, I could give a great example where, you know, yesterday, my day to day manager on Under Oath messaged me. We just, we saw SoundScan for the week of the top albums and we were just having a conversation and it was why is Mac Miller's album number three or four or whatever it was this week it it went up like got from like a thousand to twenty thousand in a week and we were just bored and go to chart metric and we're going to all these sites trying to figure out what driver drove this and it's not our act but it's still important to understand why other acts sales are being driven in in a week and you know for us, we're at a loss. We couldn't figure out what it was that drove those sales. But I did see a couple of other Warner Music acts have big jumps. So I was like, oh, maybe they did some kind of sales special for a couple of different records 
with some, you know, platform, you know, iTunes, I guess. I don't know where else they're still selling significant amounts of music, but I, 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 I love looking at that and just figure out why is something happening. And it may not even be my act, but I'm hoping that I can learn how to drive sales for one of my acts from what someone else is doing. Oh, you, you hit the nail on the head with asking the question why. Uh, that, that is just so key, I think, with all this data, not only why to use it, but also trying to find the answer to that question and that alone whenever you're searching through it. Uh, Mike, can you kind of wrap us up? Uh, this has been a really fascinating discussion. Um, like, when you ask the question why, are you able to find it in the data more now than ever? Um, try to wrap this thing up to me, right? I like the question of what is, is missing. And what I've always wanted is for somebody to be able to simplify a way for me to, I just want to compare. I want to say is under oath as big as demon hunter, right? And I want all of the data to be able to be compiled in one place and take in every last bit of thing you could measure and spit out. Yes, one is definitively better than the other, but we don't really live in that world because there are so many different points that uh, I, I just don't think that that's possible yet, but that's kind of where I hope that we get. So ultimately to me, right, I feel like a data novice on this panel and it's just so wonderful. I love like Randy's curiosity about what happened with Mac Miller is why I like to call Randy all the time. And for those of you that are out there who don't really understand data yet, start asking these questions. Start to find other people like, you know, I didn't even realize that Bill was so into, into this as he was until I went to Ryan and said, hey, how do we build out this great panel? And that's what I do on the regular for all of my artists is when I don't understand exactly what I'm getting in, I try to go to somebody else, either that's within the team or within my Rolodex to say, hey, what is it that I can be doing with this data? And oftentimes I might go to them and say, hey, this is what I'm trying to figure out. What data should I use to help me make this determination? That's awesome. Everybody, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate your time. It's been fantastic. All right, thanks everybody for being here. I got a really uh, exciting panel to present and I'm super excited to have everybody here. So uh, today we're gonna be talking about the Sideman, uh, the uh, guy in the band who is usually hired on by the, uh, well, I would call sort of self-directed artist who uh, has a band that uh, is making enough money to afford to pay for musicians to help them out and fulfill their vision. So we've got four amazing sidemen here with us today, as well as Mike Mowry. So let me start by introducing Mike Mowry from 10th Street Entertainment is here. And I have Owen Beverly. Owen has an, uh, an amazing catalog of music that everybody should check out as uh, Indianola, uh, previously uh, French Camp. I'm going to go through all the different iterations, but also performs with Nicole Atkins and uh, has previously performed with Oland. Uh, let's uh, introduce Doc Coyle. Doc, you might know from the band Bad Wolves and previously from the band God Forbid. Gerardo Larios is here with us. He is from the band Spoon, probably the most uh, decorated, I saw an article the other day, it was the most critically acclaimed band of the uh, first 10 years, of the, or the last 10 years, something like that. It's, it's an amazing achievement, amazing band. And I've got Dan Sugarman here from Ice Nine Kills. Dan also uh, re, uh, writes and records his own music as well. So uh, let's get started. Doc, I'm hoping uh, you'd be willing to kick us off. Um, uh, when you moved, from the East Coast out to LA, uh, did you envision getting a gig as a side uh, as a side man? Was that part of your plan? And how crucial was it to be in LA to make that happen? Kind of. I, I would say it was more of an experiment. At the time, I was about thirty four years old, and in rock and roll years, that's kind of like old man. <laughs> that's over the over the hill stature. So I was you know, kind of coming out here just to see kind of what I was made of. But what put me on that path really was getting a gig, filling in for Mark Morton from Lamb of God on a tour with Metallica. Uh, 
in 2009. At the time, I had never played really with anyone except for God Forbid. I actually turned down the gig at first because uh, I was so used to like being in one band and thinking of that group of people that kind of seeing myself as my own entity was kind of alien to me, no pun intended. And, um, and that gig was such a high level in terms of difficulty and challenge. And it was on the biggest stage possible, opening for the biggest metal band of all time. And when I did that, kind of, and I was self, I doubted myself the whole time, it kind of, and I actually did a good job, it kind of put a different confidence in me that like maybe I could do things outside of just the band I was in. Um, when I quit, God forbid, I went on tour with On Earth, for, did two tours with them playing bass guitar. And then, you know, it kind of opened up this idea that maybe I could do it. And then the thing coming out of the kind of hardcore metalcore scene was so many of those artists basically were as good and as professional as the band they were in was. And when the band ended, usually most of those people went to get regular jobs. And so it was kind of like a big, um, you know, feat to like survive past your band. Cause it means you're not just someone who exists on the achievements of just the kind of entity that you are kind of your own thing. And that was something I was trying to prove to myself that I actually, uh, was a good enough of a professional musician to actually play with other bands. And I moved to LA and I just started playing with everyone. And I got a gig with uh, this band called um, The Killing Lights, which was guys from Vampires Everywhere. Um, and they were like on Victory Records. And then I played with uh, a female drummer named Maytal Cohen, who is a huge YouTuber. And I went on tour with her. And then I filled in for Darkest Hour, went on tour with them. And, you know, I, I play in a band with Rob Trujillo from Metallica called Mass Mental and sometimes another band with also Kirk Hammett called The Wedding Band. And even since Bad Wolves has taken off, I went and played with Mark Morton from Lamb of God with his solo band. Um, I've turned down gigs, you know, with, uh, you know, suicidal tendencies and things like that. So even though I'm in a band, you know, that is works full time, I'm always doing things outside of that and never kind of, people still call me and Part of it is just you, you, you tend to see the same people get the same gigs mainly because of reliability. You know, they just know, okay, this person's going to show up and I don't have to worry about them. They're going to show up prepared, you know, and usually nine out of 10 times I end up being like the, the musical director. I come in, you know, I got, you know, I got all the tabs for all the songs. I have all the charts. I'm like, <laughs> and not because I'm like, think I'm better or work harder than anyone. I'm just so paranoid about it sucking that I just go overboard. <laughs> Understood. Owen, you've moved around a lot over the last few years. Uh, what, Memphis, New York, Nashville, some time in Scandinavia, am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and so what are the differences in terms of uh, finding these sideman gigs from city to city, and and is there a difference between how you uh, uh, connect and ingratiate yourself to a scene when you arrive on it new? Um, well, I think you know probably like some other people on this panel and at large, you know what some of the work that I do is not necessarily a, a product of that's what I was trying to do when I became a musician. It's just that was the work that was available to me. Um, so when moving around, trying to, uh, you know, uh, start new projects, uh, carry on with older projects. At some point, you know, if you're not financially um, successful at it, then you kind of need to make yourself available to a wider net if you want to be a musician full time. So for me, it's kind of been more about doing the work that is available for me to do and it, it's taken on you know in, I, i've learned to play instruments that i didn't know how to play because i got an offer to you know go on tour with the band playing that instrument um and now i'm doing a lot of studio work which you know isn't something that i was into 10 years ago so i think it's kind of like it's such a dynamic field you know if you're dedicated to being in the music business you know the the big break is not always like the thing that comes along and changes your life sometimes it's just a slow grind 
over decades of kind of adapting and learning new skills and just doing whatever you can to, to try to stay in your scene. And I guess to answer your, your question, sometimes I, you know, when I moved to New York, it was because I was hoping to broaden my, uh, my, my networking as a writer and a musician. And it was really difficult because there's a lot of people that go to New York to do that. But after four or five years, you know, I had kind of gotten somewhere and was doing some really cool writing projects and it, and it started to play with, uh, you know, nationally touring act, which was OLAN. And then that led me to Scandinavia where, you know, I got some other gigs playing with some Danish artists. Um, and then after that, I kind of wanted to move to a new spot and just try something different. And so I ended up in Nashville, which is another big music city. And, you know, being here for three years, I've, I, I play with, three or four bands that I haven't hadn't heard of before I moved here. And, you know, it, it's just kind of, I, I guess to reiterate my earlier point for, for me, it's kind of constantly been about adapting and, you know, tightening up on whatever it is. You know, if you get a call and somebody says, Hey, do you play keys? It's like, well, I haven't done a keys gig in a long time, but you know, maybe honestly say, well, these are who I've played keys with before. Here's some recordings of me playing keys. And then before the first gig, I'm spending two weeks playing the keyboard because I haven't done it in a couple of years. You know what I mean? Um, so for me, it's like just constantly adapting, trying to be willing to learn new instruments, new skill sets, new software, whatever it is. I just got a pedal steel last week after being in Nashville for three years. And, uh, you know, it's just, I, I think that it's, chal it's fun because it's challenging picking up the new skills and then you just have more things to work with and you're more available when an opportunity might come along. Awesome. Thank you. Gerardo, you've had a different journey here in one of the, if not the most uh, popular band to ever come from your hometown of Austin. So what has your journey been like to get to where you are in your sideman career? Yeah, I mean, I moved to Austin in 2005 and I was playing just in local bands for a good 10 years. And I mean, it was... It was a jump from going to from the local scene directly to getting the the gig with Spoon, and I mean that was a it's a pretty life changing event. You know, first of all, it's like as a musician, how do you join a band that has that history and that has that reputation already, right? And it, it's it's kind of a tough gig to just walk into because personally like mentally you have all these things like am i good enough am i do i deserve this like what how, how am i gonna continue this gig and like be successful at it and i guess at the end of the day like doc said you know my thing is to always over prepare because i don't want to suck <laughs> even though at the end of the day you know there's times when i do suck um so yeah it it was just a it was a pretty like I said, life-changing event in, in terms of what I was used to, where I was at, and then all of a sudden coming into this completely different machine, the way that it, everything works. Um, so it was, I mean, it was, it was pretty awesome. So how did the gig come along for you? So I've been friends with Jim, you know, who's a drummer, um, since pretty much since I moved to Austin. I came through his studio multiple times with different bands. And, you know, he, he's an amazing producer and his studio is, it, it's like a world-class studio. So I had been coming in and out through the years and through the years we became friends. He would call me in for session work, with the stuff that he was producing. And eventually one day he called me, he was like, hey, you want to get lunch? And I was like, sure. I just thought he was going to talk about a new project or something like that. And he was like, hey, we have an opening in the band. Would you like to audition? And I was like, yeah, why not? Um, and it, it was funny because that weekend I was playing with uh, Third Root, which is one of the side projects of Adrian Casada. And it was like, I'd never heard this music. We had a gig with 
third route coming up in like two days. So I had to learn all this music. I was also playing keyboards for this band called Money Chicha. And they had a two hour sh show. So we had two hours worth of music that I had to learn. And that like two days later, I was supposed to audition for Spoon. And I was like, shit, I don't know how I'm going to, I'm going to have to let somebody down. But, you know, again, I just, I just stuck with it. I like practiced my ass off as much as I could and I nailed the audition and that's it. I've been, I've been with them ever since. That's such a great story. Uh, Dan, do you have any uh, anything sort of uh, that sounds familiar for uh, how you got to Ice Nine Kills? I mean, I'm, I'm in a unique position because um, almost all of the gigs that I've been like recognized for have all come from like internet situations. Um, Ice Nine came about from my previous work with my old band as Blood Runs Black and because me and Ricky, the other guitar player for Ice Nine, had crossed paths in the past. He put my name in Spencer's mouth and Spencer reached, reached out to me on Instagram and just offered me, like he said, we're, we're auditioning people. If you want to check it out, go ahead and do it. Check out these songs. And I sent him the uh, audition videos within like two hours. And he was like, what the fuck? This is <laughs> a lot faster than we expected. And also, um, are you interested in the gig? And it was like, it was completely uncalled for. But my previous gig with this Blood Runs Black was also completely internet-based. Like I, I connected with them just on talking online and then similar to all these guys, how there's just like a, uh, an opportunity where there's an opening for an audition and you just kind of like, you do your work to be the right person in the right place at the right time without any of those three things, it's not going to work out. So I feel like I got lucky and I had done the work and gelled with the guys and it just worked out awesome. And it's been definitely the most fun band I've been a part of to date for sure. Had you, have you gone through lots of auditions and that sort of thing similarly before? Um, this is actually, um, amazingly, my uh, third actual band. A actual band, but it's because my first band, Fallen Figure, uh, we were supposed to sign with Metal Blade, and then I joined As Blood Runs Black instead. And then af after As Blood Runs Black, I joined Iceland Kills. Um, so the string of bands make it seem like not too much happened, but like I was in a ABRB for like nine years, eight years, Fallen Figure for like eight years before that. So it's, I think I'm, I'm, I'm loyal, if anything. <laughs> Well, Mike, what's your perspective on the sideman from the manager's point of view? Is is uh, are you getting hit with unsolicited you know, videos and that sort of thing for the bands that you've represented over the years? Uh, when there's an announcement that somebody's been removed, absolutely, um, if it's public. Uh, but you know, I think my perspective is, um, you know, it's it's a wonderful role to have somebody play and you kind of hit the nail on the head in your intro, Paul, when there's money that's available to be able to pay somebody of the caliber that you want. I think it's a win-win for both sides. Um, you know, as a manager, uh, you know, especially with a band like, you know, at the current time Ice Nine Kills or like Refused in the past had side men, it's like they've got enough of an established identity that really we need somebody to come in and be utilitarian at the very least, you take a guy like Dan and, you know, from knowing Doc as long as I have and from hearing these other guys, it's like, and then from that place of like, okay, I'm coming in to do a job, they start to add their own influence, which is really, when it's done tastefully, is, is a win-win for everybody. Oh, good. I want to get into that in, in, in a, a little bit later because I think that's an important piece. Uh, Doc, was there an emotional transition when going from self-directed artist to sideman or were there other challenges that you didn't expect? I mean, I think overall there can be a lot of advantages because you don't have the kind of, you have less emotional investment. You don't have to worry about dealing with the merch or booking the, you know, renting the bus or dealing with the trailer. You know, you pretty much have to just show up and do the musician part, which is kind of when you have your own band and you're especially building it up from a DIY perspective, that's kind of what you dream of is when you can, man, it'd be nice just to just have to play. Um, you know, and I think the, one of the most important things it teaches you, you know, much from like, I guess you could make a lot of sports analogies in that you learn how to fulfill different roles. 
and there's a time to be the band leader and there's a time to essentially be a support role you know and i've been in certain situations like when i was out with that band mates hall where i was out most of the band was green and they hadn't really toured a lot and so i had to become kind of the mentor guy and and be and kind of te help teach people like okay this is how you kind of act on the road this is how you kind of load your gear on stage this is how you deal with the tour manager um you know this is how you kind of act on a bus just just little things that you don't even anticipate that you're going to have to have to deal with um and yeah and just kind of figuring out like i said i end up kind of being the md the musical director with a lot of my bands partially because it's just my natural the way i uh approach things but i think it's also in different scenarios people find your skill sets almost innately and like oh that that person's good at this and you kind of have to do that but at the same time you also can't have uh, too many cooks in the kitchen you have to know when to shut up and be in the back and take direction and sometimes you know it's uh you know you have to be able to kind of swallow your ego sometimes you know and i'm like i said i i play in a band with two of the guys from metallica and sometimes you gotta just shut the fuck up be in the back <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, and, and not in a terrible way, but but it is you know. So you have to like you know, because part of being good is especially being playing, acting like the rock star is knowing how, when to use your ego as like a surfboard to so you can perform well and be that person, and then you kind of have to be able to turn that off in these in these other times when it's where you have to act in this lesser role. Owen, can you build on that a little bit? I mean, you're one of the greatest songwriters I've ever heard. How often do you sit in a room, like in a, especially a rehearsal room, and you're hired in as a musician? How do you like find that that line to, that you need to straddle between where you feel you can make it better, but n maybe even stepping beyond just that role as a musician? Well, yeah, I, th I think that. Um... <clears throat> that sort of th those nuances are what define professionalism i mean you know th that's that's the kind of stuff that kind of blends we have to use our personality a little bit as a tool um to know when maybe your input is going to sound like you're overstepping or to know when maybe your input is is really what people are looking for to help kind of work through a part or a recording idea or whatever um it, it, it it's it's difficult it's, it's it's just like it's just like reading any room or, or knowing your audience you know from gig to gig you could work with a, an artist that is you know begging you to come help co-write the next album or you could be working with somebody who is sort of begging you to stay home <laughs> um maybe figuratively or literally literally um and yeah I, I don't i don't think there's it's, it's case by case there's no clear answer and, and also i think it's important to realize that you know the other people in the room to know when your input is not even really needed you know sometimes it should most of the time in music you know be the the best idea is the one that sort of makes it to the top and you know i think a big part of professionalism is just knowing when it's somebody else in the room that is having that idea and knowing when it's you and knowing how to speak up and maybe kind of help influence things for the greater good and how do you uh, sort of value those contributions do you ever you know how do you broach a topic like publishing and songwriting credits in that sort of situation is is that a case of it's tough, man. you just you hope that the person that you're working with you know will be able to recognize your the value that you're bringing to it but it doesn't always work out that way i mean sometimes you take less of a percentage than maybe you think you deserve but it's you know you you appreciate the opportunity for the work enough to where you know you're willing sorry my dog is barking you're willing to uh you know take some sacrifices on your side just to just for the opportunity but of course that, that's not every situation either totally 
So, Gerardo, what about like, uh, you know, maybe even because you talked about other bands that you would be brought in as a sideman. How did you value your time and your talent? And, you know, how did you negotiate that sort of thing? And, and is there even a negotiation when you get an opportunity like Spoon or they just offer you a minimum wage? You're like, yeah, that's good. I'm good. You know? I mean, I think, I mean, that's a good question, but really for me it was just it was a very humbling experience at least in, in the context of spoon just because you know we're all confident in what we do we all think oh this part is is badass and I, I really love it and then we're in the studio recording and you know i have my ideas of, of what i would like to try and then you quickly find out as you know others have said like you really need to learn where your where your spot is and where, where your place is and when those times are appropriate or not and at the end of the day when it comes to like you know your contribution to a project or a song i think for me it's been eye-opening and, and and really humbling in, in the sense that it's made me really think about very consciously about what i am doing right like Sometimes you just play something and you think it sounds good and you think that's going to work, but is it really doing something for the song? Is it really actually adding a unique value to the song that somebody else could not bring? And so I'm in a unique position where, you know, I play keyboards and guitar in Spoon, but Brit is a fucking badass guitar player. And Alex, who's the keyboard player, quote unquote, he's a badass guitar player too. And he's an amazing keyboard player you know so it's it's really learning when when you hear something you really think it's gonna add value just speaking up or otherwise just knowing when to you know when to step back and just sometimes sometimes you like at least in in my experience when we've been recording sometimes some people are just not even on the song at all because whatever was tried just didn't didn't fit you know and, and you have to be okay with that. And it's kind of a tough pill to swallow sometimes from an ego perspective. I bet. Dan, uh, like being in bands for eight, nine years, you must be okay to hang out with. <laughs> but uh, how? Wh what is that uh, balance between being the guy that people want to perform with versus people uh, being the guy that people just want to hang out with, especially in a studio or a intense yeah. tour situation? Interesting. Like I'm, I'm sitting here listening to all these responses, and the word "side man" is turning into "sidekick" in my head. Because I'm, I, I like in, in hearing these stories, I'm feeling like I've, I've been in situations where like. I become the replacement for the lead guitar player and that guy was also the main writer and it's happened in both bands that I've been in that were that I was asked to join so it turned into situations where I was kind of immediately given the responsibility of like hey we we kind of need to rely on you let's write some riffs like for instance Spencer's been coming over to this studio like three days a week for us to record new stuff um and it's a situation where like I'm tasked and I have Joe our, our piano player who's our bass player and, and piano he's unbelievable musician so we're tasked with translating all of Spencer's like wild outlandish ideas that are not necessarily delivered the way that a musician would deliver an idea so we're, we're left to like translate words to figure out what he means like this adjective must mean like this EQ or like he wants a riff like this so a lot of times um for me the side man thing is, as far as just coming in and being like the role that's needed I feel like I'm oftentimes put in a situation where there's like a responsibility put on me that by living up to it, I think that allows a trust to be kind of birthed that allows me to be the guy you want to hang out with and the guy you want on the bus and the guy you want on the stage because you can rely on me, you could have fun. Um, but I really think it comes down to the fact that like showing up, doing the work and, and, and being there to see it through, I think is really what's proven the, like me being given the opportunity to be loyal is a two way street. You know what I mean? Like, clearly I had to show up and do the work. So I think that a big part of it is just showing up and being uh, being willing to do whatever it takes to get the best sound. Like, like uh, I think Gerard mentioned it before. It's like the, or no, Owen did. The best idea is the one that should like rise to the top, right? So if I'm willing to see that through, whether it's mine or not, and be non-attached to it emotionally, I think that's always been the uh, the best end result. But 
Yeah, I think I think there's something really, really interesting to be said about just like my mind switching to sidekick totally made me think about this slightly differently. I don't know if anyone else is kind of seeing that too. <laughs> no, got it. Mike, we all know what breaks up bands or causes uh, bands to lose members. Are the rules different for sidemen? Like what causes uh, a sideman to be dropped? Things that sidemen need to know and be aware of when they get into these situations? Should I write this down right now? Should I take yeah. it <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see what the others on the panel, you know, their experience has been. But, you know, I think in a lot of ways, it is a more clearly defined relationship. You know, with most of the bands that I've managed as an artist development manager, you get these guys that met in high school and it's really some sort of friendship where, you know, the singer was the guy who couldn't play an instrument. So he ended up being the singer, um, you know, or the bass player, you know, that was the simplest instrument for him to figure out. And then once you start, you know, the band grows and is warranted of, you know, having the, you know, role of somebody like these guys, the relationship just totally changes. And you're able to clearly define things a little bit better. Um, and it, you know, sounds like from the cast we have here, everybody understands that the level of professionalism, uh, you know, is just, it's raised. And in fact, I think that's why in some cases it can work so well, right? You don't have these kind of, you don't have the baggage that comes with the things that maybe broke the band up or even that wasn't what broke them up, but it was carrying itself on. And you've got this clearly defined relationship, which allows everybody to thrive. Not always the case. But Doc, you were, raising, you were raising your hand there. I think you had uh, something you wanted to add as well. Yeah, I'd say that probably the one factor that gets hired guns kicked out of bands is overestimating their own value or kind of irreplaceability. And anytime, and that's why I say never get comfortable. Always, like me, you know, and a lot of people don't know this, even in Bad Wolves, the only technical members of the band are singer and drummer. So even though I'm in the band and um, and it's my band, I'm not in the band and it's not my band. So, uh, so I kind of always act as if, you know, I could not, you know, I could be out of the band in five seconds and always, you know, and, and I, and I can name some people, you know, that that's, ha that's happened to, and they just got a little too comfortable and they got a little too, they were feeling themselves too much. And they started, well, I need this much and I, I want this. And it's like, Oh yeah, there's uh, there's the door. Have fun, um, and which is fine. And sometimes uh, people outgrow a situation or outgrow a role where they're in a support role, and and maybe it's time for them to kind of be at the head of their own organization or or, or anything. But um, I just wanted to make that that point. That's usually the thing I see. Well, you, you, you sort of touched on one thing. I was going to ask a question to you that's sort of the flip of this, but maybe I'll ask both sides. Like, uh, you're very active on social media. Is there a uh, argument for, you know, associating yourself with the band and becoming one of the more upfront members of the band on social media as a form of job security? And then the flip side of that being, uh, do you have to be more careful on social media because somebody could not like what you say and uh, that could be uh, detrimental to, to your standing as, uh, as an employee with that particular company? Yeah? yeah, I mean, I could say with Bad Wolves in particular, we're in a odd situation, probably not too, too dissimilar from Ice Nine Kills, where uh, the lead singer gets you know, most of the attention and kind of a big portion of the fan base is connected to that one individual. So I kind of, you know, talk about it from, from, you know, ultimately I think it's better for the band if the fans know everyone and are familiar with everyone. So anytime the organization, the management focus, you know, puts too much on the singer, I'm like, I'm like, I get it. You guys are kind of going with the easy thing, but in the long run, it hurts you because it associates the band with one person. And, and if you're going to be a band, like I said, not every band is a band, right? You can be, it can be Marilyn Manson. And even though there is a band, it's Marilyn Manson or some, you know, Rob Zombie, it's Rob. He has band members, but it's Rob Zombie. If, unless you want it to be that, then you have to give, uh, 
you have to give everyone a platform and, and, you know, many of the biggest bands, you know, whether it's Metallica or Korn or, uh, you know, Guns N' Roses, like the fans know everyone in the band and they're fans of everyone, you know, and, and so it's, it's important for, you know, it's kind of interesting just seeing the other guys in my band really learn and go out of their way to establish themselves as individual entities because they were the least known people when the band got started and they've, they're on top of it, you know, and they're, cause they're starting to see, Oh, the more I, I make myself available, the more I kind of do self branding and every, every guy like sells his own like guitar pick packs and is selling photos and doing all and it, and it's working and people are saying, Oh no, no, that's not just the bass player. That's, they know your name and they know your face. And you, if you don't do that stuff, you're just, you know, I always talk about that uh, almost famous thing. It's like, don't worry about me. I'm just the out of focus guy. Like, you know, <laughs> Don't, you know, you have to make sure you're not just the out of focus guy. Owen, I got to ask you as, as uh, someone who you, you have a, a, uh, a career as a self-directed artist, uh, as well as, as a side man, is there a hard wall between the two or are you able to leverage opportunities for yourself as a solo artist through the uh, musicians that you work with? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, wh whether it's co-writing with the artists and getting tracks on a release or uh, being an opening act, you know, having your own band open for an act that you're working with, that there's definitely, um, I think, organic opportunities that come up. Uh, li listening to this whole conversation is funny because you know, I am, I'm, I'm, I do play both sides and that, that's something that I have to think about a lot um, because I'm actively hiring side men to kind of join me on my own endeavors while being hired to do the same thing with other people. So I, I think that that, it, it gives me a lot of perspective with the way that I treat the people that I bring into my own projects because I understand like the lifestyle and just can speak the language in a way that I think might be lost on people who are kind of just exclusively used to just hiring out um, musicians. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's interesting listening to everybody's points of view because there's so much subtleties to it and just listening about how to keep gigs and not lose gigs and sometimes how to lose a gig maybe is what your goal is, you know, I mean, there, there are certain, there's certainly p plenty of people I can think of who, you know, whether they said it or not, through their behavior, they demonstrated that they did not want to be a part of a project anymore. <laughs> and that was just sort of their, their way of uh, making the uh, not getting asked back part more organic, too. Um, but yeah, it's interesting, you know, you, you get a really clear idea of um, the value what what people should expect and to be paid and what people deserve to be paid and the, and the type of conditions that people should be expected to do this job under um when you do both sides of it you definitely at least in my experience have a, a high appreciation for a how, how hard of a job it is and b you know how hard it is to run your own business too so coming from that perspective of seeing both sides, uh, are, are there artists that you've worked with who perhaps have had a reputation for going through musicians fairly quickly just because they don't know how to treat the people they work with? And then how do you, in a situation like that, uh, is there a way to make it a, a situation that is doable for it? I, and name names. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all the the spectrum is vast. You know, there's there's artists that run through players. There's players that run through artists. Um, usually, it goes along with the luxury of either of being really talented um, or very successful. Um, you know, it, it, I can I equate. I have lots of friends as, as we all do that do other jobs and you know they 
the same grievance grievances you can see everywhere. You know, it's it's hard to work in close proximity to other people that you're also traveling with seven days a week, sleeping literally on top of each other in a tour bus or you know, sharing beds in a hotel doesn't really matter. It, it's a it's a tough job. So I think even though it's it's very <laughs> It's a stereotype to be a moody mu musician on the one hand, but on the other hand, it, it's it's tough to go out there and have your personality on display every day, every night, you know, and, and be in close quarters like that. So, you know, the, it, diff there's definitely artists that run run through players, and you know, I, I'm I'm assuming that most of us have found ourselves in that situation and you know, you, you either make the most of it or you do it for as long as you want to or you say, you know what, like I can tell this this seems like a this seems like experience I've had before. I'm just gonna bow out of this one. Unfortunately, sometimes you don't know until you're <laughs> a month and a half into a three month commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Gerardo, I, I mean, perhaps it's not uh, sort of change uh, change uh, uh, topics a little bit. It's perhaps not obvious that you don't need a college degree to be a musician, uh, but uh, it should be. But is there anything education-wise that either has been crucial for you as a full-time musician and or was crucial in getting you to the point where you could be a full-time musician? I would, I would say the answer to that is no. I mean, I, I think that there's benefits. I mean, I, I, I did go to school for music and all that, but I mean, if anything, the only thing that I learned that is that's applicable in, in this context is just being prepared and always making sure that you're not, you know, le letting the people that depend on you down Right. And so the dependability, I think, is just such a key factor in, in being successful in this role. And really, even if, if you're not an absolute genius musician, as long as you're very reliable and you do your job well, you know, people are going to keep calling you back. So, yeah, I don't think the professional musician thing is, is, is very relevant these days, in my opinion. Everybody drop out. I could be wrong, right? but that's just my opinion. <laughs> uh, every mom watching this video is just freaking out right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, Dan, uh, is there a difference in the way that you prepare for studio recording versus uh, going out on tour? And does that change, I guess, depending on the different acts that you've worked with over the years? Um. It's pretty similar. It's a matter of just literally being prepared and having the knowledge under your fingertips. But I think that there's a much bigger thing in preparing yourself for the tour situation because there's a lot more dealing with an onslaught of different personalities. And I think that's where, um, like, ha having the uh, ability to learn about networking by just doing it and then learning how to kind of, like, deal and cope with the different types of personalities, um, Sometimes even, and this is going to sound maybe negative, but like learning how to manipulate personalities into the way that you like, you might need some things to happen. Like, hey, our drummer never gets his drums into the trailer. Like, what can we do to make that happen today? Like, that's not bad manipulation. You, those drums need to get in the freaking trailer, right? Um, so I think it's a matter of like, just getting, getting creative and finding ways to uh, connect with people that make them want to keep you around is really what it's about. And I... I don't really know the answer with that. I actually, like, I've, I've asked myself often, like, having the opportunity to be in another band that's doing cool things, like, like Ice Nine, I wonder why was I presented the opportunity? Like, I literally, I ask myself these podcast questions right now, you know what I'm saying? Um, and the thing that I typically come up with is really just, like, the commitment to my craft, my commitment to, like, doing things as good as I possibly can, um, my commitment to being accessible to people. I think that was a really big part of why I was contacted in the first place, just because like, I think a lot of people in ICE-9, um, the, the individual members create their own brands to a certain degree. And I had built out my own to a certain degree before I was offered the spot. And I think that goes hand in hand with making you valuable in a band that needs those types of components filled, you know? 
Absolutely. Mike, uh, not specifically necessarily for Einstein Kills, but for all the artists that you've worked with over the years, uh, you know, the line is that you should dress for the job that you want, not the job that you have. How important is the look, whether it be being somebody who looks healthy or, uh, or doesn't, <laughs> or isn't as good looking as the singer, that sort of thing, uh, or having like the way that somebody dresses, so on and so forth. How important is that? I mean, it's a good question. I think most of the people that are ready to fill that type of role that we're looking for, sort of, it, it's already inherent in them. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I, you know, I think in many of the, there, you know, the guy that we got to fill in actually brought a whole new flair that I think if we had been looking at just his looks, it wouldn't have worked on paper. That said, his ability to play, his ability to fit in with everybody, his ability to do all the things these guys are talking about, you know, and gave him the, that's what gave him the confidence to kind of stand out on his own anyways. And, and you know, it was a little bit of a transition, but once, you know, the fans got used to him being, you know, on stage, and even though he looked a little bit different than the old guy in terms of the way he dressed and presented himself, they actually came to like that a little bit more. Got it. So I gotta, I gotta jump in on this topic because Please. it's one of my favorite things uh, to talk about in the music industry. Uh, because stuff, things I experienced personally, I almost got kicked out of a band for being too tall, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is hilarious. And I remember going on an audition for a band that was like very like gothy and you know leather and makeup, and I was trying to get a gig. And then, you know, and it, it kind of, I had this revelation that, you know, my playing probably has almost nothing to do with why or not I'm going to get this gig. It's, thank God I didn't get this gig, by the way. But um, it's this thing that, you know, and that was on my mind, like, a lot when I moved to L.A. was like, you know, I'm at a certain age, but you kind of, if you can look younger and present yourself a certain way, it really opens you up to a lot of opportunities. And it's crazy how many players like that are, you know, mind-blowing players, but they just don't have that look that when a big spot opens up, like they're not going to even gonna look at this person because they don't have the vibe. And it's, and it's interesting how many, especially like in, in, in the, the metal world, which is very curmudgeonly and, kind of conservative and in certain ways that they kind of get they take it personally and they they get mad at it and it's like no nah, man it's like it's like you know if you want a job at hooters you kind of gotta come with the uh <laughs> fair point with the, I, with the proper I, I, accoutrement i think doc <laughs> is also underestimating his personality and his ability to fit in right but great great points but uh, I well, sort of similar to that, but let's say sonically, like Doc, when you like get up on stage with Lamb of God, your guitar has to sound like Mark Morton, right? Like, I mean, to a degree, Kirk Cammett called me out. He goes, I heard someone playing a solo. I knew it wasn't Mark. Uh, <laughs> so you're always going to sound like you, but yeah, you have to. Uh, and I mean, that's the thing, you know, so I started a cover band, you know, back on the East Coast. And one of the things, you know, we were doing, you know, like rock and metal from the 90s, 2000s stuff. And it was really important to me to get all the details because I would always get pissed off when I would go see a band, a cover band, and they would just kind of get it right. And, it's, and, it, and then I kind of used that skill when I would fill in for a band was like, well, don't just show up and like play the part, right? Have the right kind of tone have the right kind of guitar effect have you know pay attention to the dynamic just all that little stuff and it it shows you that you're you're not just playing the parts you're embodying the parts and you're and the tone and the sound of that particular band is is paramount like i'm not gonna for every gig i'm not gonna use the same amp for every gig i'm not gonna use the same guitars for every gig i'm not gonna bring the same effects for every gig it's it's and slowly over time i've especially like on a instrument level i'm always trying to get different types of guitars for different gigs because you can't because you need that versatility you know um and that's like i said it's just just and that's those are the things because i've 
kind of, you know, doing the cover band and being, you know, and bringing a lot of musicians in, you get to see how other people approach the same idea. Are they paying attention to the details like me or are they kind of just doing a once over? And it, and it really gives you, uh, and I think it's something, what, you know, part of the reason why I keep getting these cool gigs is that people see that I'm paying attention to those things and I'm going a little bit beyond just playing it properly. Cause it drives me crazy. If I have another guitar, cause you know, I do a lot of bands with two guitar players. And when that other guitar player is not paying attention to those details or using the wrong kind of effect or the, you know, maybe it's using too much distortion in one part or not enough distortion. It like, it drives me crazy. <laughs> oh, and uh, Doc used the word versatility. And I, 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 I kind of want to segue there because I think that it's a good topic. Like being a multi-instrumentalist, I imagine is, I mean, for, for both you and Gerardo are great at number of different instruments, your ability to sing and to do harmonies are things like that the the you know competitive differentiator between you and other musicians in your scene who'd be going for the same kinds of gigs? Me? Uh, no, sorry for Owen. Yeah, I think I think singing definitely helps. Um, you know, it's you have, you have to have a pretty good budget to take out a group of back background singers. It's a lot easier to just get the guitar player and bass players sing the harmonies um but if they can't then you know <clears throat> um so i i think the singing for sure the multi-instrumentalist i mean maybe maybe a, a broader question is you know for example if you play bass can you also jump on synth bass and do a song like that if you play drums are you also proficient with the spds or another type of sampling instrument um you know it, for guitar of course there's a million different um pedals and amp configurations and things that it probably helps you have a leg up to be familiar with um but but again you know i think that all that all comes back to part of being prepared for your job is sort of you know looking at the things that you might be asked to do or looking for things that maybe would help the show and sort of being able to say, well, I, I actually know how to do this. So on this song, maybe instead of playing guitar, I'll jump over and hit this trigger pad, you know, and I'll work on getting the samples this weekend or something like that. So to, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think it is helpful to just have a broad a skill set as, as you can, especially now when going out and playing music you know, it, it's not like it's not like the Beatles at Shea Stadium. You know, with a couple ants and a couple instruments. There's there's a lot going on now from everything. You know, from backing tracks to vocorders and harmonizers, and you know, there, there's a lot of things that I think um, is just useful to have in, in in your in your bag of tricks. And has that been a learning process for you, or did you? you know just arrive in new york city and know what you needed to know um i think uh you know it's just like hanging out with having mentors you know get the first gigs you get there's you know there there's always going to be there's usually going to be somebody in the room that's been doing it longer than you have and knows if not more than you then has a specialty that they can share with you um so, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm using regularly um, for my employment now that, you know, I've, I, 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 can, I can single out the people that taught me how to do them. I can single out the time in my life where I was in that project that I spent, you know, three weeks, you know, working on this record with somebody and they showed, showed me how to use, you know, an analog tape machine or, or, or whatever it is. So I think if you have the willingness to learn and you're fortunate enough, enough to be involved in projects where there's people who want, who want to teach you or at least you can glean something from. Awesome. Gerardo, uh, you're a multi-instrumentalist as well. Uh, how crucial was that to getting your current gig? I mean, obviously it's, it's of utmost importance. Um, but I think, I mean, there's, there's always going to be somebody that plays better than you. There's always going to be somebody that plays one more instrument than you. Um, 
and so while that all that is important um in fact, when I was auditioning for Spoon, they already had somebody lined up to fill the the spot. That person ended up going on tour with um, somebody else and kind of dropped the gig. And so he said that he could help out for a couple of months. But at the end of the day, it turned out that we all became like pretty good friends. And like when we're on tour, we have an amazing time. We all hang out together. We all party together. It's so, so there's these all other skills that aren't necessarily related to the music that kind of solidify that position as well. I mean, I could throw a rock and find somebody that sings better than me for sure. Or somebody that plays keyboards better than me. But, you know, in my particular experience, since I was, reliable and i was able to bring what they needed to the table but on top of that i kind of had the vibe that they that they felt comfortable with i think that's what ultimately just made everything gel together well i gotta ask one last question of you uh before we wrap up because we're running on time but uh and i feel bad asking you in the wake of you talking about how well you party with the rest of the guys in spoon but <laughs> biggie uh from good fight management and a recent panel was talking about how there's these stages in musicians careers where it gets really challenging to keep uh the keep keep musicians as musicians uh can you talk about uh, your experience as a husband and father and being a like on the road for months at a time and and as a sideman how challenging has that been it's hugely challenging i mean especially for in my my experience having young children you know when i went on tour for the first time with spoon it was a full year and my daughter was eight months and my son was you know however old he was and a year and a half um or almost two years so yeah that was it, it took a huge toll in a lot of respects you know it took a toll in my relationship with my wife um it is emotional stress from being away from my children feeling guilty that i'm on the road and you know after an awesome gig we fucking killed it let's go to the bar and have fun and in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, my family's at home and my, my poor wife is like struggling, trying to put these two fucking kids to sleep while I'm just at the bar partying, you know? So, I mean, there, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to that, but it, you, you just, have to, just have to take it as it comes and do the best you can and just always kind of recognize that you're going to, you're going to be in tough spots. And if you can figure stuff out in terms of your relationships, other than the band, you know, if it takes a toll on that, you just need to make sure that you're working hard at making everything better. Mike, I'm going to leave this to you to kind of wrap us up. Is there anything um, about the way that you, from a management perspective, how you work with sidemen that has evolved over the years or uh, uh, something that you know now that you wish you knew then? Um, I think for me, and, you know, as it's evolved, I've learned that, you know, the role isn't, it always takes on something different than what we initially imagined. And I think for many of the guys who are sidemen, um, you know, it sounds like they never know what's going to come of it, right? Gerardo's talking about a situation that changed his entire life. Whereas Owen's talking about all these, working with all these great people, going to all these different places. You know, Dan had a relatively comfortable existence and uh got kind of catapulted into a new spotlight and doc you know just continues to to amaze me with all of the opportunities that he comes into and i don't think any one of them nor myself right when we approached a situation or at least in the past it was like i need you to do this thing so it can go this one way and what's been great is the addition of new blood new perspective new attitudes always changes the course in a way that oftentimes in my experience ends up better than uh, I could have ever imagined it. So I want to thank you guys. This is really amazing. Um, really, really great. Thank you, Paul, for putting this one together. Thank you. Hey, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Uh, I can't tell you how this is. I've fanboyed more in the last past hour than probably any time else in, the, in my entire life. So <laughs> this is pretty cool. <laughs> I thank hope I guys. kept it inside. Kept it inside. So now.
Thanks everybody for being here, greatly appreciated. This is the team around Ice Nine Kills, and I'm incredibly excited to uh, speak with each of you. Uh, we got Andy from Fearless Records, uh, Eric Powell from, uh, sorry, Eric Powell is from Sound Talent Group, the booking agent, correct? Uh, we got Billy Candler from Absolute Merch, who's handling the merch. Uh, Eric German, attorney from MSK, correct? And uh, Mike Mowry from 10th Street Entertainment is uh, Spencer's manager for, is it almost 10 years now? Have we hit the 10 year mark, Mike? Not quite, we're about, a, we're about a year away. Yeah. Okay, getting close. And of course, uh, Spencer from Ice Nine Kills. So Spencer, I'm gonna start with you. If you can find a way to go back in time to the early days of your, you as a musician and specifically with the brand of Ice Nine and Ice Nine Kills, at what point were you doing it all yourself and how did the transition start to happen where you started to bring in people to help you out with the band? For many years, we were independent. I started the band in high school. And at that point in the music industry, if you wanted to get someone else on your team, whether it was a record label or a manager or a booking agent, it was back in the physical press kit days. You know, that, that's the scene that I came from. So I remember going to Staples and getting the, uh, you know, the, the leaflet pamphlets and putting our bio in there and putting a, you know, a nice little promo picture that if you saw these promo pictures, I would be very embarrassed. I don't know what I was wearing. But uh, there came a point where I, we decided to be a little bit more sophisticated about what we were doing. And I noticed that the bands that were gaining more traction in the industry had some sort of representation. And uh, I, you know, I, I read a lot of stuff about how certain bands got signed. And for me, it all, it all came back to having a great manager. And that became sort of the goal after the initial trying to get signed to a label didn't work. Um, and I'll tell another funny story about that at some point, but basically Fearless Records, I, I recently found a rejection letter from Fearless Records from like, you know, 2005. It was really nice to, to see. Uh, and I, I showed Bob that he thought that was really funny. Um, anyway, so it became a, a search for a good manager. And at the time, uh, Outer Loop and Artery were kind of the, the, the hot names on the street for management teams. And I spoke with a, a lot of people and, and Mike and I just seemed to, to click. And that's how, that's how it sort of happened. And uh, it was definitely a turning point in the band's career. And uh, I think that, you know, one of the most important things, if you're, if you're paying a manager to be on your team, uh, you should probably listen to his advice. Uh, what are you paying them for? And, uh, you know, Mike and I have established a great relationship over the years, and uh, he's been instrumental in bringing in the other the great members of our team. So, Spencer, that's a long time that you spent uh, doing a sort of DIY. So how did you find a balance between being a creative and being an entrepreneur? It was definitely difficult, um, but I, I think that, it always comes down to, to good music. So that, that was already always sort of the priority, you know, without good music, you can't really get anywhere, whether it's building your own following or attracting the right team. Uh, and I think that finding that right balance took, took a while, but um, I think once we did, things started to happen. You know, we'd have the, the good music or what we thought was good material and then finding the most uh, sophisticated ways to market it. And at the time when we were coming up, it was a lot about purevolume.com and MySpace. And uh, those were also sort of the hotbeds for people in the industry finding talent. And uh, I'm glad that we, uh, we sort of wrestled through the, the bushes to, uh, to get to where we, where we are now. Mike, can you talk about the first time you were introduced to Ice Nine Kills and what set Spencer and Ice Nine Kills apart from everybody else who might be approaching you every single day back at the time that you uh, uh, discovered uh, Spencer? Yeah, I think, uh, Spencer, you might uh, recall better. I think you've even said that you found some early emails between us recently, but uh, one way or another, Spencer had reached out and um, you know, there was a lot of young bands 
trying to get signed, uh, as Spencer alludes to, I mean, the Rosartery Foundation, which was kind of the pinnacle, and then my company at the time, Outer Loop, which was sort of sitting right beneath them. Um, and, you know, what I recall in particular was hearing, um, you know, the, the record um, that has, I mean, Safe is Just a Shadow, and liking it, and really getting Spencer Spence, Spencer's sense of melody. And then what truly sealed the deal is at the time I had a little uh, production arm that put on shows and the guys that ran this club, um, you know, they had Ice Nine Kills through and they just said, they talked about how great the band was, how professional Spencer was. They talked about the fact that the band had, you know, they're all, all of their own gear. They showed up, they ran their own tracks. They were like this self-sufficient model. And at the time, these guys were putting locals on every show. They had, you know, regional touring backs, regionally touring bands. And they also had many of the, the bands that were playing the Warp Tour and were, you know, uh, like that level that, that Ice Nine was aspiring to be. And those guys told me that Ice Nine was better than all of the, many of those bands that came through. And they talked about even at that stage in a 500 cap room, how they had 50 to 100 like diehard fans. So that really kind of helped kind of clear a way for me to, to give it some real attention. And then honestly, when I met Spencer and just sensed his passion, I could tell he was smart. I could tell he was driven. Um, and could, you know, I couldn't tell he, whether he was in it for the long haul or not, but uh, that is, that is where he's been. So Spencer, Spencer for you, uh, how creatively liberating was it to start working with the manager and with the, the team that, that, that Mike then brought on? It was great, especially since so many years had been spent building, trying to get to that point where there was someone who had uh, stature in the industry and experience with bands, someone guide, guiding us. So it was, it was a great uh, combination of excitement and um, just stuff that we learned through the course of working with, with Outer Loop and, and Mike that, uh, that you know, we still carry with us to, to this day. And it was the first time that we got a sense of having a team behind us. Um, that was the first time we really ever had any sort of um, a real manager that had a built-in infrastructure and um, employees. So, so it, was, it was a different world to be able to have, you know, five people on an email chain that were all helping you try to work towards the same goal as expanding the band. So Mike, when you first started working with Spencer, did were there any previous relationships that you had to dismantle or was this just ready for you to take and then start building a team from, from scratch? There were some small things to clean up, um, you know, at the, you know, but really, more or less it came poised and ready for us to take and do what we were doing at the time which was you know taking hungry road ready artists i mean the other thing is ice nine kills was playing dates they were figuring out ways to either book their own shows or get themselves on like regional tours and so that's one of the most challenging parts uh for a developing act or at least it was in in 2011. um and uh yeah i mean we kind of set out to do what it is that you know managers do to extend our relationships to start to build some semblance of a team um but also to kind of leverage our relationships to get them onto to larger tours and we had a pretty early breakthrough i think it was summer of 2012 spencer when you guys went on the all-stars tour which was uh a tour put on by pantheon agency and sumerian records or at least some affiliation there and um that was what was so great about that was one is it, they they had to to mobilize their fan base in order to get the opportunity and they shined and that made a lot of impressions amongst people in the industry and then the second you know uh component of it was once spencer got out there and started meeting with these other bands day in and day out not going to their local show and saying hi but them seeing his drive, the way that he was selling CDs and selling merch. I was getting phone calls from promoters, from, you know, other manager friends, from other people in the industry saying, what, what am I, you know, what am I missing here? This guy and his team that are out there on the road are, you know, hustling in a way that, that we really haven't seen in quite some time.
So Spencer, what was your approach in those early days, especially when on those very first tours, when you are coming in contact with industry people? I'm sure Mike is calling people up when you play LA, for example, and making sure that people that he knows are gonna be there. What were those early shows like and, and what were those early conversations like with potential team members? I think we looked at everything as a huge opportunity and when some when one band wouldn't work as hard we'd be the, we'd be the band working twice as hard so it, back in the old days you know when we would book tours we would book them around larger festivals uh, we spent uh, an entire summer on the warp tour without playing the warp tour when we would sneak in every day and sell cds and i would have i think it was a uh, a uh, 150 CD limit that I set for myself every day. If I didn't sell 150 CDs, then I was just going to quit. No, but um, we we ended up selling about 10,000 records that summer, just walking around with our iPods and, and working the lines, and that just that sort of um, you know DIY mentality just sort of flow through everything that, that we've ever done. And, and when we got that opportunity, like Mike had said, with the All-Stars tour, that was our first opportunity to be on a great tour for, you know, opening for larger acts uh, in, in rooms where there'd be more than 50 people. You know, the, the tours we were doing, you know, maybe luck, luck out and there'd be a, um, a demographic or an area where we'd be drawing 150 or something, but those were few and far between. So as soon as we got that opportunity, we weren't going to let it pass us by. And uh, we spent a lot of time hustling CDs outside, working the, the, the merch area and being the band that went and, and hung out with the kids and met everyone after the show. Um, I know when a lot of bands would kind of just go to the dressing room or, or go off to party we would be doing that kind of stuff because we didn't want any sort of opportunity to pass us by. And um, yeah, that, that was a pivotal moment, that tour. And meeting industry people, was that a component of it? Uh, there, there weren't so many industry people to meet on the tour. I, I remember, you know, like the LA date, uh, definitely met some people, especially on like the Sumerian uh, staff side because Ash was the one who, uh, kind of made the final judgment call to uh, to put us on the tour. So definitely met people in that regard. Um, I think uh, the, the booking agency we were working with at the time was there. So I think that all those uh, situations, you just have to look at them as an opportunity to, to, to make friends with people and not be too overbearing with people in the industry, but just to, to, to make sure that they're on, uh, that you're on their radar, so to speak. So Mike, Mike, when in, in those early days, what were the first and highest priorities for you as far as people that you felt were the roles, I guess, that you needed to bring on to the Ice Nine Kills team? Um, it was, I mean, they came with an attorney in place, a guy that Spencer had known. Um, so when I build a team, an attorney is always an integral part of that because within every we're going to do deals, um, we're going to need their advice. So the fact that we already had an attorney really had us go, I mean, and we also had an existing kind of merchandise solution. Um, we didn't have the relationship. We really didn't have the horsepower that we have now um, in terms of selling things. So it wasn't such a huge priority um, to find like the best kind of partner that could help us creatively so that leaves uh our label and booking agent and i can't remember exactly who the agent was at the time um i know you guys were doing some tours uh and it might have even been jeremy weiss from ci who puts on launch i know he was involved in a couple of uh tours that were booking but then i think shortly thereafter spencer we moved you guys over to pantheon right which was ash's company that's correct yeah we were with um uh, Jeremy and Spencer Carpenter at CI and uh, you know they were instrumental in, in building us in the beginning and sort of putting us on the road and helping us get full tours and then yeah I think we, we moved to Pantheon that's right. Yeah Powell were you at Pantheon at that time because you spent some time there right? Yeah I think uh, I came on board right when Fred Del Rio and Amanda Fiore uh, signed Ice Nine Kills so there's been a lot of overlaps before we actually started to work together. Yeah, so Eric wasn't our agent, right? But he was at the same company at that time. Um, 
So moving them from CI, which, you know, has done a great job for many bands over the years to something that was a little bit more uh, established nationally was a priority, but also to get the band signed to a record deal. Um, I would have taken either one. Uh, you know, it didn't really matter which was happening first, but many times when you're pitching record labels, they want to see the band. We want to present them in the best light possible. A better agent allows us to either get into a better club or to get on some of these better tours, which then allows, you know, the band to kind of shine. So Eric, uh, Eric Powell, do you mind talking a little bit about, uh, how you were introduced to Ice Nine Kills and then how you got involved on the team? Sure. So there's been a lot of overlap with Ice Nine Kills over the years prior to me being involved. If it was me having acts support Ice Nine Kills or when I was at either the Pantheon Agency or the uh, Agency Group, uh, I would be working on a tour with another agent that Ice Nine Kills would support. Uh, when I left Agency Group in 2015, I think Ice Nine Kills was coming to a, an, uh, their relationship with the agency group was coming to an end through the United Talent Agency merger. And Mike and I had known each other for quite a while. So when they were in a search for a new agent, uh, you know, we had a good conversation uh, about working together. And, I, you know, I think we really bonded on, I think there's a similar blue collar worker mentality towards both of us. You know, Einstein Kills, like Spencer said, uh, was very involved, you know, if it's following Warp Tour or if it's just taking whatever tour slots they could get to continue to, you know, start to build a resume and a platform. Uh, and I, I think that's a similar route and a path that I've taken over the course of my year. So I think we hit it off pretty right away. And I think, you know, that was about four years ago. So when you talk about a resume, uh, which is a, a great segue to the next question I had for you, actually, which is, you know, when you're putting together a tour, you have your tent poles, uh, I imagine, where you build the tour around. But are there tent poles as well for the artists that you consider working with? Those, like, uh, you know, the Warp Tours and, and All-Star Tours and the other things that had been in Ice Nine Kills in, in, uh, in their past that let you know that, uh, this is a band that you will be able to book and frankly would be able to make money with in the future Well, I think with Ice Nine Kills, I think they were very underrated at the time Like we were speaking in early 2016 every trick in the book was about six months old at that point It was selling really well. They were out there headlining selling out a lot of these rooms uh, They were getting ready to do Warp Tour um, where you know, they were quietly one of the breakout bands of, of the tour um, and I think the industry was a little slow on kind of catching on to that, but I think moments like Warp Tour really showed it. And then I think that really evolved into the Hell in the Hallways tour that we had booked in fall of 2016, where, you know, Ice Nine went all in on production. And we were playing three to 500 cap rooms, but we had CO2, we had a full theme to it that a lot of their peers weren't doing half of that. And I think that really set the tone that, you know, there was a belief that there is something much more to what we're doing here. Uh, and I think that started the ball of momentum that led us to where we are today. It's funny you talk about that because, Mike, I remember listening to an interview with, that you had, geez, it must have been four or five years ago, uh, about, about, probably about the same time that this was going on, talking to uh, an artist who was hosting a podcast about the investment in production and how it pays off. And here's Eric these many years later, talking about that very thing. So can you talk about um, uh, just the investments that you made or that uh, you and Spencer made into the career in order to develop the team that you have now? I mean, Spencer's taught me so much in regards to how it can and should be done the right way. You know, he was somebody who always thought, was thinking three steps ahead and in order to get to that third step, he had to back it up to the second and back it up to the first and knew that he was willing to sacrifice, you know, money that was going to go into his pocket in order to invest in some of the stuff that Eric is saying. And so, you know, that can be a very fine line and it can be very challenging for artists. You know, when you finally start to generate some money, you know, and you want to be able to whatever, either buy something nice for yourself or go home and show mom and dad or your girlfriend or whoever it is, hey, I made a little bit of coin. Um, Spencer was typically always willing to sacrifice that for the idea that if he put it back in, you know, with the right guidance and kind of the right um, approach, that it was actually going to pay off. And that has been our experience and still is to this day. 
Andy, can you talk about uh, how you were introduced to Ice Nine Kills? It sounds like the timing was just before uh, Eric Bell got involved. Well, I came in later uh, as okay. as a label, but I mean, I can speak to you all the way back to the All Stars Tour because I've been the promoter for the All Stars Tour or Ice Nine Kills uh, in Orange County forever. Um, you know, and I, and I think the the thing that you know when we talk about uh, underrated, I think even before the Silver Screen came out, I think myself and Mike Mowry, we Eric Powell, we called people and and we're, we're telling people how they were, were under undervaluing the band and underrating the band uh, uh, plenty of times. But the band was doing more business than their peers, and they were putting on a better show. You know, so when you look at at growth, you know, you kind of see bands that kind of go sideways or teeter off on cycles. There was like a, a it was like a almost unprecedented growth going on. So it just led right into the next record. You know. The Silver Scream, which we, you know, I think a nice moment um, for Spencer was at the Blasco and the team here, the Blasco selling out in advance versus the last LA proper play, which I can't think of what the number was, but it was, you know, the that, that amount of growth in a year and a half was pretty incredible, you know, so you kind of saw it on the rise and, and I think people who are in the business could see it, um, you know, I think my, like I said, myself and all these people on this including billy talked about it and saw where it's going but people didn't you know it took some convincing so it took the next album to get to the point of blowing the lid off the thing you know um which which you know i think the silver screen speaks for itself and then again in investing into the live show i don't think you'll find many better live shows you won't find bands of their caliber uh you know in terms of the rooms putting on better live shows you're either an indie rock band sitting there you know burning holes through your shoes, boring people to death, or, you know, uh, or you're, you're really taking it and you're trying to put the entertainment value to it on another level. And that's brand. And that's, that's, that's passion that Spencer, but you know, that's having understanding that your own art and taking it to the next level. I think a lot of people have difficulty doing that. I think there's only a handful of artists on my roster that even understand the value of that and will invest what Spencer has and, and what Mike has. Cause outside of money, everyone, it's a lot of time. You don't, you have to put on that live show without rehearsing it uh, properly and knowing that it has to fit in every room you go into. I think, I think like uh, probably most people who are watching this, uh, um, at least my reaction is that like, wow, everything in retrospect seems inevitable, but what you and your team over at Fearless Records provided, you must have saw some sort of missed opportunities that, or or something in Ice Nine Kills that that you guys brought to the table that really threw this up on steroids. What were the things that you guys learned from, either from mistakes early on or from successes that might have been unique, uh, or for the first time with Ice Nine Kills that now you apply elsewhere in, in other artists that you work. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, all you had to do was see the band on Warped Tour to, to know what was happening. Uh, that was a, that was a clear-cut, you know, sign. I think, you know, having ha like having conviction and having a brand and being more than just a, a song is is super important. I don't think bands are thinking that way. Um, you know, we, we have to look at the whole package. This is art that we're selling, you know, and that's that has to be something that, that people buy into. And if you're talking about having... You know what I think we talked about earlier, having a hundred super fans after you know uh, the All Star Tour and having the you know super fans be at the show. You don't get those unless people buy in, you know. And I think taking that and helping people establish themselves. And I don't think there's you know better ways. There's not many artists that have better content than than Spencer does. Uh, just period. So using that and and explaining to others like, hey, use this is a case example. This is what you can do. When you build strong brands, this is this is the the doors that are open. I think there's even more coming for Ice Nine Kills. You know, there's an audience that wants more than just the music. Uh, I mean, that's that is that's that's kind of not the norm, right? So I think that the lesson to be learned is to take that and, and apply it to other artists. Saying, think of your turn your entrepreneurial brain on. Your your band is a business. Look at look at more ways to expand your audience than just the songs. Excellent. Billy, it seems like uh, that's where merch kind of comes in. I mean, what Andy's talking about there is how do you turn, uh, how do you get the money? How do you turn this into a business? How do you capitalize on being a brand? And so I guess my question is like, where were things 
for Ice Nine Kills before you got involved? And what opportunities did you see in Ice Nine Kills when you got uh, when you started working with Spencer? Um, to me, I think it all kind of goes back to where I think I'm actually going to jump ahead um, in a sense here. I think if you look at everybody on this conference right now, uh, you know, we call this Ice Nine Kills ship. I guess uh, Spencer is absolutely the captain of this ship. And I think that that is something that um, is not super common to see right now. So every conversation that, you know, I have about merch is either, either with Spencer and Mike, you know, if it's, if it's about where we're taking things in general or just any kind of plan. I mean, Spencer is as involved as any other artist I've ever worked with. And I think that is the reason why this whole thing works so well. So um, it actually just comes back to, you know, I think we met in like 2013 or 14 on Warp Tour. I had a band I was actually managing at the time. Our merch company was very much so in the infant stages. I mean, we were, you know, I think we had three clients. <laughs> um, and, you yeah, know, just through the band that I had out, you know, we just became kind of friends. And, and I remember just commenting on their merch. They had some really good parody shirts. Um, I think I wanted one. It was like a, a Justin Bieber shirt, uh, you know, Thyson Kills logo and, and uh, you know, a few good references. And, and we just kind of struck up a conversation and, and I was friends with Mike at the time. We worked in management together and we were just kind of starting the merch company. And I just remember being like, yo, Mike, let us try something for Ice Nine Kills. Like their brand is so rad. And um, we just came in and like slowly started doing things, not even really as like the official merch partner. And just working with Spencer and working with Mike and just, it was like this creative freedom that like had never really had with like any other clients on really anything we'd worked on. It was just, um, you know, I think it, as opposed to a lot of other bands now, I mean, what you see come through in their brand, I mean, that's, that's coming from Spencer. It's organic, it's genuine. Um, and I think that's why it works. You know, the vision that, uh, you know, it, it, the vision and kind of the, the, um, you know, for, I guess, lack of a better term, the brand, I mean, really has not, you know, altered too much since we started working with them five years ago. You know, he knew what he wanted to do, knew where we wanted to go. And, uh, you know, like I said, early on, it was, it was definitely really slow. There was a lot of things rumbling that, that you know, were working. But I think, yeah, it was, it was that Warp Tour in 2017 or 18 that just really is when it kind of popped off. And I think everyone got it. Um, but in terms of just, you know, the, the actual team and, and coming on board, um, I think that uh, it goes for pretty much everyone on here. I think it's, it's, you know, Spencer and Mike have done such a good job of kind of making everybody feel like part of the Ice on Kills family, feeling really involved in the business in general. I don't think any of us here are kind of casual Ice on Killers, you know. I probably talk to Mike or Spencer almost every single day. Um, and I think one thing they've really done good is, yeah, just they really do make this feel like a team. You know, I have personal relationships with everybody on this call, whether it's through Just Ice on Kills or just, uh, you know, industry in general or whatever. But um, it's definitely a very, very cohesive business across all platforms. You know, if they have a record rolling out, I'm on calls with the label to make sure that the merch is going along with what they're doing. You know what I mean? Like I remember having... I mean, not even formally, but, you know, talking to Eric Powell about just how insane the tours were going to be and what the merch numbers were going to be and what we should expect before, I think, the last headliner where you guys went out and just absolutely tore the roof out of everything. So, um, yeah, it's definitely, you know, a, a really cohesive unit here, I think. And what I think speaks volumes is that it's just, yeah, I mean, Spencer's been super, super involved in this and probably the same way and the same passion for the last seven years. <laughs> you know, so, and... Uh, so and don't forget, have, Billy, your old uh, management office, your first office was right next to the old Fearless office in Huntington Beach. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, Billy, just real quick, because uh, I think that probably people watching this, a lot of people, they know what the record label does. They know what the attorney does. They know what the booking agent manager for, or, oh, at least they think they know what the manager does. Can you uh, sort of walk through what it is that you do for your clients as the merchandise company? Sure. I mean, you know, uh, it, we're, we're definitely a full service company and, and kind of like to be involved with, with really anything that involves kind of selling, uh, selling the brand on wearable apparel, which, you know, for a lot of bands, you know, especially early on, it's the only way that they can make money. You know what I mean? So bands that are signed to record deals, you know, especially early on when they're not recouped, usually aren't really seeing 
you know, much from that side. Like I said, they'll go tour. And like Mike said, they'll reinvest all the money they make in their touring and their production or any of that kind of stuff. And the only real way for them to, uh, you know, make some money is off of the merch. And so our job is to, you know, obviously work directly with them to, uh, you know, really first and foremost, make sure that the merch that we offer goes in line with the band is doing with the brand that they've kind of set out. Um, so everything from when the tour is happening, help develop the tour line. And then obviously, you know, print it, keep them stocked, run the logistics on the road, handle all the drop shipments. And then uh, the e-commerce, which is kind of the, the real fun part. So it's, it's you know, get in with Spencer, get in with Mike, get into it with, uh, you know, some of the creatives and the designers and, and stuff like that and kind of, you know, map out not only a strategy, but kind of a calendar for when we're going to release things. Um, a lot of just random getting together and brainstorming. I think it was just like a random... Uh, we went and got like breakfast with Spencer and his girlfriend. We came up with the idea for Nightmare on the Ninth, um, and just kind of, yeah, just just try and be as creative as possible, and then uh, make sure people know about it. So everything from building and optimizing the website, um, working with you know some of the other partners on the team that uh, like he's brought in a marketing team, um, and yeah, just making sure that. Uh, you know, if people want a shirt, that, it, that it's going to be cool. <laughs> and, uh, you know, really, I guess that, that uh, everything that, that uh, the band is doing kind of is embodied in, in the shirt. Because realistically, I mean, people buy band merch as an extension of the band, you know what I mean? So, um, Excellent. Awesome. Thank you, Billy. Uh, Eric German, I, I apologize for keeping you for last. I know it's been a while. Nobody's heard you speak yet. But uh, can you talk a little bit about the balance that you need to have as part of this team? But I would assume you are directly, uh, you, your job is to represent Spencer's interests, correct? And then how do you find that balance with the rest of the team? Well, obviously, my job is to represent Spencer's best interests. But the fact of the matter is we've got a lot of other people on this call that also do an excellent job of representing Spencer's best interests. So that makes my job a little bit easier vis-a-vis -vis them. I consider everyone on this call an important trusted business partner of Spencer's. And part of doing a great job for Spencer and Ice Nine Kills is understanding how important these other relationships are and being the glue and sometimes the, the extra uh, helper uh, where I can to help lift these guys up and make their job easier, right? So. I see it as a total team player and, uh, you know, whatever role I can play, I, I endeavor to play. And, you know, Spencer is definitely the heart at the center of the whole thing. But my interactions are primarily, I would say, with Andy and Mike, and uh, along with Spencer being involved. And I deal with Billy and Eric as other partners on this business as, as needed. But primarily, I'm dealing with you know, record company issues, music publishing issues, all of the different contracts that come across his desk and really just kind of convening as I think Billy puts so well. I speak to Mike, I don't know, if not every day, every couple of days. And uh, I speak to Andy, if not every week, you know, probably every week or close to it. I speak to Spencer. You know, we have a group text or a couple different versions of this group text that go back the entire time I've been with this group and you know there's if a day goes by and I don't see some sort of funny uh, uh, you know thing on the text then I know uh, something's wrong so you know I, I think I'm in a lot of ways uh, you know here to assist as needed by anyone on this team all in service of Spencer and I think yeah spoken like a true future politician <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but can you, how long have you been uh, working with Spencer and what is that uh, uh, how has the work that you do for him changed and evolved over that over that time period well i mean i i've uh, i came into the scene in 2018 right around the time right before that warp tour popped off so I had the great pleasure of walking in after these guys did all the hard work to build this incredible castle. I got to kick back, take my shoes off, and sit down in the master bedroom and go, wow, isn't this place nice, you know? And uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful. I mean, obviously, there's a culture that's been created by, by Mike and Spencer and this team. It's a, it's a friendship. So it's been a lot of fun to be able to, you know, there's a lot of ball busting and, and you know, ribbing and good times. We've gone on trips together. 
Most of us on this team uh, were have gone on multiple, you know, road trips together. I think we had one plan, two guys that got killed by COVID. But uh, the, uh, you know, it's fun. We enjoy each other. How has my role changed? My role has changed. Uh, the more I become integrated into what this is, the more that time goes on, the more I understand the brand and the opportunities. The more Mike and Spencer welcome me into the brainstorming. And we, uh, we do a lot of, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about how we can grow this business. And it's fun. It's just like any startup business or venture capital level, you know, uh, uh, you know company. We look at it that way. and we, we audit every piece of the business and, and I'm constantly trying to adjust it and to, to put good deals in place to help uh, us make money and grow the brand and connect better with fans. And so, you know, every day is a new adventure. And I will tell you, this, this time that we've been in this quarantine zone or whatever, this team has been hustling. I mean, it's another deal and another opportunity and another way to connect better with fans and another way to pivot this business to all online in the short term. We've been doing this on, on, a, on a daily basis, and it's pretty cool. So I think as the days and weeks go by, I become more and more involved, and I'm really thankful for it. Spencer, as you look at your career in retrospect, does it – look like it's in like phases almost you know like when you're hustling for yourself when you've got that early team uh you know when you got mike putting together this team and the future that is going to come and then the follow-up question would be if you do look at it that way has the team evolved based on how your career has shifted or is your career shifting to these new phases because of the people that you've got around you Absolutely. Yeah, I do see it in terms of phases now, now that I think about it. I think the initial phase uh, from the inception of the band w was, was trying to get in that proverbial door, trying to get to that other side of the gate. Um, and it took so long to get there. And I think um, establishing, our, establishing ourselves with that first member of the team, which was Mike, uh, really helped us get into that initial door. And uh, the other members that we've carried with us through the rest have, have been instrumental in getting us to that next phase. So it, it, you look at it as you've accomplished one thing and how do you get to the next level? And that's how I'm always thinking about it. And now that we've had a little bit of success, you, you, you don't look back on the, on the journey and say, you know, hey, what a pain in the ass that was. You really have to uh, learn to love and respect the journey and uh, you realize that once you get to that next level, that you appreciate it so much more because you've worked so hard for it. And I think every single person on this call, one of the, the things that is definitely uh, something that we all have in common is, is passion. And I, I think that that has been so key in continuing to grow our brand because at the end of the day, we're all friends and this is all fun and it's all exciting. And, um, you know, one of the things I love about our team is that even if when we, when we gain some success and we do something that's unbelievable that no, no one's believing that we're doing this in merch or that the album's streaming like this or we get this tour, we're never satisfied. We're always looking at what can we do next. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I love about these guys. When you talk about that passion and that hustle and, you know, that's been a recurring theme even from early stage of your career, uh, how challenging has it been for you over the years to delegate and to allow other people to have an influence and, and, and to creatively provide you input into what it is that Ice Nine Kills looks like, sounds like, everything that this team does for you? I think it, it took time to get the right players uh, in line. And I think that once you do, you build that trust and you build that dynamic. And I know that, um, you know, if, if I, I have a question about what makes sense as far as uh, what tours we're going to go to, what, 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 what's the right look, when's the right time to hit a certain place. Like I, I trust, you know, I trust Eric completely with that stuff. Uh, if there's anything in, in um, as far as legal advice or, or anything contractually, I know Eric knows more than anyone about that kind of stuff. And uh, for, for Billy, he, he knows what, what kind of stuff is selling and how to take a design and take it to the next level. And Mike is always there to, to guide that team, and he, he knows everyone to get to. And um, as far as 
getting someone like Eric German involved, you know, that was through Mike and Mike's personal relationship. And, uh, and with the label and Andy and everyone being so supportive of, of our brand and our vision, um, it's just been a, a fantastic experience. And I think with, with all of those different facets, it comes down to trust. And, and there's, a, there's definitely a mutual, mutual trust among all the members of this team. And, um, and I have a lot of confidence in everyone. That's awesome. Mike, uh, I, I want to transition a little bit to uh, uh, the Silver Scream specifically. So how early in either the songwriting or the recording or the, uh, the, the post-production process do you start bringing in and taking input from each member of the team? And, and is it changed by member to member? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, you know, bands, especially on the trajectory that Ice Nine Kills was on, we operate on these album cycles, we do the touring that makes sense for it, and then the band goes to start writing and recording. You know, the interesting thing of, as, as the band was continuing to grow was opportunities would continue to present themselves even as the band was writing and aiming to record. And the nice thing is, you know, prior to working with Drew Folk, who produced the last album, Spencer's got this great relationship with Steve Sopcich, who's based up in upstate New York, and um, was able to kind of carve out a lot of time for the band to kind of go. It wasn't like, hey, you've only got a month to come in. So um, if I recall correctly, you know, there were some tours that even got presented to us and some things to, to deal with while we maybe should have been recording. But inevitably, you know, the nice thing about, <clears throat> you know, I've been working with the band for a, an EP and then two albums prior to The Silver Scream and trusted Spencer and his bandmates and his, you know, resources to make another great record. And so, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to get in there and dig too much. That said, you know, part of what, my goal is to do like everyone else's is to continue to allow the band to grow and be able to step aside from the emotional component of what the band is creating and you know attempt to maybe give some objective input and so you know oftentimes what happened was you know spencer came and he and he had a vision for what it was you know he'd written the previous record all about novels um and and you know was transitioning to do it all about horror films. And I, I can't, I don't try to interfere with the vision in any capacity. I don't mind commenting. And one of the things that I enjoyed about my role is, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the biggest horror fan. So I was trying to approach it from the perspective of, I like the band, I like the music. If I don't, if I'm not all in on the brand, right? And therefore I'm not into the gimmick which I don't think it's a gimmick, but if, if that part it doesn't appeal to me, is it still compelling? And um, thankfully it was. And, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, uh, so, so relatively early on, I mean, you know, you got to remember we've been working together for five or six years prior to even going into the writing session and there is this trusted relationship. And then what I do a lot of, right, of, is share with the other members of the team. Right, because the beautiful thing about everybody, you know, not only did Spencer comment that everybody's passionate, like everybody on here could play another role on this team easily, right? Billy used to be a manager, and he's a promoter. He could easily, you know, be a man. I guess the only ones that most of us couldn't do is is be an attorney, right? But Eric German surely could be a manager, and he could run, you know, do any of these other things. He's got an A in our ear. That's how all of us approach it. So it's actually really fun. And Spencer's open to that, right? Uh, he has final say for sure. And most of the time, you know, he's got his vision and we don't need to mess with it. But when we do get to get involved, at least on the, on the tiniest bit, to kind of make sure that it's, you know, uh, zooming towards the interstate as opposed to the access road, uh, he does allow us to do that. So Andy, when, uh, well, I guess I, I should uh, preface this, that the, uh, work that Fearless did in terms of videos and, and everything in the rollout seems to me, at least from my layman's eyes, seems pretty unprecedented at Fearless. Maybe I'm wrong, if not unprecedented just about anywhere. So what were those early discussions like? And do you recall the first time that Mike or Spencer introduced you to this theme idea for the Silver Scream? And how did 
uh, what was your process to buying into this? Uh, Mike came into my office right when I came to Fearless, and he said, cool, I just sent you the demos. I was like, great, let's get into these. And it all started. And Drew Folk was already been introduced at that time, the producer. And I was like, okay, let's go. And then, you know, we got the record right. And it was, I, we knew it was going to go. Um, and then, you know, when it came back to me, always is like the music video, the content is like, let's just keep going. Like, let's just keep going. We have something that's working. It's, it's great. People are growing. Like we saw it. You know, it didn't, you didn't need to see the streaming. You just saw it on, on social media. So, um, you know, I, th I do agree. I think it's unprecedented that, you know, labels do this much in terms of the video space. But when you have someone like Spencer, which is, you know, you don't, they don't grow on trees, you have, to, you have to double down on it. And that's just the reality, um, you know. So when you have something, and it's so exciting. I think Spencer said everyone's so passionate about this. A lot of people here can wear different hats. It's like, you know, from a label perspective, I'll call anyone. I'll do any job to get you know the done the work done for our artist i think i know eric german does the same thing i know billy canler does the same thing you know i know everyone here mike we talk about it you know i think a lot of people don't realize is that yes we do talk on a daily basis or every other day basis with with people like mike mowry and i don't speak to all my managers that way and i think it's because we do have a, a long relationship um and you know we all have the same interests and same goals you know, I think it's it's pretty special when you get to the point where everyone can have creative conversations, can disagree, can argue, but at the end of the day, we all know we're working on the same team and we have the one we're all passionate. You know, and I, I can, it's not every team, but it's definitely this team. You know, and and having long-standing relationships with everyone on this team makes it very easy to uh, have the trust that Spencer keeps referring to. You know, and I think having that trust and and know how and at the end of the day, it's it is it is Spencer's art. It's his project. So you know his instinct is better than all of ours. We can take our professional knowledge, our know-how, and our experience, and and help you know give input. But at the end of the day, um, you know no one knows it better than he does. And you know it's it's a it's an honor to be a part of it and 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 help fuel the fire. Excellent. And and the other people on your team it was that. Uh, your responsibility to make sure that everybody else was feeling as passionate and ready to dive in as you were, or was that a natural process? What was that like inside Fearless Records? Yeah, I mean, you, you the staff at Fearless, which you know we're we're a small team, we're we're a total of fifteen, but um, a lot of ours get gets our hand, a lot of the staff gets their hands dirty. You know, we speak constantly. You know, we we throw around Fearless Family a lot. A lot of us care about each other on that level. So, and we care about our roster on that level. Whether it's a small span or the biggest band on the roster, it doesn't really matter to us. We really want to make everyone feel like family. So, um, you know, Nona, Nona Faye, who is the the PM on this, um, you know, which you know, I think a lot of people could speak the world world about her. She is uh, she's a go getter and she's a killer. And you know, she raises her hand whenever she sees something to talk to me and she goes hey this is this is insane we should you know and then our our, our digital marketing team which is, is based in new york and la digital marketing consulting there's a lot of people that touch this um so it's you know it's a priority act so it's it's a lot of things are going on a lot of people but you know we're having daily we my i've set up especially in covid era i have, I have twice a day conversations with the whole staff much similar to this on zoom or skype business where i i make sure everyone raises their hand on even the little bit of things. So everything's always a group discussion. The passion's insane. If you go to a show, if you go to an Ice Nine Kill show, our whole staff is there top to bottom, you know, and, and, and I, and it's something that is, it's culturally that, you know, Bob created that a long time ago is, is that you go and support your artist. Doesn't matter where it is. You go to, if there's five people there or 500 or 1500, 5,000 or a festival of 30,000 people, which, you know, we've done with a Hank group of these guys, which tend to be kind of fun. But, you know, we go and support the artists and we go and, and, and show, you know, that we're there. And I think, I think that just, you know, that type of passion is, is not everywhere, but I think it's been something cultural and fearless from day one. Eric Powell, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that in retrospect, everything seems inevitable, but can you recall what the conversations were like when you were talking to promoters for the tour that was going to support the release of the Silver Screen? What were they like and how have those conversations changed since the success of the Silver Screen? 
Well, it's interesting because when we started the rollout for a silver screen, it was on Warp Tour. It was right when Warp Tour was starting. And I think people were starting to catch on to what was going on, but we had put American Nightmare out, I think, the first week of Warp Tour. And within a couple of days, it was one of the biggest songs in the set. Everybody in the crowd knew the words. And it was the final Warp Tour. So we're talking crowds of eight to 10,000 people some days, and everyone knows the words start to finish of the set. And I think that that kind of started to set the tone uh, to what the album cycle would become. So we released the record supporting Atreyu that fall and then went into supporting Falling in Reverse. And I think that on both those tours, there was this feeling that there was a changing of the tide, that Ice Nine Kills was starting to carve themselves out as the next headliner in this world. Uh, so, you know, coming off those tours and those very successful tours, we decided to go big for the Octane Accelerator Tour in November, December of uh, 2019. Octane being such a critical partner in what we were doing, it made a lot of sense to have them involved. And we decided to uh, work with Live Nation on their touring office and put them in a lot of the House of Blueses. And we went into the Worcester Palladium uh, downstairs, which you know I think was in a lot of ways poetic. Spencer had started his career, uh, or just as a kid going there as a fan. And, you know, I think, what I, I forgot what year it was, but you know, Einstein played a battle of the bands there. So I think to sell that show out, uh, you know, Thanksgiving weekend at 2,600 tickets in advance, I think it was like a, it was a real moment for the whole team. You know, I, I think I remember watching that whole set of just like, it's almost how surreal it was, uh, how the fans never stopped from start to finish with, uh, in the set, you know, and even after 90 minutes, they wanted more. Awesome. Thank you. Billy, can you talk about that warp tour that preceded the Silver Scream and how merch was moving and and uh, uh, and then how it changed and how merch the merch game has changed for Ice Nine Kills in the wake of the Silver Scream's release? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I think it's actually Warp Tour 2016 was our first Warp Tour we did together. I think we started working together in 2014. Uh, the 2016 one, I remember the first day of Warp Tour. Uh, just being absolutely kind of blown away by, you know, how much bigger their crowd was and how much bigger their merch numbers were than kind of we expected. And so we went into 2018 being like, all right, this is going to be pretty big. Like, you know, new song coming out or anything. We, we planned, you know, for them to do well. And I remember that first show was just like, absolutely, no one thought it was going to be that big. The merch numbers were, I mean, I remember... Yeah, you know, me and Spencer will have these side conversations and it'd be like, how are we doing? How are we doing? You know, like compared to the other bands, I'll be like, number one, man. I mean, I think they, you know, that, that, that was the summer. Uh, I think they were our highest grossing band on Warp Tour in terms of sales and things that I've always just kind of heard passively, you know, from, from industry people or just the, you know, once like the merch numbers usually will kind of pop a little bit ahead of everything else. And that's when you know it's coming. So I think that warp tour was the one where just like, all right, this is this is taking the next step. Let's go. And so the Silver Screen has been really, really fun. Um, you know, with the Nightmare on the Ninth, you know, it's about you know the, the merch drop is centered around a uh, different song on the album. Um, you know that the promo that we do is centered around that song, and it's gotten you know obviously it's a super creative record, and it's allowed us to do really cool, super creative promo and kind of tie it all together with with the album as a whole and fans have really bought into it. Um, we're seeing people that buy every single drop, <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, I think it's just, I mean, the more ammo that, that Spencer gives us, the, uh, you know, more fun that, that we get to have with it. And so, and we're talking about going really out there with some of, some of the next things. And, um, I don't know, it's cool. I mean, it, you know, at the end of the day, uh, good music wins, right? So they, they put out a, a great record and did some really cool things around it and just makes everyone's job so much easier. Eric German, I, I think I got two things that segue so well that, that something that Eric Powell said, which is, you know, talking about that, that Worcester Palladium show, which that uh, post that Spencer put on Instagram was uh, just incredible because it was like, this is, this is us playing our very first gig and last night we just sold it out. It was awesome. And, and then Billy talking about how what's coming. So on a legal front, I know you can't talk a lot, but what are the sorts of things that you are trying to protect Spencer from as things continue to grow? I, I, my, my job at this point is, number one, to, to, to help him make money, to help him 
make his business a well-oiled machine to help him put himself into deals and relationships and contracts that are going to put money in his pocket and, and, and allow him to spend money on the creative product and to realize his vision. I mean, I want to see, you can only imagine anyone who's watched this video this far or who's interested in this band, can't just close your eyes and think about the things we could do if, if we had uh, uh, you know, all the money in the world, right? So all of the things we could do if we got all the money in the world, we're, we're thinking about trying to do those things. And I'm trying to help figure out how to get sponsor the opportunity and this team the opportunity to get the tools they need to realize this vision. I mean, this could be quite grandiose, man. You know, I, again, I don't want to give away all the secrets, but, but just understand that uh, this motherfucking monster's coming out of the water with a, with a knife ready to slit some throats, man. I mean, we are going to surprise you. We are going to knock your socks off. And, you know, on the broadest of levels, the biggest of entertainment properties, we're, we're planning on it, talking about it, and actually taking affirmative steps towards making it happen. So my job is to, is to do all those things and to create those opportunities and kind of, you know, to use a football analogy because Andy Sorrell, right, we're on, we're on Team Raiders, right? Uh, I, I'm going to block and tackle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clear the way and make the path to give Spencer the space to go get that first down, right? The second thing is on a, on a bigger picture level, I'm trying to protect his creative vision. So on another football analogy, I'm a left tackle protecting his blind side because while he's out there doing what he does, trying to make things happen creatively and to realize his vision, I need to make sure that I protect that like a princess in the castle at the end of the Donkey Kong game, you know? That's so precious that can that, you know, I have to make sure that none of these, you know, terrible business people and Hollywood schmucksters and, and fast talking people come and try to and try to you know take advantage of that or to uh, cut into that. So you know it's the coolest things possible. And how can I make sure that the creativity stays pure throughout all of that? That's my mission in life. You know, it's his creative vision. Mike is uh, Spencer is the is the board of directors. And uh, Mike is the CEO. And, you know, like, and, and my job is general counsel. And my job is to make sure that they know where all the pitfalls are. And I do everything I can to make sure that they, they're safe. And we achieve our goals. <laughs> Spencer, as a creative, uh, I mean, Eric kind of uh, talked about how the world of opportunities have really opened up for you. Uh, is that exciting? Is that scary? I mean, is it, uh, where are you creatively now? And are there anything, is there anything that people are saying no to <laughs> now, you know? No, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time. And also something that, that I should mention, I think that moving to Los Angeles where our team exists has been a pivotal move in my career and I think that uh, I don't know if we would be as far along or if I would have had as great relationships as with with these people as I do now because I'm so close um, in proximity to them you know being able to go and, and see Eric German anytime or, or, or go to the absolute offices or go to 10th Street or stop in a fearless that stuff has made a world of difference um, but to get, get back to your uh, point, I think that, yes, there are an enormous amount of opportunities compared to what they were before uh, with the Silver Scream. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that I have a team like this to navigate me through these uh, you know, difficult decisions and which, which deals to make. And uh, you know, Eric's been uh, pivotal in, in, that, in that side of the game. Let, let me say this, Paul, just to jump in. Please. Like, you think about the things that it, Einstein Kills is not just a rock band anymore, right? It's a brand. It's a giant brand, and it's only going to get, you know, I mean, it's it's a developing brand. It's going to get giant. And you think of all the things and think of what the fans are into and think about, you know, some of the things that you would do if you were Einstein Kills. Think of the things that the fans probably dream up. We're going to do them. And, and, how exciting is that? I get to be a part of creating something on the level of, you know, that may have the cultural impact of a Marilyn Manson or an Alice Cooper or a Rob Zombie or something like that. 
And, and uh, you know, maybe that's only the beginning of what we can achieve. So that, you know, we're, we're really real deal. I mean, you probably know some of this stuff, but we're working. Mike, I, I mean, I would imagine like in the early days of when you're working with Spencer and you're putting together a team, you're hoping to have two people, three people, four people. And then as the career and the success grows and grows, the team grows with it. Am I right? Yeah. And more importantly, whether or not the team grows, just the expertise of each member on the team actually grows. You know, and that's the most comforting thing about this is all of the people that you're seeing on the screen. I mean, it's not, there's a few other, you know, tangential members that aren't here. Um, you know, we use one designer almost exclusively for all of the Ice Nine Kills merchandise. Our good friend, Mike Cortada, he could easily be sitting here with us um, if we wanted. Obviously, everybody here has their own staff. I mean, Billy's got such a great staff that is, you know, working. Uh, you know, 24 seven, it feels like. Um, and, and it goes back to what Spencer said, like everybody's passionate, but I've been in the business long enough and built a number of teams where you had passionate people without the expertise. And, you know, it's so nice for me, right? If I'm stuck on something, which happens all the time, I can call anyone here. Again, it doesn't have to be on their level of expertise, right? I can call Eric Powell and talk to him about something creative. I can call Billy and talk to him about something touring related. You know, I can call Eric and talk about anything and Andy the same. Um, and that's just so refreshing to know that A, I'm gonna get a solid answer and B, if they don't know, they got access to a whole Rolodex of people at their companies, right? That are gonna help us to craft this vision or, or craft a strategy to implement Spencer's vision. Spencer, uh you know, it, it, you seem very thoughtful about everything about your career, even from an early, uh, from the early days. Were there any decisions or any strategy that you had about who you chose to work with that you felt and feel has benefited you to get to where you are? Or were there any mistakes along the way that you would want to encourage people not to make for themselves? I think back early, early on in my career, before any of these gentlemen were involved, um, we got wrapped into a bad contract. And uh, I think that that can be so easily avoided by having uh, a proper um, attorney uh, read over said agreement. Uh, the way we were kind of looking at this uh, deal, which I can't really talk about too much into detail, but oh, it's just one album, you know, what's the big deal? And it ended up haunting us for several years. Uh, you know, we were young, we were eager to, to, to sign something that we thought would get us to the next level. So that that's one one pitfall, and I know so many bands make that mistake, and they, they pay for it for years. So th that's something that, you know, everyone can learn from a mistake like that. Um, but everything else was just a very organic uh, growth um, and, uh, you know, got introduced to different members of this team by, by um, current members of the team. And I think that uh, we, we really struck gold here with, with such a competent team. Like, you know, Mike said, everyone on this call is an expert at what they do. And I think you pair that with passion and you really have something. You mentioned earlier that you have you found the rejection letter from Fearless Records, right? Uh, what are those points in your career where you felt alone and you felt like maybe this can't help or this can't I can't make it on my own? What were the did you have those times where it was particularly challenging where you almost thought, no, I, I just can't do this? Definitely. I mean, through through every phase that we talked about, there were, you know, several dark periods where, you know, why, why can't we win the uh, the local regional Warp Tour battle of the bands to just play one date on Warp Tour? Couldn't figure out why the hell we couldn't do that. Why are we why aren't we good? I think I went into my mom's room one day and said, Mom, why do we just suck? Can you just tell me do we suck? Um that, that summer that I, I spoke of on the Warp Tour when we followed the whole um, tour. And, you know, there were high points of that summer, you know, when, when, when I would look down at my, my 
backpack and realized I had sold like 300 CDs that day and, and realized that we were doing something. We were, we were pushing the, the needle forward. But, you know, there were definitely dark times on that tour when I would be sweating in the, you know, 110 degree Arizona heat and, and seeing bands on stage that I thought that we were just as good as. And, uh, and um, I think that, that all that belief that we should be there and that, you know, no one was going to tell us that we couldn't uh, kept me going. And, uh, you know, e even when uh, we started to gain some traction uh, with the, the previous album, Every Trick in the Book, um, and uh, Eric Powell alluded to it, you know, we were still, we were doing well. We were drawing a lot of people and uh, we seemed to be great, get, like generating a great buzz and fan base. But still there, were, there was this stigma that was attached to the band because we had been around for such a long time and people kind of turned, uh, turned their nose up to us. Like, oh, that band's, they're not going anywhere. They've been around too long. They've never reached that next level. Those were frustrating times too, but um, I think that uh, just pushing forward and uh, never giving up um, the belief in yourself is what got us to that point. And I think that I always had the vision, and I think with the Silver Scream, the music finally equaled the quality of the vision. And I think that that was, um, that was a real turning point. And I, I think also just, you know, it comes down to good music. And I think that while in the past, uh, the music had been good, you know, back when Mike started to manage us. And I think that that's um, part of the talent of, of, of people like this, that they can see through a raw product. But I think uh, back in, in, in those times, I think we were a little bit too preoccupied about what other bands were doing. And if, if we do this part, is it not going to be heavy enough? Or is this not going to fit in with how all the bands on Rise sound? And I think as soon as we started to... Um, not worry about that and I just started to say let's just try to do our own thing that's when we start to see a lot more success Mike can you wrap us up I, I want to ask you about what the future of Ice Nine Kills looks like as a result of having the expertise and and the creativity that that, that this team uh, on, on this call has that might not have been there before yeah, I mean, going back to Eric German's analogy that the castle was built prior to him coming in and being able to take up quarters in the master bedroom, right? Like, he helped come in and, and redo the wiring, redo the plumbing, get us to this place. And now we're, now we're looking to either, you know, build a whole new wing to this thing or, you know, an entire second home entirely. We can run with it, you know, whatever it looks like. But the great news is, you know, we now got a platform. It's no longer so much about trying to get people to pay attention. You know, the gatekeepers who are the friends of all of us on here, everybody on this team has gone to bat for Spencer prior to the Silver Scream coming out. And Spencer stepped up to the plate, I'll mix metaphors here a little bit, and just crushed a freaking grand slam, right? And now he's going to get to come up to bat once again. And all of us that are, that are in here in the, you know, the training camp with him, with him saying, look, here's been my, my workout routine, right? He's got this next vision and he's writing music and he's spending time and, you know, it's just such, it's so exciting. You know, it really is. I'm so grateful like to, to be able to sit here and, and kind of almost pinch myself to walk through this history like this has been so miraculous. And I'm imagining, right, we've sped time up. We're on an exponential scale. So then if we do this again in two or three years, you know, we're going to be to hopefully talking about growth that's just so, you know, out of this world in comparison to what we've done in these past, you know, nine or 10 years that you've spoken about. That's awesome. Uh, anybody else, you guys want to say anything before we wrap up? This it, has been fantastic. I'm sorry I didn't get it. Every one of you I could spend an hour and a half with. So I, I feel, uh, yeah, Billy, please. I have one that's just kind of general advice when it goes to, uh, you know, any bands trying to build a team. Um, it, it, and maybe just off of some mistakes that I've seen that, that uh, have not happened in this one. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, your team's only as good as you make them, right? Um, I think the biggest difference in, in on a new client, whether it works or whether it doesn't, is, I mean, the, I get so many that are just like, what do you guys want? And they're like, I don't know, just make us cool. I don't know, we just want something cool. 
you know, where Spencer is literally the complete opposite. I mean, down to the specific details. I mean, I don't know how many, you know, revisions I'll get where it's just like the little red iPhone thing, just like circling, like just change this part or whatever. I mean, down to, you know, every little detail, every vision, you know, he knows what he wants. He's known what he's wanted forever. Um, so, you know, obviously build a good team, but give them something to work with. If you don't know where you want them to take you, they're not going to get you there. So you've got to have some sort of vision and idea before you start putting the team together. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I, I think people are going to just soak this up. This has been such a great conversation. So thank you very, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and thanks thank to Launch back. Music. Launch Music for allowing us to do this. And, yes. uh, you know, they've, they've been huge supporters of what, you know, we've done, been doing for such a long time. So special shout out to Jeremy Weiss and Spencer and those guys. So Absolutely. Sweet. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Paul.